Introduction to the Phenomenology of Religion. Winter Semester 1920-21. Part 1. Methodological Introduction Philosophy, Factical Life Experience, and the Phenomenology of Religion. Chapter 1. The Formation of Philosophical Concepts and Factical Life Experience. The Peculiarity of Philosophical Concepts. It is necessary to determine the meaning of words of the lecture's announcement preliminarily. This necessity is grounded in the peculiarity of philosophical concepts. In the specific scientific disciplines, concepts are determined through their integration into a material complex and the more familiar this context is, the more exactly its concepts can be fixed. Philosophical concepts, on the contrary, are vacillating, vague, manifold, and fluctuating, as is shown in the alteration of philosophical standpoints. This uncertainty of philosophical concepts is not, however, exclusively founded upon this alteration of standpoints. It belongs, rather, to the sense of philosophical concepts themselves that they always remain uncertain. The possibility of access to philosophical concepts is fundamentally different from the possibility of access to scientific concepts. Philosophy does not have at its disposal an objectively and thoroughly formed material context into which concepts can be integrated in order to receive their determination. There is thus a difference in principle between science and philosophy. This provisional thesis will prove itself in the course of these observations. It is due to the necessity of linguistic formulation alone that this is a thesis, a proposition, at all. We can, however, take a more efficient route in order to realize that a preliminary understanding of the title's concepts is necessary. We speak of philosophical and scientific concepts, of introductions to the sciences and to phenomenology. This shows a certain commonality despite the difference in principle between them. From where stems that commonality? Philosophy, one might think, is just as much a rational, cognitive comportment as science is. This results in the idea of a proposition in general, of the concept in general, etc. But this conception is not free from the prejudice of philosophy as a science. The idea of scientific knowledge and concepts is not to be carried over into philosophy on the basis of an extension of the concept of the scientific proposition to the proposition in general, as if the rational contexts of science and philosophy were identical. Nonetheless, there is a leveled-off understanding of philosophical and scientific concepts and propositions. In factical life, these concepts and propositions encounter each other in the sphere of linguistic presentation and communication as meanings which are being understood. Initially, they are not at all marked off from one another. Since we have to realize that the comprehension of philosophical concepts is different from that of scientific concepts, we must find out how this leveled-off understanding of such concepts and propositions arises. Is this entire consideration not a perpetual treatment of preliminary questions? Apparently, one hesitates evasively at the introductory stage one makes necessitate the capacity for positive creations into a virtue. Philosophy can be reproached for turning perpetually upon preliminary questions only if one borrows the measure of its evaluation from the idea of the sciences, and if one expects from philosophy the solution of concrete problems and demands of it the construction of a worldview. I wish to increase and keep awake philosophies need to be ever turning upon preliminary questions, so much so that it will indeed become a virtue. About what is proper to philosophy itself, I have nothing to say to you. I will deliver nothing that is materially interesting or that moves the heart. Our task is much more limited. 2. On the title of the lecture course. The title of this lecture course reads Introduction to the Phenomenology of Religion. This title can be given a thrice nuanced meaning, depending on the noun one emphasizes. We must reach a provisional understanding of the three concepts introduction, phenomenology which for us will have the same meaning as philosophy and religion. In the midst of these efforts, we will soon encounter a peculiar core phenomenon, the problem of the historical. This problem will lead to limitations upon our present aspiration. We will begin with the clarification of the meaning of words, but we will refer immediately to the connections among objects indicated in these meanings such that these connections will be put into question. 1. What does introduction mean? An introduction to a science is usually comprised of three aspects. Ate delimitation of the material domain sash to buy it. The doctrine of the methodological treatment of the material domain and can be taken together determination fest telling off the concept the goal and the task of the science. The historical consideration of the previous attempts to pose and resolve the scientific tasks. Can one introduce philosophy in the same way? An introduction to the sciences presents the domain of the subject matter, and the methodological treatment of that domain its goal and task, and a historical overview of the various attempts at solutions. If the sciences and philosophy are different, and if the philosopher wishes to give what is properly philosophical its due, then it is questionable whether he can simply adopt this scheme of an introduction. One recognizes a philosopher by looking at his introduction to philosophy. An introduction according to the usual scheme obscures the philosophical connections. With regard to their subject matter Sashraltig, an introduction to biology, to chemistry, and to the history of literature are very different in kind, but they possess a great formal similarity. They proceed according to the same schema. 
the idea of science not taken logically and abstractly, but concretely as the enactment of science, understood as actual research and collaboration, and not, for instance, as a pure rational system motivates, understandably, the sense shin of the scheme of an introduction. Historically, of course, the sciences, even with respect to their sense, originate from philosophy. Originating is meant in a very specific sense in this context. One usually takes this to mean that specific particular disciplines split off from a universal science, that is, that they autonomize themselves. In this context, origination means the determination, with an independent method, of a specific domain of a subject matter that previously had been worked upon by philosophy. Thus, one presupposes that philosophy itself is a science, too. This conception of the origination of the sciences from philosophy as the cognitive dealing with the world, in which the sciences are already embryonically present, is a prejudice on the part of current philosophy that is projected back into history. Only a particular, formative modification of a moment already potentially present in philosophy a moment, however, found in philosophy in its original, unmodified form turns the sciences, in their origination from philosophy and according to the specific character of this origination, into sciences. The sciences are thus not to be found in philosophy. This leads us to the question too. What is called philosophy? The introductory questions never interest the scientist as much as the proper, concrete scientific problems. And the introduction, especially where it encounters what is philosophical, reveals a certain well-grounded insecurity. We will not let ourselves be disconcerted by such judgments. Perhaps in philosophy the introduction has such an important meaning that it has to be considered alongside every step into philosophy. The introduction is not merely technique. The question of the essence of philosophy appears unfruitful and academic. But this, do, is only the consequence of the common conception of philosophy as a science. For instance, a philologist is not interested in the essence of philology. But the philosopher occupies himself seriously with the essence of philosophy before he turns to positive work. The fact that philosophy constantly has to attain clarity about its essence is a deficiency only if the idea of science is cited as the norm. The history of philosophy can be understood philosophically only if there is a difference in principle between philosophy and science for only then can the great philosophical systems be considered, with this problem as the guiding thread, according to the following aspects. 1. What is the original motive of the philosophy under consideration? 2. What are the conceptual, cognitive means to the realization of this motive? 3. Did these means originally arise from the motive of the philosophy under consideration, so that they were not adopted from other ideals, particularly scientific ones? 4. Do certain points of rupture, at which philosophy opens out into scientific channels, manifest themselves, as in all previous philosophies? 5. Is the motive of the philosophy under consideration itself original or is it adopted from other motives of life and from other ideals? It is in this respect that we will consider the history of philosophy. If the history of philosophy is considered otherwise, it becomes either merely beautiful talk or a classifying occupation. How do we arrive at the self-understanding of philosophy? This can be attained only by philosophizing itself, not by way of scientific proofs and definitions, that is, not by philosophy's integration into a universal, objectively formed material complex sesh susamanhang. That this is so lies in the concept of self-understanding. What philosophy itself is can never be rendered evident scientifically but can only be made clear in philosophizing itself. One cannot define philosophy in the usual way one cannot characterize it through an integration into a material complex, according to the manner in which, as it is said, chemistry is a science and painting is an art. The integration of philosophy into a conceptual system has also been attempted by claiming that philosophy deals with a specific object in a specific manner. But even here the scientific conception of philosophy comes into play. In these attempts, the principles of thought and cognition remain unclarified. One can, nevertheless, speak in this manner of painting, despite its not being a science. One can say, for example, that it is an art. In fact, this is, in a very formal sense, justified even with regard to philosophy, wherein this kind of formality is still to be clarified. The problem of the self-understanding of philosophy has always been taken too lightly. If one grasps this problem radically, one finds that philosophy arises from factical life experience. And within factical life experience philosophy returns back into factical life experience. The concept of factical life experience is fundamental. The designation of philosophy is cognitive, rational comportment says nothing at all with this designation, one falls prey to the ideal of science, thus obscuring precisely the main difficulty. 3. Factical life experience is the point of departure. What is called factical life experience? Experience designates one the experiencing activity, to that which is experienced through this activity. However, we use the word intentionally in its double sense, because it is precisely the fact that the experiencing self and what is experienced are not torn apart like things that expresses what is essential in factical life experience. 
Experiencing does not mean taking cognizance of but a confrontation with, the self-assertion of the forms of what is experienced. It has both, a passive and an active sense. Factical does not mean naturally real or causally determined, nor does it mean real in the sense of a thing. The concept factical may not be interpreted from certain epistemological presuppositions, but can be made intelligible only from the concept of the historical. At the same time, however, factical life experience is a danger zone for independent philosophy since the ambitions of the sciences already validate themselves in this zone. The idea that philosophy and science are objective formations of sense, separated propositions, and propositional complexes must be eliminated. When the sciences in general are taken to be philosophically problematic, they are investigated according to a theory of science as to their extricated propositional truth complex. One has to grasp the concrete sciences themselves in their enactment, and the scientific process must be laid out in its foundations as historical. This is what contemporary philosophy not only overlooks but intentionally rejects this historicality as allowed no role. We defend the thesis that science is different in principle from philosophy. This must be considered. All great philosophers have wished to elevate philosophy to the rank of a science, which implies the admission of a deficiency of the respective philosophy namely, that it is not yet science. One therefore orients oneself toward a rigorous scientific philosophy. Is rigor a super-scientific concept? Originally, the concept and sense of rigor is philosophical and not scientific originally, only philosophy is rigorous it possesses a rigor in the face of which the rigor of science is merely derivative. Philosophy's constant effort to determine its own concept belongs to its authentic motive. For a scientific philosophy, on the contrary, it is never possible to reject the reproach of ever tarrying with the epistemological, preliminary considerations. Philosophy is to be liberated from its secularization to a science, or to a scientific doctrine of worldviews. The derivation of science from philosophy is to be determined positively. Today, one usually assumes a standpoint of compromise in its particularity. Philosophy is said to be science, but its general tendency is to present a worldview. In this, however, the concepts science and worldview remain vague and unclarified. How can one reach the self-understanding of philosophy? Apparently, the path of scientific deduction is cut off in advance through our thesis. This self-understanding cannot, further, be reached through reference to the object of philosophy. Philosophy does not, perhaps, deal with an object at all. Perhaps one may not even ask for its object. Through mystical intuitions we would cut off the problem in advance. The point of departure of the path to philosophy is factical life experience. It seems, however, as if philosophy is leading us out of factical life experience. In fact, that path leads us, as it were, only near philosophy, not up to it. Philosophy itself can only be reached through a turning around of that path, but not through a simple turning which would orient cognition merely toward different objects but, more radically, through an authentic transformation. Neo-Kantianism Natorp simply reverses the process of objectification of the cognition of objects and thus arrives at the subjectification which is supposed to represent the philosophical, psychological process. In this, the object is merely drawn from the object into the subject, whereas cognition qua cognition remains the same unclarified phenomenon. Factical life experience is very peculiar in it, the path to philosophy is made possible and the turning around which leads to philosophy is enacted. This difficulty is to be understood through a preliminary characterization of the phenomenon of factical life experience. Life experience is more than mere experience which takes cognizance of. It designates the whole active and passive pose of the human being toward the world if we view factical life experience only in regard to the experienced content, we designate what is experienced and what is lived as experienced as Earl of T's the world, not the object. World is that in which one can live one cannot live in an object. The world can be formally articulated as surrounding world milieu, as that which we encounter, and to which belong not only material things but also ideal objectivities, the sciences, art, etc. Within this surrounding world is also the communal world, that is, other human beings in a very specific, factical characterization as a student, a lecturer, as a relative, superior, etc., and not a specimen of the natural scientific species Homo sapiens, and the like. Finally, the I self, the self world, is also found within factical life experience. Insofar as it is possible that I am absorbed by the arts and sciences such that I live entirely in them, the arts and sciences are to be designated as genuine life worlds. But even they are experienced in the manner of a surrounding world. One cannot, however, abruptly demarcate the phenomena of these worlds from each other, consider them as isolated formations, ask about their mutual relationships, divide them into genera and species, etc. that would already be a deforming, a sliding into epistemology. An epistemologically performed layering and ranking of these three worlds would already be a violation. Nothing is said here about the relation of the life worlds the primary point is that they become accessible to factical life experience. One can only characterize the manner, the how, of the experiencing of those worlds that is, one can ask about the relational sense of factical life experience.
it is questionable whether the health relation determines that which is experienced content and how the content is characterized. We will isolate, furthermore, the taking cognizance of what the cognitive experiencing, since philosophy is supposed to be cognitive behavior. First, however, the meaning of this taking cognizance of must be understood from the motive of experiencing itself. The peculiarity of factical life experience consists in the fact that how I stand with regard to things, the manner of experiencing, is not co-experienced. What belongs to cognition according to its own meaning must be phenomenologically isolated prior to all decrees that philosophy is cognition. Factical life experience puts all its weight on its content the how of factical life experience at most merges into its content. All alteration of life takes place in the content. During the course of a factically experienced day, I deal with quite different things but in the factical course of life, I do not become aware of the different hows of my reactions to those different things. Instead, I encounter them at most in the content I experience itself factical life experience manifests an indifference with regard to the manner of experiencing. It does not even occur to factical life experience that something might not become accessible to it. This factical experience engages, as it were, all concerns of life. The differences and changes of emphasis are found entirely in the content itself. The self-sufficiency of factical life experience is, therefore, grounded upon this indifference, an indifference which extends itself to everything it decides even the highest matters within this self-sufficiency. Thus, if we pay attention to the peculiar indifference of factical experience to all factical life, a specific, constant sense of the surrounding world, the communal world, and the self-world becomes clear to us everything that is experienced in factical life experience, as well as all of its content, bears the character of significance. But with this, no epistemological decision has been made, either in the sense of some kind of realism or in the sense of some kind of idealism. All of my factical life situations are experienced in the manner of significance which determines the content of experience itself. This becomes clear if I ask myself how I experience myself in factical life experience saying theories. Generally, one analyzes only theoretically and thoroughly formed concepts of the soul, but the self is not problematized. Concepts like soul, connection among acts, transcendental consciousness, Problems like that of the connection between body and soul none of this plays a role for us. I experience myself in factical life neither as a complex of lived experiences nor as a conglomeration of acts and processes, not even as some ego object in a demarcated sense, but rather in that which I perform, suffer, what I encounter, in my conditions of depression and elevation, and the like. I myself experience not even my ego in separateness, but I am as such always attached to the surrounding world. This experiencing oneself is no theoretical reflection, no inner perception or the like, but is self-worldly experience, because experience itself has a worldly character and emphasizes significance in such a way that one's own experienced self-world no longer stands out from the surrounding world. This self-experience is the only possible point of departure for a philosophical psychology, if one can be posited at all. The wish to return from preconceived psychological theories to the factical is an erroneous undertaking, since these theories are not philosophically motivated in the first place. One could object that I experience myself how I feel nonetheless factically, without special reflection I know that right now, I acted clumsily, and so forth. But this how, do, is no thoroughly formed manner of relating to something but a significance factically tethered to the surrounding world. The factical of which cognizance is taken does not have an objective character but a character of significance which can develop into an objective context. By no means can we hope that all of this is immediately comprehensible, but only that all these things become accessible in a continuous process of philosophizing, one perpetually developing anew. Here we are concerned only with attaining the starting point for the understanding of philosophy itself. 4. Taking Cognizance of Let us now consider factical cognition, the taking cognizance of. What is cognized therein does not have the character of an object but is experienced as significance. A relating, a grouping together, manifests itself now therein. A connectedness of objects that bears a specific logic, a material logic, a structure peculiar to the specific material states of affairs, is formed. In a specific situation, I can factically listen to scientific lectures and, in the course of this, then talk about quotidian matters. The situation is essentially the same, except that the content has changed and yet I do not become conscious of a specific change of attitude. Scientific objects, too, are always first of all cognized with the character of factical life experience. One can, however, push the relating tendency to the extreme and orient oneself toward the ultimate structural complexes of objecthood in general Husserl's idea of an a priori logic of objects. Insofar as philosophizing transcends factical experience, it is characterized by the fact that it deals with higher objects and the highest of them, with the first and ultimate things. Moreover, in philosophy everything is related to the human being and to what concerns him tendency toward worldviews. In grasping the subject, the style remains the same, too the subject is considered as an object. Admittedly, in this way philosophy, 
too, through its scientific relation to objects, would have to be designated a science in the sense of a formed out cognizing. Our considerations here have thus only increased the difficulty of the self-understanding of philosophy. How is a mode of cognition other than taking cognizance of to be motivated? Factical life experience itself, through its indifference and self-sufficiency, always covers up again the philosophical tendency that might surface. In its self-sufficient concern, factical life experience constantly falls into significance. It constantly strives for an articulation in science and ultimately for scientific culture. Apart from these strivings, however, Factical life experience contains motives of a purely philosophical posture which can be isolated only through a peculiar turning around of philosophical comportment. The difference between philosophy and science consists not only in their objects and methods, but is in principle of a more radical nature. A self-understanding of philosophy is required even if one does not assume the derivation of science from philosophy. Heretofore, philosophers made an effort to degrade precisely factical life experience as a matter of secondary importance that could be taken for granted, despite that philosophy rises precisely from factical life experience and springs back into it in a reversal that is entirely essential. If this thesis is justified, every compromise vanishes and with it vanishes every assimilation of philosophy into science, through whose assistance philosophy maintained its meager existence for centuries. Philosophy's departure as well as its goal is factical life experience. If factical life experience is the point of departure for philosophy, and if we see factically a difference in principle between philosophical and scientific cognition, then factical life experience must be not only the point of departure for philosophizing but precisely that which essentially hinders philosophizing itself. I would claim that all of you, with only a few exceptions, constantly misunderstand all of the concepts and determinations which I have set forth. It has to be that way, and it does not do any harm initially. This misunderstanding, in fact, accomplishes for our progress the indication, if misunderstood, of certain phenomenal connections, which will be indicated, and the meaning of which will become intelligible only later. Factical life experience is the attitudinal, falling, relationally indifferent, self-sufficient concern for significance. Let us first of all consider the relational sense of factical life experience. What shows itself here is that the course of this experience is characterized by a constant indifference, that the differences of what I experience play themselves out entirely in the content. That I am in a different mood at a concert than in a trivial conversation constitutes a difference which I experience merely from the content. I become conscious of the diversity of experiences only in the experienced content. Thus, the manner of participation within and of being taken along by the world of the eye is an indifferent one indeed, it is so indifferent that it engages everything, and accomplishes all its tasks without hesitation. This manner of apprehension, however, tends to fall into significance. Significance seems, then, to be the same as value but value is already the product of a theorization and, like all theorizations, has to disappear from philosophy. The pure taking cognizance of does not take cognizance of formed out objects but only of connections of significance. But these connections tend toward an autonomization which can be presented in a downright logic of objects, of the connections and relations of objects. The experience that takes cognizance of plays, in an unnoticed way, a decisive role. In the falling tendency of life experience, a connectedness of objects increasingly forms and increasingly stabilizes itself. In this way one arrives at a logic of the surrounding world insofar as significance plays a role in the connectedness of objects. Going beyond this, all science makes an effort to thoroughly develop an increasingly more rigorous order of objects, i.e., a material logic, a material complex, a logic found in the things themselves for example, for art history a different one than for biology, etc. Scientific philosophy is nothing but an even more rigorous forming out of an object domain. Object domains are formed there which transcend sensible experience Plato's world of ideas. But the attitude to the objects, the relational sense, remains identically the same in scientific philosophy as in the particular sciences. Only a different dimension of objects appears, insofar as these objects are capable of explaining a context more thoroughly. More recent philosophy moves consciousness into the center cant. Especially in Fichte's treatment of this material problem, the subject is a new form of object to a gigent guide vis-a-vis other objects. Nonetheless, we find here too, in Fichte's departure from Kant's practical philosophy and his utilization of Kantian anticipations, a basically attitudinal tendency. Judging from its history, philosophy is thus always a forming of connections among objects, as rigorously as possible although German idealism saw the peculiar difficulty of the cognition of the subject. At this point we no longer understand how a radical difference between philosophy and science can exist at all. The falling tendency of factical life experience, constantly tending toward the significant connections of the factically experienced world, its gravity, as it were, conditions a tendency of factically lived life toward the attitudinal determination and regulation of objects. The sense of factical life experience thus contradicts the sense of our thesis. We have to look around in factical life experience in order to obtain a motive for its turning around.
It is, to be sure, possible to find this motive, but it is very difficult. For this reason, we will choose a more convenient route, since we possess knowledge of past and contemporary philosophy. The factical existence of the history of philosophy is, in itself, certainly no motivation to philosophize. Nevertheless, as a cultural possession, one can take it as a starting point and, with its help, clarify for oneself motivations to philosophize. In order to understand it in as lively a way as possible and to follow the sense of factical life experience rigorously, we will look around in the present and its philosophical tendencies not in order to understand it philosophically but merely in the sense of the factical taking cognizance of. For the sake of brevity, we will consider concrete tendencies of the philosophy of religion in their most typical representatives. Chapter 2. Current Tendencies of the Philosophy of Religion. 5. Trilch's Philosophy of Religion. The interest in the philosophy of religion is currently increasing. Even women write philosophies of religion and philosophers who wish to be taken seriously welcome them as the most important appearances in decades. One only has to compare, for example, the two essays published in the Presentations of the Kant Society, number 24-1. Rotbrook, on the philosophy of religion of law and 2. Tillich, on the idea of a theology of culture. One both are influenced by Trielch. In what follows, we wish to characterize Trielch's religious philosophical position since he is the most significant representative of the current philosophy of religion. Otherwise, things are taking place dependently in theology. Trielch possesses a great knowledge of concrete religious philosophical material and also of the historical development of the religious philosophical problem. He is coming from theology. The presentation of his views is rendered difficult through the frequent change of his basic philosophical standpoint, throughout which, however, his religious philosophical position is maintained quite remarkably. As a theologian from the school of ritual, his philosophical standpoint was initially determined by Kant, Schleiermacher, and Lotz. In terms of his philosophy of history, he is dependent upon Diltai. In the 1890s, Trielch turned to Vinil Bondrakirchen value philosophy. In more recent years, he switched finally to the Bergson Similian position. He understood Hegel from Bergson and Similian in the end oriented his philosophy of history toward Hegel. What goals does Trielch posit for the philosophy of religion? His goal is the working out of a scientifically valid, essential determination of religion. A. Psychology. Initially, a description positivism of the religious phenomena is required immediately, free of theories, the phenomena in themselves cf. The similar demand by Max Weber for sociology. Two religious phenomena are to be observed naively, as not yet hackneyed the prayers, cults, liturgies, in the deeds of great religious figures, preachers, reformers, and then to be characterized in their transcendental, primal, conditions. Trielch distinguishes between central and marginal religious phenomena. The central phenomenon is the belief in the attainment of God's presence which in principle co-grants as well the ethical command. Marginal forms are the sociology and business ethic of religion had is, its factical expression in the historical world as Max Weber, for instance, studied them. In order to attain this goal, the philosophy of religion has to utilize the method of individual psychology and the psychology of peoples, and, further, psychopathology, prehistoric studies, ethnology, and the American method of surveys and statistics. According to Trielch, the best description of religious phenomena so far has been undertaken by William James. Three here Trielch is influenced by James Ian and Dilthey and descriptive psychology. Thus, Trielch took up into his own work all basic psychological tendencies. B. Epistemology. This psychological description is followed, as a second task, by the epistemology of religion and the element of validity contained in the psychic processes. Trielch, Psychologie und Erkenntnis Theory Psychology und Epistemology. Lecture presented at the American Congress for the Philosophy of Religion, 1904.4 The point is here to investigate the rational lawfulness of the religious formations of ideas. In these, specific a priori lawfulnesses are always operative, ones which are at the foundations of religious phenomena. The universal epistemology has already determined the problem of the a priori in general. Here, Trielt relies upon the Windelbond Rickerschen epistemology. There is a synthetic a priori of what is religious, similar to a logical, ethical, or aesthetic a priori. This isolation of the religious a priori signifies the fixation of religious truth in general, of the rational element in what is religious. Particularly in his later work, Trielch does not mean rational in the sense of what is theoretically rationalistic, but rather rational means only what is universally valid or rationally necessary. Trielch determined it earlier as a rational a priori, but later he moved away from this view and claimed, without any determination of the content, that it is not irrational but an irrational a priori. He claims that it is crucial to connect the logical, ethical, and aesthetic a priori to the religious a priori and to see how the former receive their consolidation from the religious a priori. The work of the epistemology of religion is critical it wishes to separate what is factical and psychological from what is valid a priori. In this context, 
Factical life experience does not fulfill the function of a domain or area in which objects exist. It has nothing to do with the monism of experience or a theory of monism here, nothing is being explained. In taking up and clarifying given connections of meaning, current phenomenology does not rigorously enough question the right to validity of what is factically given. But factical life experience is what is priorly given, on the basis of which, however, nothing is to be explained. Phenomenology is not a preliminary science of philosophy but philosophy itself. Current work in the philosophy of religion takes place primarily in theology, chiefly in Protestant theology Catholic theology takes on philosophical problems with respect to the specifically Catholic understanding of Christianity. Protestant theology is essentially dependent upon the main respective philosophical trends to which it attaches itself. It is a prejudice of philosophers of religion to think that they are able to settle the problem of theology with a quick sweep of the hand. Apart from these works, we have to consider the work of the psychology of religion, about whose contribution we must decide later. Insofar as the religious philosophical problem is tackled within philosophy, it is without doubt to be supposed that the approximation of Fichte and Hegel, which is constantly increasing at present, will lead to a renewal of religious philosophical speculation. Five, the application of these principles forces the taking up of the religious philosophical problem in a certain direction which we will later critically reject. In any case, this speculative tendency has a special meaning for the increase in religious philosophical work which, no doubt, will take place. That literati of today have appropriated the philosophy of religion is probably well known to all of you, but this should not concern you here. See Philosophy of History Only on the basis of the separation of the psychological from the a priori can one trace the historical necessity of what is religious. The history of religion considers the realization of the religious a priori in the factical course of spiritual history no only the mere facts but the laws according to which religion develops historically. Hegel first envisaged this goal, but his constructive method is to be rejected. To be sure, this task will not succeed without metaphysics, but only an inductive metaphysics can be admitted. The philosophy of the history of religion, further, has to comprehend the present and predetermine the future development of religion. It has to decide whether a universal religion of reason will come about, one which would syncretistically emerge out of the present world religions of Protestant Catholicism, according to Soderblom, or whether in the future one of the positive religions Christianity, Buddhism, Islam will reign alone. d. Metaphysics this is a metaphysics of the idea of God on the basis of all of our experiences of the world. Critical epistemology, two Kant, etc., can amount to such a metaphysics. For one arrives from the teleological context of transcendental consciousness to one last meaning, which demands the existence of God. Trielch actually steered the philosophy of religion out of theology. He focused the philosophy of religion around the problem of a unification of religious history and systematic CF. Albrecht Ritchell 1822-89. For he attempted, in the wake of Rickard's consciousness in general, a reworking and rational critique of the religious historical material. The failure of this attempt drove him to a break with theology. He wanted to ground the newer philosophy of religion in a preliminary phenomenology, that is, a preliminary doctrine of types of historical religions. He names this specification the psychology of religion. The central phenomenon is the belief in the experienceability of the presence of God peripheral our mythology, ethos, sociology of religion. Psychopathology and ethnology show that the original phenomenon of all religions is mysticism, the experiences of unity in God. Wherever religion is spiritually actualized, a priori foundations are necessary which mark even the individual psychic processes as religious. The epistemology of religion is to work out, analogically to the theoretical a priori, a religious a priori, which means a fixing of the truth content, which constitutes the rational moment of religion through which religion first becomes possible cf. Rickert. Ratio means, later in Trielch and accordance with the norm not only in the logical, but also in the ethical sense, etc. The reunification of the thus found and emphasized a priori with the psychic modes of appearance of religion belongs to religious metaphysics. For Trielch, the religious a priori stands opposite a higher mental worldgeist swelled, the experience of which is the fundamental religious phenomenon. Religious metaphysics is in principle different in Trielch's in philosophical metaphysics, just as religious a priori differs from theoretical a priori. Therefore, there can be a historical representation on the basis of a teleological principle of development won by the history of philosophy. Thereby metaphysics becomes co-effective, but not a constructive dialectical metaphysics such as Hegel's, but rather an inductive metaphysics of religion. Moreover, the philosophy of religion should transform the further development of religion and, for instance, solve or discuss the question of a religion of pure reason or syncretism or a privileged form of one of the great religions cf. Soderblom etc. The metaphysics of religion must integrate the reality of God into the context of the world. Even within an epistemological philosophy, the theological basis and the meaning of facticity of consciousness will lead to a faith in God. We have then four religious philosophical disciplines 1. Psychology, 2. Epistemology, 
3. Philosophy of History These three taken together make up the science of religion and 4. Metaphysics, which is the authentic philosophy of religion. The science of religion is a philosophical discipline like logic, ethics, aesthetics metaphysics is founded upon these as a final region. Trilch himself maintained above all, alongside specific investigations die Sittler and der Christlichen Kirchen und Gruppen Social Doctrines of Christianity, 6 etc., the philosophy of history. In its principal foundations, he altered his view. Earlier, he understood history teleologically, as progressive development. Of late he affords each religious historical epoch its own meaning it is not merely to be viewed as a point of passage. From the provocations of life arise ever new, no longer rationally graspable motives for the following epoch. Religions arise from rational moments and spontaneous forces of life they have their own meaning which renders them independent they thus become an impulse for development. A logical dialectical connection cannot be determined a logical scheme of development is a violation cf. Simmel and Bergson. Trilch poses the problem of a historical dialectic cf. His essay in the Historische Zeitschrift 7. With that he departs from Rickard's philosophy of history and arrives at Dilti cf. The latter's Aufbau der Geschichte like in Welt in den Geist Wissenschaften construction of the historical world in the humanities 8. His fundamental concepts are individual totality and continuity of becoming, rather than development cf. Dilti's effective complex work Kung Su Samenhang. The modification, which follows therefrom, of his a priori conceptuality has not yet been developed by Trilch. Whether he now, Following Rickard C.F. Simmel, hold fast to the concept of the religious a priori is doubtful. C.F. His critique of the Book of Otto, Das Heilige the Holy in Contudian 1917.9. 6. Critical Observations We do not want to criticize Trielch's view, but rather more precisely understand his basic position. At issue is to validly determine the essence of religion scientifically. Trielch has a fourfold concept of the essence of religion. 1. The psychological essence of religion, the genera of its particularity of form. 2. The epistemological essence of religion, the a priori of religious reason. 3. The historical essence of religion, understood as general typology, the actualization of one and two inches history. 4. The metaphysical essence of religion, the religious as principle of everything a priori. Position of religion in the entire complex of reason. Only all four of these concepts give a total picture of the philosophy of religion. We must now understand in what way this philosophy of religion refers to religion, whether it grows from out of the meaning of religion, or whether religion is not as much as grasped in the manner of an object and forced into philosophical discipline as that is to say, integrated into material complexes that already exist in themselves before religion. There is also a psychology, epistemology, philosophy of history, metaphysics of science and of art. These religious philosophical disciplines thus arise not from religion itself qua religion. From the outside religion is observed and integrated as an object. The philosophy of religion itself is the science of religion. The entire problematic is thus thrown back onto the view of philosophy itself. The concept of religion becomes secondary. One could just as easily think out a sociology or an aesthetics of religion. A driving motto of Trielch's philosophy of religion is found in his view of the Reformation. He sees nothing new in the Reformation rather he thinks that it progressed from within the sense structure of the Middle Ages. What is new is thought to arrive, then, in the 18th century and in German idealism. Trilch took up many medieval and Catholic elements in this manner in his philosophy of religion. One rightfully accuses that he, similarly to Dilti, had no understanding of Luther. Lastly, for Trilch it depends on the metaphysics of religion, on the proof of God. But the proof of God is not originally Christian, but rather depends upon the connection between Christianity and Greek philosophy. This metaphysical view also determines Trilch's philosophy of religion. We do not want to establish a critique on the basis of content. We want to see how religion and philosophy comport themselves, how religion becomes an object for philosophy. In Trilch religion is placed into four religious philosophical disciplines in a finished material complex. Insofar as the philosophical observation of the world moves in different regions, religion is placed into these regions, and it is seen how religion expresses itself in them. The four concepts of the essence of religion arise with this. The four regions are not only methodological they are rather also divided according to their material character. The psychic reality is, in its structure and in its character of being, something other than the a priori region of rational lawfulness and this is again something else than the reality of history, in particular the universal history and this is something other than the last metaphysical reality, in which God is thought. How the regions link together is not treated. Thus the philosophy of religion is determined here not according to religion itself, but according to a particular concept of philosophy, and indeed a scientific one. One would like to see something new here offered in Trielch's metaphysics, that here religion is no longer studied as an object, insofar as the primal phenomenon faith in the existence of God is treated. After all, the existence of God would then be gained in an uncognitive manner. 
But Trilch says, despite this, that the object of faith must be studied as a real object in connection with other real objects, insofar as reason is thought as a unity. In a last universal study of objects, the entire human experience is to be brought to the level of concepts, and thus also God must be studied as a real object. Here it also becomes clear how Trilch could maintain his position on the philosophy of religion unchanged by altering in principle his philosophical views. Religion is for him an external object and can as such be integrated into different material complexes as appropriate to different philosophical systems. As such the possibility of constant transformation in Trilch is the strongest sign that he posits religion as an object. The connection between religion and science is, according to Trilch, not a forced one. Insofar as religion finds itself in a cultural context, it must contend with science defensively and negatively in its apologetics but also positively, the science of religion, through prediction of future religious development, can achieve something in the further development of religion. Science, indeed, does not make religion, yet it represents a fruitful factor in its further development. According to Trilch, the history of Christianity shows this through its alliance with ancient philosophy it has achieved its strong historical position. However, presently, the possibilities of religious philosophical products are exhausted. At issue is only an emphasis upon the right possibility. What have we now profited, for our purposes, from this study of Trilch? Above all, a concrete representation of the philosophy of religion. Then four determinations one can attribute to religion the psychological, the rational a priori, the historical, and the metaphysical. Finally, that philosophy, in its comportment, recognizes religion as an object of cognition. Thus we have argued against our thesis of the radical difference between philosophy and science. For since philosophy has to turn religion into an object of its cognition, it cannot be understood how philosophy is to occupy itself with religion, if between philosophy and science that is, cognition of objects sees held to exist a fundamental difference of relational sense. Will not the phenomena become an object of study in the phenomenology of religion, just as, for instance, in the phenomenology of aesthetic pleasure? Initially, after all, it is necessary to examine religion in its factuality, before one addresses to it a particular philosophical study. Chapter 3. The Phenomenon of the Historical. 7. The Historical as Core Phenomenon. We want now to attempt to set forth a core phenomenon that reigns through the connections of meaning of the three words in the title Introduction to the Phenomenology of Religion. This core phenomenon is the historical. Insofar as we then intend to view the historical as core phenomenon of what is meant by the title, we will immediately find out how far the phenomena which occupy us can be characterized as historical. To what degree are introduction? Philosophy. Religion historical phenomena? It goes without saying that the introduction to a science is historical. Science is a complex of timelessly valid principles. The process of introduction proceeds, on the contrary, in time, is dependent upon the particular, factical historical situation of science etc. The same holds for philosophy and religion. They are also subordinate to historical development. But is the historical not precisely a matter of indifference for philosophy, which seeks the eternally valid? Moreover, does not the characterization as historical fit any phenomenon one likes? Yet if we now assert that the philosophical problematic is motivated on principle from the historical, so is this possible only insofar as the concept of the historical is polysemous? In any case, the necessity arises of grasping the problem of the historical principally, and not to content oneself with the considerations of a sound common sense. We have characterized philosophy and religion by subsuming it under the historical philosophy and religion are historical phenomena. Just as the Felberg and the Candelar Mountains, or the University, the Cathedral, and the train station are buildings. How such a characterization of philosophy is possible as a problem philosophy subsists, at any rate, in factical life experience. General concepts are handled like objects so that one moves in a circle with characterizations through general concepts, and never leaves the realm of objects. Now the question is whether the possibility exists of discovering another sense of historical or altogether, one which cannot be predicated of objects in this way. Perhaps today's concept of the historical is only a derivation of this original concept. To this aim, we must inspect more carefully in which sense the characterization historical, which we have just performed, is to be understood. Historical means here becoming, emergence, proceeding in time, a characterization that befits a reality. Insofar as one remains within the cognitive consideration of the connections among objects, each characterization or use of the sense of historical is always determined through this fore conception of the object. The object is historical it has the particularity of proceeding in time, of changing. We proceed not from the usual philosophy of history, which has the task ex professo of dealing with the historical. We mean the historical in the way we encounter it in life not in the science of history. Historical means not only proceeding in time that is to say, it is not only a characterization which befits a complex of objects, but in factical life experience and in the straightforward, attitudinal Einstellungschaft and evolution of philosophy, the historical, 
in accordance with this view, obtains the character of a quality of an object changing in time. In a much broader sense than the historical facts existing in the brain of a logician which results only from a theory of science which empties out the living phenomena of historical as immediate veracity. A historical thinking. Historical consciousness is said to distinguish our present culture from others. Historical thinking indeed determines our culture it disturbs our culture firstly, in that it provokes, excites, stimulates secondly, in that it hinders. This means one a fulfillment life gains its foothold in the diversity of the historical to a burden. Thus the historical is a power, against which life seeks to assert itself. One would have to consider the development of historical consciousness in the living cultural history. I refer you to Diltai, who, I am convinced, has not grasped the core of the problem. What Trilch says about this and also about the Reformation is essentially influenced by Diltai and, in terms of content, only determines it more closely. 1. The worldization of a well chung and the self-sufficiency of factical life that one wants to secure one's own life by worldly means lead to a tolerance of alien views, through which one wants to gain a new security. From there stems today's fury to understand cultural forms, the fury of classifying life forms and cultural epics of typologization that goes all the way to the belief that it has reached the last frontier. Contenting oneself with this, one enjoys the diversity of life and its forms. Historical consciousness of the present is most sharply expressed in this panarchy of the understanding. In this sense, present life is filled with the historical. But what presents itself as the logic and methodology of history has no feeling for this living historicality which, as it were, has eaten into our existence Dasein. 2. The opposed, hindering direction lies in that the historical withdraws the view from the present, and that it ruins and paralyzes the naivete of creating. From there arises the assault of genuine activism against the historical. Be the concept of the historical. The historical is the phenomenon that for us should open up an access to the self-understanding of philosophy. The phenomenological question of method is not a question of a methodical system, but rather a question of access that leads through factical life experience. Attendance to the methodological complex is important for understanding our study. It is a methodological complex in the sense of an access to the problems themselves. We will see that this access to the problems plays a decisive role in philosophizing. It is crucial to find motives in factical life experience for the self-understanding of philosophizing. From this self-understanding, the entire task of a phenomenology of religion first arises for us, one dominated throughout by the problem of the historical. When one hears the problem word the historical immediately and factically, insofar as one wishes to philosophize about it, one seems to have already solved half the task by no more than reference to the philosophy of history, believing this to be a solidly circumscribed discipline. But we cannot gain the phenomenon of the historical from the philosophy of history, since we reject the entire partitioning of philosophy into disciplines. With this the historical has become homeless, as it were, since it has lost its systematic place. We must therefore derive the historical from factical life. One never says something is historical, something, an object, has the quality of being historical. With that the historical shifts into a complex of objects. Philosophy and religion are likewise obviously historical phenomena. However, with such a characterization, nothing exceptional is said, for art and science are also historical in this sense. Particularly in the case of philosophy. This characterization seems secondary, since it depends exactly on what philosophy is in its meaning, irrespective of how it is historically actualized. Only if one problematizes the validity of scientific principles, the historical plays a certain albeit negative role. One says that the validity of these principles is independent of the historical, is extratemporal considering the historical serves then only to demonstrate this. But this would be a more secondary role for the historical here the meaning of philosophy and validity is already presupposed. But we assert the importance of the historical for the sense of philosophizing per se, before all questions of validity. This assertion is grounded in the concept of the historical as polysemous and we have not yet grasped the authentic sense of the historical. We must clarify the sense of the historical phenomenologically. What is meant when one says that some occurrence or other, some undertaking, etc. is historical? What is meant is that every happening in time and space has the quality of standing in a temporal context, a context of becoming. The quality of being historical is then predicated of an object. Object object and thing Gegenstand are not the same. All objects are things, but not the other way around all things are not objects. A danger ensues of holding determinates of objects for determinates of things. Conversely, one is seduced into holding something that determinates immediately for determinates of objects and into applying formal points of view to specific observations of things. Since Plato, the blurring of these differences has been disastrous. Now, a phenomenon is neither object nor thing. However, a phenomenon, formally speaking, is also a thing to add is to say, a something at all. But saying that says nothing essential about the phenomenon one has only shifted it into a sphere into which it does not belong. That makes phenomenology so extraordinarily difficult. Objects, things, 
and phenomena cannot be placed alongside each other as on a chessboard rather, this systematization of things also is inappropriate for phenomena, and from the point of view of phenomenology, a doctrine of categories or a philosophical system becomes senseless. For the time being, only the difference between object and thing is important for us. It befits an object to be temporally determined as such, it is historical. A more general concept of the historical than this seems not to be found. The historical actuality will, in each case, modify itself according to the character of the object and yet in principle the historical remains the same. The application of the historical to human reality, too, will be a determination of the object historical. The human being itself is, in its actuality, an object in becoming, standing within time. To be historical is simply one of its characteristics. This view of the historical runs entirely within the bounds of sound common sense. But philosophy is nothing else than a struggle against common sense. In this way, the problem of the historical is not to be settled. Indeed it is difficult to gain a different view today. If today's philosophy of history were our point of departure, and if we let that philosophy stipulate the problems, we would never escape this object conception of the historical. Therefore, we want to proceed from factical life. In this consideration, philosophy of history is regarded only as a factical view of the historical problem. We are not, however, accepting its terms, participating in it rather we are only trying to understand what the real motives are, in each case, for the viewpoint of the philosophy of history. To aim for a deep-rooted understanding, one would have to feel one's way into the entire present-day constitution of mind. Here we can emphasize only a few fundamental currents. See the historical and factical life experience. The historical plays a role in present-day factical life experience in two major directions. 1. Positively speaking, the diversity of historical forms provides life with a fulfillment and allows it to rest in the diversity of historical formations. 2. Negatively speaking, the historical is for us a burden, a hindrance. In both respects, the historical is disturbing against it, life seeks to assert and secure itself. But it remains in question whether that against which factical life asserts itself is still really the historical. Diltai's investigations are important here on Leitung in Die Geist Swissenschaften Introduction to the Humanities, one die Aufklärung und die Geschichtliche Welt the Enlightenment in the Historical World Deutsche Rundschau, two analyzer und Auffassung der Menschen im 15. Und 16. Jahrhundert Analysis and View of the Human Being in the 15th and 16th Centuries Gesammel to Work a 2 3. The expression of historical consciousness is, at first, polysemous. The science of history exists because the historical plays a role in our present day life not the other way around. Historical thinking can have many meanings in the face of the historical object I do not need at all to think historically and yet I can think historically without having a historical object before me. The problem of the historical takes its meaning in this, that the historical, through the distancing from a particular, present, world-orienting standpoint, opens the eyes to other life forms and cultural ages. Now either one glimpses the highest in itself which are time, gifted with enormous capacity of feeling, has to offer in the all-encompassing understanding of this rise of accessibility and openness or one lays out the different types that surface in history, and, in comparing, chooses and decides among them. Still more, the historical is felt today as a burden. It inhibits our naivete in creating. Historical consciousness incessantly accompanies, like a shadow, each attempt at a new creation. Immediately, consciousness of transitoriness stirs and takes from us enthusiasm for the absolute. In so far as a new spiritual culture is insisted upon, Historical consciousness, in this sense of being a burden, must be eradicated, and thus the self-assertion against the historical is a more or less open struggle against history. 8. The struggle of life against the historical. We can differentiate three ways of attempting to assert oneself against history. Perhaps this is a somewhat violent differentiation, also because spiritual life today is no longer clearly conscious that it incessantly confronts history. The platonic way the historical is something with which a break must be made. Self-assertion is itself a break with the historical. The way of radical self-extradition to the historical Spangler. The way of compromise between the two extremes and B. Diltai, Einleitung in die Geist Swissenschaften Introduction to the Humanities, Simmel, die Problem der Geschichts Philosophy Problems of the Philosophy of History 4, and the entire philosophy of history of Rekord and Windelbond. We attempt to understand these modes of liberation from the disturbance of the historical entirely schematically, in order to understand the sense of the historical itself, as well as the sense of these tendencies of liberation. A. The Platonic Way. The Platonic Way is the most accessible, and, in present day spiritual life, determined in its essence by Greek philosophy, the most readily given and most popular. Historical reality is not the only reality, not the fundamental reality at all, rather, it is only to be understood by reference to the realm of ideas, in whatever way one may grasp them as substances, as values, as norms or principles of reason. One should keep in mind that the motive in Plato, and also still today, 
for this discovery of the extratemporal realm, is laid forth in the territory of theoretical knowledge, of logic in such a realm. One opposes, in the struggle against skepticism Protagoras, the content of knowledge to temporally preceding operations thereof, and thus comes to a concept of truth which is grasped as the validity in itself of theoretical principles. In so far as this theoretical thinking plays a foundational role in the Greeks, in so far as everything is only as it is known, given the dominating role of the theoretical, the moral act, artistic and practical creation are likewise referred to an ideal reality of norms and values. The primacy of the logical, theoretical is to be found in Plato's relation to Socrates, in the explication of the principal virtue as knowledge. Following Plato, a virtuous life is possible only through knowledge. Now the connection between ideas and the sensible world arises as a difficulty to which this philosophy has never properly attended. Here, in modern Platonism, there is a great scope of possibilities. Some say that reality is only the occasion for the appearance of ideas, of anamnesis. Others want to grasp the historical as a fusion into reality itself ein Vermung in die Wirklichkeit selbst. The theories about the connection of the two worlds are various, and need concern us in no greater detail. In any case, the historical has become something secondary. B. Radical self-extradition. Alternatively, the second way is a complete radicalization in an opposing sense nevertheless, in principle, it proceeds in the same manner, so that today, in the struggle between absolutism and skepticism, both parties move in the same direction and fight over something they have not yet made clear to themselves. The second and third ways are grounded essentially epistemologically. This epistemological foundation fundierung must be made clear. Platonism, too, has received such an epistemological foundation, but the ontological is its genuine uniqueness, that of a meta-real lawfulness. Sima worked out an epistemological foundation of the second door, for example, third way, in his Die Problem der Geschichts philosophy. Ein Erkenntnis Theoretische Studie 1st edition 1892, 2nd edition 1905, 3rd edition 1907. His view is not original. Dilti gave the first radical conception of the problem in the Einleitung. The philosophy of history of Indelbond and Rickard is only an emptied out, formal study of the points of view that Dilti had already presented. Today one begins to return beyond this logic of history, to Dilti, and, after fifty years, gradually to understand him. If one wants to grasp the problem of the historical philosophically, it is not admissible to proceed from the philosophy of history, because this represents only a forming out of a historical consciousness in reference to which we question whether it itself arose from an originally historical motivation. It is telling that the task of turning against the historical falls to philosophy. Characterization of three ways the mode of relation, the relational sense of the tendency to secure, and the sense of the conception of history itself. Simmel asks how does the stuff of immediate reality become the theoretical formation that we call history? The stuff undergoes a process of formation. There are two great categories for dividing reality, the natural scientific and the historical. Similarly Rickert to me in that he and his grandson five supplies a logic of conceptual representation whereas Simmel asks more in terms of a psychology of knowledge. He gives himself the task of investigating the process of formation in which history emerges. The result is that the human being, as known, is the product of nature and of history yet the human being which knows makes nature and history. The free human personality holds history in its hand history is a product of free, forming subjectivity. How does this peculiar process of formation occur? Each image of history, because it receives its structure from formative subjectivity, is dependent upon a present that views history. Each historical image is thus, in its view of its tendency of development, oriented toward the present. How does a historical image, a historical objectivity, arise? How is it that reality is grasped once according to the natural sciences, at other times historically? It has been said that the historical is that which is effective if an occurrence shows a certain amount of effects which another does not have, it thus receives historical meaning. Six, however, according to Simmel, the sum of occurrences and of their effects does not equal the historical meaning, but rather brings it about. This is because a sum of occurrences can only be grasped as effective if an interest is there, against which the effect is seen as effective. Something becomes historical when the stuff of the immediately experienced releases in us a certain effect of feeling when we are touched by it. Historical interest has two fundamental directions, which must always go together, so that something like history can emerge at all. On the one hand, historical interest is an interest in the content as such, irrespective of whether the story told is authentic, of whether it is truthfully recounted or not. This interest is enjoyment and pleasure taken in the contest between fate and personal energy, attention to the rhythm of profits and losses, etc. But this interest does not suffice. Then follows, on the other hand, an interest in whether or not the content is real. But a reality in itself is not yet historical it must also awake an interest in the first sense, that is to say interest in the content. Only when both interests in the content and in its reality come together does historical interest exist. 
What is decisive is that history loses its disturbing character, that in the epistemological analysis its structure is recognized as nothing other than a product of freely formative subjectivity. This tendency is radicalized in the second way. It is preformed in Spengler's philosophy of history der Untergang des Abendlandes I7. Spengler has the tendency to present the science of history as such as reliable. In a certain sense, his tendency is new, and one must wonder that the science of history has not welcomed and taken up this tendency in the way it actually deserves. Since Spengler wants to raise history to a science, he thereby supports interests that in the 19th century turn against the exclusive rule of the natural sciences. Exactly in that which Simmel emphasizes that history is always formed from a particular standpoint Spengler sees the deficiency of the science of history. It would be crucial to render the science of history independent of the historical conditionality of the present. One must carry out a Copernican act. How can that happen? In that the present, which drives history and recognizes history, is not absolutized, but is rather placed within the objective process of historical happening. And this placing within can only be achieved on the basis of an epistemological conviction. To this Spengler attaches a wild metaphysics, one which resembles Simmel's history as the expression of a soul soul of culture. History is not contrasted to an extratemporal reality rather, the security of the present against history is reached in that the present itself is seen as historical. The reality and uncertainty of the present are experienced in such a way that they themselves are drawn into the objective process of historical becoming, which is nothing else but an ebb and flow of the becoming a being which rests in its midst. See Compromise Between the Two Positions The third way attempts to combine the first two. Both are fighting fiercely, as the reaction against Spengler's skepticism shows. It directs itself against the extreme position of the second, with whose epistemological foundations it begins. For the formation of history as objectivity and knowledge assumes the standard of the value of truth. History is a permanent actualization of values, which, however, can never be fully actualized. Rather, in the historical here comes the dependence on Spengler values are given only in a relative form, one through which, as it were, the absolute shines in the confrontation with history. It is thus crucial not to wipe away, as it were, the historical reality, but rather, in a universal consideration, to form the future by oneself, from the entire treasure of the past, in a process which, according to its own nature, strives to actualize the generally human, the humane. In all three modes, the tendency to typologize plays a role, but in each case the typologization has a different significance. The first mode requires the typology in order to refer the historical to the absolutely valid world ideas history as ideographical vindel bond. It works with ideal types Max Weber. In the second mode in Spengler typologization plays a still greater role. Insofar as history is the last reality, it is crucial to follow the different formations of this forming out. The morphological study of types represents the peculiar vehicle of this kind of knowledge in the science of history. The fundamental reality itself is here a morphological concept the morphological formation of types is the real vehicle of historical knowledge. For the third mode it is crucial to demarcate the present and its type sharply against the past in order to determine the future by means of a universal historical orientation which is also only possible through the historical formation of types. 9. Tendencies to secure. The attempt to grasp the sense of the morphological typologizing formation of concepts has never yet been made. The concept of typologizing is important for the sense of the securing that is striven for in the three aforementioned ways. We will consider, within the framework of our problem at large a relation of the tendency to secure to history the sense of the historical itself which follows from this nth question whether the securing succeeds namely, whether it actually hits upon that which, in the historical, genuinely disturbs us. A. The relation of the tendency to secure. The platonic way consists not only in the juxtaposition of idea and reality rather it is comprehensible only through the relation of temporal being to extra-temporal being. This relation is still today expressed in the characteristic platonic concepts. The relation should be clarified by four limit concepts or images temporal being is an imitation of the extra temporal the extra temporal is the paradigm while the temporal is the after copy the temporal participates in the extra temporal presence of the extra temporal and temporal beings these images signify an objective connection of being between the two worlds of the temporal and the extra temporal here we cannot go into a discussion of these concepts and of the way in which they are epistemologically bent and employed we are concerned only that the temporal and the extra temporal are here seen objectively the mode the sense of securing fulfills itself through the development of a theory about the sense of reality of the temporal. In recognizing what kind of sense of reality the temporal has, it ceases to disturb me, because I recognize it as a forming out of the extra temporal. The second way shows the same type of securing. As much as the skepticism of the second way opposes absolute validity of Platonism, the mode of securing against history is the same in both. For in Spangler, the historical world is the foundational reality, the single reality we know only cultures, that is to say, the process of becoming a world destiny. My recognizing as a foundational reality the historical in which I myself stand and which disturbs me results in my having to enter into the historical reality, since I cannot resist it. 
for us today, a conscious participation in the declining Occidental culture ensues. Thus also in Spengler the interpretation of the reality of the historical has a liberating effect. It is now entirely clear that the third way is merely a compromise of the first two. On the basis of a theory of historical reality, it seeks to fulfill the tendency towards securing. A historical dialectic is designated as the task of the philosophy of history the oppositions of the temporal and the extra-temporal are to be pursued in their tension and suspension off bung, so that from this the dialectical lawfulness of the historical can be won. On the one hand, I am within history on the other, I am oriented toward the ideas I actualize the extra-temporal by entering into the temporal. This beautiful and touching sentimentality of culture has been recited for so long that I do not wish to bore you with it. One sees there in a deep dialectic and thinks with that to have solved the problems of history while in fact this way represents the most extreme degeneration of the entire problem, already because it is, as a compromise, incapable of grasping originally the motives of the first two ways rather, it merely takes them up and makes them accessible to the cultural needs of the present. For us the question is whether these tendencies to secure correspond at all to the disturbing motive itself. It is thus necessary that we, initially, attempt to understand, on the basis of the ways characterized above, why they actually defend themselves against history. And it is now characteristic of the three ways, and of the entire problem of the historical, that this question is a secondary one, that the disturbance is taken for granted. In the entire consideration, history as the science of history plays no role initially. The theory of the science of history is an entirely secondary problem within the problem of the historical itself. The present-day confrontation with history testifies, in essence, to the struggle against skepticism and relativism. With this, history appears in a more popular sense, and the basic point of its argumentation is that every skepticism cancels itself out. But logical deduction is no match for historical forces, and the question of skepticism is in this way not to be done away with for this argumentation was already used by the ancient Greeks. The struggle against history indirectly and unconsciously is a struggle for a new culture. All three ways are fundamentally dominated throughout by the Platonic view, even Spengler, who absolutizes historical reality only in opposition to it. The first way posits the absolute norm as a higher reality against the historical. The second way renounces norms it sees the reality in the historical itself, in the cultures. The third way recognizes a minimum of absolute values, but ones given only in relative forms in the historical. The orientation of a universal history should further develop in a productive synthesis of all past cultures. The historical reality is, in all three ways, posited as an objective being. The way is that of knowledge de erkennens, of study of the material. Along with this goes a tendency to typologize, to understand by forming types. This tendency is important because it characterizes the fundamental character of the theoretical attitude and its relation to history. Therein the attitudinal character of the relation to history is shown. Attitude has here an entirely particular sense. We use relation bazook in the general meaning of the word. Not every relation is an attitude, but each attitude has the character of a relation. Attitude is a relation to objects in which the conduct for Halton is absorbed in the material complex. I direct myself only to the matter, I focus away from myself toward the matter. With this attitude Einstellum the living relation to the object of knowledge has ceased Eingestellt in the sense of it will cease, for instance, as one says, the struggle has ceased. We have then a double meaning in the word attitude first an attitude toward a realm of the matter, secondly a ceasing of the entire human relation to the material complex. In this sense we indicate the relation to history in the three ways as attitude and aligns to Lungsmasig. History is here the material Zaka, the object toward which I take a cognitive attitude. Spengler too shows in the course of his study that that which disturbs us is the same as that which is disturbed both are expressions of one soul of culture. His relation is attitudinally cognitive. The morphological study of types is nothing other than the solidification and foundation of the complex of the matter from out of itself it executes the material complex in the logical sense that typologization executes surlitigt history. If one says that the conduct of system building is an understanding, an attitudinal understanding is meant but this has nothing to do with phenomenological understanding be the sense of the historical itself. What is it then that is disturbed? From out of what is the disturbance motivated? We can now go only so far as it is presented in the three ways, as they grasp it in concepts. It is peculiar of the three ways that that which seeks securing is not at all regarded as a problem. That which seeks securing and which disturbs us goes without saying. Where the phenomenon of disturbance is observed, it is already seen from within the Platonic schema. 1. The Platonism of today is modified from its original through the inclusion of Kantian philosophy. From that standpoint, Neo-Kantianism of the Cohen and Bindelbaum schools, too, seeks to interpret Plato anew. Platonism becomes transcendental, in the sense of having to do with consciousness be with Sain's massive givendit between the temporal historical and the extra-temporal world of ideas. A third, mediating realm appears, the realm of meaning Marburg school, Rickert. In what sense does subjectivity form the mediation? The acts of consciousness, the abilities and activities of consciousness occur, proceed, 
run a psychic course but they have a sense above and beyond that. Through this they are related to objects Gegenstand and this relation is determined through norms. But the difficulties of Platonism return in a refined form. To Spengler the decisive thing is that which is true reality, the act context of historical existence Dasein, the human historical reality, the achieving life and existence Dasein, desires a security, and from this arises concern Bekamerung. Spengler and others have the name culture for this achieving and creative historical actuality. 3. Along the third way, what is meant by being in need of security is clearly shown, while the discontent itself remains unproblematized existence Dasein is something that goes without saying, something which no longer needs to be attended to only securing it is much more important. The third way is called the philosophy of life. Simlo grasps life more biologically, Dilti more spiritually, Spengler links, in a peculiar way, the first and third ways. Life is the fundamental reality and secures itself through the turn to ideas. Eight ideas are the dominators of life simul. Thus life tends to secure itself either against history first way or with history second way or from history third way. The concept of life is a polysemous one and, from this entirely general, formal point of view, the critique of present day philosophy of life would make some sense. Such a critique is justified only when one succeeds in grasping this concept positively in an original sense but in another sense not so lest it misjudge the actual motives of the philosophy of life and pull it back into the rigid Platonism. In Rickard it becomes clear that, in the Platonic way, the human historical reality is not understood from out of itself, but only with regard to an a priori complex of values. Rickard says that the human individual is, in his singularity, nothing other than what he achieved for the values of culture. With this, the concept of the individual is grasped purely Platonically. See does the securing suffice? Does the securing suffice for that which drives forth the disturbance? That which is disturbed, the reality of life, the human existence and its concern about its own security, is not taken in itself rather it is regarded as object and as object it is placed within the historical objective reality. The worry is not answered, but rather is immediately objectified. Spengler is the clearest on this point and drives the tendencies subsumed with contemporary philosophy to the end. He wants to secure the science of history. Through this view, having supposedly first made history into a science, he has destroyed history, he has mathematized world history such that the types stand next to one another like houses. And the formal, aesthetic study of soul and expression is imposed on history from without. Thus an aesthetic and a mathematical tendency. The life concerned for itself is set up in a historical context, but the actual tendency to concern is not attended to. From where does it arise that, despite this, the three ways are recognized by life as securings? This is grounded in the fact that concern is already touched upon by the four conception of the study. The concern is reinterpreted attitudinally. That comes from the tendency of factical life to fall away attitudinally. Thus the concern itself becomes the attitudinal foreconception of an object. Here lies the actual fracture point of the entire problem of the historical. The meaning of history, which is pre-delineated within the concern itself, cannot become clear in this way. The possibility is offered here to endure the attitudinality docile to lungs message of the study of the historical, in order to uncover the true distress. We must avoid taking the phenomenon of the historical from the science of history. The positing of the logic of history as the fundamental discipline of the philosophy of history already sets the problem up in the wrong context. The attitudinal meaning of history which appears here is a derivative one. Mostly, one falsely derives from it all other historical phenomena. We must then attempt to catch sight of the phenomenon of concern unhidden in factical design. 10. The Concern of Factical Design What effect does concern have in factical life? The relation between factical Dasein and worry is taken, in the three ways, as a relation of order. The concerned Dasein is placed within an objective context. But how does the concerned Dasein himself stand with respect to the historical in the three ways? The concerned Dasein is only an object segment from a great whole object from the entire objective historical happening. The distressed Dasein turns against the change against the happening of existence Das Jeschen Schaft Dasein. Expressed in terms of transcendental philosophy consciousness is more than a course of acts. The acts have a meaning bone. Present Dasein demands not only a meaning at all, but also a concrete meaning namely, a meaning other than past cultures had, a new meaning that exceeds the one of earlier life. It wants to be a new creation, be it an entirely original one, a great synthesis, away from the barbaric, or however one names these. We are asking not for the content and justification rather we attempt to go back from these expressions of concern Dasein to Dasein itself. With that we apparently return to the beginning. We attempt to understand the concern Dasein out of our own life experience. How does the own living Dasein conduct itself as distressed by history, to history itself? How does factical life stand from out of itself to history? Theories remain completely peripheral, even as the view that the historical reality is the reality of happening proceeding in time. We attempt only to determine the meaning of history out of factical experience. 
The difficulties of the problem are those with which philosophy must struggle anew at each step and with each problem. Despite this, the guiding thread for our study will be the old concept of the historical. In order to understand how this is possible, we must first present a main part of the phenomenological method. The confrontation with history is today so peculiar that one can say they fight with weapons that they themselves do not understand and which belong exactly to that which they are fighting against. The tendencies to secure against history have the same character as the grasped history itself, so that the problem moves perpetually in a circle and one theory of history replaces another. It is, of course, not meant that one day a philosophy of history would be given that would stand for all time had as an entirely unphilosophical ideal rather, at issue is a confrontation with history which arises from the sense of factical Dasein. In the three considered ways, the distressed Dasein is considered as an object within history itself. What is genuinely originally distressed disappears in this view, and the solution of the distress becomes very simple. But we ask what genuinely wants to secure itself against history? In all three ways life, the human historical reality, elevates itself as that which is supposed to have a meaning. This sphere is not problematized in today's philosophy, or at least is only grasped according to the conceptual scheme of the respective philosophy. One does not pose the question, whether it is perhaps impossible to grasp the sense of factical Dasein with today's philosophical means. One does not ask how factical Dasein is to be explicated originally, that is to say, philosophically. Apparently, then, a gap in today's philosophical system of categories is to be filled. Yet we will see that, through the explication of factical Dasein, the entire traditional system of categories will be blown up so radically new will the categories of factical Dasein be. Factical Dasein, as an objectively preceding occurrence, cannot be simply a blind one rather it must carry a sense within itself and thereby require for itself a particular lawfulness. But not only a lawfulness per se is desired rather the present wants to build itself further into the future, in a new creation of the own Dasein and in an own, new culture. Through this tendency, factical Dasein experiences a particular elevation of Hibung all effort points to it. We leave aside the view of history we discussed above. We ask how does the historical stand with regard to factical life existence live in itself? Which sense does the historical have in factical life existence? A difficulty is what is actually meant here by historical. I use already in the question a particular sense of historical. I already have inside a particular meaning, according to which I decide in which sense the historical exists in factical life experience. Is a particular, perhaps disarranging sense of historical already introduced with the posing of the question? But the question cannot be gotten hold of otherwise, if I want to grasp the historical in factical life existence. This is a difficulty that appears in all of phenomenology and easily leads to hasty generalizations. Chapter 4 Formalization and Formal Indication 11. The general sense of historical. We will name the methodical use of a sense that becomes a guiding one for phenomenological explication, a formal indication. The phenomena will be examined according to what the formally indicative sense carries within itself. Through the methodological consideration, it must become clear how it can be that the formal indication, although guiding the consideration, nevertheless brings no preconceived opinion into the problems. One must become clear about the meaning of the formal indication, or else one falls either into an attitudinal consideration or into regional demarcations which one views as absolute. The problem of the formal indication belongs to the theory of the phenomenological method itself, in the broad sense, to the problem of the theoretical, of the theoretical act, the phenomenon of differentiating. Later the entire problem will occupy us. Preliminarily, we are seeking the difficulty only in the concrete case. The usual sense of the historical says it is the temporally becoming, and as such, past. Factical life experience is consequently viewed as to what extent something temporal to what extent something becoming, and something conscious as post appears in it. This sense of historical is so general so it seems initial if that nothing would be lost if it were applied, without further qualification, to factical life experience. For factical life experience is, after all, a certain domain of reality the historical is becoming per se is not limited to such. This sense seems then the most general all other senses, it seems, could only be a determination thereof. But it is problematical to one extent this sense of historical is general, and whether this kind of generality can be a philosophic principle. Two questions thus arise here 1. To what extent can this general sense of historical be addressed as a philosophic principle? 2. If this claim is not justified, and yet the meaning is, despite this, a general one and merits consideration in the explication, to what extent does it not prejudice all thought, not being original, nevertheless should guide original consideration? In philosophy for centuries, generality, from the side of the object, is considered a characteristic of the object of philosophy. And exactly our general sense of historical can seem appropriate to demarcate a particular realm within the totality of all beings, and, with this demarcation, achieve a final philosophical work, insofar as it belongs to philosophy to partition the totality of beings and assign different sciences to the different regions. 
Already Aristotle says in his Metaphysics one beings are multiply said. However, Aristotle meant nothing more than what one had heretofore seen. For Aristotle, at issue is not only an ontological consideration rather an entirely other, implicit consideration hovers therein. Aristotle's metaphysics is perhaps already more advanced than we ourselves are today in philosophy. One can view this classification of beings as an ontological study. Now insofar as the beings are only for consciousness, the ontological classification corresponds to one related to consciousness in Abiwa's saint's message, in which questions are asked about the connections between modes of consciousness, modes in which the beings constitute themselves that is to say, become conscious. This problem was posed by Kant but phenomenology his earls first had the means to carry out this study concretely. From the ontological aspect, philosophy thus had to do with beings from the aspect of consciousness, with the original laws of constitution belonging to consciousness. Each thing yet is gijinstology stands under the form of this constitution. In Husserl's phenomenology, consciousness itself becomes a region, and is subordinate to a regional consideration its lawfulness is not only in principle original, but also the most general. It expresses itself generally and originally in transcendental phenomenology. 12. Generalization and Formalization The general becomes accessible through generalizing Viral Germanerung. The meaning of generalization is controversial in philosophy heretofore, and before Husserl's phenomenology was never seriously considered. Husserl first differentiated formalization from generalization logisch und Tersuchung in Logical Investigations, Volume 1, Final Chapter, 2 Ideen zu einer reinen Phenomenologie Ideas for a Pure Phenomenology 133. This difference had been known implicitly for a long time in mathematics already since Leibniz, but Husserl first carried out its logical explication. He sees the meaning of the difference, above all, in terms of formal ontology and in the grounding of a pure logic of objects g genstance logic mathesis universalis. We want to attempt to further this differentiation and, in this furtherance, explain the meaning of the formal indication. Generalization generally wrong means generalizing viral domain wrong according to genus. For example, red is a color, color is sensuous quality. Or joy is an affect, affect is experience. One can, so it seems, drive as further qualities as such, things dinga as such are essence as vazen. Red, color, sensual quality, experience, genus, species, essence, are things gegenstände. But the question arises is the generalizing transition from red to color, or from color to sensuous quality the same as that from sensuous quality to essence and from essence to thing? Evidently not. There is a break here the transition from red to color and from color to sensuous quality is a generalization that from sensuous quality to essence is a formalization. One can ask whether the determination sensuous quality determines color in the same sense as the formal determination thing Gagenstein does anything you like. Evidently not. Nevertheless, the difference between generalization and formalization is not yet entirely clear. The generalization is bound in its enactment to a certain material domain. The order of stages of generalities genus and species is determined according to the matter at issue Sashualtig Bush Temp. The measuring to Anmasung in the material context is essential. Otherwise for the formalization for example, the stone is an object. There the attitude Einstellung is not bound to the materiality of things to the region of the material things and such, but is free in terms of its material contents. It is also free from any order of stages I need run through no lower generalities in order to ascend to the highest generality thing as such. The formal predication is not bound in terms of its material contents, yet it must be somehow motivated. How is it motivated? It arises from the sense of attitudinal relation itself Einstellungsbezug. I see the determination of its what was best emptied not from out of the object rather I read the determination off the object. I must see away from the what content was chalt and attend only to the fact that the object is a given, attitudinally grasped one. Thus the formalization arises out of the relational meaning of the pure attitudinal relation itself, not out of the what content as such. From here the relational determinations of the attitudes can first be seen. The pure attitudinal relation must itself still be viewed as an enactment, in order to understand the origin of the theoretical. But philosophizing as we will see a latter must be viewed in its original attitudinal enactment and Stellungsvils of the relation of phenomenological explication and the conduct of thought is also thus illuminated. The origin of the formal lies thus in the relational meaning. That diversity of relational meaning that is expressed in formal ontological categories, circumscribes the inauthentic theoretical attitude in its relational meaning, if not likewise in its original enactment. In talk of the formal indication, does the word formal have the meaning of the formalized, or does it gain another meaning? What is common to formalization and generalization is that they stand within the meaning of general, whereas the formal indication has nothing to do with generality. The meaning of formal in the formal indication is more original. For one means by formal ontology already something materially formed out. The formal region is in a broader sense also a material domain sash jibayat also is material sash waltig. There exist, for example, certain differences within the formalized. We have.
1. Something as an object can be said of anything and everything. 2. Experience as such, thing as such, or essences cannot be said of each object. These differences go together with the meaning of general. Contrarily, the formal indication has nothing to do with this. It falls outside of the attitudinally theoretical. Philosophy is ever again given the task of classifying the whole of being into regions. Philosophy has long been moved in this ontological direction. Only late did the opposing consideration arise how is the experienced experienced in the manner of consciousness but was Sainz Massig? If one now grasps this correlative consideration as a principal task, then the realm of consciousness itself becomes a region, and in turn the task arises of determining it itself more ontologically exactly. In so far as one describes consciousness, in some sense or other, as activity, one can describe the side of consciousness as an original, active one, because that which is original of consciousness becomes identical to the constitutive original. From there arises the tendency to see in constitution the genuine task of philosophy. This task was carried out resolutely by Hegel, today most prominently in the Marburg School. We pose to ourselves the question to what extent may the general be posited as the last philosophical determination? In what sense is generalization generally wrong a generalizing virale germane erung? In what sense is formalization a generalizing virale germane erung? Projected back onto our question, the question arises, how far and under what conditions may the general be posited as the last object of philosophical determination and if that is not the case, to what extent does the formal indication, despite this, not prejudice a phenomenological consideration? Generalization generally wrong can be described as a way of ordering. In it an integration of particular individuations into an encompassing material complex results. It is possible that this context itself can be integrated into a still more general, encompassing complex. Therefore the generalization always takes place in a material sexualtigen sphere. Its direction is determined through the right approach to the material day sexualtigen. With that the generalizing viral domain erung has meaning only in an attitude, for the material complex must be free, must have a free hand, in order to entirely order itself according to its materiality each guide. The generalization general erung is a particular order of stages, and indeed a materially imminent order of stages of determinatenesses, which stand among each other in the relation of mutual concernability betreff barkai, so that the most general determination refers all the way to the very last, most subordinate. Generalizing determinations are always determinations of an object according to its materiality from another viewpoint, and indeed such that what determines, for its part, itself belongs within the material domain in which the determining what lies. Generalization is thus ordering it as determination from another, such that this other belongs, as encompassing, to the same material region sac region as that to be determined. Generalization is thus an integration into the material complex of another. Is formalization also order? In generalization, I remain in a material region. It can draw out different directions of generalization once one is chosen, it must be maintained, for a leaping over from one direction to the other is not possible. Formalization is not bound to the particular what of the object to be determined. The determination turns away from the materiality of the object, it observes the object according to the aspect in which it is given it is determined as that which is grasped as that to which the cognizing relation refers. An object as such means only the to which of the theoretical attitudinal relation. This attitudinal relation contains a plurality of meanings that can be explicated and indeed such that this explication can be considered as determination according to the sphere of objects. But the relational meaning is not an order, not a region, or rather only indirectly insofar as it is formed out into a formal object category to which a region corresponds. The formalization is primarily only in order through this forming out. Thus we have to understand under formalization several things determination of a something as object, assignment to a formally objective category, which is however for its part not original, but rather represents only the forming out of a relation. Task of forming out the diversity of the relational meaning. Theory of the formal ontological mathesis universal as from the meaning of the relational possibility itself. 13. The formal indication. Thus we have. 1. Formalization. In this forming out, a special task arises the theory of the formal logical and formal ontological. Through their forming out from the relational meaning, the formal categories make possible the performance of mathematical operations. 2. Theory of the formal ontological mathesis universalis, through which a theoretical region is posited as separate. 3. Phenomenology of the formal original consideration of the formal itself and explication of the relational meaning within its enactment. If such a formal ontological determination is posited on Gazette generality, does this prejudice philosophy? Insofar as the formal ontological determinations are formal, they do not prejudice. Thus it is fitting to lead philosophy back to them. If we ask whether the formal ontological prejudice is philosophy, this question makes sense only if one accepts the thesis that philosophy is not an attitude. In the background is for us the thesis that philosophy is not theoretical science, thus also the formal ontological study can be the final one, determining the constitutive phenomenological. 
for under this presupposition, the accepted formal ontological grasp of the object is prejudicing. What is phenomenology? What is phenomenon? Here this can be itself indicated only formally. Each experience is experiencing, and what is experience said can be taken in the phenomenon, that is to say, one can ask. 1. After the original what, that is experienced there in content. 2. After the original how, in which it is experienced relation. 3. After the original how, in which the relational meaning is enacted enactment. But these three directions of sense content, relational, enactment sense do not simply coexist. Phenomenon is the totality of sense in these three directions. Phenomenology is explication of this totality of sense it gives the of the phenomena, in the sense of verb mean ternum not in the sense of logicalization. Now does the formal ontological determination prejudice this task of phenomenology? One could say that a formal ontological determinateness says nothing about the what of that which it determines, and thus does not prejudice anything. But exactly because the formal determination is entirely indifferent as to content, it is fatal for the relational and enactment aspect of the phenomenon because it prescribes, or at least contributes to prescribing, a theoretical relational meaning. It hides the enactment character das Falschk's messiah which is possibly still more fatal and turns one-sidedly to the content. A glance at the history of philosophy shows that formal determination of the objective entirely dominates philosophy. How can this prejudice, this prejudgment, be prevented? This is just what the formal indication achieves. It belongs to the phenomenological explication itself as a methodical moment. Why is it called formal? The formal is something relational. The indication should indicate beforehand the relation of the phenomenon in the negative sense, however, the same as if to warn. A phenomenon must be so stipulated, such that its relational meaning is held in abeyance. One must prevent oneself from taking it for granted that its relational meaning is originally theoretical. The relation and performance of the phenomenon is not preliminarily determined, but is held in abeyance. That is a stance which is opposed to science in the highest degree. There is no insertion into a material domain, but rather the opposite the formal indication is a defense opfair, a preliminary securing, so that the enactment character still remains free. The necessity of this precautionary measure arises from the falling tendency of factical life experience, which constantly threatens to slip into the objective, and out of which we must still retrieve the phenomena. Formalization and generalization are thus attitudinally or theoretically motivated. Ordering occurs in their enactment directly in generalization, indirectly in formalization. To the contrary, the formal indication does not concern an order. In the formal indication one stays away from any classification and everything is precisely kept open. The formal indication has meaning only in relation to the phenomenological explication. The question is, whether the posited task of philosophy, as the general determination of the objective, can be maintained in principle whether this setting of the task arises from the original motive of philosophizing. In order to decide that, we must allow ourselves to be driven into a new situation we must become clear about the way of phenomenological consideration. This is accomplished by the formal indication. It means a positing of the phenomenological explication. We apply the results one to the problem of the historical. If the historical is taken as the formally indicated, it is not thereby asserted that the most general determination of historical as a becoming in time delineates a final sense. This formally indicating determination of the sense of historical is neither to be regarded as one which determines the objective historical world in its historical structural character, nor as one which describes the most general sense of the historical itself. Temporal is, preliminarily, still taken in an entirely undetermined sense one does not know at all which time is being spoken of. So long as the sense of temporal is undetermined, one could understand it as something not prejudicing one could mean insofar as each objecthood constitutes itself in consciousness, it is temporal, and with that one has won the fundamental scheme of the temporal. But this general formal determination of time is no foundation rather it is a falsification of the problem. For with that a framework for the time phenomenon has been pre-delineated from out of the theoretical. Rather, the problem of time must be grasped in the way we originally experienced temporality and factical experience entirely irrespective of all pure consciousness and all pure time. The way is thus reversed. We must ask, rather, what is temporality originally in factical experience? What do past, present, and future mean in factical experience? Our way takes its point of departure from factical life, from which the meaning of time is one. The problem of the historical is thus characterized. Philosophy, as I understand it, is in a difficulty. The listener in other lectures is assured, from the beginning on in art history lectures he can see pictures and others he gets his money's worth for his exams. In philosophy, it is otherwise, and I cannot change that, for I did not invent philosophy. I would, however, like to save myself from this calamity and thus break off these so abstract considerations, and lecture to you, beginning in the next session, on history and indeed I will, without further consideration for the starting point and method, take a particular concrete phenomenon as the point of departure, 
however for me under the presupposition that you will misunderstand the entire study from beginning to end. 1. C.F. Metaphysics 1003A33. 2. Edmund Husserl, Logical Investigations, Volume 1, Prolegomena to Pure Logic, 2nd Revised Edition, Tübingen, 1913. 3. Edmund Husserl, Ide und zu einer Rhein und Phänomenologie und Phänomenologischen Philosophie, in der Buch für Philosophie und Phänomenologischen Forschung, Volume 1, Tübingen, 1913. Part 2. Phenomenological Explication of Concrete Religious Phenomena in Connection with the Letters of Paul Chapter 1 Phenomenological Interpretation of the Letters to the Galatians 14. Introduction In the following, we do not intend to give a dogmatic or theological exegetical interpretation, nor a historical study or a religious meditation, but only guidance for phenomenological understanding. Characteristic of the phenomenological religious understanding is gaining an advanced understanding for an original way of access. One must work the religious historical method into it, and indeed in such a way that one examines it critically. The theological method falls out of the framework of our study. Only with phenomenological understanding, a new way for theology is opened up. The formal indication renounces the last understanding that can only be given in genuine religious experience it intends only to open an access to the New Testament. Initially, we will interpret the letter of Paul to the Galatians. The letter to the Galatians was significant for the young Luther along with the letter to the Romans, it became an dogmatic fundament. Luther and Paul are, religiously speaking, the most radical opposites. There is a commentary by Luther on the letter to the Galatians. One yet we must free ourselves from Luther's standpoint. Luther sees Paul from out of Augustine. Despite this, there are real connections of Protestantism with Paul. The letter to the Galatians contains a historical report from Paul himself about the story of his conversion. It is the original document for his religious development and, historically, reports the passionate excitation of Paul himself. Correlatively, only the story of the Apostles is to be invoked. To begin with, it suffices to seek a general understanding of the letter to the Galatians in order to penetrate there within the grounding phenomena of primordial Christian life. The original Greek text is the only one to be used as a basis and actual understanding presupposes a penetration into the spirit of New Testament Greek. Eberhard Nesle offers the best Greek edition Novum Testamentum Graecum.2 If one wants to use the aid of a translation, Luther shouldn't be chosen, for it is all too dependent upon Luther's own theological standpoint. The translation of Vidsek of Erlag v. More, Tubingener that of Eberhard Nestle is recommended. Three. In the letters to the Galatians, Paul is struggling with the Jews and the Jewish Christians. Thus we find the phenomenological situation of religious struggle and of struggle itself. Paul must be seen in struggle with his religious passion in his existence as an apostle, the struggle between law and faith. This opposition is not a final one it is rather a preliminary one. Faith and law are both special modes of the path of salvation. The aim is salvation. Finally life. The fundamental comportment of Christian consciousness is to be understood out of this, according to the sense of its content, relation, and enactment. Reading modern positions into it is to be avoided. All concepts are to be understood from out of the context of Christian consciousness. In this respect the historical research of theologians has been a service, as questionable as it may be for theology itself. The letter to the Galatians can be divided in three main parts. 1. Demonstration of the uniqueness of the apostolic mission of Paul and his vocation through Christ. Two. Conflict between law and faith at first theoretical, and then applied to life. 3. Christian life as a whole, its motives and its tendencies in terms of content. 15. Some remarks on the text. 15. World. The present time has already reached its end and a new has begun since the death of Christ. The present world is opposed to the world of eternity. To whom be the glory has a particular meaning. 18 to 9 The struggle for the right evangelism. Intended is not a saving of the Galatians rather the original Christianity should be grounded from out of itself, without regard for pre-given forms of religion, such as the Jewish pharisaical. Paul's own religious position is to be constituted. 110 Significant. Complete break with the earlier past, with every non-Christian view of life. 112 Paul wants to say further that he has come to Christianity not through a historical tradition, but through an original experience. A theory that is controversial in Protestant theology connects with this it is asserted that Paul had no historical consciousness of Jesus of Nazareth. Rather he has grounded a new Christian religion, a new primordial Christianity which dominates the future the Pauline religion, not the religion of Jesus. One thus does not need to refer back to a historical Jesus. The life of Jesus is entirely indifferent. Of course that may not be read out of a single passage. One thirteen important passage for what is characteristic of Paul. Conduct manner of life conducting of life posture of life to which I am turned. 114 Zealot. Paul's passionateness maintains itself also after his conversion. 
116 Among the Gentiles one does not know whether this became clear to him already with the calling or only gradually. 117 Arabia equals East Jordan perhaps ascetic life, perhaps already missionizing. 118 To get to know, therefore, history East War. 22 Emphasizing the running. Paul is hurried, because the end of time has already come. 216 Speaking justly, stems from the Jewish religion. The life of the individual is a trial process before God, against which Jesus turns ethically in the Sermon on the Mount conviction. But the law of Christ later has a new Christian meaning. Paul's argumentation is here rabbinical Jewish theological. His own original position is to be differentiated from this view. The argumentation from out of the Old Testament is characteristically rabbinical. 217 As conclusion ab absurdum is found often in Paul. 219 Very important. Concentrated form of the entire Pauline dogmatic. Through the law I died to the law merely ethical. Since Christ is identical with the law, the law died with him as does Paul, too. 220 Decisive for Pauline mysticism. Wright's Einstein points to the connection of the terminology with Hellenism. For however, one may not interpret exclusively philologically hermetic writings. 32 By believing what you heard from the hearing in faith. CF. Rom. 1011 FF. 43 To the elemental spirits of the world under the elements of the world. In the Stoics indicates element, as already in Empedocles. Philo Judas at the same time as Paul designates the pagans as elemental spirits. Compare with 49 and 10 stars count as world elements. The feast times were arranged according to the stars. 48 By nature are not gods. They are divine beings. Compare with V. 1 The stages? Under? The guardians are compared to the stage of the star priests. 49 To know in the sense of love as in the first verse. The love of God to human beings is what is fundamental, not theoretical knowledge. 414 You took no offense to my sickness. Sickness often grasped as lecherousness. 424 Allegory The allegorical textual interpretation was then practiced by Philo. Hagar means an Arabic mountain, or, that is what the mountain is called in Arabic. 426 The Jerusalem above the final state of redemption is described in the Apocalypse Baruch. 55 Connection of faith and hope cf. Kordot is important. The bliss is not completed here, but is moved to the higher world. Compared to the unwavering running toward the aim. 511 The offense of the cross that is the real fundamental part of Christianity against which there is only faith or non-faith. 16. The fundamental posture of Paul. Paul finds himself in a struggle. He is, pressured to assert the Christian life experience against the surrounding world. To this end he uses the insufficient means of rabbinical teaching available to him. From this his explication of Christian life experience has its peculiar structure. Still, it is an original explication from the sense of the religious life itself. It can be further formed out in the primary religious experience. Theoretical contexts remain far from this and explicational context is one, one that presents itself similarly to a theoretical explication. At issue is a return to the original experience and an understanding of the problem of religious explication. Harnock's dogma is Chide history of dogma 5 begins only with the 3rd century. According to Harnock, Greek philosophy first dogmatized the Christian religion. But the actual problem of dogma, in the sense of religious explication, lies in primordial Christianity. This here lies before us. The question of expression explication seems to be secondary. Yet, with this seemingly external problem, we stand within the religious phenomenon itself. It is not a technical problem, separate from religious experience rather the explication goes along with, and drives, the religious experience. Law is here to be understood primarily as ritual and ceremonial law. Also intended as the merely secondary moral law. Therefore, there is a struggle of the Jewish Christian community for the law, the law as that which makes the Jew a Jew. The work of the law the attitude to the law. The opposition of faith and law is decisive the how of faith and of the fulfillment of the law, how I comport myself to the faith and also to the law. Phil. 313 shows the fundamental posture of Paul. The third chapter, in particular, contains a secure dialectical argumentation. Nevertheless, we are not dealing with the logical mode of argumentation. Rather it arises out of the consciousness of faith of this explication itself. The expression to consider, to speak is characteristic for the articulation of the consciousness of faith, in the sense of making comprehensible the posture of faith for the individual himself, and being able to appropriate the specific religious comprehensible meaning. Paul shows his main theological car the argument that Abraham himself would be justified only through faith. Accordingly, how does it stand at all with the law? 32 The works of the law stands in sharp opposition to by believing what you hear compare with Rom. 1013, 14. The fulfillment of law is impossible each fails in it, only faith justifies. Whoever thus stands under the law is condemned. 319 offers an accumulation of determinations that are supposed to suggest the inferiority of the law. 
In studying the religious world of Paul, one must free oneself from drawing out certain concepts such as etc. faith, righteousness, flesh and putting together their meaning from out of a heap of singular passages of the Pauline writings, so that one has a catalog of fundamental concepts that say nothing. Equally mistaken is the thought of the theological system in Paul. Rather, the fundamental religious experience must be explicated, and, remaining in this fundamental experience, one must seek to understand the connection to it of all original religious phenomena. In order to win a guidance for this kind of study, we will initially emphasize the phenomenon that lies before us in the letter to the Galatians. Later we will reach out historically further, not so much forward into a later time as backward to the original Christian community and to Jesus himself. To be compared with the fundamental posture of Paul is Phil. 313 Self-certainty of the situation Stellung in his own life break in his existence Original historical understanding of his self and of his existence. From out of this, he performs his feat as apostle, and as human being. Chapter 2 Task and Object of the Philosophy of Religion 17. Phenomenological Understanding In which way are we to consider, for the philosophy of religion, that which we brought to attention, in an entirely primitive way, through a reading of the letter to the Galatians? That is to be decided only out of the leading aim of the task of the philosophy of religion. Therefore, we must sketch out what is most necessary in the method, and indeed in a brief, schematic treatment thereby the connection with the general methodical introduction will be made as well. If one determines the task of the philosophy of religion entirely naively, one can say religion should be understood, grasped philosophically. Religion is to be projected into an understandable context. Thus the position of the problem of the philosophy of religion depends upon the concept of philosophy. If one admits a limitation to primordial Christian religiosity, one must then observe that it is a historical fact. If one grasps the philosophical context as a determined, demarcated field for example, as consciousness the primordial Christian religiosity becomes a fact, that is, an example, a singular case in a range of possibilities, of types, of possible forms of religiosity. Because everything historical should come into consideration merely as example, it is clear thought as is entirely usual today, after all a bare collection of material lies in the sense of this formulation of the problem. Through this formulation of the problem, the object to be recognized for example primordial Christian religiosity is already characterized it is thereby sketched out in a particular sense of history. The historical types of religion are placed into a diversity of possibilities. They are a material to be drawn upon in this way, they form an extra-temporal diversity. Which presupposition lays at the bottom of this formulation of the problem? We do not ask this because we reject each and every positing of presuppositions, but because each philosophical positing of the problem must be clear about its presuppositions. Today's usual philosophy of religion makes the following presuppositions in its positing of the problem, about which it is not clear. 1. Religion is a case or an example of an extra-temporal lawfulness. 2. From religion only that which has the character of consciousness will be taken up. And indeed the phenomena of consciousness, which correspond to the entirely particular concept of consciousness of the philosophy used as a foundation, standardize the entire formulation of the problem. Now if one describes as our task the phenomenological understanding of primordial Christian religiosity, so it sounds the same according to its wording. However, the former formulation of the problem understands away from its own object it makes the object disappear. By contrast, it is the tendency of phenomenological understanding to experience the object itself in its originality. 18. Phenomenology of Religion and the History of Religion One will say that the usual philosophy of religion also holds on to the historical, to the religious historical. But does the formulation of the problem of the usual history of religion attain to the genuine object of religiosity itself? So long as it is not certain that the religious historical and the genuine religious philosophical understanding, that is, phenomenological understanding, coincide, it is still not at all said that the history of religion can deliver material for the philosophy phenomenology of religion. To what extent does the religious historical material, even if only as a starting point for the philosophy of religion, come into question? That is a problem that we cannot decide here but it is a fundamental problem, which arises for all history of ideas guys to sheet. Today's philosophy of history achieves nothing for positive historical research and vice versa. It is the merit of Spengler to have compressed the comic effect of this situation into a philosophy. The problems of the philosophy of history are to be retrieved only out of the concrete historical sciences themselves. Is then the material of the history of religion usable for phenomenology? In what way is the history of religion itself at all appropriate to its objects? One could say if the history of religion clarifies religiosity from out of its religious environment, as it does out of its historical time, how can one then accuse it of not reaching its object? After all, it interprets, as objective science, free of prejudices and preconceptions, only on the basis of its material of sense that the contemporary sources offer, independently of all tendencies of the present. This argumentation has certainly an appearance of justification. On the one hand, 
one has to agree with it to a certain extent. But on the other hand, it must be objected that all objectivity of the science of history and the object historical understanding offer no guarantee so long as the guiding for conception is not clarified. It is to be shown, moreover, that all motives for historical understanding are always awakened through factical life experience. The science of history has only the task of employing them in formal formed outness and in rigorous methodology. The tendencies of understanding arise from out of the living present, which are then merely formed out in science and exact methodology. The exactness of method offers in itself no guarantee for correct understanding. The methodical scientific apparatus critique of sources according to exact philological methods, etc. can be fully intact, and still the guiding for conception can miss the genuine object. Despite this, the modern history of religion accomplishes much for phenomenology, if it is subjected to a phenomenological destruction destruction. Only then can a history of religion be considered for phenomenology. In this way, the history of religion accomplishes important preliminary work at the same time, however, all of its concepts and results necessarily require phenomenological destruction. Yet this is still not a clarification of the context in which the material at hand forms the starting point for understanding. The guiding for conception of which the historian is himself unaware of had is to say, the tendencies that already motivate the formulation of the problem is decisive. It is often overlooked, especially in the specialized sciences, that already the formulation of the problem itself in no way offers itself out of the bare material rather it is already for conceptually determined. But phenomenology must always keep its eye exactly on this problematic of the for conception, in connection with history. 19. Basic Determinations of Primordial Christian Religiosity now in what sense should the material we have retrieved from the letter to the Galatians be used? What is the aim of our phenomenological understanding? It is not an interpretation on the basis of a historical kind of context, into which the letter to the Galatians would be placed rather we want to explicate its own meaning. Already the basic determination of primordial Christian religiosity is decisive for this. First, it is necessary to insert a remark that is important for all religious historical study. It is therein customary today to work with the categorical opposition of rational and irrational. Today's philosophy of religion one is proud of its category of the irrational and, with it, considers the access to religiosity secured. But with these two concepts nothing is said, as long as one does not know the meaning of rational. The concept of the irrational, after all, is supposed to be determined from out of the opposition to the concept of the rational, which, however, finds itself in notorious indetermination. This pair of concepts is thus to be eliminated entirely. Phenomenological understanding, according to its basic meaning, lies entirely outside of this opposition, which is only a very limited authority, if at all. Everything that is said of theft or reasoning to soluble residue that supposedly remains in all religions, is merely an aesthetic play with things that are not understood. Which basic determination do we give to the object of the philosophy of religion? The letter to the Galatians had delivered to us a confusing variety of things Paul's apostolic calling, warning the community, etc. from that we have carried out an indifferent taking cognizance, without understanding its guiding for conception in order to see that it cannot work this way that is to say, in order to subject this taking cognizance to destruction. We encountered a connection that seems to be self-evident that Paul gives his doctrine and directs his warning wholly in the manner of the stoic cynic wandering preachers of the time. Nothing special lies in the manner of his presentation. One may compare with this the words of the Athenians about him Acts 17 17 ff. We, too, approach the letter to the Galatians similarly. The question arises whether this self-evidence is really such, and whether the connection of calling, proclamation, doctrine, warning does not have a motivated sense one which belongs to the sense of religiosity itself. Thus for example the proclamation is itself a religious phenomenon, which is to be analyzed in all phenomenological directions of sense. Now in the presentation our basic determinations run like propositions but they are not to be understood as propositions that are to be proven afterwards. Whoever takes them as such misunderstands them. They are phenomenological explications. As basic determinations we stay to for now. 1. Primordial Christian religiosity is in primordial Christian life experience and is itself such. 2. Factical life experience is historical. Christian religiosity lives to temporality as such. 3. These fundamental determinations are for now hypothetical. We ask if, with these, the basic meaning of Christian religiosity is hit upon, what follows from that methodologically. 20. The phenomenon of proclamation. Now, from out of the indicated context, we single out the phenomenon of proclamation because in it the immediate life relation of the world of self of Paul to the surrounding world and to the communal world of the community is able to be comprehended. It is thus a central phenomenon. Now in a purely formal manner, various questions can be posed to proclaims. How is proclamation done? What is proclaimed? Etc. Here, too, there exists a certain complex out of which a unity is to be retrieved. And indeed we emphasize the how of proclamation. The enactment of life is decisive. The complex of enactment is co-experienced in life. 
out of this it is to be made understandable that the how of the enactment has basic meaning. We are thus asking after the how of the proclamation of Paul. We are relatively conveniently situated for answering this question, for after all we have the how of proclamation before us in Paul's letters. Within the formulation of the question of the how of proclamation, the epistolary character appears, all of a sudden, as a phenomenon. Theology especially Protestant theology influenced by the development of the historical humanities in the 19th century, has brought forth work on the history of style in regard to the literary forms of the New Testament. Further investigations may be eagerly expected, although the point of departure is misguided as much according to the science of history as phenomenologically. One approaches the matter entirely externally, insofar as one integrates the New Testament writing into world literature, in order to analyze its forms accordingly. Even if it were so that the forms of the New Testament are differentiated in no way from contemporary literature, still one may not proceed in this way. In analyzing the character of the letter, one must take as the only point of departure the Pauline situation and the how of the necessary motivation of the communication in letters. The content proclaimed, and its material and conceptual character, is then to be analyzed from out of the basic phenomenon of proclamation. 21. Four Conceptions of the Study the four conceptions in the historical study extend in their effects into the critique of sources, the singularities of the assessment of the text, conjectures, questions of authenticity. One can illustrate this in the first letter to the Thessalonians, which was declared inauthentic by the Tübingen school which stands under Hegelian influence, for on the basis of its slight dogmatic content in comparison to other Pauline letters. Thus, the four conception reaches all the way into the most minuscule aspects of historical research, indeed into the addition of sources. In this, the relations in art history are again different from those in the history of religion. Thus, each pre-given historical material must be submitted to a four-conceptual observation. But with that nothing is yet achieved for phenomenological understanding, because it has a different character than the object historical. Object historical understanding is determination according to the aspect of the relation, from out of the relation, so that the observer does not come into question. By contrast, phenomenological understanding is determined by the enactment of the observer, Despite the different origins of understanding, the connection of phenomenological understanding to the history of objects is closer than in other sciences. Thus phenomenological understanding consists, first, not in the projecting of what is to be understood, which, after all, is no kind of object, in a material complex. It has, secondly, never the tendency of determining such a realm with finality, but rather is subordinated to the historical situation insofar as the foreconception is even more decisive for phenomenological understanding than object historical understanding. Thus, one has to begin at the starting point the foreconception of the phenomenological understanding. Such a starting point is not possible for every observer, for every phenomenon it must be borne by a familiarity with the phenomenon. One proceeds methodologically securely if one approaches the basic determination purely formally one intentionally affords the concepts a certain ability in order to secure their determination first in the process of phenomenological study itself. In this sense we have posited the following starting points for the sake of the determination of primordial Christian religiosity. 1. Primordial Christian religiosity is in fact a life experience. Postscript it is such experience itself. 2. Factical life experience is historical. Postscript Christian experience lives time itself to live understood as verbum transitivum. One cannot prove these theses. Rather they must prove themselves in phenomenological experience itself. The letter is something other than empirical experience. The basic determinations are thus hypothetical if they are valid, then such and such results for the phenomenon. We initially consider the apostolic proclamation of Paul. If it represents a basic phenomenon, from out of it must be one a relation to the total religious basic phenomenon. In the enactment and through the enactment, the phenomenon is explicated. Apostolic proclamation is still too broad a characterization of the phenomenon. The apostolic proclamation is decisively clarified as soon as it is determined in its how, in its sense of enactment. This formulation of the question of the how is thus decisive. The character of the material tat we are dealing with letters is convenient for these questions. The Pauline letters are, as sources, more immediate than the later composed Gospels. However, one may not isolate the epistolary character, nor bring into the problem literary question of style. They are not primary. The epistolary style itself is the expression of the writer in his situation. Although the Pauline letters lie so near to each other temporally, so that a Pauline development from one to another does not come into question, they are nevertheless really different. For example, the letters to the Romans and to the Galatians are much richer in dogmatic content than the letter to the Thessalonians. One must free oneself as well from the schematic classification of the letters. 22. The Scheme of Phenomenological Explication How is a phenomenological explication of its material enacted? Material has a particular methodological sense. The explication of the phenomenon from out of the material is carried out in particular stages. Schematically speaking, 
the steps of the phenomenological explication are as follows. 1. Because the basic phenomenon is factical life experience, and because it is historical, so the first task is to determine the complex of phenomena object historically, pre-phenomenologically, as a historical situation, but already from out of phenomenological motives. 2. The enactment of the historical situation of the phenomenon is to be gained. To this end a diversity of what may be encountered in the situation is to be characterized and indeed in such a manner that nothing is to be decided about its actual connections briefly articulation of the situational diversity the accentuating situation of the diversity is to be gained the primary or archontic reigning sense of the accentuating situation is to be ascertained from there to arrive at the phenomenal complex and from out of this to posit the study of origin. But in doing this, we must remain conscious of certain limitations. 1. The basic comportment of the personal life experience of the observer phenomenologist is eliminated. 2. The study aims at the historical phenomena, but does not yet involve that which is decisive. One should note that the explication comes to a head ever more from step to step, becomes more and more individual, grows ever nearer to the peculiar historical facticity. This succession of steps becomes understandable only if one frees oneself from the theory of regents unshakably. Remarks on the scheme of phenomenological explication. Re1. Gaining the object historical complex is already determined by the aim of the explication. It is not coincidental. The object historical emphasis should be studied to yield an authentic emphasis and should be kept in mind. Re2. The application of the object historical complex of occurrence to the original historical situation encounters three difficulties. A presentation through language. The language of the study of the material is not original. There is a more original conceptuality already in factical life experience from out of which the material conceptuality that is common to us first derives. This reversal in conceptuality must be enacted, or else it is hopeless to ever grasp the situation. One may not simply take up self-evident concepts. The question of the philosophical concepts has not been posed since Socrates. At times, one believes to come closer to the problem through a dialectic. But one may not posit life as irrational without being clear about the sense of irrationality. No material of explication has been understood as long as its indicated sense complex is not enacted. The complex of enactment itself belongs to the concept of the phenomenon. The philosophical concept has a structure incomparable to the material concept. Be empathizing with a situation. The problem of empathy does not budge as long as one grasps it epistemologically. But the motive of the problem of empathy is not epistemological at all. Empathy arises in factical life experience, that is to say, it involves an original historical phenomenon that cannot be resolved without the phenomenon of tradition in its original sense. Today the environment of Paul is entirely foreign to us. But what is crucial for us is not the material character, the ideational of his surrounding world. This moment falls away entirely the environment first gains its sense out of the understanding of the situation. The question of the explication itself. Through the completion of the explication, that which is explicated becomes apparently independent, released from its enactment. But this is a distorted view. It is peculiar to the theoretical attitudinal abstraction that what is abstracted is grasped as a moment of a material region, so that thereby the basic determinations of the region are one. What is abstracted is studied further without reference to that from which it is abstracted the fundamentum of the abstraction does not matter. The abstraction as such, the transition from the fundamentum abstraction is to the abstracting is not co-experienced. Otherwise in the explication if particular moments are explicated in the explication, those moments of sense to which the explication is not directed are not simply shoved aside rather the how of their reaching into the just explicated, directional sense or the direction of sense in the process of explication is co-determined precisely by the explication itself. Here one could ask can one, with the relational sense for example, study as well the what the content of that to which one is comported, and even the how of the enactment? But this objection is attitudinal. The directions of sense are all three grasped. The enactment of the explication is not a separated succession of acts, grasping determinations. It is to be gained only in a concrete life context. One can thereby also, at the same time, have the directions of sense that are not seen. Chapter 3 Phenomenological Explication of the First Letter to the Thessalonians 23. Methodological Difficulties The first letter to the Thessalonians was written in the year 53 AD thus 20 years after the crucifixion it is the earliest document of the New Testament. Its authenticity is now no longer doubted. We ask, according to the stated method what is the object historical situation of Paul as he wrote the letter? The letter was written on the first missionary trip in Corinth. The trip led first to Philippi, from there for three weeks to Thessalonica. The opposition of the Jews led Paul to leave the city secretly, and from there he went to Athens, from which he sent Timothy back to Salonica and met him again only in Corinth. Paul writes the letter just after his arrival in Corinth. The situation is entirely determined by this. Compare for this I thess. 
36.32 Acts 185. On the first sojourn of Paul in Thessalonica see Acts 171-16. If we present this object historically, Paul appears as a missionary who talks as a usual wandering preacher, without attracting too much attention. Now we no longer observe the object historical complex, but rather see the situation such that we write the letter along with Paul. We perform the letter writing, or its dictation, with him. The first question how, does Paul, in the situation of a letter writer, stand to the Thessalonians? How are they experienced by him? How is his communal world given to him in the situation of writing the letter? That is connected to the question, how Paul stands to this communal world. The content of the communal world is to be seen in its determination in connection with the how of the relation to this communal world. Thus we must draw out the basic determination of this relation. We have still another methodological difficulty to consider. One could say it is impossible or possible only in a limited way to transport oneself into Paul's exact situation. Indeed, we do not know his environment at all. This objection arises from the view that what is given in the manner of objects is primary for a situation with which one must empathize. But one must judge Paul's position with regard to his surroundings from out of his personality and ask whether the surroundings are important for him at all. The empathy problem is posed, for the most part, epistemologically, and is therefore misguided in its starting point. Scheler's view comes closest to the right one which, however, is still strongly epistemologically burdened. Furthermore, the assertions of Paul are not different from an objective historical report. That is a problem of presentation through language, each expression falls into an attitudinal one. One must realize that it is misguided to cut concepts of objects to fit subjectivity. Finally the problem of emphasis. How are the givenness of the surrounding world, the communal world, and the self-world, which flow into each other in factical life, emphasized? One can always observe only one at a time. This emphasis is not abstraction, because the other factors are nevertheless constantly co-given. The tendency is not toward the dissipation of historical facticity, toward gaining general religious phenomenological assertions from one example. It is not the ideal of a theoretical construction that is aimed for, but the originality of the absolute historical in its absolute unrepeatability. All questions of philosophy are, at bottom, questions about the how strictly understood, questions of method. The turn at which the object historical situation becomes an enactment historical one succumbs to a difficulty in presentation in the explication of the enactment historical situation and there exists an imminent explication with a more original conceptuality than that with which we are familiar, from which the usual conceptuality is first always derived, from which it originates. The actual preliminary question about the meaning of philosophical conceptuality has not been posed since Socrates. The conceptuality familiar to us tends toward the attitudinal, the study of matter. If one, from here, views only the problem of presentation, one sees that each thing to be explicated which is made known in talk, is not understood as long as one does not also grasp the complex of enactment in the concept. The material concept is absolutely incomparable to the phenomenological concept. An original consideration of the motives of the problem of empathy shows that it has nothing to do with epistemological questions. The problem of empathy is not to be solved without the phenomenon of tradition of historical factical life experience. One difficulty is that we cannot at all, with our ideas, put ourselves in Paul's place. Such an attempt is misguided because what is crucial is not the material character of Paul's environment, but rather only his own situation. The problem of the presentation, empathy, and explication of autonomized individuals is badly posed. The explication differs from each material abstraction of the theoretical attitude. Their abstraction is grasped as affiliated with and co-determining a material region it is essential that the abstracted is fixed in further progress without regard to that from which it is abstracted so that the from which remains a matter of indifference for the sense of the abstracted. Accordingly, the transition from the base to the abstracted is not important. Explication means if it is explicated toward a particular direction of sense, the remaining directions of meaning are co-projected into it. In this, it is important to determine the how of the co-projection. If one claims it is not possible to explicate one direction and in the same stroke the others as well as, for example, the content sense, relational sense, and enactment attitudinal comportment of this objection. The individual directions of sense are not things. The complete disappearance of this difficulty can be seen only in a concrete situational context. The turn from the object historical complex to the enactment historical situation itself derives from connections which can be shown in factical life experience. Does one, with this turning around, at all emerge from history? Where does the phenomenological begin? This objection is legitimate, but it maintains as its background the conviction that the philosophical has a special dimension. That is the misunderstanding. Philosophy is returned to the original historical. This difficulty, therefore, does not burden our study. 24. The Situation The turning around from the object historical to the enactment historical lies in factical life experience itself. It is a turning around to the situation. 
situation counts here for us as a phenomenological term. It would not be used for objective contexts also not historically such as condition for example, fatal situation or condition. Situation is thus for us something that belongs to understanding in the manner of enactment, it does not designate anything in the manner of an order. A diversity of situations or also within a situation should not be grasped as a complex of order. A situational series is not, moreover, a series in the manner of an order compared to Bergson's Dury, concrete one. The question of the demarcation of a situation is independent of the determination of an object theoretical section, of a historical period or epoch. And the object historical period is also something other than a mathematically physically determined particular period. A special investigation is needed in order to determine when an object historical and a situational demarcation coincide. For the question of the unity or the diversity of the situation, it is important that we can gain them only in the formal indication. The unity is not formally logical, but merely formally indicated. The formal indication is in the neither nor it is neither something in the manner of an order, nor explication of a phenomenological determination. We cannot project a situation into a particular field of being, nor into consciousness. We cannot speak of a situation of a point A between B and C. Language protests against this. And indeed we cannot do this because a point is nothing like an I.I. Clichy's. Being like an I is understood entirely indeterminately. Being like an I belongs to each situation. With that it is not said that the like an I of a situation is that which unifies the diversity. Nothing is expressed about the relation of the I and the not I. One should not here read into this a subject-object relationship, nor claim in the wake of Fichte that the I posits the not I. Too about that, we express nothing. Apparently the Fichtean relation is entirely general, but it nevertheless prejudices already entirely particular connections. It says the I posits the form of non ins not the factical world is posited. Fichte only grasped the Kantian situation more sharply. That which is like an I can stand in connection with the same and with a not I, and the latter amongst itself. The only differentiation we make between that which is like an I and the not I is the following that which is like an I is and has the not I, the not I merely is and does not have. This again is entirely formal indication the is should not even be taken in the seemingly most general way, as predication, much less as existence, real occurrence, etc. The problem is the origin of the concepts of being the predicative is of theoretical explication arises out of the original I am, not the other way around. Insofar as that which is like an I has something, the departure for the situation can be taken from here. For what is had seems to give itself objectively. It offers a starting point for the carrying out of the explication. Situation carries in itself in the usual sense of the word, a sense of the static. This connotation must be disregarded. And yet a dynamical view misjudges the situation as well, in which one views the phenomenal context as a flowing and speaks of the flow of the phenomena. From that viewpoint, situation means a shutting down. But the, situational complex stands beyond the alternatives of static dynamic. For the notion of flowing and streaming has the manner of an order as well therefore homogeneity is at least implied, if not explicitly co-posited. The time of factical life is to be gained from the complex of enactment of factical life itself, and from there the static or dynamic character of the situation is to be determined. We grasp situation purely formally as unity of a diversity. What makes up its unity remains indeterminate but the situation is not a homogeneous field of relations the situational structure does not run in one or more dimensions, but rather entirely otherwise. Already the starting point of a phenomenological study is having the manner of an order and the attempt of a material description fails because of the phenomenon itself. One must return ever again to the point of departure. The departure is to be taken from the having relation of that which is like an I. For what is had seems always still to appear as something objectively characterizable the relation of the people before Paul to him is how he has them. 25. The having become of the Thessalonians. Thus we will pursue as what Paul has the congregation in Thessalonica and how he has it. In doing so, we will go back to a particular moment of the object historical report Acts 174 to Paul's relation to the few who fell to him some of them were persuaded and joined Paul. In turning to the situation, is this object historical relation retained, and in which way does it come to expression in the letter writing? Paul is co-included in the state of the congregation of the sum. The Thessalonians are those who fell to him. In them, he necessarily co-experiences himself. We put forth formally the state of the relation of Paul to those who have given themselves over to him. Paul experiences the Thessalonians in two determinations. 1. He experiences their having become. 2. He experiences, that they have a knowledge of their having become you know. That means their having become is also Paul's having become. And Paul is co-affected by their having become. Showing this concretely from the letter is very easy. In the course of Ithes, the frequent use of one to come, to become in similar words, and to you know, you remember, among others, is striking. The thorough pursuit of the repetition of the same word seems external but one must view this, in an enactment historical understanding, as an ever-repeatedly surfacing tendency, as a motif. That is something other than the repetition of a natural event. Re 1. Ithes. 15, 6, 
7, etc. The complex of the event is emphasized here in a particular way. The became enters it again and again. In writing, Paul sees them as those whose life he has entered. Their having become is linked to his entrance into their life, 21 coming. 25 came the how of this entrance is characterized compare with 27, 8, 10, 14. These passages emphasize that for Paul the Thessalonians are there because he and they are linked to each other in their having become. Re 2. As you know 22, 5 in connection with came. 29 you remember. 211 as you know. 36 you remember. 42 you know. 49 you do not need to have anyone write to you. 51 you do not need to have anything written to you. This knowledge is entirely different from any other knowledge and memory. It arises only out of the situational context of Christian life experience. Knowledge about one's own having become poses a very special task for the explication. From out of this the meaning of a facticity is determined, one which is accompanied by a particular knowledge. We tear the facticity apart from the knowledge, but the facticity is entirely originally co-experienced. Especially in this problem, the failure of the scientific psychology of experience can be shown. Having become is not, in life, just any incident you like. Rather, it is incessantly co-experienced, and indeed such that their being I now is their having become toward insane. Their having become is their being now. We can grasp that more closely first through a narrower determination of having become. Can one explicate this meaning from out of the letter itself? I thess. 6 D is A an acceptance of the proclamation in great despair. The brought the despair with it, which also continues, yet at the same time a joy which comes from the Holy Spirit is Olivia joy which is a gift, thus not motivated from out of one's own experience. This all belongs to the character of the 213 the Word of God is at the same time a subjective and objective genitive. The having become is understood such that with the acceptance, the one who accepts treads upon an effective connection with God. 41 learned, you have accepted the how of the Christian standard of living, etc. That which is accepted concerns the how of self-conduct in practical life. Thus we have determined through to accept, further through receiving. That which is accepted is the how of self-conduct. The main passage which clarifies the connection is 1910. It is about an absolute turning around, more precisely about a turning toward God and a turning away from idol images. The absolute turning toward within the sense of enactment of factical life is explicated in two directions serving and waiting, a transformation before God and an obstinate waiting. Knowledge of one's own having become is the starting point and the origin of theology. In the explication of this knowledge and its conceptual form of expression the sense of a theological conceptual formation arises. The is characterized in its how and despair. The acceptance consists in entering oneself into the anguish of life. A joy is bound up therewith, one which comes from the Holy Spirit and is incomprehensible to life. Does not mean a belonging rather it means an acceptance with the winning of a living effective connection with God. The being present of God has a basic relationship to the transformation of life living. The acceptance is in itself a transformation before God. Now we give a formal schematic of the phenomenon. Without pre-understanding the entire context one cannot extract a singular reference. The formal schematic of the explication has meaning only in the formal articulation, for it does not emerge in the enactment of phenomenological understanding. In its formal elevation what is authentic is lacking. On 1910 the turning toward God is primary. The turning away from the idol first arises from out of it and with it. This turning away is secondary. You turn to God from idols in classical Greek means illusion, in the Septuaginta idol images where Paul has it from. For the explication, the task arises to determine the sense of the objecthood of God. It is a decrease of authentic understanding if God is grasped primarily as an object of speculation. That can be realized only if one carries out the explication of the conceptual connections. This, however, has never been attempted, because Greek philosophy penetrated into Christianity. Only Luther made an advance in this direction, and from this his hatred of Aristotle can be explained. 220 You are my joy and my nor did we seek praise from mortals whether from you or from others 26 seems to stand in absolute contradiction to 220. Paul wants to win his own security through his success with the Thessalonians. Here is meant the opposition to the Greek wandering preachers, whom Lucian accuses of addiction to fame. 38 Paul's life is dependent upon the Thessalonians standing firm in their belief. He hands himself over entirely to the fate of the Thessalonians. The concepts hope, glory, joy have a special meaning, or else one arrives at contradictions. In order to gain the sense of these concepts, we are forced to go to the basic context of the life of Paul himself. The entire conceptual structure is otherwise than one at first thinks. We are compelled, by the force of the phenomena themselves, to go back to what is original. And determine every other reference as fundamental directions. The awaiting of the of the Lord is decisive. The Thessalonians are hope for him not in a human sense, but rather in the sense of the experience of the, the experience is an absolute distress which belongs to the life of the Christian himself. The acceptance is an entering oneself into anguish. This distress is a fundamental characteristic, it is an absolute concern in the horizon of the of the second coming at the end of time. 
With that we are introduced into the self-world of Paul. 26. The Expectation of the Parousia Paul lives in a peculiar distress, one that is, as apostle, his own, in expectation of the second coming of the Lord. This distress articulates the authentic situation of Paul. It determines each moment of his life. He is constantly beset by a suffering, despite his joy as apostle. Twice in the text we find, we cannot take it anymore 31-35. 310 The having become of the Thessalonians is at the same time a new becoming. Is lacking means a supplement is needed. 217 For Paul, the Thessalonians have an absolute significance. One must proceed from his distress, in order to understand his letter-writing comportment. We take a further look into the self-world of Paul, in that we approach the passage to core. 122-10. Having been blessed with inspiration is not what is decisive he excludes that and does not communicate it. The how of the enrapturement is unknown and unimportant. 2 core. 125 Separation of existence is one who is enraptured and as apostle. Paul wants to be seen only in his weakness and distress. There is certainly a still more original reason why the difficulty belongs to the Christian. A thorn in the flesh what that is as much discussed. It is to be understood more generally than Augustine does, who grasps it as concupiscentia. Flesh is the original sphere of all effects not motivated from God. 218 Satan hindered us. One may not stay with the idea that Paul is speaking of Satan. The concept of Satan and his place in the life of the Christian cannot be explicated on the basis of this passage alone. In the Old Testament, Satan means simply adversary enemy in war, to get to the point, the one who fights against what God wants. What is primary is not speculating whether and what the devil is. Rather one must understand how the devil stands and it affects Paul's life. Satan constantly hinders the work of Paul in exacerbating his distress, this absolute apostolic concern about his calling in this end of time. CF. 35 Attempter. 311 Paul then asks God in prayer prayer in the decisive sensato direct him to the path to the Thessalonians. Already in 217 he calls himself bereft, because, after all, he is far from them. The conclusion of the letter at 527 corresponds to the prayer I implore you to read the letter aloud to all. These moments the impossibility of bearing it any longer, the devil, the call to prayer, the imploring at the end all this makes possible, for the goodwill, an understanding of Paul's distress. In other letters cf. 2 Cor. 57. The passages of this. 413 18 and 51 12 are to be compared in order to clarify the idea of the if the situation is now indicated, we come now to the letter writing as a form of proclamation. The following interpretation should take care of several difficulties heretofore. The questions are these 1. How does it stand with the dead, who no longer experience the 414 18? 2. When will it take place 51 12? First we take up the second question. We can first gather how Paul understands the question from out of the how of the answer. Paul does not answer the question in worldly reasoning. He maintains a total distance from a cognitive treatment, but does not also, in that, claim that it is unknowable. Paul enacts the answer in juxtaposing two ways of life when they say verse 3, and but you verse 4. What is decisive is how I comport myself to it in actual life. From that results the meaning of the when? Time and the moment. The difficulties of phenomenological understanding are not only technical ones. The meaning of the individual as that of the infinitely complicated does not come into question here. The understanding is made difficult in its enactment itself this difficulty grows constantly the nearer it approaches the concrete phenomenon. It is the difficulty of putting oneself into another's place, which cannot be supplanted by a fantasizing oneself into or a vicarious understanding what is required as an authentic enactment. 2 Cor. 122.10 gave us a preview of the self-world of Paul. The extraordinary in his life plays no role for him. Only when he is weak, when he withstands the anguish of his life, can he enter into a close connection with God. This fundamental requirement of having God is the opposite of all bad mysticism. Not mystical absorption and special exertion rather withstanding the weakness of life is decisive. Life for Paul is not a mere flow of events it is only in so far as he has it. His life hangs between God and his vocation. The ways of having life itself, which belongs with the enactment of life, still increases the anguish. Each authentic complex of enactment increases it. What has been one heretofore is to be understood methodologically, in that from out of this it first becomes understandable what Paul has to say to the Thessalonians. What he says to them, and how he says it to them, is determined by his own situation. Schematically. It is this, the pressing situation, in which he writes the letter cf. Ithes. 310 most earnestly is a very strong expression for urgent what is lacking in your faith important for the place of sins in Christian life. The proclamation is for Paul characterized formally by an intervention in the knowledge of the Thessalonians at a particular moment. Through the phenomenological characteristic of the proclamation the following must become apparent as authentic perspectives. 
1. A decisive understanding of the communal world in relation of Paul to the Thessalonians 2. What Paul's situation authentically accentuates 3. From this the solution of the problem of knowledge, which belongs with facticity 4. A preview of the richer structure of Christian life experience, which is, in its what and how, always dependent upon the complex of enactment. C.F. Diaris is with us from the summer semester 1919 lecture Uber das Wesen der Universität on the essence of the university the argument about the origin of perception and of knowledge from the explication of factical life experience and from the lecture in winter 1919-1920 Phenomenologische Grundproblem Basic Problems of Phenomenology The Developments Regarding the Concrete Logic of a Material Region.4 The difference of our present study from that of the letter to the Galatians is important. It was only a mere taking cognizance of the content but it is a particular necessary step within the connection of access to understanding itself this step will always be taken, if we attempt to carry out the authentic enactmental historical understanding. The letter to the Galatians has a dogmatic content. This content is seen primarily in the exegesis. One must, however, be clear about how this content is to be understood as believing knowledge. What Paul says is characterized by the fact that he says it now to the Thessalonians or the Galatians. One may not pounce upon the isolated content. The so-called dogmatic content of the letters is to be understood according to the entirety of how a communication of Christian knowledge is maintained. One errs if one grasps it in isolation. What is the dogmatic form of the first letter to the Thessalonians? Paul answers two questions posed to him see above page German p. 99. Initially, the expression has in its conceptual history a sense we do not intend here the expression changes its entire conceptual structure, not only its sense, in the progress of its history. Christian life experience different in kind is evident in this conceptual transformation. In classical Greek means arrival presence in the Old Testament for instance in the Septuaginta the arrival of the Lord on the Day of Judgment in late Judaism the arrival of the Messiah as representative of God. For the Christian, however, means the appearing again of the already appeared Messiah, which, to begin with, does not lie in the literal expression. With that, however, the entire structure of the concept is at once changed. One could think, first of all the basic comportment to the is awaiting, and Christian hope is a special case thereof. But that is entirely false. We never get to the relational sense of the by merely analyzing the consciousness of a future event. The structure of Christian hope, which in truth is the relational sense of parousia, is radically different from all expectation. Time and moment 51 always used in one offers a special problem for the explication. The when is already not originally grasped, insofar as it is grasped in the sense of an attitudinal objective time. The time of factical life and its falling, unemphasized, non-Christian sense is also not meant. Paul does not say when, because this expression is inadequate to what is to be expressed, because it does not suffice. The entire question for Paul is not a cognitive question cf. 52 for you yourselves know very well. He does not say, at this or the time the Lord will come again he also does not say, I do not know when he will come again rather he says you know exactly. This knowledge must be of one's own, for Paul refers the Thessalonians back to themselves and to the knowledge that they have as those who have become. This sort of answer determines that the question is decided in dependence upon their own life. Thus he juxtaposes two different ways of life 53 when they sign 54 but you. But this is not a juxtaposition of two different types rather the motive lies in the how of the communication. We will find this sort of juxtaposition again in the second letter to the Thessalonians. One observes 53, if you say, that is, they are such who realize it all to say something about that. 53 peace and security in factical life this expression represents the how of self-comportment to that which encounters me in factical life. That which encounters me in my worldly comportment carries no reason for disturbance. Those who find rest and security in this world are those who cling to this world because it provides peace and security. Peace and security characterizes the mode of this relation to those who speak this way. Sudden ruin overcomes them 53 then sudden destruction will come upon them. They are surprised by it, do not expect it or still better they are precisely in the attitudinal expectation their expectation is absorbed by what life brings to them. Because they live in this expectation, the ruin hits them in such a way that they cannot flee from it. They cannot save themselves, because they do not have themselves, because they have forgotten their own self, because they do not have themselves in the clarity of authentic knowledge. Thus they cannot grab hold of and save themselves cf. 54 in the dark. The comparison with the pregnant woman 53 characterizes the suddenness. It offers particular problems, namely what the comparison achieves in the sense complex, how far it can be pressed, etc. In general, the use of the comparisons presents the explication with particular. 54 But you, brothers, are not in the darkness. So that the day surprises you like a thief. Has a double meaning one opposite the darkness is the brightness of knowledge of oneself 55 For you are all children of light. Two means day of the Lord, that is, day of the. This then is the kind and mode of Paul's answer. Through this let us keep awake we see the question of the one leads back to my comportment. How this stands in my life, 
that refers back to the enactment of life itself. The meaning of the when, of the time in which the Christian lives, has an entirely special character. Earlier we formally characterized Christian religiosity lives temporality. It is a time without its own order and demarcations. One cannot encounter this temporality in some sort of objective concept of time. The when is in no way objectively graspable. The meaning of this temporality is also fundamental for factical life experience, as well as for problems such as that of the eternity of God. In the medieval period these problems were no longer grasped originally, following the penetration of Platonic Aristotelian philosophy into Christianity, and today's speculation which speaks of God increases the chaos. The pinnacle of the error is reached today in projecting onto God the concept of validity. The present study takes up the center of Christianity the eschatological problem. Already at the end of the first century the eschatological was covered up in Christianity. In later times one misjudged all original Christian concepts. In today's philosophy, too, the Christian concept formations are hidden behind a Greek view. One would also have to draw on the Gospels the great eschatological sermon of Jesus in the Gospel Matthew and Mark out of which the basic position of the problem arises. The basic direction of eschatology is already laid Judaic, the Christian consciousness being a peculiar transformation thereof. The origin of the meaning of the respective concepts is characteristic cf. The Apocalypse of Ezra 5. The division of the directions of sense form, relation, enactment must be observed. The how of grasping reality, the how of understanding events is not to be carried out objective attitudinally from out of the reasonable human understanding. Rather, understanding the entire situation is necessary for understanding the phenomena. Here, how Paul answers the question of the one of the is decisive from this can one first judge what he said. There is no security for Christian life the constant insecurity is also characteristic for what is fundamentally significant in factical life. The uncertainty is not coincidental rather it is necessary. This necessity is not a logical one, nor is it of natural necessity. In order to see this clearly, one must reflect on one's own life and its enactment. Those who speak of peace and security 53 spend themselves on what life brings them, occupy themselves with whatever tasks of life. They are caught up in what life offers there in the dark, with respect to knowledge of themselves. The believers, on the contrary, are sons of the light and of the day. Paul's answer to the question of the one of the is thus an urging to awaken and to be sober. Here lies a point against enthusiasm, against the incessant brooding of those who dwell upon and speculate about the one of the. They worry only about the when, the what, the objective determination, in which they have no authentic personal interest. They remain stuck in the worldly. Chapter 4 The Second Letter to the Thessalonians 27 Anticipation of the Parsia in the Second Letter to the Thessalonians in his exegesis of both letters to the Thessalonians, the theologian Schmidt seeks to construct an opposition between the first and the second point one according to the second letter, the is preceded by the arrival of the Antichrist with war and turmoil but according to the first, peace and security reigns before the, which arrives unexpectedly. According to the second letter, the Antichrist is to come as a warning and an intermediate sign. But this playing off of different ideational voice till Lung's massacre views against one another is not in the spirit of Paul. Paul is not concerned at all about answering the question of the when of the Parsia. The when is determined through the how of the self-comportment, which is determined through the enactment of factical life experience in each of its moments. Consideration of the second letter should confirm our results thus far. We will not go into the question of authenticity, nor the exegesis cf. Hallman in the Zeitschrift für New Testament Wissenschaft Journal for Scholarship on the New Testament, 1901 and 19042. Only lack of understanding can disown Paul of the second letter to the Thessalonians. Initially, we will get clear about the situation of the second letter. In what way did the first letter affect the Thessalonians? That is not so easy to see but we can highlight some main features. The second letter presents a response to the present standpoint of the congregation. There are those in the congregation who have understood Paul, who know it is crucial. If the depends upon how I live, then I am unable to maintain the faith and love that is demanded of me then I approach despair. Those who think this way worry themselves in a real sense, under the sign of real concern as to whether or not they can execute the work of faith and of love, and whether or not they will hold out until the decisive day. But Paul does not help them rather he makes their anguish still greater to this. 15 Evidence of the Righteous Judgment Only Paul himself could have written this. The overburdened nature player of off expression in the second letter has an entirely particular motivation, and is a sign of its authenticity. 111 of his call now at issue is to ask God that one will be dignified by the calling. Christians must be, those who are called, as opposed to those who are cast away 213-14 obtain the glory of looking around for the of the Lord concern. Paul sets those who have understood him up against those who, in more imminent expectation of the, no longer work and loiter idly 311 mere busybodies not doing any work. They occupy themselves with the question 22, whether the Lord will come immediately. These people make an idling out of unconcern for the contingencies of life. They are concerned in a worldly manner, 
in all the bustling activity of talk and idling, and become a burden to the others cf. ifs. 411. Thus they have understood the first letter otherwise. One may not read the lines from tooth s. 213-14 as an isolated apocalypse. Compare with 25. We are not dealing with a theoretical instruction. There, Paul reports the appearance of the people of unlawfulness, the son of ruin, of the adversary, and the like. He will come before the 23 first. That is correct in terms of content. But that is not what is crucial primarily. The passage has been interpreted this way Paul went back, became milder, no longer teaches the immediate imminence of the parousia he has become more careful and wants to comfort the people. Yet the entire tenor, the entire mode of expression of the second letter, speaks against this. This is not deprecation, but rather an increased tension, also in the individual expressions. The entire letter is still more urgent than the first note taking back, rather an enlarged tension. The Thessalonians are to be referred back to themselves. The overburdened character of the expression in Paul is to be understood first from out of this, for everywhere here precisely the complexes of enactment of factical life are emphasized. The following passages are characteristic of this. 2 Thess 13 and 213 We must always give thanks. 13 Your faith is growing. The is not a taking to be true, or else the would of no meaning the is a complex of enactment that is capable of increase. This increase is the proof of genuine consciousness. 14 Therefore we ourselves boast is an increase of, praise. 111 Decision very good resolve and work of faith cf. 28 By the manifestation of his coming emphasis of what is current. 29 Lying wonders. 210 Wicked deception that is certainly a Hebraism. Everywhere the sense of enactment, here the love of truth, is emphasized through the overburdened expression. 210 To love the truth. 211 Powerful delusion. The particular vivacity. What is urgent in the situation is everywhere stressed in the full conviction of the expression. 213 Through the sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth truth stands in relational connection to faith. That shows that the itself represents a context of enactment, which can experience an increase. 214 You may obtain the glory, look about in the 31 So that the word of the Lord may spread rapidly so that the proclamation runs. In order to understand this overburdened nature of the expression plero free, one must imagine Paul in the urgent anguish of his vocation. That those who are perishing is missing a real enactment, which will not at all let itself be expressed positively for the complex of enactment can be explicated neither positively as a mere course of happenings, nor negatively through some negation or other. The complex of enactment determines itself first in and with the enactment. Paul's kind of answer occurs in the same sense as in the first letter. Again, he opposes two modes of factical life. One does not see this if one focuses one's view only on the content. In the so-called Apocalypse 2 Thess 22 13 is found precisely 2.10 what is decisive and every kind of wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth. The decisive position is characterized through. The knot is neither a non-privativum nor a non-negativum, but rather has the sense of the enactmental knot. The enactmental knot is not a refusal of enactment, not a setting oneself outside of the enactment. The knot concerns the position of the complex of enactment to the relation which is motivated from out of it. The meaning of the knot can be clarified only out of the historical context. The without has no relation. It would have to have a positive emphasis, but then a yet enacting would also be an error. Because then that which has the character of enactment would be characterized as a happening. But that which has the character of enactment is only co-possessed in the enactment itself, cannot for itself be objectified. The thoughts of negative theology grew from similar motifs of the beyond yes and no. In order to escape the Antichrist as Antichrist, one must have first entered into the complex of enactment of the religious situation for the Antichrist appears as God. The problem of negative theology appears, in a pale form, in medieval mysticism. 28. The Proclamation of the Antichrist The meaning of the proclamation of the Antichrist is the following one must take the Antichrist for Antichrist. After all, he pretends to be a God. Cf. 2 Cor. 44 The God of this world, after Ironhouse Satan. The facticity of knowledge is necessary for this. Whether one is a true Christian is decided by the fact that one recognizes the Antichrist. The event which should come before thee is thus, in its relational sense, one that is directed to the people those who are called into the glory. With the arrival of the Antichrist, each must decide one even those who are unconcerned decide through this lack of concern. Already whoever remains undecided has removed himself from the complex of enactment of the anguish of expectation, and has joined the CF. 2 Cor. 43. In the exegesis, the eschatological phenomenon is considered object historically. It is said that people that had believed that the end of the world had come millenarianism. Around 120 AD this stops later millenarianism returns to life repeatedly in medieval millenarianism and in modern Adventism. It is said that these millenarian ideas are temporally historically determined, and therefore have no eternal validity. 
one attempts to examine the eschatological ideas according to their lineage. Thereby one is led to late Judaism, further to ancient Judaism, finally to ancient Babylonian and ancient Iranian notions of the end of the world. With that one believes to have explained Paul, freed from all churchly deist had is to say, to have determined how Paul himself was to have looked. We will see that precisely this objectivity is, in the highest sense, constructed. For this view never puts into question whether those who have eschatological ideas of this kind indeed have them as ideas. In talk without qualification of ideas, one misrecognizes the fact that the eschatological is never primarily idea. The content of the idea may certainly not be eliminated, but it must be had in its own relational sense. The enactmental understanding from out of the situation eliminates these difficulties. It is a difficult problem for the history of culture a problem that is very close to the concept of philosophy to shed light upon how it so happens that the history of dogma history of religion has taken precisely this criticized ideational attitude. The main problem with this is not how the history of dogma entered in this ideational way, but rather why it never turned in another direction. Oriana saw this problem in his commentaries on the Gospel of John and on the individual writings of the Old Testament. Equally well did Augustine see this problem of the historical that lies in Christian life experience. Three, it is a false conception to form a general concept of the historical and then impose it onto the individual formulations of problems, rather than proceeding from the respective complex of enactment for example, from that of artistic creation or of religious experience. Likewise, the philosophical methods corrupt the sense of the history of religion. That which Paul says has a peculiar expressive function, from which one cannot tear out the ideational content, in order, for instance, to compare it with the content of ancient Babylonian ideas. The original complex of enactment, in which the eschatological is found for Paul, is important, independently of connections that exist between Persian and Jewish eschatological ideas. The obstinate waiting is not some ideational expectation, rather a serving God. The obstinate waiting stands in the complex of enactment of the entire Christian life C schema and 26 the expectation of the part of CAP. 67. Thus the second letter to the Thessalonians is easy to understand, despite some difficulties. The situation is, in relation to the first letter, changed in so far as the words the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night are understood correctly by some calm, obstinate waiting on incorrectly by others. These latter set the work aside, stand around and chat, because they expect him every day. But those who have understood him must be despairing, because the anguish increases, and each stands alone before God. It is these to whom Paul now answers that the anguish is in proof of the calling the others he sharply rejects. The event of the Parsia is thus directed, in its sense of happening, toward the people who bifurcate into the called and the rejected. Of the rejected, the Lord of this world had is, Satanus blinded their sense. They cannot testing I thess. 521, that is to say, test. 29. Dogma in the complex of enactment. It is noticeable how little Paul alleges foregeeped theoretically or dogmatically even in the letter to the Romans. The situation is not of the sort of theoretical proof. The dogma as detached content of doctrine and objective, epistemological emphasis could never have been guiding for Christian religiosity. On the contrary, the genesis of dogma can only be understood from out of the enactment of Christian life experience. The allegedly dogmatic doctrinal content of the letter to the Romans is, also, only understandable out of the enactment in which Paul stands, in which he writes to the Romans. His procedure of proof is nowhere a purely theoretical complex of reasons, but is rather always an original complex of becoming of the kind that, in the end, is also merely shown in a proof. What reigns here is the opposition of basic comportments of practical life and, which does not mean the rejected ones, but rather to be in the state of becoming rejected, etc. The participium prosentis instead of participium perfecti emphasizes the enactment that is still in process. At issue is an acceptance, which is a final deciding. That has a positive sense, in disabling knowledge. This thus grounds the to know and testing. Paul sees these two types of people under the pressure of his calling as the proclaimer. The love is enactment truth means a complex of enactment, which enables for the of the divine. On the basis of this, the knower first sees the great danger in store for the religious person whoever does not accept the enactment cannot at all see the Antichrist who appears in the semblance of the divine he opposes above every so-called God, and becomes enslaved to him without even noticing it. The danger becomes apparent only to the believers the appearance of the Antichrist is directed precisely toward the believers, the appearance is a test for those who know. The believe to eleven the delusion. They are deceived precisely in their highest bustling activity with the sensation of the parousia, and fall from their original concern for the divine. For this reason, they will be absolutely annihilated. Paul knows no mere afterlife post-existence for the damned away from God and they lose life. The appearance of the Antichrist in godly robes facilitates the falling tendency of life in order not to fall prey to it, one must stand ever ready for it. The appearance of the Antichrist is no mere passing occurrence, but rather something upon which each one's fate is decided even that of the already believing. As who opposes himself to the divine, he is the enemy of the believer, 
although he makes his appearance in the form of the divine itself. The revelation is only a revelation for one who possesses the possibility of distinguishing. Thus the warning to Thess. 23 that they should not let themselves be deceived. 211 the rejected believe the lie they are not indifferent they are highly busy, but they are deceived and fall prey to the Antichrist. Thus, they do not neglect what is Christian as irrelevant, but rather show a peculiar increase, which fulfills their blindness and completes the fallout fall to the anti-godly, so that a return is impossible. In Paul, to be damned means an absolute annihilation, absolute nothingness there are no levels of hell, as in later dogma. The recoiling and increasing reformulation of Christian life experience into objective form was affected through the apologetic reaction of defense against paganism and its science. Becomes first 23 does not mean extension of the deadline, rather precisely, in the sense of Christian facticity, an increase of the highest anguish. Thus Paul concludes in 215, with a summary of his eschatological account tradition. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that you were taught by us either by word of mouth or by letter. To the Christian, only his of the complex of enactment in which he really stands is to be decisive, but not the anticipation of a special event that is futurally situated in temporality. In late Judaism, the anticipation of the Messiah refers primarily to such a futural event, to the appearance of the Messiah at which other people will be present. Ezra 4 shows already acquaintance with the Christian prevalence of enactment, as opposed to the event complex that is expected. From this complex of enactment with God arises something like temporality to begin with. 2 Thess. 26 7 And you know what is now restraining him that, which holds back the Antichrist. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Theodoret, 4 Augustine, and others see in the precipitous order of the Roman Empire, which suppresses persecution of Christians by Jews. This passage could be regarded as an objection to our argumentation. Paul would be here concerned with the objective. But the secret of sin is already at work that is what is decisive. Sin is just as much a mystery as faith. But only until the one who now restrains it is removed. The verses 6-7 encompass the problem of the Christian attitude toward a non-Christian surrounding world and communal world, and thus the problem of salvation history. From this context hath this. 413 can be understood as others do who have no hope. That is to say, all who stand outside the Christian context of becoming are without guidance as to the question of the dead. The way in which God resurrected Christ, so too will he bring the dead to him along with Christ. That we believe. But we do not have to concern ourselves with such curious questions, for faith gives us certainty. Mark 91 individuals among you will not die, before that the kingdom of God comes has come to power. Paul, too, still expected the parousia before his death. The great presentation Alf Makung in which the Antichrist appears facilitates faith for the believers, if they already are decided. The decision itself is very difficult. The expectation must already be such that through faith, the deception of the Antichrist will be recognized as deception. The before is thus here increase of the highest anguish. That is why 2.15 Paul says only stand firm and master the traditions that you have experienced. The questions of content may not be understood detachedly. The opposition of dogmatism and morality is actually misguided, too. The title eschatology is just as oblique, because it is taken out of Christian dogma and designates the doctrine of final things. Here we do not understand it in this theoretical disciplinary sense. Chapter 5 Characteristics of Early Christian Life Experience 30. Factical Life Experience and Proclamation On the object of proclamation we must differentiate between the proclamation of the synoptics and that of Paul. In the synoptic gospels, Jesus announces the kingdom of God, Luke 1616. In Pauline Gospel, the proper object of the proclamation is already Jesus himself as Messiah. C.F. Icor. 151-11. Here the essential teachings of Paul are found, but they are and remain entwined with the how, with life they are not concerned with a specifically theoretical teaching. C.F. Rom. 13. Rom. 109 The resurrection and the faith in the Son of God as Lord is the basic condition of salvation. The concept of the gospel as we know it today arises first from Justin and Iros and is entirely different from the Pauline concept character of enactment. The first sentence of the gospel of Mark still has the original sense. Beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, whereby Jesus Christ is to be understood as general obj. The factical life experience of the Christians is historically determined in so far as it always begins with the proclamation. The connection of the Christian with the surrounding world is discussed in Icor. 126-27-720. The significances of life remain, but a new comportment arises. We want to follow further the problem of proclamation in such a way that we leave matters of content entirely aside. Now it must be shown that Christian religiosity lives temporality. What meaning communal worldly and surrounding worldly relations have for the Christian must be understood and if they do, in what way? Christian factical life experience is historically determined by its emergence with the proclamation that hits the people in a moment, 
and then is unceasingly also alive in the enactment of life. Further, this life experience determines, for its part, the relations which are found in it. For all its originality, primordial Christian facticity gains no exceptionality, absolutely no special quality at all. In all its absoluteness of reorganizing the enactment, everything remains the same in respect to the worldly facticity. The accentuation of the Christian life has the manner of enactment ithes. 3359. All primary complexes of enactment lead together toward God, are enacted before God. At the same time, the waiting is an obstinate waiting before God. The obstinate waiting does not wait for the significances of a future content, but for God. The meaning of temporality determines itself out of the fundamental relationship to God however, in such a way that only those who live temporality in the manner of enactment understand eternity. The sense of the being of God can be determined first only out of these complexes of enactment. To pass through them is the precondition. Further, it must be asked how dogmatic conceptuality arises out of such complexes of enactment. It is essential that the proclamation always remains co-present as alive, not only as a thankful memory. In this having become, how should the Christian comport himself to the surrounding world and communal world accor? 720-126 FF, wise, powerful, of noble birth? The reality of worldly life is targeted. The reality of life consists in the appropriate tendency of such significances. But these do not at all become dominating tendencies in the realm of the facticity of Christian life. Rather remain in the condition in which you were called. At issue is only to find a new fundamental comportment to it. That must be shown now in the manner of its enactment structure. The indeed existing daisy and insignificances of real life are lived, as if not. 31. The Relational Sense of Primordial Christian Religiosity the relational sense of primordial Christian religiosity to the surrounding world, communal world, and self-world is to be determined the authentic self is still to be differentiated from the self-world. Precisely the relations of the self-world are hit the hardest self-worldly concern carries the semblance within itself. Paul is clear about the fact that these relational directions demand a peculiar characterization, which he renders in apparently common terms spirit, soul, flesh. Precisely these concepts typically illustrate that a wrong direction of understanding is entirely unable to hit upon the genuine meaning. One grasps them as qualities and lingly dingly she determinates. Only the correct explication of the sense complexes allows a religious historical comparison. Before this, all such compilation of material is not useful even for a modicum of understanding. The explication must be maintained on its first level. There are subjective limitations of understanding a new creation, Gal. 615, Call. Icor. 720 stands out. One should remain in the calling in which one is. These are remaining. In all the radical reorganization, something remains. In what sense is the remaining to be understood? Will it itself be taken into becoming, indeed in such a way that the sense of remaining is, in its what and how, first determined out of having become? With this, a peculiar complex of senses indicated these relations to the surrounding world receive their sense not out of the formal significance they indicate rather the reverse, the relation and the sense of lived significance are determined out of the original enactment. Put schematically something remains unchanged, and yet it is radically changed. Here we have a playground of clever paradoxes, but that does not help us. Pointed formulations explain nothing. The relational sense is not changed, and still less the content. Thus the Christian does not step out of this world. If one is called a slave, he should not at all fall into the tendency to suppose that something could be won for his being in the increase of his freedom. The slave should remain a slave. It is a matter of indifference in which surrounding worldly significance he stands. The slave as Christian is free from all bonds but the free one as Christian becomes a slave before God. The is a before God. These directions of sense which refer to the surrounding world, to one's vocation, and to that which one is self-world determine in no way the facticity of the Christian. Nonetheless they are there, they will be maintained and first authentically assigned zuzhenye there. The significances of the surrounding world become, through having been, temporal possessions. The sense of facticity determines itself in this direction as temporality. Until now. The relational sense of the surrounding world and communal world was purely negatively determined. Insofar as these relations have no possibility at all to motivate the archontic meaning of primordial Christian religiosity, the positive question arises regarding the relation of the Christian to the surrounding world and the communal world. Now for the relational sense in which the Christian stands to the surrounding world. These are difficult connections, because the relations to the self-world are precisely hit the hardest through the Christian having become. In Paul himself these connections are only briefly, yet sharply, touched upon core. And Phil. Paul is clear about the fact that this relational direction requires a unique characterization spirit, soul, flesh. Usually, these concepts are grasped as conditions ALS Zeus Stanley Shea. The surrounding worldly and communal worldly connections co-constitute facticity but they are temporal possessions, insofar as they are lived in temporality. I core. 
729 to 32 we know the as end. Here the appointed time has grown short. There remains only yet a little time, the Christian living incessantly in the only yet, which intensifies his distress. The compressed temporality is constitutive for Christian religiosity and only yet, there's no time for postponement. The Christian should be such that those who have a wife, should have her in such a way, that they do not have her, etc. To the present form of this world the form of the world passes away is not meant so very objectively, rather is ordered toward a self-comportment. Rom. 122 shows how form should be understood and do not be conformed to this world. Here one can gather the enactment character of. The connections Paul makes should not be ethically understood. That is why it is a misperception when Nietzsche accuses Paul of resentiment. Resentiment in no way belongs to this realm in this context one cannot speak at all of resentiment. If one enters into that kind of talk, one shows only that one has understood nothing. One is tempted to translate the by as if, but that will not work. As if expresses an objective connection, and suggests the view that the Christian should eliminate these relations to the surrounding world. This means, positively, a new sense that is added. That concerns the complex of enactment of the Christian life. All of these relations experience a retardation in the respective enactment, so that they arise out of the origin of primordial Christian life experience. Christian life is not straightforward, but is rather broken up all surrounding world relations must pass through the complex of enactment of having become, so that this complex is then co-present, but the relations themselves, and that to which they refer, are in no way touched. Who can grasp it, should grasp it. The isolation of Christian life sounds negative. Properly understood? The complex of experience can be grasped only out of the origin of Christian life context. In Christian life there is, however, also an unbroken life context, on the level of spirituality geistigkeit which has nothing to do with the harmony of life. With brokenness, the anguish and the gloominess of the Christians is still intensified it has entered into the innermost realm. The aforementioned passage can apparently be easily interpreted, and yet a genuine understanding renders it ever more difficult. The Christian life should, on the side of the surrounding world, receive a character of self-evidence I core. 411 to 13. 32. Christian facticity as enactment. Christian life experience is not modified by having become itself. The relational sense of Christian life experience is different from that of the surrounding worldly. If the surrounding worldly relational sense were independent of Christian life experience, then certain passages in Paul would be incomprehensible. The conversion to Christian life experience concerns the enactment. In order to raise the relational sense of factical life experience, one must be careful that it becomes more difficult, that it is enacted. The phenomena of enactment must be entwined with a sense of facticity. Paul makes of enactment a theme. It reads, not. This indicates the tendency toward that which has the character of enactment. Refers back to the enactment itself. Articulating the phenomena gives rise to the necessity of setting aside any psychological schema. One must allow the phenomena to present themselves in their originality. Nothing is accomplished yet in merely bringing to given us this succeeds only through phenomenological destruction. C.F. I. Cor. 411 Paul says become my descendants. He gives up all worldly means and significances and yet fights his way through. Through the renunciation of the worldly manner of defending oneself the anguish of his life is intensified. Entering into such complex of enactment is almost hopeless. The Christian is conscious that this facticity cannot be one out of his own strength, but rather originates from God phenomenon of the effects of grace. An explication of these complexes is very important. The phenomenon is decisive for Augustine and Luther, cf. 2 Cor. 47 f. To God and does not come from us, then the oppositions etc. We have the treasure of Christian facticity in earthen vassals. What is available only to us Christians is not sufficient for the task of arriving at Christian facticity. Without Christian facticity, the significances of life would be decisive and would modify the relational complex. But here the course of the sense of factical life runs opposite. The enactment exceeds human strength. It is unthinkable out of one's own strength. Factical life, from out of its own resources, cannot provide the motives to attain even the. Through the over-intensification of a significance, life attempts to gain a foothold. This concept of a foothold is meaningful in an entirely particular structure of factical life experience. One cannot apply it to Christian factical life experience. The Christian does not find in God a foothold cf. Jaspers 1. That is blasphemy. God is never a foothold. Rather, to have a foothold is always accomplished in view of a particular significance, attitude, view of the world, insofar as God is, in giving a foothold and in winning a foothold, correlative to a significance. Christian worldview actually a contradiction. It does not arise from a complex of a historical kind, like the Christian. Thus whoever has not accepted is unable to sustain facticity or to appropriate the knowledge. C.F. I. Cor. 321 F. Phil. 212 F. In Christian life experience, it arises from the sense of the surrounding world, 
that the world does not just happen to be there. It is no indifferent. The significance of the world also that of one's own world is given and experienced in a peculiar way through the retrieval of the relational complexes in the authentic enactment. 33. The complex of enactment is knowledge. That to deal with the world, the do not have dealings requires a particular mode of deciding testing, to know. As long as one begins from contemporary psychology and epistemology, stipulating phenomena of consciousness, one arrives at a false understanding of knowledge. Characterizing it as practical knowledge brings one no closer to its sense structure. One cannot simply presuppose, as understood, knowledge per se and then adapt it. The question as to which basic complex knowledge refers back, is thus answered in that of the serving and waiting. Knowledge does not run alongside and freely in abeyance, but is rather always present. The complexes of enactment themselves, according to their own sense, are in knowledge. Cf. I Cor. 210 These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit for the Spirit searches everything, even the depth of God etc. According to its own essence, knowledge requires. In modern exegesis, the meanings of the word have been researched in the contemporaneous and in the ancient literature further back, all the way back to Plato. One sees analogies to this especially in certain passages of the Hermes Trismegistus and the so-called Corpus Hermeticum. These lines coincide linguistically stylistically and chronologically with Paul. It is said that, in the above cited passage I Cor. 210 FF, Paul characterizes himself as a pneumatic. The human being becomes God himself. Human spirit is said to be the godly, human soul the human, in him. This passage serves as argument for a connection of the Pauline writings to the Hellenistic mystery religions. Too, but this is misguided. Object historically, no objection can be made, but from the enactment historical interpretation, the spirit, searching, things, the depth of God I core. 210 means something entirely different. The in Paul is the basis of enactment from which knowledge itself arises. Is in Paul connected with an I core. 215 cf. Also 2 core. 416, the external and inner human being Rom. 84 ff. Is a 86, a conviction that is to say, a tendency of life. Gal. 220 phil. 122 is the complex of enactment of authentic facticity in surrounding worldly life. Its opposite is thus the and. There is in Paul no being spirit as in corpus hermeticum, but rather a having spirit, living in spirit, or being subject to. Thus it is false to view as a part of the human being rather as one who has appropriated a certain peculiar property of life. That means the. In sharp opposition to this is the theoretical cognition, the in hermetic writings, cf. 2 core. 33. There remains a deep opposition between the mystics and the Christians. The mystic is, through manipulation, removed from the life complex in an enraptured state God and the universe are possessed. The Christian knows no such enthusiasm, rather he says let us be awake and sober. Here precisely is shown to him the terrible difficulty of the Christian life. Real philosophy of religion arises not from preconceived concepts of philosophy and religion. Rather, the possibility of its philosophical understanding arises out of a certain religiosity for us, the Christian religiosity. Why exactly the Christian religiosity lies in the focus of our study, that is a difficult question is answerable only through the solution of the problem of the historical connections. The task is to gain a real and original relationship to history, which is to be explicated from out of our own historical situation and facticity. At issue is what the sense of history can signify for us, so that the objectivity of the historical in itself disappears. History exists only from out of a present. Only thus can the possibility of a philosophy of religion be begun. Paul in struggle not only for his mission, but for the Galatians themselves against the law not only as law, but rather as belonging to the world era weltzeit. A push away into the unredeemed, not a radical seizing of the spirit. The conflict about circumcision question of the conditions for the entry into Christian life external sign of inner belonging to the alliance bun swelled after exile. Not law, with its works and morals, distinguishes, but rather, faith in Jesus Christ. Superfluousness, harmfulness in law a way to salvation is embodied view of existence. Way to salvation in upholding the commandment meaning of the entire law to refer man to his doings the works of his doings? The reward will be of the law. For Paul God alone acts in the sending of Christ. Thus not the works of human beings, but rather grace. Law grace at issue is existing, living, whether of the law or of faith, either or of the paths, to life not itself the aim. Thus glory, honor, immortality. Thus for now as regards the letter to the Galatians drawing out an understanding of the direction of sense, the archontic, the phenomenological fundamental dynamic. At issue is whether what is Christian explicates itself, originally of itself becomes its own existential existential possession, or atrophies in worship? Passion of the Apostle disseminating? In this letter behind this the eschatological. Faith not empty as is stated as yielding a final bliss, rather an act mental relation of the concerned entry to the future being extinct since the beginning of the end of time. 
Christianity something with an entirely new principle of existence Christian salvation. Explicated in struggle and through struggle. Faith is dying with Christ and indeed faith is recognition of the redeemed Christ, that he is the Messiah. That, however, has its essentially eschatological turn, thus includes within it running toward the aim. So he is, at the same time, hope for the completion of the beginning. Religious Experience and Explication On 17. Religious experience each sense, and insofar as it is concrete affects its way of explication. Genuine or imposed schematic ordering. Unemphasized explication emphasized, pre-dogmatis dogmatic. Religiosity and religion grow into a factical life world, grow up in the language that belongs to it. New creation of the language only limited. Against this its function of meaning conceptual structure receives a reorganization from within, whereby the fallen away frame of language, despite the reorganization, maintains itself even more strongly dialectic Paul. The development of Paul the paradox reorganized, sublated Aufgehoben by a systematics. In order to understand that originally, one needs to emphasize the basic experiences and the experiencing for conception thothetic dynamic of sense. One has always confused this with the system, and through the rejection of a schematic systematization, one has delivered oneself over to individuation bearings alone, and for the individuated phenomena searched for religious dependencies. Methodical problems, not in the technical, but in the philosophical sense. The phenomena form their own proper complex. Religious attitude register. The structural complex of the religious is the first thing it must be found. But no descriptive task, rather one of explication. That is to say, the taking out of the pre-enactment and the basic enactment, the taking out being interpretive versus tent. Out is attitudinally and regionally thought it is a simpler, originally more authentic for conceptual enactment through this the order is not created, but all explicative enactment and situational movements and steps are one in the fundamental guidance of the explication terminus. Now one can be absolutely interested in the explication and to it directly, and must be so actually, but it does not need to be communicated, above all not if the calling is missing but it can also have the consequence that the explicational structures are understood destructively and historically then arise as an AFM. That is not a preparation and relief, but is a first forcing toward the difficulty and then motivated as such out of factical life. Methodological Considerations Regarding Paul I On 18 and 19 A Short Methodological Instruction to understand Paul and his apostolic pronouncement phenomenologically and from a decisive sense complexes of Christian life. Already itself an isolated, crude way of speaking. But adopting it does not mean dividing it up into philosophical concepts, making it accessible, thereby neutralizing what is foreign to us today. We would then precisely move away from that which is to be the object, and turn the object into a case, an individuation of religious consciousness in general, whereby it is itself entirely questionable from where the latter arises as a standard in the first place. Historical life as such does not let itself be shattered into an unauthentic thingly manifold which one now exhaustively studies and in particular the meaning of our special object protests against this. One must even claim that a religious historical study that fuses the object into a general religious historical framework, researches according to contexts of emergence and motives of development, and strives for a general interpretation of the former time, comes still closer to the object insofar as this approach is at least historical, if also attitudinally historical and object historical and in this case engenders principal difficulties in the history of religion. The observational relation that is characterized as historical is closer. Only an indication for the authentic, for at its basis, the latter also, like every primarily attitudinally motivated observation, runs against any phenomenological understanding. The introduction must explicate the sense of the phenomenological relation of access, the starting point, the possible starting points, the concretely required beginning that is not at all left to philosophical flirtations, the inner connection of all of this with phenomenological enactmental understanding. For the following effort the instructions can only be laid out so far what is crucial is not to have our understanding led away from the object that is to say, interpreting the object on the basis of a ready-made framework and inserting it therein, just as little as in the abundance of the contemporaneous material that is brought up for comparison. What is the object at all according to its fundamental determination? Do not ask in this way, theoretically constructively, but rather only the starting point of determination for analysis. Factical life does not belong to a region, it is itself also not a region it is, moreover, not in opposition to all that is regional rather it is crucial to make an effort to show the object in itself in a particular way and to lift it into an explicitly phenomenological understanding. This understanding remains outside of the differentiation of rational conceptual grasp and a rational letting be of an indissoluble law presumably one believes to have left the object undisturbed the opposite is the case, for the aforementioned irrational law has the sense of its irrationality from a concept of the rationality of life that is itself unclarified and, moreover, factically fundamentally misguided. It is peculiar to phenomenological understanding that it can understand the incomprehensible, precisely in that it radically lets the latter be in its incomprehensibility. 
that is itself comprehensible only if one has understood that philosophy has nothing to do with the scientific study of object and subject. Again a question of the introduction. The access is essentially determined by the fact that the phenomenon to be reached Christian religiosity Christian life Christian religion is grasped, in its basic sense direction, already in the starting point of the explication. At first, as they come to understanding in the starting point, these sense complexes can still be far removed from authentic philosophical understanding. It is enough if they are recklessly grasped hold of and, for the enactment of explication, not let go of, but ever more radically secured. In this, the evidence of securing is not determined by the sense of scientific general validity and rational necessity, but rather through originality of the concern and measured against this, as is absolutely required. Cf. Methodological considerations regarding Paul II. With this it is said it is crucial to emphasize sense relations of the appropriation first of all the emphasis proper to experience, entrance and predominating relations, which also already offer themselves in their content, to make them apparent and to explicate them radically originally, in absolute distance to that which is to be appropriated into the enactment of appropriation. And still also taking it AFM? One such basic determination is as a starting point Christian religiosity is in fact a life experience, it actually is this itself. We attempt to understand this from out of the apostolic proclamation of Paul. 1. Manner how of the proclamation to place the apostolic mission into the life of the communal world. 2. Accentuation of the sense complex is the eschatological absolutely teleological. Methodological considerations regarding Paul II. On 20 and 21. Factical life in which basic phenomenological direction? Accentuation of the directions of sense that which exists to best and factical meaning? The proclamation, gospel, in terms of content, relational, enactmental. When is proclaimed to the individual, in which communal world the factical life tendency? How is proclaimed apostolic, for appropriation? What is proclaimed not doctrine, worldly wisdom? Who proclaims, and as which? The what meets what in which way? The historical. Jesus Christ, cross, resurrection. The proclamation in its authentic accentuation of sense and tendency of enactment and mission? Demanding. How of the demanded appropriation revolution of factical life through proclamation? insofar as it is appropriated. What is triggered in factical life experience, awakened, disturbed, forced in the basic self-worldly experience, also in the resistance. Which new basic articulation of life is raked up, and where to and how. This articulation is such that, through itself, it demands confrontation as a not setsung from all those who run into it. Out of this the meaning of the undertakings must be understood the writings of the New Testament form of literature. Sense of one's own explications New Testament theology. Our study is subject to a limitation from the New Testament, only the Pauline letters. The problems that arise in regard to the entire ending, whether the Jesus-Paul question indeed chronologically the oldest and at the same time most immediate record is at all properly posed, and other questions have not even been touched upon. In this the historical situation of the letters is also to be observed much more carefully, how in it the direction of proclamation is motivated and act mentally. Thus one may not simply take them as doctrinal writings on equal footing. Much less can one strongly emphasize the historical as objective situation while forgetting the real motivational connection with the proclamation or while treating it only as an aside. It is what is decisive. That is why such an exposed position in the letter to the Galatians must be treated first although it must precisely be said, that this situation is not such that it carries within it, fully apparently, what is authentic rather the reverse. The proclamation has made a turn in regard to, or is stuck on, the problem of path. The height of the literary form has here not the tendency of independent integration into world literature and comparison, but rather the opposite the retreat to the enactment of proclamation. That surrounding worldly motives and forms are taken up speaks precisely to the originality of the basic driving motive of proclamation as a Christian motive. To be one only from out of the explication of origin. Compare Norden, Weiss, Boltmann Theolog Schrundschau one Wendland. Form style are not aesthetically typologizing rather the how of explication, concern appropriation of the enactmental understanding decision. In the same way all problems of interpretation remain peripheral, in part because they burden the study above all, however, because they are not decisive, perhaps not even radically posed. Due to the neglect of the hermeneutical problem. Dilti crudely understood, but for him specifically, no problem. Spranger, Vokeldfest Script 2 CF. Supplement Das Historische 3. One must observe above all the following that drawing out concepts and ideas of content and still more the comparison of these to what is contemporaneous or previous Greek Hellenistic, Jewish Israelite is misleading. Apparently real scientific knowledge and yet burdened with a wide-ranging presupposition that in Christian experience there is to be found ideas of content and concepts at all. The expressions are always to be taken as a cluster of relations, of sense complexes. 
we may not approach it with the attitude that we will encounter things in the bare juxtaposition of things, and order them according to a scheme of a healthy and small understanding. The mood is precisely that which is decisive everything depends upon and phenomenological investigation must show precisely to understanding the peculiar phenomenal complex factical life experience, and especially the Christian one. The genuine foreconception will then also have been developed first of all for the object historical, attitudinally understanding study. In reference to the phenomenological radicalization, one need not fear the objection that it is thus modernized every understanding modernizes in so far as it, in the explication, uncovers something new that lies in the sense. If one only hangs on to the ideas of content the picture of the world and its erstwhile theoretical interpretation and order than modernization may appear very crass but holding on to ideas of content is, precisely, no real grasping at all, and is entirely illegitimate as a measure for modernizing reinterpretation. Methodological Considerations Regarding Paul III On 22. Significance of the Study for Theology Not as praise of its importance, but rather positive demand for a new posing of the problem which actually drives me. The concept of theology remains entirely suspended in this. The outdated concept might indicate it cannot be avoided that the discovery of the phenomenal complexes changes from the ground up the problematic and the formation of concepts and offers authentic measures for the destruction destruction of Christian theology and Western philosophy. The pre christian Christian Revolution and how are they both in themselves determined, how comparable are they, and how are they to be brought, phenomenologically, in which basic determination? To determine from this determination also the meaning of the opposition and of development revolution. Christian not simply a determination, according to which different things meld together and dominate something. That holds precisely in reference to the eschatological. Compare criticism regarding the lecture.4. Phenomenological explication and psychologization, spiritualization for geistogen, rationalization. In principle to be distinguished the course in content, attitudinal substitution of psychologically meant contents with the physical phenomenological return to the sense complexes. 1. Must be observed, that perhaps the opposition physical psychical has been misread into it from out of the attitude for which there are no problems of access. 2. The phenomenological explication poses a problem, but not an unsolvable one and above all no such internal hermeneutics of bare science, but the problem of basic existence in the context of the destruction. Compare the outline in the introduction to the phenomenology of religion history of ideas. For conceptual history. 5. 3. The phenomenological explication does not aim at isolated contents, and only and primarily at them rather, it aims at the relations and enactments, which are readable off the content in each temporally conditioned form. However, these relations and enactments are, in turn, not to be elevated in a priori perpetual armamentarium rather, they are to grasp the sense from the appropriation of one's own factical existence. 4. Above all one may not spread out the phenomena like pieces on a stage of consciousness and let them dwell there in differently falling attitude. The radical idea of constitution also does not change this on the contrary. Pronouncement of the existential communication to the community, i core. 1. Paul shows the gospel as strength for those who are called and it has the fundamental enactment of faith. Thus from out of this as fundamental experience, the entire factical life experience is determined, and all significance is in it must be determined radically therefrom. It is a falling if one turns to other extra-worldly means and the wise of the world bring confusion. In principle only concretely the cold should do every move, permanent concern, authentic appropriation in factical life experience, that is to say, live temporality authentically, as what and how it is, out of Christian fundamental enactment. That means the proof the wise and the showing or wise of what is proclaimed lie not in having had insight rather, the proclamation of showing of the spirit, force, I core. 24. Faith should, after all, be no human wisdom. CF. There are 25. Communication of existence and the apostle is only a tool of this showing. The hermeneutical four conceptions. On 22. Origin of the hermeneutical relation. Which direction of sense is at all the archontic in the hermeneutical? To what mode of original complex does it refer back? Phenomenology of Pauline Proclamation I. First letter to the Thessalonians. On 2326. In the study of the letter to the Galatians CF. Methodological considerations regarding Paul find the first, initial taking cognizance of the content of apostolic Paul in the situation objective historical situation, and indeed far into the middle of his apostolic activity struggle, theological confrontation. Going back into factical life and grasping the situation factical step by step more sharply. First letter to the Thessalonians a piece of apostolic proclamation itself. It shows itself in its incipience. To lift the fundamental situation from out of itself to radicalize the phenomenal complex itself, out of which one may no longer step. Form of the proclamation content of proclamation how of the proclamation this last being the decisive, and indeed enacted in which factical situation, 
how it arises therefrom and acted in it and breaking into what, how of the breaking in. Not to be separated from the literary form. As a special problem. Expression as communication. In this, the explication of the proclamation does not have the aim of a peripheral contribution toward an image of the personality as type P fundamentally mistaken measure which is inappropriate to the being, the life, of Paul. How of the proclamation enact mental complex in his life, how the proclamation is positioned in his life, and how it perpetually occupies him the hurry 22 proclamation in broad, great struggle of effort. The warning from Nung may not be separated, no practical, usual appendage, rather corresponds to the fundamental sense of Christian existence of perpetual and radical concern. I thess. To strengthen 32 so they do not trouble themselves for nothing, everything toward. How does Paul see the Thessalonians? Those who have passed away at Schlaf and not coincidentally. 310 Restore, 312 313. Yet they who, in the night, urge themselves toward the facticity of the end of time. 219 Fear of not being able to praise, of not having fulfilled the vocation. Belongs essentially to the warning. The uncertainty 32 wavering and sadness can become great, for instance those who have passed away what will become of us? The dead in Christ, not death. Serious, their constant determination intensity? For instance Christlessness? constitutive for the decisive in what is Christian. Phenomena, where and how of their connection and situation. It so proceeds in the memory of the beginning, which is to be kept in mind it concerns only the unfolding of this. Factical life surrounding worldly, communal worldly, self-worldly relations determined from the enactment of the end of time facticity in this there is for him only proclamation, everything depends on their failure or success what is decisive never a boasting, thus also about him as apostle. Our coming 1921 was not not in vain we know, you are chosen you stand in the expectation, it depends on you, each of you. The proclamation must have constant determination, because the proclaim does not to be assimilated into the secular world, it does not penetrate, from itself, it is only, beginning, evermore, devoured building back to the foundation, not building up and building further and falling. For this reason, the Apostle, 3135 he is always to them in the how of the Apostle. Knowledge of distress the certainty of eternity not poor on movement, that does not stop and let rest but the opposite 218 ff. 35 decisive, precisely now, despite all this, the last concern and we thank God for that. He considers his apostolic responsibility before God and only this. 15. Responsibility in this the proclamation is concerned and in this his factical life relation to the Christians. Communal world has arrived in this becoming at the situation. That the gospel stands in their life, that they can no longer avoid it. 33. Their relationship to Paul faith thinking on Gedenk and the how of having become Christian through him is decisive, 2936. Problem, whether the connections? Do not have a new fundamental sense despite the schema. Phenomenology of Pauline Proclamation 2. First letter to the Thessalonians. On 2326. The letter of concerned existential contemplation of the situation. Arising out of this, therefore nothing special. Construction and presentation still uncertain. Each letter singly in its situational structure? and then not some sort of generalization. Rather an original complex of enactment, so that what is authentically historical comes to be expressed. Where do I stand and go and with me you, you who were called? Essential discrimination in factical life experience, particularly phenomenological? This situational structure not coincidental, but to the fundamental sense of factical life experience of the Christian. How and in how far? CF. 218.35 Here are what is decisive in his existence hope. You are also my hopes in the parousia. You, in what you have now become and are becoming, are so through my apostolic proclamation, my concernful enactment in regard to you, that is to say, you are my real being 37. For if you were not so, I would have been missing, my concern and accomplishment would have been missing. That I am apostle, and that God works through me, is certain not if it fails, it is my fault failure in Philippine new confidence created, 21 and therefore I cannot bear it, I am restless concerning you, for I do not know where you and I lean the oppression on that the tempter is at work and indeed the more so, the closer to the decision this my struggle 22. All the more must I see you, that is to say, have you in person in front of me 310 C and restore. Always again the absolute and dos lets to parousia. Stands ominously in its place. How is this standing phenomenological? Or articulation of enactment? And that phenomenologically back to existential fundamental concern. Life? Death? Not to become, not to eliminate God, that is to say, the a-calling. Phenomenology of Pauline Proclamation 3. First Letter to the Thessalonians. On 2326. Opposition of the Jews' indication, that something new, different faces them, against which they rebel. It touches upon something in the factical life experience of the Jews and of the inhabitants of Thessalonica in general. 4. 
Fromto, that is to say, in they themselves something must have been turned around, again convinced. So the communal world in Thessalonica stands for Paul also. That's certainly only for one moment not yet eschatologically determined, neither the communal world, nor the communal world the fundamental relation of Paul. What is the apostolic enactment of the mission in its fundamental direction, motive, and tendency? Explicational structure, later. How, in this congregation in Thessalonica, stand out a communal world the relation of Paul to the congregation? Communal world 1. How the Thessalonians themselves, as what determined, how experienced, their existence for Paul? 2. How for Paul the relation is enacted? This also means brought to that through him, that is to say, the turning around triggered through him. B. Self world. C. Surrounding world. In the sphere of this communal worldly situation and under it, belonging to it, for it itself a particular decisive before, becoming T. In all phenomena of such religious fundamental sense? Re a communal world Thessalonians such as he writes to. Is that the fundamentally determining, independent character? No, rather only on the basis of are they distinguished in a special way through this? Yes and no no, in that they are unceasingly in their being yes, but this stands in question for him primarily as apostle and for them, insofar as the urgency of their awakening continually and urgently imposes itself, that is to say insofar as it urges eschatologically. Articulation of the communal world, which through call, faith eschatological, phenomenal basic sense of what is communal worldly experienced. Previously the pagans, no link in a complex of significance or even in a practical earthly purpose. Those who receive the gospel through him, and who show themselves as called in their acceptance of it, thus those who met him in his own most practical life experience, those to whom he came. As which is it motivating the writing of the letter to them, possible basic motive, cause, starting point cf. The return of Timothy. The gospel came to you. How this came to be its setting in so decisive, that also here in the reverse, Paul himself does come from memory. They are thus standing in a history the entire meaning of which is enactmentally co-given within the eschatologically chosen. To contrast in that, unique encounter with others, entering into factical life can be an occasion for the eruption of new enactments but never so much as here, where existence grounds itself in this encounter. Phenomenology of Pauline Proclamation 4 On 23-26 To you the gospel came, thus summoned, and thus as such, they who were troubled in torment know constantly, 32 given in the historical basic posture. This becomes clear in that he is writing to them. Alone in that ever more increasingly abounding what is decisive is the increasing concern. It is each individual, 211 511, 14, 15 everywhere is encourage each other. Factical life emerged out of a genesis and became in an entirely special way historical enacted. Such a fundamental character that makes possible absolutely no single ideational relation, or at all a primarily concern free one. But that means the coming and encountering are not something peripheral. How not? The phenomenon of proclamation center of motivation of the enactment. Their genesis is at once and stands in that of his own he belongs with that to them, stands now with them in their fate in an entirely determinate sense. From this, now, the longing to see them, 310 because he is bound as apostle, because they have been entrusted to him, and that in this time. Path Aristotle off Paul the first 59 21 12. 317 ff. Expelled from them, but from physical distance, not the heart. His the end os lets to with 219 his existence. The joy that we feel before our God, 39. Regarding the motivation of the letter writing. Himself in struggle against life, that is to say, has in his life a decisive meaning, not coincidental mood, enjoyment, pleasure, lovableness, or personal concern on Nama. Necessity of his apostolic existence 218. 35 blocked when I could bear it no longer. The urgency of time. 48. When you stand in this anguish and distress. Not earthly. 311 God may clear the way. 527 entreat you to read the letter to all brothers. How does Paul experience the surrounding world? Is that what is discussed here? The not characteristic. Eschatology here falsely localized. How is his self world given to him? Phenomenology of Pauline Proclamation B. On 2326. Directions of explication communal world is receiving. Communal world is receiving world into which the gospel strikes. How is it to receive it? Take it up, react. Communal world each individual. For this, how is the structure to be gained from out of the enactment of proclamation? For this, how is the structure to be gained from out of the resistance and its how? CF. Supplement Proclamation 6. Sermon of the Cross its how. 218 shows there must be a fundamental situation there, one decisive for the communal world. Paul in struggle against factionalization, that is to say the advancing of opinions of individuals, pomposity. I think, I core. 114, that I have no longer baptized, that is to say, that I cannot brag about it. For baptism is also not what is decisive, 
but rather proclamation, and indeed how not in wise talk so that the cross will not be emptied out through so much chatter rather simply through his appropriately plain speech. That is the only thing, and here there is no possibility of chattering, if one has only grasped the how cross and the corresponding sermon of the cross, I core. 117 f. It is exactly such, that upon its basis absoluteness, uneffectedness is decided introduces an eitherer and leaves no room for halfwayness and opinions big talk, which covers over the authentic. The initiation may not be softened and weakened by a mode of reception that, through talk and wisdom overlooks it, which thus does not hold itself radically open. The situation of the existential concern is radically prepared. To take up the preparatory despondure and situation of the Sermon of the Cross. The self-worldly situation of the Apostle. Eschatology and how of Paul in this. In the face of this falling tendency of life and attitude and communal worldly tendencies wisdom of the Greeks is required a radical restraint. In order to preach in the simplicity demanded always see the cross only as such. The cross is such that with it, one takes an inferior position in the communal world, that one would actually have to hide it, that one would have to be ashamed for it. But Paul Rom. 116 For I am not ashamed of the gospel. That is to say an absolute faith is the basis, and the above is able to follow how faith absolute concern determines the accentuating situation as our chantic sense no juxtaposition in a series, but a motivational complex of factical life. How of the Thessalonians having become, concrete life complex of the same. For Paul hope joy glory he experiences them in this way, as themselves waiting obstinately, living towards. In his nature, he is an essentially other. From this distress the absolute concern. Entry 310. Prayer. From this. What is seen in this letter writing in such a situation is determination of the what of that which is written from out of the how of existence and from that, in particular, the how of this what. 413 We do not want you to be uninformed, you should know. Starting with the and its fundamental fullness developing the attitude toward Einstein in their factical world or its own explication. With this Paul meets them in their own facticity, to which, after all, the knowledge belongs. 511 The itself rises out of his own most self-worldly experience urgency. The Thessalonians are those who know in becoming, indeed so, that he as apostle must want that they also know. Factical life experience has its genuine own explication, co-determined by the fundamental experiences. Insofar as Paul conducts himself only in absolute concern to the Thessalonians and sees them in their authentic how, will he move in the intercourse with them openly in the self-explication, not only this rather there is for him no other possibility at all in this urgency. What came to be spoken between them is his factical life experience's own explication, and indeed in its facticity itself, not doctrinal about it, in the slickness and detachment of theory rather, the explication takes up the turns and breaks of factical life in all its sadness and no more. Origin of theology died in what the Thessalonians are starting point for the explication of the authentic knowledge of facticity. Dogmatic. Connections do not quench the spirit. 519 cf. Diesner exclamation mark 7. The other letters are to be understood in this way, too. Therefore letter to the Galatians is to be regarded in advance as a whole, in order to avoid always comparing and indeed so, that in the study it will become apparent how it is absolutely not carried out the means of understanding such that in even so wide-reaching an explication what is decisive has been missing. The content of the letter in a narrower sense, that about which he writes and the how of this writing, insofar as it is understood correctly from the beginning and is not alienated, from the outside, is able to also explicate authentically the communal worldly life complex in its articulation and with it the factical life of the Thessalonians, and above all that of Paul. To explicate the how of the proclamation such that from out of itself under the force of the phenomena, that is to say from their enactmental mobility. At the same time the eschatological is thereby also brought more originally to a preliminary understanding. Eschatology and facticity as experienced in factical life the facts of salvation history. The screaming it expresses the urgency, also that he sees the Thessalonians as on the way the having become being is a new becoming they have become and absolute becoming which has, must. Because Paul experiences in himself the absolute anguish and moves from out of, it to core dot and only so does he understand authentically. That is to say at once he cannot bear it, that is to say, he must say to theme and therein he finds himself again authentically. 37 ff. The anguish, in which he rejoices, and which makes him ever more inexhaustible. The higher they stand, the greater the danger. Enactmental historical understanding. On 24. The object historical complex of happening should be understood enactmental historically. The approach to this turns such that the complex of happening will be experienced, at any point, situationally. Thus situation means no object historical concept, but a phenomenological term literally, although it is often used object historically. Limits of the event complex limits of the situation do not coincide equals problem. The later question how that pertaining to event will be experienced by the situational complex. Question of the how of proclamation questioning that opens up. 
Question somehow always there is question that always explicitly takes cognizance of. Diversity of the situation. Principal things about the situational structures. F dot and F. I, that lives the situation and to whom it belongs F. Self world lives away from and towards no longer formal, but important. I posit it in the manner of formal indication, as unity forming with that it is not said that it already actually captures the situation. Formal indication of the scheme of the situational diversity and unity. I in relation to that of the I eclicum and that of the not inic titch like and self world, communal world, surrounding world. Formal indication of the situational diversity, a relational complex likewise nothing concluded about the unity and diversity. I is and as such it has already a closer determination of the relational complex, not formal, rather formal indication. The is of the theoretical predication and is of the enactmentally radical. Selfness, existence, are incomparably separate, hence the employment here is formal indicational. It is a fundamental error to think that one can gain what is existential and enactmental through concretization, and specification and material completion of the predicative is. The other way around the theoretical and predicative only of falling, and indeed that of the pure attitude. To lay out what is had. Since this relational diversity and unity of the situation is not one of order, so that no determination can be given in such a way that elements of diversity can be studied in isolation, and these lays diversity in one region, with the starting point of the explication is already. From here precisely the situational structure is to be understood, for which there is no regional a priori, but a historical originality and decision against it and for it, not theoretical, but enactmental, because each enacts on its own. How, for instance, is the eschatological? Not encompassing, not common, but reigning throughout enactmentally. What through where to? What and how is reigning and on what grounds? Because the enactmental understanding is also in danger of falling, compressed into an attitude or interspersed with attitudinal moments, it is difficult at times to grasp what is authentic in a situation. Mostly that of what is given it still has something of attitudinal being had and can be directly so. The what for the Thessalonians apparently again characterized attitudinally, to be sure, in the situation, in having, but still not authentically. What they are surrounding world and have surrounding world is that belonging to the Iacliches. What they are that is to say, for Paul in a situation, to which we place, and what they have as such beings, do not separate own thing determines the other, is the same, that is to say, existential fundamental determination is indicated. Eschatology I. I. Thess. On 26. I. Thess. 413 to 511 concerns 1. Fate factical life, being off those who have passed away, in relation to the two. The when of the. Thus to something that stands in essential relation to them, to their factical life, to that of their now Christian life, initially in their communal world from out of which some are torn what does this mean? But why for the others, not for oneself? Because they themselves can deal in what will happen then? Everything depends upon the meaning of the Asia. What does it mean, so that the Thessalonians begin to mourn and have no hope, that is to say, actually fall? This meaning is something which decides their factical life their hope, the having of hope, and the how of this having. That is, the authentic how of their being cf. Schema 8. Paul intervenes in their knowing, in which the is at stake, at stake is that for which they obstinately wait, at stake is their obstinate waiting an essential determination of the how of their factical life. Indeed, he intervenes so originally and genuinely, in their knowing, that he gives them knowledge precisely by way of the how by way of the enactmental sense of the same. In so far as the how is decisive, which emerges more and more clearly in the progress of the explication. We realize here what was formally indicated earlier, and do not follow the order of the letter's content, which itself, as it presents itself object historically, is something external after all, even if not in isolation and merely external. Event, how, who. The relation to theme what is coming. How is it there, which objectivity is involved in its cognition? This itself is a faith. The how of the relation is motivated essentially in the enactment factical life. 413, FF. A certain grief is to be resisted. Is this warranted in Christian terms? How does Paul resist this practical purpose? For this reason, no decoration, which is otherwise common in apocalyptic stat is forbidden for Paul, cf. 5 ff. No curiosity, no drive for communication. Paul says nothing about the fate of those who have passed away now, what has become of them since, where they are, but only what is decisive again they will not be passed up. Here everything is condensed only into the simple line in his urgency and in his authentically Christian existence. He, as it were, does not hear at all the broodings of hopeful, falling speculation. Difficulty of death, following two core. 58 and Phil. 121, is an immediate transition to community with Christ, why is the motif of consolation first sought in the future Parsia? Is not death already equivalent? Stalin 183.9. 51 to 11. 
on time and moment Augenblick biblical use of the terms not coincidental the explicit characterization of the when, not an objectively indifferent when decisive. And how does he determine this when? Not through objective temporal specifications, but through the how, and indeed how as referred, at the same time, to the relation to the how. For the relation or the enactment, is what is decisive in the when. You do not need it, you know that the when in your factical life, and precisely in this aforementioned how of its enactment. This relation or enactment is grounded in a being chosen. Because you are called, the basic sense of your being is. Take to acquiring a safeguard that is to say awaiting, put on the armor. Strive calm. For those who have no hope and thus despair, but have seeming happiness and security, it comes as sudden and inescapable unexpected, unprepared for it no means for overcoming and taking a stance they are handed over to it. The corresponding relation is a falling one, absorbed in peace, security, finding sufficiency. Corresponding relation pushed away, not even seen. They cannot escape they want to save themselves but can no longer do so. To be taken absolutely. They are mired in darkness such that they themselves enactment they are hidden. They do not look at it, and run away from themselves. Opposition when they say 53 but you 54 such that it characterizes two ways of relating to it. For the wise the day does not come like the thief in the night not suddenly and inescapably, 55. The day and on the day for the Christian, sober in contrast to exaggeration, an errant falling. Those who drink who are drunk no erroneous enthusiasm rather, which runs in the same direction as sleeping, being reasonable. Eschatology 2 at this. On 26. The hope that the Christians have is not simply faith in immortality, but a faithful resilience grounded in Christian factical life. Hope is experienced not as boasting and thus no concern for oneself but rather precisely hope in coping, endurance of the oppression. Having hope and mere attitudinal expectation are essentially different. To have expectation as hope, faithful, loving serving expectation in sadness and joy. Cf. 45, especially f. 212 having no hope and without God in the world. To what extent do the Thessalonians which? Suffer a loss, such that they are despairing, such that they have no hope, that is to say, step out of the special sense of enactment? They should by no means concern themselves with brooding, that is to say, they should not speculate about problems, that is to say, mere attitudinal expectation. Faith. Not mere, attitudinal acceptance is true of a fact. Still emptier and less appropriate or more one-sided than the Protestant, exclusive emphasis on fiducia. Both read off a relational moment, but see neither the authentic nor the enactmental. Unmistakably, the expressions that Paul uses in his teaching refer to the fear of a merely partial and temporal exclusion. He holds up to them not the assurance that a resurrection stands before even those who have passed away, but rather that which God through Jesus at the coming about of the messianic realm will bring with him 47 that aggregate to red aeus gloriae fiant participis tertini 10. At the same time, or priority, of the living, or of the reception of salvation, thus again a when, not so much an objective one in general. The care was directed only to the advance of the living, or the disadvantage of the dead. If we have faith central fact, then is given in this faith a self-relation to the question resurrection, that neither speculates nor, above all, comes into doubt. Those who have passed away, as long as they are believers, will not be lost they will be present also, and that is what is decisive. If we believe, then we have the right hope, that is to say, the genuine relation to that which is meant in the question. Faith in the dead and resurrected Chris means with regard to its content the how of the factual. Salvation historical. The modified eschatological expectation 2 core. 59, 10 I corner 614 2 core. 414 fill. 121 f. 217 310 f. On the contrary I core. 1551 729 31 17, 8 1622 ROM. 1311 Colonel 34 Phil. 45. One must take care not to reinterpret the expectation of Paul object historically, as one of his generation that also concerns him. The complex of enactment is primary that is the decisive when, that he is prepared for it. Is that not a paraphrasing modernization? Paul believes cf. Above means, he believed. However, not falsely here there is no true and false. The question of the development of his view is to be treated correspondingly. The how of the coming of the Lord itself determines the how of the entrance of the living and the dead, by command called trumpet. The day is thus characterized, the sign of this day. Reawakening and ascension coincide with the command order, orders to the rowers, call of the field marshal and the hunt the dogs directed to the prey. God calls the dead to stand up. Not call for battle against enemies. Eschatological symbols trumpet double meaning 1 a revelation of power that makes everything tremble, 2 signal for the gathering of the God of the people. Do future time and the days of the Messiah coincide? Either authentic eternity or the time of the Messiah, only better as opposed to that of the present, but still worldly erdish, not actually of the end of time, 
and yet futural. In late Judaism the time of the Messiah still worldly, but worldly completion of the Old Testament theocracy. Eschatology 3 2 Thess. On 27 and 28. Residence of the ways of the determination of the how of the one or fate in 2 Thess. 1. Increased uncertainty, still more radically urged to enactment, that is to say, thus possibility of doubt as to the capacity to hold out to sadness and in such way always concerned in a Christian way, but not authentic still attitudinally stealing a glance at sadness. 2. In emphasizing the enactment, at the same time emphasis on the unimportance of worldly life thus only from this side unconcerned about worldly matters, but in a worldly sense doing nothing? And concerned about the parsia in a worldly way. Much bustling activity of talk and speculation. To see from the lack of understanding how the Thessalonians should have understood and how Paul now in the second letter helps them along. Chapter 1 The Keeping Oneself Ready, Chapter 2 Again The Two Ways of Comportment. Plerophory in 2 Thess. Means what? What does it aim at? At the emphasis of the existential enactment in the letter, which is what is crucial. Resolution, fulfilling Valmik and the enactmental tendency to the good 2 Thess. 111 Work of Faith 212 Took Pleasure in Unrighteousness Sin, cf. 35. Not to be quickly shaken 22 to be shaken up, confused, uncertain, to lose clear knowledge the basic orientation of our knowledge, and with that be terrified through nothing, which may impose itself in talk the day has come that would be an objective determination, in particular in false terror, not to be confounded with religious fear and, that cannot be given. The new question as to the one of the Parsia, 2 Thess. 21 12. We understand already, from I 51 ff, how the when is to be understood, what in it is decisive. Now Paul does not want to measure out the when, fix the soon or the not soon that is to say, halt, or even take back what he said earlier rather you should not, in false concern, cling to people who deceive you, but understand everything salvation historically, just as I explicated from out of faith, in fundamental comportment to God, or to the opponent's sin. No one, and above all not the speculators and chatterboxes, can say the day has come now as grasped as the now when it comes, because before this the Antichrist must appear. No story that then still happens, an accident, rather something essential, if also negative, encountering God and Christians. It does not at all come to a mere before and after. Before is nothing of an order or attitude, but rather concern something existentially significant not in who recognizes him? Only the believers, for he precisely deceives. Thus the one is always uncertain even for the believer for them what is crucial over and against the Antichrist is only resilience. Take note of the introduction of the question of the Antichrist through the decisive existential problem, and indeed under the aspect of the pure, faithful holding firm. As a sign of the time which gives the meaning of time and of experience of time day, the experienced understanding believing, insofar as it is decided also takes its meaning. Apostasy, its coming, that itself means standing firm and it can be recognized only from out of this firm standing. And how is it recognized? Not as worldly sign. Antichrist adversity to God signifies a sign the end of time? Initially not Jew, son of ruin, he falls to ruin. Final fate of the God adverse undertaking, to oppose, to rise again. To sit in the temple is the decisive sign of unbelief against God thus only the meaning of adversity to God is the decisive in all concepts decisive sign of the time. Eschatology 4 2 Thess. On 28 and 29. 25, 6 You remember the knowledge of faith, so you also know now and must know, that which forces down and restrains. 29 Antichrist. So the Antichrist must come first, the time of testing, of the highest anguish and decision, the most stringent either or. It is not so simple and comfortable as the chatterboxes think. Do not let itself be deceived by them, that is to say, be brought into the wrong fundamental posture toward the parsia, confusing the obstinate waiting, letting oneself fall. Rather, it is a highest anguish, and it is not the most important thing that you take note of the objective when, rather that you stand firm in it, do not falter. Be concerned about the sign of the time in this way, and do not forget the most important matters by observing what happens and the like, by speculating cognitively about it. Striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, Phil. 127. The existential fundamental posture of the Jews according to Paul. C.F. Rom. 1. The existential fundamental posture of the pagans according to Paul. Two words, illegible. 1. Rudolf Bultmann, Neues Testament. Einleitung 2 and Theologe Rundschau. 17. Yargong, Tübingen, 1914, pages 79-90. Literary Review of E. Norden, Agnostos Theos. Unchersuchungen zur Vermengeschicht Religiosa Reed. Leipzig, 1913.J. Weiss, Literature Geschichte des Neuen Testaments, in die Religion und Geschichte und Gegenwart 3. Tübingen, 1912. Column 2175, 2215.p. Wendland. 
die your chrysalic and literature for men, in hot books um no and testament, second and third ed, Tubingen, 1912. I, 3 pages 257 448. CF. Further J. Weiss, Paulus und St. Gemeinden. Einbild von der Entwicklung der Jur Christendoms. Berlin, 1914.p. Wendland, Die Hellenistische Römische Kultur in Ihren Beziehungen zu Judentum und Christentum in Hot Books um Neuen Testament, 2nd and 3rd ed., Tübingen, 1912, i, 2 pages 1 to 256. 2. Edward Spranger, Zur Theorie der Verstehens und Zur Geistswissenschaft like in Psychologie und Festschrift Johannes Vokelt Zoom 70. Geburtstag. Dargebricht von Paul Barth, Bruno Bach, Ernst Bergmann, Jonas Cohn, UA Munich, 1918, pages 357 to 403. 3. The manuscript of the supplement has not been preserved. 4. The manuscript of the supplement has not been preserved. 5. CF. Text of the lecture course, above p. 61. 2 words, illegible. 6. The manuscript of the supplement has not been preserved. 7. Kurt Diesner, Offerstungschaftung und Neumagident bei Paulus, Naumburg Zala, 1912. Theology des, University of Greifswald, 1912. CF. Further Kurt Diesner, Paulus und die Mystik sein Leipzig, 1918. Illegible insertion. An illegible word. An illegible word. An illegible word. 8. CF. Text of the lecture course, above p. 68. 9. CF. Wilhelm Stalin, Experimental Untersuchungen über Sprachpsychologie und Religionspsychologie, in Archive for Religion Psychology, ed. W. Stalin, Volume 1, Tübingen, 1914, pages 117 to 194. 10. Francisci Tortini, Dissatisfaction Christi Disputations. Access Rundi Justum Disputations du AI. De Circulo Pontifico, 2. De Concordia Pauli et Jacobian Articulo Justificationes. Geneva, 1691. Augustine and Neoplatonism. Early Freiburg Lecture, Summer Semester 1921. Motto. Curiosum genus ad conducentem vitam alienum. Desidiosum ad corrigendum suam. The human race is inquisitive about other people's lives. But negligent to correct their own. Augustine. Confessions X 3,3. Introductory Part. Interpretations of Augustine. The task set before us is a limited one to what extent it is limited will become clear, at least negatively, in its demarcation from other interpretations and evaluations of Augustine. These latter ones concur in their high esteem of Augustine's cultural historical impact. Medieval theology is based on Augustine. The medieval reception of Aristotle was able to assert itself if at all only in a sharp confrontation with Augustinian directions of thought. Medieval mysticism is a vivification of theological thought and practical ecclesiastical religious ritual which, in essence, goes back to Augustinian motifs. In his decisive years of development, Luther was under the strong influence of Augustine. Within Protestantism, Augustine remained the most widely esteemed father of the Church. Augustine was subject to a renewal in the Catholic Church, in particular in 17th century France Descartes, Malbranche, Pascal, Jansenism, Bosway, Filian. He remained especially at home there until the modern Catholic school of apologetics in France, which at the same time appropriated Bergsonian ideas which, in turn, were determined by Plotinus. What is at work in this is not really Augustine, but an Augustinianism which is more appropriate to the doctrine of the Church, and which slightly violates the dogmatic boundaries only in ontologism. What Scheler is doing today is merely a secondary reception of these circles of thought dressed up in phenomenology. Augustinianism has a twofold meaning philosophically. It means a Christian Platonism turned against Aristotle theologically, a certain conception of the doctrine of sins and of grace freedom of the will and predestination. Augustine was subject to a reconsideration through the awakening of the critical science of history in the 19th century that is, through the emergence of a real history of dogma and of the Church, as well as of the history of Christian writing and of Christian philosophy. Of the research of the last decades, we might characterize briefly the three most prominent interpretations and evaluations from which the following attempt distinguishes itself and with regard to which it essentially limits itself. 1. Ernst Trielch's Interpretation of Augustine E. Trielch presented the most recent interpretation in his work Augustine, Die Christliche und die und das Mittelalter. Evangelis und die Schrift de Civitate de Augustine, Christian Antiquity, and the Middle Ages, following de Civitate de 1915. Trielch interprets Augustine from the perspective of a general, universal historically oriented philosophy of culture. Since the Christian movement left the realm of education, property, 
and society the problem of culture became the great problem of Christian thinkers, one that is, the question of how the world and the real goods of culture are to be integrated into Christian salvation. The problem of culture how one is to establish oneself in the world, make oneself at home in it with decency and adjusted to progress, after one has already fallen for paganism. Trilch sees the real significance of Augustine in his having become the great moral thinker of Christian antiquity with his ethics of the Summum Bonum. Augustine is, the last and greatest conjoinment of the dying ancient culture with the ethos, myth, authority and organization of the early Catholic Church. To an old shelf warmer, translated into the phraseology of universal history and philosophy of culture. Thus, Augustine, in his essence, could not at all be taken up on the soil of another culture. 3. He is more conclusive for antiquity and less foundational for the Middle Ages. In this way, one of the most important demarcations of the great periods and main formations of the Christian idea has been achieved. The course of this study runs entirely within the method of the history of religion which Trielch had already determined cf. Introduction to the Phenomenology of Religion, Winter Semester 1,920,214. According to this method, the research into, and presentation of, the religious formation of ideas is to be separated from the background of a determinate, theological dogmatism and these ideas have to be viewed in their fusion with the respective general situation of culture. 5. The method of the history of religion must be one of the history of culture, which also includes the method of social history. Trielch does not mean to say that the great religious movements themselves derive immediately from the general situation of culture. 6. But belong to it? This misunderstanding would be even worse, because the derivation could really have a meaning in the end. But assertion? The opposite is the case. But its possibility of assertion is founded upon it, and its institutional fixation as a religion of the masses is conditioned by its integration into a given system of culture. 7. Thus, Trielch is concerned with this problem tad is to say, since he establishes the problem of culture as the essence of a universal historical study of history, the study becomes, to a considerable extent, encompassing, but equally blurred and merely the material of an educational orientation. This is so, particularly, if one takes into account what such orientation is supposed to accomplish a general philosophy of religion and of culture. Everything remains suspended in midair, as long as this background has not really been determined or has not seriously been problematized. CF. Introduction to the Phenomenology of Religion. 89. Instead of a theological dogmatism, a general philosophy of religion and of culture is supposed to form the background of this manner of consideration. One can easily see that the determination of the essence of Augustine depends entirely on the meaning and legitimacy of this background. 2. Adolf von Harnack's Interpretation of Augustine. Harnack understands Augustine and his significance differently. Harnack's presentation is based on a much greater familiarity with Augustine's writing than is found in the case of Trielch and Hiss in this respect to universal presentation. Harnack's presentation has to be understood on the basis of the task of a history of dogma, as he formulated it. Within the problematic of a history of dogma thus conceived, what is peculiar to Augustine does not, according to Harnack, appear as the formation of a new dogmatic system, but as the revivification of the old one on the basis of personal experience and piety, and, in closest connection with this piety, the integration of the new fundamental thoughts of the doctrine of sin and grace. This results in a double task for the study of the history of dogma on the one hand, the presentation of his piety, and on the other, his effect as a teacher of the church. In his general evaluation, Harnack emphasizes the first aspect and characterizes Augustine's peculiarity as the reformer of Christian piety. 10. Augustine rediscovered religiosity in religion. He led the religion from the congregational and ritual form into the hearts as a gift and a task. 11. What Augustine formed as dogmatism and the doctrine of faith connected with the old Catholic symbol. In this way, the peculiar outline of this doctrine emerged, one which continued to have an impact in the West in the Middle Ages, and which even forms the basis of the doctrine of Reformation a combination of Old Catholic theology and the Old Catholic scheme of Christology with the new fundamental thought of the doctrine of grace, pressed into the framework of the symbol. 12 In this, with regard to the work on the formation of the doctrine, Augustine distinguished himself by having been the theologian within the Old Church who most ardently strove for the unity of a system of a doctrine of faith. 3. Wilhelm Dilthey's Interpretation of Augustine A third interpretation was presented by Dilthey in his Einleitung in Die Geist Wissenschaft and I Introduction to the Human Sciences I 1883 in the context of a historical pursuit of the formation of historical consciousness and an epistemological basis for the human sciences. Oscar Becker's notes he traces knowledge back to descriptive psychology, to experience in the sense of self-observation, internal perception. Now, what is the significance of Christianity, and of Augustine in particular, for the foundation of the human sciences? A change in the life of the soul goes along with Christianity. The life of the soul turns back to itself. A new vivacity comes to humanity through the experience of a great model of the personality of Jesus. What is the significance of this alteration for the purpose of complex of science? With Christianity, the limit of ancient science, 
which merely concerned itself with the representation of the outer world, has been overcome the life of the soul becomes a scientific problem. By virtue of God's revelation in historical reality salvation history, he is torn out of the theoretical transcendence in Plato and enters into the complex of experience. The origin of historical consciousness lies here. Diltai pursues this connection further. He shows how Christianity becomes a doctrine and a philosophy under the influence of ancient science. What is Augustine's significance in this process? In the face of ancient skepticism, Augustine ascertained the absolute reality of internal experience in the form of a precursor to the Cartesian cogito, ergo sum. But the turn to metaphysics follows immediately the veritate say turn a eternal truths are the ideas and the absolute consciousness of God. Knowledge is an aspect of the essence of substance. The human soul is changeable it requires an unchangeable basis. This is the internal experience of God's existence Augustine, de Trinitate. Diltai says that what Augustine wished to accomplish was accomplished first by Kant and by Schleiermacher. Thus, Diltai entirely misunderstands the inner problem of Augustine. 4. The Problem of Historical Objectivity the question is to which of the three interpretations is the objectively correct one interpretation of the history of culture, of the history of dogma, or of the history of science is badly formulated. The attempt to create agreement among the interpretations, or to refute one or the other by bringing contradictory material to bear, would represent a complete misperception of the meaning of historical objectivity. The distinction between true and false in the usual, mostly uncritically accepted sense must not simply be transferred to history. However, an argumentation on the basis of a skepticism resulting from this would be equally erroneous. For the meaning of skepticism in its usual conception is valid only in opposition to the aforementioned concept of truth with this concept, skepticism belongs to the same level of enactment volgues to of a theoretical determination and securing, and to the norms imminent to their meaning. Skepticism only states that a 13 does not attain its goal which according to its opinion, to it really ought to attain. Just as that concept of truth is inapplicable, so too is an argument on the basis of skepticism. In other words, the bringing together of the historical and the relative is absurd. This remark is merely to indicate that questions and decisions about historical objectivity lie within an attitudinal direction Einstellung's right hung very much their own. If one wished to draw the quietest conclusion, seeing all interpretations as equally justified, this opinion would be of the same origin as the skeptical one. The solution comforts and contents itself with the bringing together, the replacement of what ought to be. Idea is customary today. What is comical about philosophy is that, on top of everything else, it supplies the sanctioning theory to all of this. Thus, if historical experience and knowledge are not to remain deliverable over to traditional standards of knowledge, then we have to seek a decision positively, in the sense of historical experiencing and determining, a decision which itself can only be a historical one. The yielding of such a decision, along with its genuine appropriation, dominates the following considerations, which, however, are meant to be merely preliminary work. In their concrete execution, they might be the most likely considerations to open up an understanding of the sense of enactment of the historical experience affected therein, and of the peculiarities of the problems that arise. A brief discussion of the three interpretations of Augustine characterized above, however, may immediately remove us, negatively speaking, from those perspectives not in question here. We will consider 1. The sense of access Zugang Sin. 2. The motivational basis for the starting point and the enactment of access Zugang Zulzug. Important is first of all the distinction itself and assistance to the understanding, no discussion on our own. 5. A discussion of the three interpretations of Augustine according to their sense of access. The sense of access is the same in the three interpretations, however different the directions of access to their object may be, insofar as it is in each case a different content, a different, holistic determination of the whatness and halish as wasp estimthe it scans as of the result ethics, religiosity, epistemological foundation which is dominant. The object Augustine is viewed Gazean from different perspectives in Zeke it is viewed in Gazean with regard to different sides of it but it is viewed as an object, in an objective complex of a determinate order. The framework of this order differs according to its breadth, whether it is thought as a developmental complex or not. Trilch provides the broadest, universal historical framework. In the succession of periods of the Christian formation of ideas, and thus at the same time of the development of European culture, Augustine is subjected to a position and a fixation of meaning what is here most essential about him is the concluding moralist of the culture of Christian antiquity, and he is determined as essential on the basis of this cultural philosophical framework. What is at issue is less the formation itself of Christian ideas or the person, but, in a philosophy of culture, the cultural social objective process of effective influence and the prevalence of Werkungs und Durchsetzungsprozess corresponding to the so-called comprehensive framework and the so-called depth of thought of all cultural philosophical orientation, such a presentation always moves along the thinnest margins of thoughts and catchwords. Given the lack of a living familiarity with historical life, and the compulsion to universality, such a presentation is almost necessarily merely a thin reworking of secondary literature. 
In Harnock, do, the perspective on the object is in a prefixed complex of order the emergence of the dogma of the old church and its development. Augustine is a reformer, viewed in regard to what lies ahead and fixed as the source of effects on that which follows. The same holds for Dilti. The framework here is the development of the human sciences in European cultures. Insofar as, in these historical interpretations, the dominant perspectival sense Schindler Hinsicht is that of viewing Hinze and the object as placed in a historical complex of order objectively posited, we designate this perspective the object historical attitude. What is presented has the sense of the object judge and stance and of the objectively drawn image, and the conditions of access focus on the control of the possible material that will come into question. The determination of the object which has been made primarily in this way first of all underlies all further evaluations and claims. 6. A discussion of the interpretations of Augustine according to their motivational basis for the starting point and the enactment of access. a. The motivational centers of the three interpretations. So far, only the sense of access of the three studies has been characterized. The attitude tends toward the object historical characteristics of order. This does not exhaust the discussion. The objective framework of order is essentially co-founded in the positing of the chronological sequence of historical time. Time functions in objective history 1 is a methodologically regional means of determining material. As such, it is enacted in the attitude in the manner of such regional means according to its origin however, it is already a specific kind of orientation 2 is itself an objective material object, a determinate time and age. The possessive relation to time is the relation of the objective distance of contemporary time from earlier time. 14 of the objective and qualitative structural difference of the contemporary age from an earlier 1.15. The sense of access as the object historical perspective is, to be sure, the same, but the motivational basis for the starting point and the enactment of the access is different still. With Trielch, this basis is the effort toward a specifically characterized philosophy of culture more precisely, the conviction to assist the resurrection of contemporary mental life, and religious life in particular, through a system of cultural values which is universal historically oriented. With Harnock, the effort is directed toward the theological understanding of faith. The conviction that a critical historiography of dogma shows how an ecclesiastical theology which originally does not agree with Protestant Christian theology came about. 16 and Dilti's effort strives for the foundation or the structure of the historical human sciences in the end, the conviction that in the mental historical penetration of what is past what is objective, a concrete mental task of life in the present is given. 17 how these convictions are to be understood and to be judged as motivational centers and in their relations of historical enactment Volzges Jeshi Klichi Bazihung and what they themselves really are cannot be determined here. Insofar as the claims of the three aforementioned conceptions reach beyond the material interest and problem solving of a singular discipline and this is the case here they subject themselves to philosophical or theological criticism. This criticism must judge their motivational basis with regard to its originality, and that it has to pursue the question as to what extent and in what sense an objective study is philosophically meaningful. B. Demarcation from Object Historical Studies At this point, we only say the following with the intent of negative demarcation 1. None of the constellations of motives mentioned above is relevant to our investigation. 2. Insofar as such a constellation is a living one, its meaning prohibits us from viewing the particularly emphasized, real philosophical phenomenologically founded goal in an objective historical study. With a different set of motives, a different sense of historical experience is given. How this set of motives is only connected to the object historical set of motives and what it means at all is difficult to determine, and even more difficult to convey given the contemporary state of philosophical means of explication and customs. It may suffice that it attempts the enactment in a concrete manner. Above all, one has to guard against hasty constructs, and should not think that the opposite of object historical study is subjective, non-scientific, and the like, or rather is founded on a subjective perspective and a subjective purpose. This supposition achieves nothing but a stunted and inferior form of historical study which, in itself, is entirely legitimate for exactly in this. The meaning of the relationship between history and science remains undiscussed. In its demarcation from the object historical attitude, this means for our study that, although we speak of the object in apparently the same manner, regarding it in this direction of understanding fails to follow its sense. The intention here is not directed toward a comprehensive image of the life and work of Augustine nor are these works understood as the expression of the personality in the sense of an imagistic presentation. When we will speak of development and the like, this is done without the purpose of providing an image. This negative demarcation can be grasped still more specifically. The title of this investigation reads Augustine and Neoplatonism. Speaking object historically, this is the question of the extent and manner of influence of Neoplatonic philosophy upon Augustine's philosophical theological dogmatic work. In more recent research into Augustine, this question is discussed constantly. Harnock, taught of the theological influence of Ritual 18 precisely focuses on the process of the Hellenization of Christianity and tracing the emergence of church dogmas and their development. Likewise, 
Dilfay under the unmistakable influence of Schleiermacher and Richel has spoken of the penetration of Greek metaphysics and cosmology into inner experience. But Diltai has not given us really concrete evidence, nor are the existing proofs more than statements of a literary historical kind, findings which report the adoption of concepts and terms. A juxtaposition of philosophy and dogma historical schemata in which Neoplatonism appears as material and means of education. But even if this problem of the object historical context had been grasped more sharply, it would not befit the problem which guides the following study and which is to be worked out in it. The study bears this title because we take as our orienting starting point the aforementioned question of the object historical context, and because we will guide ourselves through this question in order to throw into relief certain crucial phenomena which determined themselves decisively in the historical situation of enactment of that time, and which still carry us in this determination. That does not mean, however, that the question of the relation between Neoplatonism and Augustine represents a special case of the general problem of the relation between Greek antiquity Greek and Christianity, as if the general problem could be illustrated and decided on the basis of the concrete situation of the material to say nothing of the fact that such formological shattering of the historical jeshik like an in general into extra-temporal problems and determinate, accidental realizations goes against the meaning of the historical historian, divisions which cannot be removed by Hegelian manipulation once one has made them or if one retains as a starting point the idea of a Hegelian, or any other specially formed, system. The historical context in question here is the most inappropriate ground for the problem Greek antiquity and Christianity, once this problem has been admitted. Firstly, because the Christianity into which Augustine grows is already entirely permeated by what is Greek, and secondly, because what is Greek and Neoplatonism has already been subjected to a Hellenization and Orientalization, if not also, as seems very likely to me, to a Christianization. We want to gain access to sense complexes which are precisely covered up by such formulations of the problem as diltais. In the end, we are not dealing with Greek metaphysics and cosmology, nor with experiences the psychological taking cognizance of, nor, above all, with the mere penetration of the latter by the former. We are also not dealing with the foundation of the sciences and inner experience. The fact that, for diltai, the question takes a very different direction results from his conviction that the problem Augustine did not solve has, at least in principle, been decided by Kant and Schleiermacher. In the objective form of Greek metaphysics and cosmology lies the problem of the meaning of object theoretical, material science, and the question of the inner experience and the essence of the factical connection harbors a much more radical phenomenon merely the defining title here factical life and, above all, the relationship between the one and the other is different from the penetration of one into the other or, to put it positively, the epistemological foundation constitution of the former science in and from the latter inner experience. Only from the outside can one see a problem lying in the objective historical form that does not exist in historical enactment. But the task and difficulty of enactment consists precisely in twisting the problem out of this manner of posing the question imminent perception, adequate description. See demarcation from historical typological studies. But precisely from this, one would like to conclude that we are dealing with a general problem, and that Neoplatonism and Augustine constitutes only a typical form of it. This is not the case. And if we understood the historical in this sense, the real meaning of the study would be lost. The concept of type and the complex of experience and conception which carry it, turn back into the object historical manner of posing the question. Neoplatonism and Augustine will not become an arbitrary case, but in the study their historicity historicitat is precisely to be raised into its own, as something in whose peculiar dimension of effect work Hung's dimension we are standing today. History hits us, and we are history itself and precisely in our not seeing this today when we think we have it and control it in a heretofore unattained objective study of history, precisely in thinking this and in continuing to think and construct on this opinion culture and philosophies and systems, history gives us, every hour, the heaviest blow. Speaking of standing in the dimension of effect has nothing to do with the platitude that one is always dependent on tradition. On the contrary, precisely this view tempts us to seek to make new culture and a new age in a false manner, precisely in the manner of epigones. This is only to indicate the direction, in itself a negative manner. It is meaningless to give general speeches about this if the factical situation faked as stand is not already somehow compelling, or if it is not seen in the genuine direction of appropriation. This manner of posing the problem leads us, in the treatment of Augustine, to draw on the theological, just as much as on the philosophical, very concretely and determinately, and not, for instance, to extract a philosophy which we then use as a basis. The boundaries between the theological and the philosophical are not to be blurred no philosophical blurring of theology. No intensification of philosophy pretending to be religious. Rather, precisely going back behind both exemplary formations of factical life ought to one indicated principle how and what lies behind both, and to how a genuine problematic results from this all this not extra temporally and for the construction of an approaching or not approaching culture, but itself in historical enactment. Main part. Phenomenological interpretation. Of Confessions Book X. 7. 
Preparations for the Interpretation A. Augustine's Retractions of the Confessions Toward the end of his life, around 426 or 427 he died in 430, Augustine wrote Retractionum Libri Duo. Retractation is that is, a taking up again of his opuscula libri, epistolae, tractatus, a re-examination judiciarius veritate with judicious severity one in which he notes, corrects, and improves what, to him, now seems problematic. In the preface prologus, where he thus determines the task of the retractation as, he also gives an account of the motives which provoked this reassessment. Illudatium quad scriptum est, ex multiloquio non effugis peccatum prov. X. 19 sedistam sententium scripturae sancti proptere et timeo, quia tam multis disputationibus me sine dubio multicologi posunt, quasi non falsa, et certa vidiantur, sibetium convincent or non necessaria. It is also written there much talking does not avoid sin prov. 1019 But I fear this sentence of the Holy Scripture, for with so many writings of mine, one can without a doubt gather many passages which, if not false, may certainly be seen as, or convince one of being not necessary. Two. The preface is to be explicated from an existential perspective. On the Confessions, Augustine writes, Confession of Marim Libri Tredecim, et de malice et de bonus means in my good and my bad being, life, having been three day and loud at use to met bonum, at quinium excitum humanum intellectum et effectum interim quad ad me ad anet, hoc in me gerat cum scriber entur, et agunt cum leguntur. Quid illus alii sention, ipsi viterant multis tam and fratribusius multum placus et placirscio. A primos gui ad decimum de me scripti sunt in tribus ceteris, de scripturis sanctis, abio quad scriptum est, in principio fecit deus coilum et terram, us gui ad shabati requiem generali, 1, 2, 2. The thirteen books of my confessions praise God as just and good for my bad and my good actions and my good and my bad being, life, having been, and they excite the human intellect and effect. As for me, they had this effect on me while I wrote them, and still have this effect when I read them. What others think about this, is their concern. I know, however, that they greatly pleased, and still please, a great many brothers. The first ten books deal with me the other three books deal with the Holy Scripture according to what is written there in the beginning. God made heaven and earth until the rest on Sabbath General 1122.4. b. The grouping of the chapters. To begin with, a registering overview of the content of Book X should be made, so that we have at our disposal the knowledge of what is written in the book. It is divided into 43 small chapters the serial order breaks down later and reunifies itself in a very different LCF. The objective of a long excursus on memoria has a fundamental function. While the meaning of such a taking cognizance of and its function in factical life seems obvious, it is so far from obvious that we cannot say anything about it at the outset, but will have to do so in later contexts. Later considerations formal. Will differ from these in ways not exhausted by the later ones being more thorough, more detailed, more complete, more secure, and better but rather the direction, means, and enactment of their grasping will finally change, and will change abruptly. The exposition referred is not meant to supplant or improve upon the original but to surrender it to a genuine explication, to articulate it in a special way. This requires a detour through an ordering putting away, so that a thing is more easily accessible to us at the outset. A pure exposition, as description, does not exist. That could be, at most, a bad interpretation which is unclear about itself, which takes itself to be absolute. Exposition is still the primarily, objectively oriented point of departure for the actually intended explication, one which also articulates itself in a falling manner abfalland. Only this gives it its meaning. As a starting point, we have an orientation about what it all is actually stated there, what it is all about. In this respect, Book X can be easily demarcated from the other books, as Augustine here no longer relates his past, but rather tells what he is now in ipso tempore confession amerim, quod sim what I am in the very time of the making of my confessions. Point five from a linear and objective viewpoint, the book thus gives a supplement and a completion, although we have to observe that, objectively speaking, there is a gap between the years of 388 and 400. No gap if what is at stake is not at all or certainly not primarily, biographical and objective representation. For the overview we may utilize the division into chapters, a division which is not unimportant for the following articulation. The distribution and combination into groups of the single chapters will, at first, appear arbitrary 1 to 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 to 19, 20 to 23, 24 to 27, 28 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 42, 43. 8. The Introduction to Book X Chapters 1-7 A. The motif of confitary to confess before God and the people. 1-4 Beginning with the call to God, Augustine wants to become clear about what it might mean to confess before God, from whom, as the all-knowing, nothing can be concealed, 
and who thus cannot really be informed of anything which he does not already know. What does it mean to confess in the face of God, and what does it mean to confess to one's fellow human beings? And what is that good for? In regard to the confessions about his past, the prophet is clear. First of all, by showing that grace assists even the weakest one, it shakes up the weak without leaving them in despair. And the good and the strong ones will rejoice, not that evil and sin occurred, but that what was is now no longer. But why give a report about the present condition? To justify the publication, Augustine writes. Uncongratulary mihi cupid cum audirant quantum ate exceedem near tuo, et rare promi cum audirant quantum retarder ponder meu. Indicabum italibus. Do they desire to congratulate with me when they hear how near, by your gift, I am now come to you, and to pray for me, when they hear how I am held back by my own weight? To such I will reveal myself. Six. B. Knowledge of oneself. 5. So Augustine wants to dare confess himself. And he will only confess what he knows about himself. Augustine admits not knowing everything about himself. He wants to confess that too. Quaestio mihi factus sum. I have become a question to myself. To comprehend is the range of man's relation to the human, but to believe is man's relation to the divine. 7. Terra difficultatis. Difficult territory. Observe the different relational sense bazook sin. Taminest aliquid hominis quad nec ipsis et spiritus hominis quibus temptation abis resist here valim, quibis non valim. Yet there is something in the human being which is unknown even to the spirit of man I do not know which temptations I can resist and which I cannot. 8. Yet one thing is certain for him that he loves God. Quid autum amo, cum te amo? But what do I love, when I love you? Question mark 9 Augustine attempts to find an answer to this question by investigating what there is which is worthy of love, and by asking whether there is something among them which God himself is, or what gives a fulfilling intuition if he lives in the love of God, what suffices for, or saturates, that which, in the love of God, he intends. Cum te amo already indicates an existential stage her eth stage which has experienced mercy and, in this mercy, has been pulled out of deafness, the stage which can hear and see, that is, the stage in which loving, in such loving, is opened up for something definite ten and only from here on, in the come, decoil met terra heaven and earth and ounce God's praise not, however, when my attitude is that of natural scientific research. See the objecthood of God. 6. I do not love physical shape, gracefulness, brightness of light and the pleasantness of sound, nor the fragrance of blossoms and ointments, nor earthly limbs and embrace and yet I love something like this when I love Deum meum my God lucem, vosem, odorum, cubum, amplexum interiorize hominis maleite, voice, fragrance, food, and the embrace of my inner man. Eleven. But what now is this? He queries the earth, nature, the seas, and the abysses and whatever animals live in them, and the whole cosmos, the sun, the moon, the stars. And they respond we are not what you are looking for. But we may reveal something of this to you, the questioner ipse fecit knows. He made us, peas. 993. Interrogatio mea, intentio mea et responsio eorum. Species eorum my questioning with them was my attention to them and their answer was their beauty. 12. And he turns to himself and asks what a human being is. An outside and an inside. Corpus et anima and me mihi priesto sunt and me I see a body and a soul. 13. This is not simply an objective characterization, a synthesis. What should he query? The corporeal world has been gone through already, so Melius quod interiores what is in word is better. 14 For the messenger's tat is to say, the sense report to this interior, and the homo interior inner man decides about the message. The homo interior really poses the questions, and to in the response ipse fecit knows is given. Yet this is accessible to all those who are of a sound mind. Why does nature not speak to all beings in this manner, for example, to animals? They cannot ask. Animalian interrogare equiant animals cannot question it. 15 Questioning is already a judging and a standing over the subjected, subdeity, cannot do this. The only answer to the judging questioner had is, only to him who can internally decide, by way of comparison. To him truth speaks and decides your God is not heaven, not earth, is no corporeal mass at all here, the part is less than the whole. 16 However, alongside the exterior, the interior is experienced. 17 And the human being is permeating, moving, and giving life to the body anima, melioress. Vitam previs the soul, the better part, gives life. Deus autum tua sedium tb vitae vita est but your God is to you the life of your life. 18, 19 This does not have to be understood, as Diltai would have it, in an objectifying, Greek metaphysical manner. Cf. Lumen, vox interiorize hominis light, the voice of the inner human being. And the concept vita life. But in any case, an unclarified entanglement of motifs and explicating tendencies remains here. D. The essence of the soul. 7 Thus God is something which surpasses the soul, and indeed, the soul in particular surpassing new meaning. Qui est il super caputani my may I? Who is he who is above the top of my soul? Not only the idea of objective having been created, 
and thus it is necessary to go through the soul itself. Augustine finds the power by which the soul is attached to the body and with which it moves its mass. Non ea viri period de meum nom reperiorit et equus, et mulis, quibus non est in electius pees. 31. 9 quia estate idem vista qua vivid etium iorum corpora it is not by that power that I find my god for then the horse and the mule, which have no intellect, could find in pees. 319 Since it is the same power by which their bodies live also.20 Apart from the life-giving power, Augustine finds the power which makes possible sensuous perceptions and which assigns to every organ its peculiar, unique achievement officium, the organizing power in a restricted sense jubens oculo et non audiat, et auriat non vidiat qua diver superio sego una sego animus. Transibo et istam bim mea nam et hanc habit equus, et mulis sentient animium ipsi per corpus commanding the eye not to hear, the ear not to see I who act through these diverse senses in one soul. I will rise beyond this power of mine for even the horse and the mule have this, they also perceive through their bodies.21 Here we already have the displacement of the question cf. 1020 Under pressure from the phenomena the question is no longer whether this or that is God, but whether I can find God therein equals thereby equals living therein. 22, 23 This happens by comparison with other living beings objective lie which are in possession of the same power. Of them it is then claimed cf. The word of scripture at peace. 31,924 That they have no intellect by which, apparently, God is to be found somehow, for conceptually not for gruff. Cf. In the following, the back and forth of the considerations regarding experience as the means objectively present at hand, and as interpretation regarding enactment. The wavering itself is an expression of what? The starting point for the existential breakthrough of the order and object relation psychology, or interpretation and grasping of the problem from factical life concretely historical existentially. 9. The Memoria. Chapters 819. Astonishment at Memoria. In the progressing transcending ascent, Augustine arrives in the wide field of Memoria. At first, untranslated. Our presentation does now not strictly follow the order of chapters but for the purpose of overview is deliberately kept still more schematic. With Augustine himself, the disorder has a certain sense of expression the always new unlocking of contents and enigmas of enactment. What phenomena Augustine brings forth, regarding the content only, and, above all, how he explicates the phenomena and in what basic contexts and determinations. G. Beata Vita the happy life shatters the framework and the structure of the usual concept. In the memoria are numerous images of things, and all that we simultaneously think about theme expanding and contracting them by thinking them through, working on them penetrate lamplomet infinitum of vast and infinite interior. 25 All this belongs to me and I myself do not grasp it. The mind is too narrow to contain itself. Where should that be which the mind cannot grasp of itself? Stupor apprehending me. Et un homens ad mirarial tomachium, et agentes fluctus maris, et latissimos lapsus fluminum, et oceani abitum, et gyros siderum, et relinquis se ipsos I am seized by amazement. People are moved to admire mountain peaks, and vast waves of the sea, and broad waterfalls of rivers, and the vast extent of the ocean, and the circular motions of the stars, but they pass themselves by dot 26 and they do not marvel at the fact that right now, when I am speaking about it, I do not see it myself, and that nonetheless, I could not speak about it if I did not see it in myself in the same enormous dimensions. Viewed objectively Augustine lets himself go, loses himself in intense meditation on the memoria. And when I am dwelling in memoria, I demand it will that, in the situation of recounting something cum aliquid naro memoriter when I recount anything from memory 27 this sort it becomes present judging wartig to me. Some things come quickly, some take more time, some tumble over me without order, in piles. And in the case that something definite is being presently sought, it offers itself perhaps I am what is sought? I refuse it abman accordance from the hand of my mind until the one I want has been awakened donic and ubult or quad volo until what I want be freed of missed 28. Other things, by contrast, surface in order, one by one, upon demand. Thus it happens when I recount. Sensuous objects. Not only what and how something marvelous here occurs, however, but also the diversity of the contents which enter the memoria, and how they do so generates astonishment.29 what enters is ordered according to its respective way of access, genuinely and in kinds colors, sounds, smells, tastes, hardness and softness, warmth and cold what comes from material bodies outside, what comes from one's own bodily interior. If it is only there having freed itself, as it were, from its manner of excess it does not matter. I represent virgage and wartige only its meaning anyway. Even in darkness I can distinguish between black and white, can determine something about colors, and no sounds force themselves in the way and I sing when tongue and larynx are at rest. Without presently smelling, I distinguish between the fragrance of lilies and that of violets. Not the objects themselves are present, but images, as it were. Within representation I am able to distinguish. Non-sensuous objects. However, not only sensuous objects are at one's disposal in this way, but, 
for example, propositions and rules, theses and the questions of the sciences for instance, when I hear there are three kinds of questions whether something is, what it is, and how it is constituted. To be sure, I do retain the images of the sounds of the words in which the proposition is presented, even if I know that the sounds have already passed, but what I have in this way is not the proposition. I have not received the thing itself, the meaning I understand through the senses, by way of hearing and I have not seen it somewhere outside of consciousness and I do not have an image of the meaning of the proposition in my consciousness, but the meaning itself. How did it get into my consciousness? I go through and query all utterances and passageways. Seeing responds if it has color, it is from me. And I have not taken them from an alien consciousness while learning, but have cognized them within myself. But hitherto they have not been in memoria. Where then have they been? So the memoria also encompasses relations of numbers and laws of spatial relations mathematical objects. These are neither of color nor do they sound, nor do they possess any other sensuous determination. To be sure, I hear the words in which they are presented and in which we speak of them, but these change Greek Latin mathematical objects do not at all belong to the class of linguistic expressions. When I see the most thinly drawn line, as thin as a spinning fiber, it is not the mathematical line itself. Only he who has it knowingly present to himself without thinking sensuously corporeally at the moment grasps it. I count colors and sounds, I measure heavy and light bodies. What counts and measures, and what is counted as such in its being counted determinateness of numbers are not of color, etc. at idea of all day sunt and that is why they truly are thirty and precisely because of this they possess being in high degree. The desire to learn and theoretical acts. If we now grasp the scientific objects in this way, not in images, but possessing them themselves, what then actually is the desire, the gaining of knowledge how does something become notitia being known, knowledge, learning, nothing other than the taking together, the ordering, of what lies in the memory in this respect of thinking without order, dispersed and neglected. Desir here really means to search, to lift up the truth out into such ordering which renders what is learned, and what is determined thus in the order, in each case jam familiar I intention I facile occur now easily occurring to the attention familiar with M31 meeting halfway the corresponding sense of four conception of a field gebets for and usefully corresponding to a pre-delineated order. What is thus ad manu imposit imposited at hand, what is at one's disposal as ordered, is that which is known, that which has been learned. If it remains unattended for a longer period of time, it submerges, and yet does not fall entirely outside of consciousness, and has to be taken out again as something new, and as if for the first time quad in animo ex quad em dispersion colligitor, it est cogitor what is gathered together in the soul from its dispersions, that is thought upon. I know even what is false, I have it at my disposal if there are falsities, it is still not false, that I know this. And I know this by having distinguished the truths from it, by way of comparison. It is one thing whether I know that I am now differentiating, and a different thing whether I remember to have differentiated. Thus, my own doing, too, is at my disposal in my representation, even the representing and the having been represented themselves. The manner of knowing current enactment self-world, and the manner of knowing that one has enacted all zogen habent theoretical acts. Thus, in the memoria I can have not only the vast field of things, materials, and objects, but myself to me he priest of some I am present to myself number 20, 21, 22. 14, and, 2, be sure, not only the discerner to differentiate, colliger to gather, cogitare to think in the more narrow sense of meminisa to remember, 34 but affections quo canemi may idem memoria continent the effects of my mind are also contained in the same memory and noematically. The effects and their manner of given us g jeben heights wiesen. The manner in which the affections are had in the memoria is very different from the manner in which they are had in current experience. Compotitor is when it experiences them. 36, 37 The manner corresponds to the essence of the memoria. When I represent to myself a joy or a sadness, I am not, or do not need to be, joyful or sad myself. I am not full of fear when I remember a fear. Yes, I can joyfully represent to myself now a sadness, and vice versa. The representation of effects is not conditioned by the character of effects of the represented situation. This peculiarity is not astonishing when what is remembered or represented is an affect of the body. Since the body is not the same as the soul, an affect of the bodha corporeal pain, for example it can very well be different from the psychic condition, for example the joy of having overcome the pain. But the enigma concerns the psychic conditions themselves. The memoria is certainly nothing outside of consciousness but is consciousness itself. How can I have sadness in a joyful mood? I have sadness. And at the same time I have the joy. In both cases I. The memoria is, as it were, the stomach the food taken in, sweet and bitter, is still there but does not have any taste any longer. It is ridiculous ridiculum to claim a really existing similarity, but they do have something in common. And when I find out something about emotions and classify and define theme cupiditas, ladies ya, metis, tristitia albris, joy, fear, sadness e take them out of consciousness itself there they are at my disposal. 
Thus, Augustine did see the having is something on its own after all. And when I have them like this, I am not perturbed perturbator by their presence. What is represented is not itself determined the situation of representation. Who would want to be able to cognitively or theoretically determine something about it if he constantly had to live in these emotions as if the phenomenologist of hate or fear constantly had to be fearful? And again, when I state something about the effects and describe them, not only the words are there, but the effects themselves are intended. And I can characterize them only if I myself have them. How do I have them? At tem non e loquirimer. Nice I in memoria nostra non tantum sonos nominum secundum imagines impressus sensibus corporis sedetium rerum ipsarum notions in venerimus, quas nulla janu a carnis acceptimus, sed is ipse animus per experientium passionum suarum sentiens memoriae common David, out ipsa sibi hic etia non commendata retinue and yet we would not speak about them unless, in our memory, we could find not only the sounds of the names according to their images imprinted in it by the senses of the body, but also the notions of the things themselves which we never received by any of the gateways of the body. The mind itself, perceiving them by the experience of its own passions, has committed them to memory, or the memory itself has retained them without being committed to it. 38. F. Ipse mihi occurro I meet myself. Ebiat ipse mihi occurro, meke ricolo, quid, quando, atubi egorum, quote modo cum agerum effectus flurum. X is what is at my disposal etium futuras actions at event et spes, et hi comni versus quasi presentium editor there also I meet myself and recall myself, what I have done when and where I did it and how I was affected when I did it. And on the basis of this what is at my disposal, I meditate upon future actions and events and hopes as if they were present now.39 What is to come, what is expected quasi presentia as if present. And thereby that in which I live is not itself in the flesh present and yet, it is not nothing, otherwise I could not say anything at all about it. But what, now, really is this not nothing? I say stone, sun. Cum res ipsi non ad sunt sensibus mis when the things themselves are not present to my senses 40 resign a gothing image. I have their image in the representation to myself. Thus, a sick person could not distinguish between sickness and health if health were not somehow present for him and yet, he is sick. And if, while saying son, the image is present, then it is not an image of the image, but the image itself. And when I mean memoria itself, is it itself present or by way of an image? The same with numbers. G the aporia regarding oblivio forgetfulness. And when I now speak of forgetting, I do understand what I mean. Thus, forgetting itself must be present. When I represent oblivio to myself oblivio the having forgotten something and what has been forgotten, is priesto present memoria quae memorum, oblivio qua memorum the memory which I have remembered, the forgetfulness which I have remembered.41 This is not playfulness or sophistry but rather, the problem has been posed as clearly as possible at the level of the problematic and the material and explicative tendencies of Augustine's time. The priesto est concerns, in an undifferentiated manner. The content which has been represented, and the enactment of the representation of memoria and oblivio, their existence being actual in his consciousness has not been distinguished. Now, oblivio is relational, a fact we have not yet considered not having present to oneself something which had been present to oneself and which should be present now as presently not having something at one's disposal, as the absence of memoria. Located in the relational sense, this being absent is grasped and, indeed, enactment high is non presence in the aforementioned sense of the not being priest hope present but for this. The being absent has to be itself seen. The antinomy stems from this if memoria is present representation to myself then oblivio cannot be present, and vice versa. If the latter is present, then I cannot represent something to myself in terms of content, it itself is not present. Said quid est oblivio, nice I privatio memoriae? But what is forgetfulness but a privation of memory? Question mark 42 Thus, when memoria is present that is, when I remember oblivio oblivio cannot be present, or when it is there, I cannot represent it to myself. Odis tergo ni oblivus camor, quacum odis oblivus immer. Present therefore it is lest we forget what, when it is present, we do forget. 43 Can one conclude from this that oblivio itself is not present but rather its images? 44 Since, if it were present itself, it would cause forgetting. Who is able to see clearly here? Quomit orgo odis duti meminorum, quanto cum odis meminis non possum? How then is it present for me to remember when, if it is present, I cannot remember? Question mark 45 Thus. We have to represent to ourselves the oblivion memnisa. Memoria retina or oblivio. Forgetfulness is retained in the memory. 46 Forgetting is represented as such. But even if we admit that only the image of the representation were present, it must still itself be present for me to get the image. But how can it be, since precisely the forgetting, according to its sense, extinguishes that which was to become available as notatum known? At tamanipsum oblivion and the having forgotten memnisum certus sum, quaid quad memnorimus what we want to represent to ourselves a bruder. And yet I am certain that I remember forgetfulness itself the having forgotten, by which what we remember what we want to represent to ourselves is concealed. 47. 
H. What does it mean to search? This memoria is Dandavidi vis a great force of life, 48 and I am myself memoria. Do I find you in the memoria? What should I do? What do I want? God vira vita true life volens te adding your undi adding potes, ad in harir tibi undi in harir tibi potes desiring to reach you in the way you can be reached, and to hold on to you in the way one can hold on to you. 49, 50 I must transcend the memoria, for animals like the fish and the bird have it, to have an memoria met bakor ad aves for even beasts and birds have memory, 51 since they find their dens and nests and whatever else they are used to. For habit is only possible through memoria. Transaborgo at memoriam. Out adding a meum so I will pass beyond my memory to reach him. 52 Where should I find you? Outside of memoria which I am about to transcend? But then I am a member too unmindful of you. 53 And how can I search for you if I do not somehow have you, if I do not know about you? Thus, I cannot say at all that I do not have something, and so I also have God in some way? What does searching mean? The woman who searched for and found the lost drachma how could she search for and find it if she did not somehow still have it present to herself? If, while searching for something, Different things offer themselves, and I reject each and everything until I have found the right thing I am searching for, then I must have what I am searching for and that according to which I evaluate what I find. And even if what I search for were there, and I did not recognize it as such, it would not be found. Being found? Objectively thought being their Dasein. To have having it prior to having found it. So if something which escapes the eye is being sought, it is present to the memoria in searching and in being sought. Cf. The lecture course Phenomenology der Anschauung des Ausdrucks Phenomenology of Intuition and Expression, Summer Semester 1920,54,55 being equals having dot really having equals not having lost it having in relation to possibly losing it an anxiety possibility intentionality. Being there day seen objectively is a theoretically formed out character which can really lack the factical appropriation, but this means that it cannot itself be used to determine the meaning of factical reality. But what if we search for that which has dropped out of the memoria, which is not in it, which has been forgotten? Where do we search in this case? Certainly in the memoria itself.56 but it is not there. Or is partly there and partly forgotten so that we still have, as it were, a remainder in our consciousness which we are trying to complement in order to remove the mutilation? If it had dropped out altogether, our reference to it could not be of any use, either. So, for instance, when we are concentrating on the name of a person which we encounter as somebody we know, we reject all the names which force themselves upon us, until we come across that one which we are accustomed to associate with that person but even what had been forgotten surfaces from an unconsciousness. So it cannot have dropped entirely from consciousness. Indeed, we look very closely at the meaning when we speak of something forgotten equi and amnimoto ad huca bleedi sumos, quad aljama bleedos nos esi memonimus, hoc ergo necamissum quarier paterimus, quad almino a bleedi forimus. For we have not yet utterly forgotten that which we remember ourselves to have forgotten. That which we have forgotten entirely, therefore, we will never be able so much as to search for.57 is still there in the consciousness of having forgotten, that is, forgetting is no radical privation of memoria, that is, it has its intentional relational sense. Understood relationally as long as we have still lost something, we still have it. What does Omnino Oblivisi having forgotten entirely mean? Not at all living in the enactment of the representation, not at all having at one's disposal the direction of access, to have shut oneself off against it, or having covered oneself up to the point of not seeing that it is still there in certain relational directions but this one does not grasp. Two questions one. What does searching really mean? Two. What am I really searching for? More precisely what, while searching, is still at my disposal? That I have it, how I have it dotted what am I directing my effort, and what escapes me? In anticipation in Borgriff God is Vitavide the life of life. But this does not have to have the formed out, concrete, traditional sense, but really has an existential sense of movement. Or as whom do I experience myself, who has forgotten what and how? That is, in my search of God, something in me does not only reach expression, but makes up my facticity and my concern for it. According to what do I recognize and grasp something as God? What gives the fulfillment of meaning saddest it suffices? Vita life. That means, in searching for this something as God, I myself assume a completely different role. I am not only the one from whose place the search proceeds and who moves towards some place, or the one in whom the search takes place but the enactment of the search itself is something of the self. What does it mean that I am? The self gains an idea of itself, what kind of idea I have of myself. Kierkegaard. 10. Of the Beata Vita. Chapters 20-23. A. The How of Having Beata Vita The Happy Life. Questions up to this point What do I love when I love you? In qua vi anima in what power of the soul do I find you? I have to transcend the memoria as well. On the other hand, what I search, what I love, must be in the memoria. I must somehow have it in order to search. What then do I seek when I seek God? Comenim te de mea quero, vitam beatam quero. Quarum te ut vivant anima mea. 
Vivitenum corpus meum de anima mea, et vivit anima mea de te vita vitae mei. For when I seek you, my God, I seek the happy life. I will seek you that my soul may live. For my body lives by my soul, and my soul lives by you, the life of my life. 58 Tradition not, or not entirely, destructed destroyer. Then, the question quomit o quero deum how do I search for God becomes the question quomit o quero vitam beatam how do I search for the happy life. 59, 60 Augustine immediately gives an answer to the question quid out amamo, com te amo? But what do I love when I love you? Question mark 61 beata vita. This answer does not follow from what preceded it. But the latter does motivate the question as to the how of the search. The search and, above all, the search for God, had become problematic. Thus, the question turns into a general theory of access, and not into a really strictly existential one. Beata vita equals vera beata vita the true happy life equals veritas truth equals God. How do I search for this? For this, somehow having beata vita according to its essence, according to its meaning. And how do I have it? According to what we determined about searching and finding, I have it only when I can say enough, here it is. 62 The search can now proceed, per recordation em oblitimt me esiat utenim by way of remembrance remembering that I had forgotten it. 63 As if I had had it somehow but only lost it, but lost it in such a way that I still know about having lost it, thus also somehow knowing about what I lost. Or I never had it at all and I search for it per appetitum descendi incognitum by way of an appetite to learn something unknown. 64 Searching for life, concern for life. Nemirum in truth, without a doubt habemus imnesci o quomato certainly in truth, without a doubt we have it, but in what way I do not know. 65 To desire life vita beata it is such a thing that omnes vellin. Et omnino quina lit nemo est all desire, and which no one fails to desire. 66 But the manner of having is different. Some are only beati happy when they fully possess it really having it, while others possess it already and hoping for it they have it in hope. The latter is inferior modo, a less valuable level of having, or a beatus assi being happy, but still higher than the manner of those who neck re next beatis under neither happy in actuality nor in hope. 67 Certainly they, too, wish to be happy and they can be happy only if they intend, in some way, the beata vita at all. How is it there, and as what Beatavitas had by such a thesis these is what Augustine untiringly labors to find out. At this point, Augustine does not want to determine how all of us received it, or how we lost it he only wants to determine whether it is in the memoria. If it is there, then the next question follows, in what manner the Beatavita is there, in what manner it is experienced. Does Augustine seek this radically? No, he remains at the same time within the classifying consideration of frameworks, and in a correspondingly dominant relational sense. Greek, Catholic. The manner of grounding by means of referring to widespread occurrence, and this according to guesswork and also in attitudinal orientation. Knowledge of the object. We saw above that, no matter how differently perfect the ways may be in which the Beatavitas had, everyone volunt desires it widespread occurrence, everyone has it, and we desire it because we love it and we can love it only by somehow knowing about it. And however different the linguistic expressions of Beatavita may be, everyone understands, beyond these differences, an identical meaning and admits that they desire it. This would not be possible if that for which we strive were not in the memoria in some way. Understanding the word, the speech. Existential sense. That it is universally there, and how it is there. Is Beata Vita present to us in the same way as the city Carthage is, as long as somebody who once saw it in person now remembers it? Obviously not. 68 For Carthage was perceived sensuously. That does not hold for Beata Vita, it is not a material thing which has sensuous perception as its corresponding, genuine mode of access. Thus, Beata Vita is not sensuous but something non-sensuous. For example, numbers are of this kind, too. Is Beata Vita present in the way numbers are had? No, numbers themselves are present we do not first strive to attain them. By contrast Vitam Beatam Habamus in Notitia, Ideo Commimus Seem, Et Damin Ad Hucat Ipposaim Volumus Sut Beati Seemus the happy life we have in our knowledge, and so we love it and yet we desire to attain it so that we may be happy. 69 What the happy life is in accordance with the established mode of access and mode of having is to be established at the same time, and by way of, the explication of the how of having. The primacy of the relational sense, or of the sense of enactment, is remarkable. What it is this question leads to the how of having it. The situation of enactment, authentic existence. Appropriate the having such that the having becomes a being. Thus, it is present in such a way that we have knowledge of it, but that we, precisely because of this knowledge, now really want to have it. And yet, it is the same with eloquence, for instance. We know what it is in those who do not have and want to possess it. But here we attain notition knowledge in such a way that we who possess it, perceived it sensuously and took delight in it. Again, knowledge was attained through the senses and from other people. Both things do not apply to the Beata Vita. Augustine opens a remarkable parenthesis here quam quam nisi ex interiore notitior. Et love. Habit, in exterior notition on dialectarian sure, 
Nekwe hak esi velen nice ideal ekterinsher however, if it were not on the basis of inward knowledge or et love had in exterior knowledge. They could not have been delighted nor wished to be eloquent unless they were delighted. Seventy. Although they gained the delight only from an exterior knowledge, they would not want it unless they were delighted to some extent. That is to say, this example only tells that in how we experience a determinate what in which we take delight. But the being delighted itself? Radical reference to the self, authentic facticity. Something which cannot be taken over from others at all. Thus, the desire to take delight or the desire to avoid pain is the real mode of having delight. Do we then have the Beata Vita and the memoria like a delight? For Tassa Eta perhaps this is the case. For in this consideration, we have to say I have never seen, heard, smelled, tasted, or touched my delight sensuously, said ex paratus sum in animo meu quanto litatus sum but I experienced it in my soul when I was joyful. 71, 72 Is Beata Vita present in wanting to take delight? In the manner of delight? Is the desire to take delight the motive for one's effort and for one's bustling activity? The manner in which Beata Vita is always somehow present delectatio finis cura delight is the end of concern. 73. And further, delight is such that I can have it present, to myself even when I am sad. That is, when Beata Vita is represented in this way, I do not need to be Beatus but can have it as miser miserable I can have it in existential misery tristi scaudium pristinum ricolo I am sad as I recall former joy. 74, 75 What now is joy? A condition of the soul, thus Beata Vita a psychic being? Cf. Chapter 25. Now, when and where did I experience Beata Vita so that I can represent it to myself, and have it present to myself? only in the manner of a joy in order to love it and to strive for it. Augustine has the answer nec ego totem, out cum possis, said beati pro ursus omnes esse volumus. Quad nice I certa pro notitia na semus, non tem certa pro volunte velimus. Nor is it my desire alone, or of some few besides, but everyone wishes to be entirely happy. If we did not know this with certain knowledge, we would not desire it with a certain will. 76 since it is indeed certain that all of us want it, we must have certain knowledge of it. That this wanting is certain is demonstrated also by the most extreme case in which one person wants the opposite of what the other wants. For one and the same reason, one person wants to serve militare, another not see out of avis qua orator, utrum beati esse valind, fieri possidat utrc statum se sinula dubitione decatopter nam forte conium alias hinc, alias on gode quad etsi alias hinc, alias alinca sequitur, unum est tam in quo pervenir omnis nitin jurat godond. But if they were asked whether they would like to be happy, both would without all doubting say that they would choose it is it then that one person rejoices in this, and another in that? The one person obtains it in one way, and another in another way, yet there is one thing which all strive to attain, namely that they rejoice. 77 at qui ipsum gaudium bitum beatum vocant. This very joy they call the happy life. 78 thus, no one can say that he never experienced something like this thus, he has some knowledge of it. Initially, the concrete factical motives are different and opposed but it really is the same. But Kiske Godant that each rejoice is decisive. And now, Augustine, before God, expels from himself the opinion that already every experienced joy is the true one, the Beata Vita. Est enim gaudium quad dotaris quite gratis voluntarily collant. Et ipsa est Beata Vita gaudirante, de te, propter te toward you, by your side, and because of you ipsa est, et non est altera. Qui autum ili imputin esse, eliud sectanter gaudium, nec we ipsum Aboli qua tam and imagine God I voluntis eorum non avertitur. For there is a joy which is granted to those who worship you voluntarily. And this is the happy life, to rejoice toward you, by your side, and because of you this is the happy life, and there is no other. As for those who think there is another, they pursue another joy, not the true one. However, their will is not utterly turned away from some image of joy.79. Accordingly, it is not so very established that everyone strives for the authentic Beata Vita. Rather cadunt and quad valent. O oh, contenti sunt they fall back upon what they have the strength to do, resting content with that. Dot 80 they fall back upon what is in their power to do, what is at their disposal in the moment, what is conveniently attainable for them of the surrounding worldly and other significances of the world and of the self. Formally indicated, the Beata Vita as such, and in relation to the how of its existence, is one. It really concerns the individual, how he appropriates it. There is one true one, and especially this, in turn, is for the individual. Cf. The path of the following explications. What, by contrast, is not at their disposal in the same way what is not lying around, ready to be grasped, non tantum vulent, quantum sad est valiant they do not will so much as is sufficient to give them the strength, 81 they do not want as much, they do not will it to the same degree. They do not project this from out of themselves toward themselves as possibility, in such a way that it would suffice to take possession to manage of themselves in the first place. The concern for it is lacking to such an extent that it is not really present. 
precisely because it becomes an object Jijun Stanlik veered in its genuine manner only in such concern. Thus it is something which is only present in an authentic complex of enactment. It has to be broken into i-existential lino in the attitudinal handling of content, but in the determinately articulated, factical historical complex of enactment. b. The Gaudium de Veritate Joy of Truth For example, in a certain sense everyone wants the truth they prefer veritas truth to falsehood as falsehood error, and this happens as easily and without inhibition as they want beata vita. There is a connection to the general velgutter a gaudium de veritate wanting to rejoice joy of truth. Universality, generality will be grasped historical factically, on a determinate level of factical life. Universality is genuine, but its meaning has been contorted umjbajin through Greek philosophy must be taken back into the existential historical unity. Beata quit vita est gaudium de veritate. A happy life is the joy of truth. 82 They experience this joy where they somehow encounter truth in their lives. And where, in what manner, do they encounter the truth? Precisely where they do not want to be deceived. Although many people intend to deceive others, they do not want to be deceived themselves. In this wish not to be deceived, in this effort to escape deceit, they are guided by a sense of truth. For they would not and could not love truth, they could not rejoice in a nice is at all equa notitia aeus in memoria eorum unless there were some knowledge of it in their memory. 83 In refusing and not wanting deceit, they are holding on to veritas, that is, the rejection itself takes place in the delectatio veritatis delight of truth. Amant enum edipsum, guia folly nolent. For they love the truth because they do not want to be deceived. 84 Veritas is vera beata vita true, happy life veritas. See veritas in the direction of falling. So they are somehow rejoicing in and making an effort toward, the truth. But why are they nonetheless not in the Beata Vita, in the genuine one, which you, God Veritas, are yourself? Kurgo nanda elegant? Why then do they not rejoice in this question mark 85 Why does the joy which corresponds to such Veritas not live in them? Quia fortius occupant or in Elise? Because they are more strongly occupied by other things. 86 The bustling activity in which they are absorbed, the cheap tricks to which they abandon themselves, rather makes them even more miserable. Potius miseros rather miserable makes them more and more lose the Beata Vita than that what is tenuate or tenuously 87 present in memoria, the somehow of truth, could make them into Beata happy ones. And you can immodicum lumen est in hominibus for among men there is a little light, 88 there is still a modicum of light. Lumen has here a very determinate, existential sense of enactment in self-worldly, factical experience, and is not to be understood in a reifying metaphysical way at English metaphysish. But now, why is it that? While it seems that the effort at truth is effortless, since it is there by itself naturally, the real truth is not being loved, but rather hated. Cur autum veritas paradodium, et animicus is factus est homo tuus theorem predicans? But why does truth instigate hatred, and your man become the enemy of those to whom he preaches what is true? Question mark 89. In factical life, human beings somehow intimate something right, live in it and for it is something significant. Inasmuch as this living and experiencing is already an absorption in factical life, and abandoning oneself over to it, it is, and will become, at the same time that which fulfills the effort toward truth. Hoc quatam ad valint esse veritatum what they love they want to be the truth 90 what is loved at the moment, a loving into which one grows through tradition, fashion, convenience, the anxiety of disquiet, the anxiety of suddenly standing in vacuity precisely this becomes the truth itself, in and with this falling enactment. The truth and its meaning are taken even into this modification that is, one does not only retreat from the vacuity, but even more, and primarily, from the movement toward it. Veritas 91 in the direction of falling, but here, there is still the genuine remainder of securing it does not have to harden into a shell gehoise this is only an aspect of the content and does not belong to what is decisive. I can live in the shell without having one even more, if I transform the building and tearing down of a shell into a process, I have secured the end in a shell-like way. Shell a relational sense, a sense of enactment. Jaspers cannot speak of the whole end of life and process of what he intends by these, in whatever terms. In this situation, they do not want to let themselves be startled, because they are motivated in a certain sense, genuinely, for theme do not want to be deceived that is, they do not want to be, as it were, taken away from what they possess as truth. Nolent convince quad falsi sent they do not want to be convinced that they are deceived, 92 they resist exposure of their error. An attempt toward truth and attempt which, however, is not genuine and not radically appropriated fall. Keeps them in error. How little depends on the what of the content everything depends on the how. Amatim lucentum. Odorantim redarganum. They love the truth when it enlightens them, but hate it when it reprehends them. 93 They love it, 94 when it encounters them as glitzy, 95 in order to enjoy it aesthetically, in all convenience, just as they enjoy every glamour that, in captivating, relaxes them. But they hate it when it presses them forcefully, when it concerns them themselves, and when it shakes them up and questions their own facticity and existence, then it is better to close one's eyes just in time, 
in order to be enthused by the choir's litanies which one has staged before oneself. 96. Thus, human beings do wish that the truth reveals itself to them, that nothing is closed off to them aesthetic, but they themselves close themselves off against it. Abia manifest hari nalant they do not want to be discovered by it. 97. But what does a human being attain in this way? That the truth remains concealed to him, although he does not remain concealed before it. But what should have become clear here even in this closing himself off against the truth, he loves the truth more than error, and thus makes an effort at the Bayadavita. He who loves the Veritas Sola only truth per quam virus and omnia by which all things else are true 98 sign interpellent molestia without any discomfort interfering, 99 without any burden, without that which pulls him back, without an inauthentic connect, convenient, self-concealing willfulness will probably have the authentic Bayadavita. Bayadavita is Gaudium, more closely, Gaudium de Veritate joy of truth understood as existentially related to the Vita Beata. By way of Veritas, however, we have, at the same time, the invasion of Greek philosophy. 11. The How of Questioning and Hearing Chapters 24-27 In searching for what he loves when he loves God, he has not found anything extra memoriam outside of memory. Extra in a double sense 1. In that searching and finding in general are in the memoria 2. In that Beata Vita is itself not an extra as an object. But God is also not something psychic. And what he has found of him truth, somehow, that is something in the memoria which he represents to himself in it, ex quota disit since he, first learned of you, from that point, since he did disit learned of you. 100 ubi enum and veni veritatum, ebi and veni deum meum ipsum veritatum. For where I found the truth, there I found my God, truth itself. 101 Thus, insofar as truth is something which I have in the memoria, which is accessible as such therein, I find God in error, cum reminiscer tui et delector in day when I recall you and take delight in you. 102 When I am mindful of you and enjoy myself toward you. With this, God is somehow already there, if only tenuate or tenuously. 103 You, God, bestow this honor upon the memoria by living in it. But in quae aeus party manis, hoc considero in what part of it, I now consider. 104 I have not found you in the representations of material things and not to be common day the affections and emi may where I had committed the affections of my soul. 105 Where I entrusted my experienced conditions and moods. And you are also not there where the soul has itself. Conium su I quote meminent animus as the soul also remembers itself. 106 You yourself are not an affecti of Ibendis, qualis est cum litamor, contristamor, cupimus, matuimus, meminimus, oblivisimur, et quid quid hujus modi est eden ecipsi animus s, quia dominus deus animi tu s affection of a living person, such as when we rejoice or are sad, or when we desire, fear, remember, forget, or anything of that kind nor are you the soul itself. For you are the Lord God of the soul. 107 Dominus Deus and Emi Lord God of the soul, thus, nor simply a special object. Augustine renounces the regional characterization of the meaning of Dominus. 108. Et commutant or hyc omnia, two outum incommutabilis mani super omnia, all these things are changed, but you remain unchangeable above all things. 109 You are not something like the soul, but you have it as charte and ea certainly dwell in it. 110 Even if, in the soul, there is no such thing as place and space, thus making it senseless to ask where? As itself an experience, an experiential complex, this object cannot be God it does not have the sense of being of the summum bonum greatest good. Cf. Delectatio. But I must have experienced you somewhere, somewhere you must have gotten into memoria and venite and te supra me I found you for above myself. 111. Yabik, veritas everywhere, truth in every experience, whatever is experienced, and whoever experiences. You are queried by many, who ask you different things, and you respond. You are there for everyone, everyone can speak with you, can stand before you. Liquide tu respondis, said non liquide clearly, unobscured, purely, genuinely omnes audienta dear to understand, that is, mode of enactment you respond clearly, but not all understand you clearly clearly, unobscured, purely, genuinely. 112 or that one makes you, in cheap blasphemies, into an object of essential insights which is even a few degrees worse than the proofs of God's existence which one criticizes haughtily and that one plays the role of religious renewal at your expense. Thus everything depends upon the authentic hearing, upon the how of the questioning posture, of the wanting to hear. Not only do some speculate about you in a convenient curiosity. Everyone gets counsel from whom they want something but they do not always hear what they really want. They take the current object of their efforts as the most important thing that is. They want to hear something regarding that they are fundamentally incapable of hearing, of remaining open. They are only curious to hear what suits them, and they are not capable of transforming what they hear into what precisely should concern Beckham earn them, though it may not suit them. The question where I find God has turned into a discussion of the conditions of experiencing God, and that comes to a head in the problem of what I am myself sick that, 
In the end, the same question still stands, but in a different form of enactment. So the questioning and hearing does not suffice unless their how has been appropriated genuinely. And Augustine himself confesses Sarah Teomavi late have I loved you, 113 late did I get to the level of factical life where I put myself in the position to love you. Amavia complex of the sense of enactment nemo quit vivid in quicumque vita, sine tribus istis animae affectionibus, credendi grasping trustingly, somehow fixing an end sperandi awaiting, keeping oneself open for amandi loving devotion, appreciating however, no one, in any walk of life, lives without his soul experiencing these three things believing grasping trustingly, somehow fixing an end, hoping awaiting, keeping oneself open for, loving loving devotion, appreciating.114 at an istiformos equa fecisti, deformis erubamid in my deformed state, I rushed into those beautiful things which you made, 115 although I plunged headlong into the world and things as formosa, beautifully formed, impressive and announcing something significant so that they captured me and my desire to know made an effort at it but deformis erabam, I myself was not in the form, I did, not have the being, which is the genuine being of a self. Dedigisti me, et exorci and pachem tu me touched me, and I am burning for your peace.116. 12. The curare being concerned as the basic character of factical life chapters 28 and 29. a. The dispersion of life. My life is deformis deformed. Not in order to excuse himself, but indeed to push himself away from himself recklessly, and to gain himself from this severe distance, Augustine now makes it clear to himself, that life is no kakwakshpat sirgong and is precisely the most inopportune moment to assume an air of importance. One or I me he some I am a burden to myself. 117 It is such that the constitutively existential sense of enactment of the awaiting setting out, the keeping oneself open for, can only be totus pes non nisi in magna valde misericordia de all hope is nowhere but in God's very great mercy. 118 Hope from despair. And this mercy urbarman precisely corresponds to the misery urbarm leechkite of this life it is I uber I ubs continentium commanding you command continence. I your directio cordis, cogitation is, delectation is finis curi. Commanding the direction of the heart, of thoughts, of delight and of concern. Cf. Et duriges justum. Scrutins corda et renesteus and you direct the just, the searcher of hearts and guts is God.119. For in multidifluximus we are scattered into the many, 120 we are dissolving into the manifold and are absorbed in the dispersion. You demand counter movement against the dispersion, against the falling apart of life. Per continentium quit collegimer et redigimer in unum necessarium deum? By continence we are gathered together and brought into the one the necessary one God? 121. In this decisive hoping, the genuine effort at continentia is alive, an effort which does not reach its end. Not abstinence which loses precisely the positive sense, but containment, pulling back from defluxio, standing against it full of mistrust. Those who are really continents cogitet quid sibi does it, non quid adsit think what they desire, not what they are close to. 122 And there will always be something quid does it which they desire. For life is really nothing but a constant temptation. Numquid non tendatio est vita humana super terum sinulo interstitia? Is not human life on earth a trial without intermission? Question mark 123 It is necessary to grasp more sharply this fundamental character in which Augustine experiences factical life tendatio trial, temptation in order to understand accordingly to what extent the one who lives in such saintliness, and on such a level of enactment, is necessarily a burden to himself. Tolerari iubs molestias et difficultates you command to endure troubles and difficulties, 124 Not just to carry the troubles gone difficulties with us, but to tackle them as such. This does not mean, however, that we should love themed hat is, basically turn the difficulties into a delight. 125 Give oneself over to theme but confront them in such a way that the tolerer enduring remains decisive. Nemo qua tolerat really geomet, et si tolerarimet. No one loves what he endures. Even if he loves to endure. 126 The tolerer circumscribes a peculiar complex of enactment which is not operative in isolation, but which moves in a characteristic and fundamental direction of factical life. In this direction, the tentatio also finds its sense and motivation, and in it becomes clear to what extent there are escaped molestia and difficulties. b. The conflict of life. The in multidefluere scattered, Dissolution into the many is an oriented being pulled by an indelectatio the life of the world in its manifold significance multum has to be understood in this way appeals to us. Cf. Above, p. 144 cadunt and the existential counter movement. Multum the manifold, unum the authentic docigently shay cf. Aristotle. 
In the defluxus, factical life forms out of itself, and for itself, a very determinate direction of its possible situations, which are themselves awaited in the defluxus delectatio finis curai delight is the end of concern. Now, this curare to care, to be concerned has a relational sense which changes in the historical factical complex of life. 127 It is enacted as time here and desiderare, as fearing retreating from and desiring taking into oneself, giving oneself over to. The multum is the manifold, the many significances in which I live. These significances are sometimes prosperous supportive, conducive, appealing that is, carrying over and supporting in the direction of significance, at other times adverse impeding, countering that for which I strive. When I now want 28 experience adversa, this experience is not simply a registering, a taking note of things, but prospera in adversus desidero in adversity I desire prosperity. 129 This desiring which is also present indicates how the experience of adversa is itself placed in its own factically concrete horizon of awaiting. It is enacted, in a determinate sense, historically. 130 This co presence is not adhered onto, but co determines, the sense of the phenomenon of the experience of adversa insofar as the experience is cura and has aliquid delectation is something delightful. I experience the counter movement only insofar as I myself live in a delectatio, cura prosper orm delight, prosperous concern. And adversa in prosperous timeo in prosperity I fear adversity. 131 In taking up and appropriating what is supportive, the fearing of impediments is, in turn, present. 132 Again, factical life is in the historical. The self, even if often only in a weak manner, is taken into a historical experiencing. Basic motif the historical and cura concern itself. If we call this peculiar commingling of the various senses of the relation of concern in the factical experience of life or its bustling active at ye conflicts vis qualtig kiat, then this remains an objectively characterizing concept, which is useful as long as it does not claim to render the real sense of the phenomenon. A first conflicted co-presence of demor fear and desiderium desire cupiditis lust 133 carries new conflicts within itself and this would be the given ground for dialectical antitheses, that is, for a playful dealing with matters which do not tolerate such treatment. Now, these experiences of concern are not simply there, in a psychic stream, as it were, but they themselves are had in the experiencing these having had as their being. 134 They are had not as a mere theoretical taking note and registering, but themselves as a concern. 135 As flandum weeping, sorrowful or latindum rejoicing, as malumbad or bonum goodthus in such a way that not only the co presence of demor and desiderium carries a conflict with it but that the sides of the conflict are themselves, in turn, experienced in a conflicted manner with desiderium as flendum or bonum, merulum as litondum or malum. And the question is precisely in what manner of concern these experiences of concern are to be enacted. These experiences of concern are pulled together into a determinate manner of enactment according to their own sensed sense of finis curi delectatio. There is not only the insecurity, but the danger to give into the pull and to fall into what is not genuine dos act. Thus the enactment of experience is always insecure about itself. In the complex of experience, there is no medius locus middle ground where there are not also counter possibilities. Thus, Augustine has to say ex quae party stet victoria nescio which side has the victory I do not know 136 toward what direction one's own life will incline in the end. 137 in experiencing, a devilish being torn apart has been uncovered. Ecce vulnera mea non abscondo, 138 look, I do not conceal my wounds and following sap. 8. 21. Augustine already considers it a valuable insight to understand that the continentia is, by itself, a hopelessness, and that it must be given, if it is to be had somehow. However, one does not yet see clearly what the connection is between this being torn and the phenomenon of tentatio, to what extent vita est tota tentatio sinulo interstitia life is all trial without intermission. And does Augustine treat only this question in the following chapters until the end? but it is becoming more and more difficult for him. His considerations are slowing down, are becoming more severe, and Augustine requires the most lithe dialectic in order to grasp those elements of the background that he, by relentless and understanding questioning, brings to light from the darkness of the soul, in order to grasp them in such a way that they flow in the fundamental direction of his confessions, and of Book X in particular. One views the considerations that follow too easily as mere hair-splitting reflections of a pedantic moralizer or one gets lost in isolated, surprising psychological analyzes. In both cases, one has lost the real direction of understanding. It is necessary to view these chapters, in particular, in connection to the real question searching for Goethe to illuminate this question from the start on the basis of these chapters. But this also poses enough difficulties, 
and the interpretation of and on the real level of enactment presented as such in a communal world has the purpose only of letting us encounter the difficulties. But even here, there is an essential limitation, inasmuch as the interpretation is phenomenological rather than theological. The difference and context of this interpretation is to be determined, not with a view toward a theory of science, but historically. Augustine himself sees quite clearly that his considerations cannot be understood without further ado a be some fleet mecum, et pro me fleet, qui a liquid boni vobis cum into sagittis unde facta procedent. Nam qui non agitis, non vo hic movent. See where I am weep with me and weep for me, you who are driven by something good within yourselves from which the deeds proceed. As for those who do not have this drive, you are not moved by the stop 139 question num quid non tendatio est vita humana? Is not human life a trial question mark 140. 13. The first form of tentatio concupiscentia carnis desire of the flesh. Chapters 30-34. A. The three directions of the possibility of defluxion. The special conditions for the proper understanding of the following chapters are clear to Augustine nam qui non into sagittus aliquid boni, non vohic movent. As for you who are not driven by something good within yourselves, you are not moved by this. Insofar as you do not have agitus for yourself everyone for himself, in whatever manner of enactment, concerning himself with the good end insofar as you do not only have it in an imagined tendency and as a wish, but make an effort at it in the concrete self-assertion, you will not be moved by this, it will not concern you, you will not understand it. This express emphasis upon an essential condition of understanding is, without emphasis and explicit mention, already operative in the presentation of the widespread generality of the delectary and the striving for the vita beata. 141 The point is not to plant it first of all, as it were, but only to encounter it, and to emphasize and seize it authentically in an enactmental manner. The ire is ire continentium et iustitium commanding continence and justice. Duce is used to him. You leave the just doc the concept of iustitia and its genuine conception is to be left aside, the difficulties of St. Paul and Luther and on this basis even more new problems, that is, at the same time real existential problems. Here, we only pursue that to which continentia refers and what concerns it. Three directions of the defluere, of the possibility of defluxion and the danger. Danger here not objective. Viewed from the outside, it looks as if Augustine only gave a convenient classification of the different directions of concupiscentia, of desire begir lichkeit. Concupiscere desiring together, a concentration as well but one where that which concentrates is precisely the objectively secular into which the self is pooled. According to its sense, a classification is, by itself, not a manner of grasping the phenomena of the concupiscentia. And we will see that it looks like an entertaining unraveling of psychic backgrounds. It is not probable that Augustine would have ever had the time for such an activity during the years in question. Augustine conducts the division, as we will say preliminarily, following 1 John 215-17. Do not love the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the Father's love is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and the secular ambition, is not the Father's, but is the world's. The world is passing away with its desires, but he who does God's will remains forever. 142. 1 Concupiscentia carnis desire of the flesh, 2 Concupiscentia oculorum desire of the eyes, 3 Ambitio seculi secular ambition. Augustine does not merely characterize these phenomena objectively, as somehow existing, but his presentation is always in the fundamental posture of the confessio that is, he confesses how temptations grow on him through these phenomena and in this posture, and how he relates, or tries to relate, to them. Confitary interpretation, here in a very determinate how exclamation mark 143. b. The problem of the I am. Augustine now considers sensual lust in a more restricted sense, the life of sexual drives, not in a biological psychological and theoretical attitude, but according to the characteristics of how he has factically experienced it and still experiences it had is, how and when he encounters it militia dii et noctis the evils of the day and the night dailiness. To be sure, he followed the demand of God had is, he gave up concubitus copulation even more, he followed the advice and chose abstinence from marriage. Set it huc vivent in memoria mea, de quae multilocutus sum, dalium rerum imagines, Quasi be con suetudo mea fixit et accursent mihi vigilant equidem carentes viribus but in my memory of which I have spoken so much, there still live images of those things which were fixed there by my habit and they occur to me even while I am awake though they lack strength. 144 But in my sleep and in my dreams, they gain power over me. Num quid tunc ego non sum? Am I not myself at that time? Question mark 145 How about my being? 
The problem is the I am. That is what about it, what is it really? Vitakwa asks your life a question. By contrast, while I am awake, when they have no power, I am. My being is determined, somehow, by the sense of the circumvention and the coping. Some equals I am existence. Existence is pulled into a being and a change of being, so that precisely with this difference, undersheet, it could modify itself and yet does not have to. While I am awake, I am able to stand firm, even and especially when the temptations attack my body, when I have to deal with it. By contrast, I do fall for them while asleep and dreaming, although only the images are there. Is ratio, the possibility of deciding freely, of evaluating, taking a stand, and choosing, closed with the eyes as well? But how then does it occur that we retain in dreams, too, the directions of stance and choice that we seized, and that we stand firm in the face of what lures us? At tam and tantum interest in term apesum et mapesum, intra momentum quo hinc ad soperum transio, vel huc on retranseo. And yet there is so much difference between myself and myself, in that moment wherein I pass from waking to sleeping, or return from sleeping to waking exclamation mark 146 there is a difference, a distance between the transitions. And yet in all those betweens there is somehow the same transire retransire some to pass to return I am, this uncovers facticity. However, this difference is not only the difference that I behave differently in different situations, but precisely through this difference I experience that I behaved in such and such a way for example. In dreams Tata myself was not really there, so that a vigilantes ad conscienti requiem redamus ipsac distantia reperiemus nos non facis, quod tamin in nobis quo quo modo factum esidolamus when we wake up we return to peace of conscience by the distance discovering that we did not do what, however, we regret that it has somehow been done in us.147 especially in the transition we have a noteworthy experience with ourselves, namely, that there is something quad nos non fessimus that we have not made which is not enacted by us, quod in nobis factum est but which is made in us, but which nonetheless occurs and proceeds with us and in us, so that we are somehow sad about it, something that is in us, something that we are ourselves and yet, that we are not. Concept of the molestia trouble. It is to be noted in what complexes of experience this difference inflates itself, and to which ones it belongs accordingly in conscience. We can already see from what has been experienced no juxtaposition. Nothing is said of duality and being split and so forth. But how me ipsum, my being myself, is determined in its full facticity on this basis. That means that it is necessary not to take the experiences, and experiences of dreams, as occurrences, but to take them in their full factical how, in which I have the world and my life and in which I am. One has to leave aside all theoretically formulated divisions like body and soul, sensuality and reason, body and mind, and so forth. Primarily, the decisive sense of the phenomena is not here at all. See wo loop displeasure. The longoris ani my exhaustions of the soul are placed in the hope of the misericordia dei gods. Mercy, ad pacem plenarium, quam tecum hap abund interior ad exterior may until the full peace which I shall have with you and me and outside of me. 148 And this hope is a certain ideal whose origin and ideal being dequeens quiet day. Est alia militia dei. There is another evil of the day. 149 It is very obvious here how Augustine sees these experiences as troubles of his day. This dailiness day and night includes meals and relaxations. Rufissimus enim quotidianus ruinus corporis adendo et bibendo. For we restore the daily decay of the body by eating and drinking. 150 So we bear with us an indigentia need. We are a corruptible, corruptible body on carry this heavy burden. Nunc autum suavis est mihi necessitas. But now, this necessity is sweet to me. 151 I turn the necessity the burdensome necessity which indicates a need always to be seen in this full significance of experiencing though a pleasure. The needing and demanding is agreeable to me. And fames et sidus hunger and thirst are indeed, and can be, pains, urine, et secut febris neck and which burn, and kill like a fever, 152 but voluptate polluncture they are expelled by pleasure. 153 And since we can heal the pains from what is at our disposal, calamitas delici vocantura calamity is called a delight. 154 So something is turned upside down, molestii troubles and militia evils are delici delights. Food and drink are supposed to be only medicamenta medicines to sustain me. Ruina decay, philosophically Christian passing away, perishing in view of immortality the objective Greek theoretical aspect of the concept of facticity being dependent upon, urgency, which is present over against me and in me. Sed dum ad quietum satiatatis ex indigentia molestia transio, in ipso transit mihi insidiatur laqueus concupus and ee. But while I pass from the trouble of need to the quiet of satisfaction, in the very passing lies an insidious trap of desire. 155 another transio I passes to be noted here. 
ipse unum transistis voluptus est, et non est alias quae transiatur quo transire cogit necessitas. For that passage is itself a pleasure, and there is no other way to pass by but the passage forced upon us by necessity. 156 The need, and that one should preserve oneself, demand according to their own sense this transistus, but it in turn is a voluptus adjungit se periculus adjucunditis, et plerum prior canotter a dangerous pleasantness joins in and often tries to go before it. 157 The transition itself becomes important to me a significance in which I live and which then absorbs the necessitas as the proper thing. Letting us merely see and experience meals. The voluptus and the pursuance of Iacunditas contain a possibility of movement within themselves, such that this possibility pushes itself in between and in first place is the proper. Nec item modus utrius cest nam quad saluti satis est, delectation i param est. Et si pay insertum. Fit utrum ad huc necessaria corporis cura subsidium patat, and voluptaria cupa diatidus fallatia ministerium supitat. Ad hoc insertum hilaris it in felix anima pursues joyfully takes it up, appropriates it as valuable, conducive, convenient, et an eopra eperit excuse at Ionis Petrocinium. They do not have the same measure for what is enough for health is too little for delight. And often there is uncertainty whether the necessary concern of the body seeks sustenance, or whether the deceptive desire for pleasure demands service. In this uncertainty, the unhappy soul rejoices pursues joyfully, takes it up, appropriates it as valuable, conducive, comfortable and in this has a ready-made excuse for its protection. 158 One's own uncertainty is exploited for the sake of comfort. It is the facticity in which I maintain myself and give myself existence which pushes itself into my authentic existing. Uncertainty, danger, possibility and quite hilarious it in felix anima in which the unhappy soul rejoices. Mode of significance, of the claiming of the enactment. Conflict. Uncertainty of the decision. Concilium certain decision mihi de hoc renondum stat I have not yet made a certain decision on this matter. 159. Non ego immunditium absonii timeo, sed immunditium cupidinitis. It is not the uncleanness of the meat which I fear but the uncleanness of my lust. 160 in his ergo tentation abis positis, certo quotidi adversus concupiscentium mandu condi et bibendi. Therefore, placed in these temptations, I struggle every day against the desire of eating and drinking, 161 against the determinate direction against a determinate how of this concrete dealing with. Non anim est quad semel precedere cut off, throw off at ulterius non adding air discernum, secut to concubita patu. For it is not such that I could cut myself off cut off, throw off from it once and for all, and decide to never touch it again, as I was able to do with carnal copulation. 162 comma 163 concubitus copulation a certain situation which I can leave behind, but I do not get rid of myself in this way. Again. A characteristic meditation intervenes and urges toward what is decisive. De Elisibra odorum the allurement of smell. Regarding the Elisibra odorum, I appear to myself as if they could not reach me. They do not come near me, as it were, so that I would have to labor with them. Itamihi video refort has a faller. That is how I see myself but perhaps I am mistaken. 164 at first sight, when I view myself from above as a thing fixed in the now, and of such and such a constitution, it seems like that to me. But I have to weep at myself in my misery, not only in so far as I see that I am situated in uncertainties, but at isti plangent de tenebrae, in quibus militet facultas mea quae and me est plerum cacultum est there is the deplorable darkness in which the faculty which is in me is hidden from me often it is concealed. 165 The knowledge of the uncertainty 166 itself lies in darkness. I cannot just look at myself to see myself lying open before me. I am concealed to myself. Nice I experientia manifested or unless experience reveals it, 167 if the complex of experience, that is, the historical experiencing and its expansion or strek on the experience oriented toward the self, existential experience, does not expose it. I can never appeal to a moment that is shut down, as it were, in which I supposedly penetrate myself. Already the next moment can make me fall, and expose me as someone entirely different. For this reason, insofar as the having myself can be enacted at all, it is always in the pull away from and toward this life, a to and fro. 168 at Nemo Securus Essi David in Ista Vita, Quae Tota Tentatio Nominatur Job. 7. 1. Utrum Kifiri Patuit Ex Deteriori Melior, Non Fiat Etium Ex Meliori Deterior. No one should be secure in this life, which is called a total temptation job. 7. 1. Anyone who could be made better from worse could also be made worse from the better. 169. The Fieri Patuit the Past. What became possible and what I am in this having become stands in a fiat 170 the becoming which could still occur. Thus, 
the self is to be sought originally in this direction of experience. In this direction, and only in this direction, does the tentatio encounter us. That is, inasmuch as it is there, life, the esta vida, has to be experienced in this way 171 understanding the self in this in its full facticity of experience. How little I have myself in this way, and if I have myself toward the future then insignificant calculations. Evo luptus orium the pleasure of the ear. This aspect of the factical is clearly also the basis for the consideration of the voluptates orium pleasures of the year 172 omnes effectus spiritus nostri prosui diversitate habere proprios modos in voce et qui cantu, quorum nescio quae occulta familiaritate excitant or all the diverse effects of our spirit have their various corresponding modes and voice and chants, and are stirred up by a mysterious association.173 thus. And as much as this familiarity does exists and in as much as the sounds and contest chants trigger a delectatio delight which can turn into a frui enjoyment gibus non est fruendum which is not to be enjoyed life and effect as spirit as the effects of the spirit will always, at the same time, stand in the uncertainty of its factical enactment. Because of this close association, the sounds and chants carry their own danger within them, a danger which can also be conducive, in that precisely through them, in the co-experience of the sounds, the effectus spiritus are becoming even more alive. Thus, what is decisive here is the sense of function of hearing or of what becomes accessible in it for the effectus spiritus. Hearing to be regarded from this perspective. The factical, unreflected experience placed at the service of, in view of, holding itself in the ordering towards summum bonum greatest good or the relation of the self to it. The same holds for the theoretical consideration of the sounds. F. Voluptus ocular and the pleasure of the eye. Restat voluptus oculorum eyes torum carnis may I care and not what is spiritual there remains the pleasure of these eyes of my flesh the flesh not what is spiritual.174 Correspondingly, the seeing is not related to purely sensuous objects it is a how of dealing with incarni in the flesh, in an orientation that is separated, non-divine, non-spiritual, and not concerned existentially, not authentically concerned, in a self-worldly manner, for the beata vita. Similarly, and in general, in the consideration of the senses in the context of the tenediones, that which they bring to the fore of experience stands in a peculiar, characteristic sense, full of content, a sense which is perhaps precisely the genuine, existentially decisive one. What is crucial is not a new determination of the content, the material what, regionally, but opening up possibility but this in such a way that the temptation lies precisely in setting aside the possibilities, and in settling oneself 175 in the real in what is significant as being accompanied by a possible fall. And the emphasis on the voluptus istorum oculorum is on the imod oculi what the eyes love, what they are looking for at the moment pulchris formas et varius, nitidos et aminos coloris beautiful in varied forms, glowing in pleasant colors 176 lux light. The devotion is such that this possession becomes entirely familiar and is taken for granted. Form and color are their totus diabus the whole day. Lux, Regina colorum, multimodo elapsu blanditure light, the queen of colors, gliding by in many forms, enticing me. 177 insinuate autum se eta vehementer, at si re pentis subtrahater, com desiderio requiritur at si ju absit, contristat animum for it insinuates itself so forcibly, if it is withdrawn suddenly, it is sought with longing and if long absent, it makes the soul sad. 178 transistus transition. cf. non autum sentio sine quo esiat i quo animo, out eager possum, nice I cum ab forward for I cannot know whether my soul can be balanced or upset to be without something, unless it is absent.179 how I conduct myself in having, in dealing with, how, and to what extent, it concerns me how, and to what extent, I am interwoven and involved. Factical experience has fixed itself in that direction, such that it is concerned to add something, to increase the significance as that is, to multiply the manifold and the alteration of what is at its disposal, the new. This increase and alteration shows how important this is taken to be, and how it can fill a life.180. g. Operators et sectators pulchritudinum exteriorum the artists and followers of external beauty. Homens for sequence quad facient cut unto nie quad valent humans outwardly they follow what they make 181 they fall into that which they are able to do. They settle themselves and follow that which they can accomplish. Quam innumerabilia didi run humans ad elisi brisocular and innumerable things shave man made to entice their eyes. 182 Those operators at sectators pulchritudinum exteriorum the producers of bustling activity usum necessarium at qui moderatum long transgredients artists and followers of external beauty the producers of bustling activity, far exceeding necessary and moderate use pursuing, continuing, seeking new fulfillment and falling, endlessly.
what is significant is experienced in such a way that it suffices for itself, by itself and by its continuation. It assumes the role of endowing facticity with meaning. To be sure, the Abilipulcritidin, quae super animus est per quas pulcra trajecta in manus artificius as Plotinus, aprobandi majum, non autumn trahund utendi majum derive the manner of approval from that beauty which is above the soul through the beautiful things delivered by skilled hands Plotinus, but they do not draw from there the manner of using them. 183 When it is a matter of measuring the factical significance and the corresponding esteemability in one's own performance, a calling upon a superordinate meaning and value comes alive. But in this, the superordinate meaning itself is placed at the service of bustling activity. This increase is then merely a hidden calculation of the same sense of enactment after all, or it has not been radically and thoroughly clarified. The cultural philosophical extension and peak of this the idea of culture, the progress of culture, the rise of the human spirit, and whatever else these utopias name themselves. One is not content with mere enjoyment and connoisseurship, but at the same time one adds a great worldview theory, a however mythical deepening, in order to achieve an even greater expansion by calling upon this deepening. But the attitude toward that from which one derives the calling, and in which one grounds it, is an attitude in carne in the flesh also understood in the sense of comfort. In order not to be disturbed, one closes one's eyes before the possibility of such a self lysalbsalic relevant attitude. Sectators pulchritudinum exteriorum fortitudinum suam non ad te custodian team spargantum deliciosus lassitudines the followers of external beauty they do not guard their strength for you they dissipate their strength in exhausting delights. 184 They do not preserve the security and liveliness of the enactment of concern and of engagement for themselves in their relation to you, but they dissipate it and spend it easily in an amusing slackness and a delightful laziness. It is no longer at their disposal for an authentic decision. They fail while giving themselves in a communal world, a borrowed significance and posture as the enjoyers and connoisseurs of these things, pretending to be familiar and intimate with the meaning of the world and the secrets of life. Decisive is the how and the enactment of the direction of fortitudo strength. The self lyself slash competence the ability, the power, what is disposable of the possibilities of enactment of self lie existing. Istis pulchris gressum inecto I entangle my steps in beautiful things 185 everywhere and all the time, I entangle myself in these beautiful, alluring things as possible situations and possibilities of continuation, of enjoyment and activity factically force themselves upon life. These characteristics of what is experienced in the how of experiencing in Carney. Ego capior miserabili leader I am miserably captured, 186 I am being drawn into it miserably. Hario in ubiq sparsus in city eyes I become stuck in the snares laid everywhere 187 and thus lose the genuine and authentic orientation toward the lux vera, illa pulchritudo quisa spirit anima mea die ac nocte. Deus stacus meum true light, that beauty after which my soul sighs day and night, 188 my god and beauty. O lux quam vidibat tobias, cum clausus oculus istus filium das bat vidi vium, out quam vidibat Isaac, cum filios non aniascendo benedicere, said benedicendo aniascere meruido light which Tobit saw when, with his eyes closed, he taught his son the way of life or that light which Isaac saw blessing his sons without recognizing them, but in blessing them. Deserving to recognize them. 189 The benedicere blessing endows one with sight in the authentic sense. Ergo ad te invisibles oculos amantes. I lift up to you invisible eyes lovingly exclamation mark. 190 Ipsa est lux, una est, et unum omnes qui vidant et amantim. This is the light, it is one, and one are all those who see it and love it. 191 CF. In John Ev. Tract. I, number 18, 19. 14. The second form of tentatio concupiscentia oculorum. Desire of the eye. Chapter 35. A. Vitere in carne seeing in the flesh and vitere per carnem. Seeing through the flesh. Alia forma tentationis concupiscentia oculorum, curiositis supervacania cognoscendia different form of temptation the desire of the eye, the superfluous curiosity of knowing. 192 To what extent is there a different form of tentatio here? Does it concern one of the different manners of experience, discussed above, and to what extent is it different? Not only different in the way seeing is different from hearing, and hearing from tasting, but in another way. Factical life in what sense perspective? Since one is not clear about the sense of such divisions, as they plainly exist terminologically, and instead separates faculties and regions, one arrives at puzzles vexi or freg and sensuousness is a how of full experiencing. In all experiences curare concern. The basic tendency of delectatio utifruit light use enjoyment, a curare characterized in different ways, is co-present, 
Thus co-present is always a certain appetitus appetite, a striving for something formal otherwise ambiguous, dangerous. In the aforementioned possibilities of temptation, the appetitus is directed toward an obligatory entertaining being entertained by something to pass the time, dealing with the content of what becomes accessible at the moment through the senses themselves emotionally. A cupid eat is say a blicked and carny lust of entertainment in the flesh itself. The delectatio follows the how of the relational sense of sensuousness, a relational sense which remains in the content as such, and indeed in the manner of a thorough and savoring enjoyment, a being pulled in it and by it. In this, what is seen and heard has the sense content of seeing is that which is enjoyed. But now, there is periodum sensus through the same sense a different cupiditas lust non se ablect and carni, set experiendi per carnem not an entertainment in the flesh, but an experiencing through the flesh. 193 Sensuousness now has a different function per carnem through the flesh. This concerns sensuousness in such a way that it enters, according to its full sense, into the sense character of access and the performance of access only this is dominant now, and indeed in such a way that the access stands in the appetitus of experiendi experiencing. Hot concupiscentia est in appetite and this desires in the appetite of knowing, 194 of the experience that takes cognizance of, and gets to know, something. It is the appetite of looking about oneself not of dealing within the various regions and fields, what is going on there? Curiosities, curiosity is the greedy desire for the new noigir, cupiditas, nomine cognitionis et scienti pugliata the lust, hidden under the title of knowledge in science 195 Pali and probably Greek scholar and philosopher, assuming the cover of profundity and of the absolute cultural necessity of special achievements. The seeing and hearing that enjoys is the factical seeing and hearing is enjoyment, it is so natural that we do not even see it any longer or it is covered up and hidden in so far as one deceives oneself doubt seeing and hearing lend the content, the experienced significance, its basic articulation. Voluptus or cupiditas oblict antisect atra pulcra, canora, suavia, sapida, lenia pleasure or lust of entertainment pursues beautiful objects, sounds, smells, tastes, and tactile experiences. Curiositas or cupiditas experiendi sectatoratium his contrarian yashendi libidnanon ad subointem molestium curiosity or lust of experience even pursues the contraries of these pleasures out of lust for knowing not for the trouble they bring. 196 that is, for these the dealing with is not primarily in question. Even that which does not yield positive enlightenment to the worldly, factical enjoyment, even the opposite of that, is intended, because the intention is such that it renders the content of the what accessible in such a way that it cannot trouble it and keeps it at bay. But precisely in this, the intention looks at the content and only looks at it, and a letting oneself, be moved is possibly sought only on the basis of this keeping at bay. And what is crucial is not really the content but the relation, and indeed the mere enactment of the relation as such. Be the curious looking about oneself in the world. The dominant sense is the mere desire to see, the naked curiosity, in particular if the experience is enacted with emotional emphasis fear, terror, horror. The expressions of this basic disposition toward the objects are multiple cinema. Hincadium, si quidio dem perversi scientifine per art as magica squared or hence also, if with the same end of perverted science, the magical arts are used to inquire. 197 in this curiosity and a certain emphasis upon one possibility of experience, and in a certain enactment of it leads also the falling into, and the dealing with, magic, mysticism, and theosophy. Finis delectation is the end of delight is perverse society a perverse science which has already, from the beginning, given up any criticism about its own sense of enactment. Hincadium in ipsa religione de astenatur, cum signa et prodigia flagitander, non ad aliquam salutum, sed ad solum experientium desiderata hence also in religion itself God is tempted by demands for signs and wonders, not desired for any saving end, but only for the sake of experience. 198 God has to endure becoming a factor in human experiments. He has to respond to an inquisitive, pompous, and pseudo-prophetic curiosity, that is, a curious looking about oneself in regard to him, which does not submit fully to his sense of objecthood, that is, which is nonsense unfug. Why is this concupiscentia understood and designated as concupiscentia oculorum? Oculi autum sunt ad cognoscendum in sensibus principes, ad oculus enum propria vitere pertinent for knowing the eyes are the principal senses, for to see pertains properly to the eyes. 199 In so far as sensuousness involves a cognizing sense of achievement, seeing has to be accorded first place among its different ways. Utimorautum hoc verbo etium in cetera sensibus, comios ad cognoscendum intendimus yet we also apply this word to other senses, when we use them toward knowing, 
200 When we give to sensuousness the full sense direction and sense function of knowledge, which it does not have without further ado, or always and primarily as such. Come aliquid cognitionize explorant when they explore other knowledge. 201 When the senses are supposed to explore and render accessible something on the order of knowledge, an object of knowledge as such, then we call its relational senchant accordingly the full sense he seeing. For kaiteri senses videndi officium sibi usurpant usurp, accord themselves, in quo officio videndi primatum oculi tenant the other senses usurp unto themselves accord the himself as the faculty of seeing in which faculty of seeing thys hold first place.202,203 to see means to first give an object as object. If we want to ascertain something in the manner of cognition, if we want to refer to something as present at hand as existing and in the manner of its existing in the regions of what becomes accessible through the senses in their manner of the relational sense which is no manner of experiere experiencing nequa enum dissimus, out equid rutlet out, alfa quam nitit out, gusta quam splendit out, palpa quam fulgit for we do not say, Hear how red it is or smell how bright that is or taste how that shines or feel how that gleams.204 Here the determinations are referred to lux light, for lux is that which is seen, what is objective qua what is merely objective. Widere enum di contra hic omnia for all these are said to be seen. 205 That is, what becomes accessible in seeing and a seeing not concretely emphasized, is never, in regard to the cognizing, relational manner of grasping, designated other than as seeing. The other relational senses are not functionalized for the achievement of access, but, inversely, seeing has the meaning of rendering accessible what is objective, in the emphasized sense of the mere taking cognizance of. By contrast, we say vidi quid sonnet vidi quid oliat vidi quid sapiat vidi quam durum sit see what it sounds like, see what it smells like, see what it tastes like, see how hard it is.206 Here we are dealing with a manifold of what is not really visible, that is, of what is objective as such deji gen stand like an als sulkin, but it becomes objective only in the seeing it receives its relational or content modification in the seeing, in the co-enactment. According to its meaning, the seeing is only looking at, considering, bringing to one's cognizing givenness, letting something become an object for oneself as the object of mere taking cognizance of. Generalis experientia sensu in the general experience of the senses, 207 the cognizing experience in sensuousness in general seeing. Seeing has the primacy in officio videndi or cognoscendi the faculty of seeing or knowing. Thus, wherever the concrete factical experiencing is according to its sense, and where it intends an emphasized taking cognizance of which in turn has different purposes, the delectatio videndi delight of seeing, which can be a concupiscentia, is alive. To what extent? The relational senses such as self-willed, and the full sense of vitre is then self-willed and primary it determines all factical experiences, including the decisive and the final ones. The self-willed relational sense goes beyond the imminent, self lie act mental interpretation selb slish vols ugs interpretation of its existential relevance. The relational sense does not only not care about it, but itself directs all life. Now, with Augustine the self-willing toward what and away from what? This form of temptation is form of temptation contains multiplicious periculosa multiple dangers. Quando o deo disere nulla retail I me intentum fieri ad spectandum, et bona cura capiendum? When? Dare I say that nothing of the sort provokes me to go and look at it, and that I am not caught by a vain concern question mark 208 and curiosity, in this relational direction, everything is in principle accessible, without restraint. Com enim hujusimoti rerum concept aculum fit cor nostrum, et portet copiosi vanitatis catervis when our heart becomes the receptacle of such things, and carries a plethora of vanities 209 caves, hideaways for the reception and carrying within oneself of godless vanities.210 one principal way and one existing opportunity, of dispersion. In life, intercourse of the human being with God what does not happen here? Interjections of curiosity are interspersed throughout factical experience. 15. The third form of tendatio ambitio seculi secular ambition chapters 36-38. AA comparison of the first two forms of temptation. Tertium tentationis genus sesavit ami, out cesarin hoc tota vita potest? The third kind of temptation has not ceased for me. Or can it cease in this whole life question mark 211 the experiential relations that determine the situation are, in the first two forms of tentatio, the following one. The dealing with that enjoys two. The curious looking about oneself that only wishes to get to know. These experiential relations aim at something that has to do essentially with the surrounding world, and not with the self self slishes. For even where, in one as well as in two. Something communal worldly myth wealth like as these or other human beings in this or other situations is the object of dealing with, or primarily the object of looking about oneself, 
of the curious wanting to get to know, being allowed to be familiar with, knowing about it, even here the stealing with and looking about oneself remain in an essentially surrounding worldly character of the object's significance that is precisely what is characteristic of their corresponding experiential relations. And this so objectively, that they precisely accomplish and enable the absorption. All communal worldly relations that turn up are taken into the determining experiential relation of the dealing with or looking about. In regard to the how of the self-worldly or even self-lie being among Dabe Sane, this means that the self qua self does not articulate itself and act mentally in the experiential enactment. 212 and 1, the self is absorbed in dealing with or in that with which it deals absorption of phenomenon of its own. In 2, the self, admittedly, is not absorbed, but it does not come to itself just the same. What is peculiar to the phenomenon is here precisely that it is neither an absorption, as in one, nor a having oneself, such that it basically is not there. 213 The Dasein, the self, the being real of life, is an absorption. The self is being lived by the world, and all the more strongly so if it in fact thinks that it lives authentically in such existence Dasein. This being lived is a special how of facticity, and can only be explicated on the basis of the authentic sense of existence vom eigentlichen existence in her. In the third form of tentatio, the self articulates itself and act mentally in a certain way, insofar as this form explicitly revolves around the self itself. The self is supposed to be taken as important in an authentic sense it is with it to buy, that is, the self-significance becomes finis delectation is the end of delight. 214 at issue is the self-validation in factical experiencing, that is, in the communal worldly contexts of life but finally also in the self-worldly contexts. The relation to the world is, here, the communal worldly one, the self-like worldly one in general. B.T. Maryville wishing to be feared and Amarivel wishing to be loved. Augustine begins the consideration with the de Marietta Marivel ab hominibus wishing to be feared and loved by men. 215 further, he calls the humana lingua human language the quotidiana fornax nostra horum tentation numer daily furnace the tempting hour. 216 These two determinations clearly refer to the communal worldly context of experience. The curare of this experiencing is at work just in gaining a certain position for the one who experiences in relation to the communal world. It is a vel wanting, striving for, consciously organizing one's life such that one is feared or loved by others. One's own world world phenomenologically that in which I live a thought is, the world of one's own acting and achieving, the self world not the self in its authentic sense pushes itself into the foreground it emphasizes itself. In this veil, experience views itself in the eyes, the claims, judgments, tastes, or inabilities, fickleness, and stupidity of others. In the Timarietta Mari veil, the self world puts on airs in a communal worldly situation it views in a special way. It is about the being in communal worldly validity. In the Timari Vel, one views oneself as the superior one, and makes an effort at such communal worldly assertion. In the Amari Vel, one takes oneself to stand out as the valuable one who deserves the esteem of others. Both Vel can be the expression of a certain inner vehemence of existence, but they are just as much, and mostly, motivated by cowardly weakness and insecurity, the dependence upon models, a need of being allowed to go along, or by the concealing prevention, and pushing away, of confrontation. In giving into this tentatio, the self is lost for itself in its own most way. Correspondingly, here is the gaining and finding, the possibility of knowing oneself and getting clear about oneself. The characterization of language more precisely, of speaking, of communicating oneself and hearing, as the source of this form of tentatio leads the communal worldly context of experience back to the decisive manner of the enactment of communal worldly experiencing. At the same time, this indicates how particularly great according to their own sense, the possibilities of, hiding oneself, of play-acting, etc., are in this manner of enactment. Augustine calls a misera vita, a miserable life, and a foid i actantia, a shameful arrogance, a life in which these communal worldly contexts of experience are thoroughly dominated by such a curare.217. Now, as with the other forms of temptation, the direction of possibilities of temptation the communal worldly direction, and indeed this particular one that is about loving and fearing, or about being loved and being feared is here co-present in the facticity of Dasein.218 according to its sense, it is the being adjusted of the experiential relations to the significances of what can be experienced in the communal world propter quatrum humanis societatis officianis asarium est et de mariab hominibus because certain offices in human society make it necessary to be loved and feared by people.219 thus we have encountered a new mode of the sense motivation of the molestia trouble and facticity. Necessarium, the sense of facticity always? 
present in factical life inescapably, that is, the seriousness of existence must necessarily, from its own full possibility of enactment, be directed toward being concerned with it. A direction of concern, and indeed a direction co-given with the experience of world. Let us briefly consider together the different senses of molestia that belong to, and really determine, the forms of tentatio.220 the self lie dasein, the existence, bears in different ways a molestia, is attached to it, and thus determines itself in its facticity. The being attached of self lie dasein to a molestia is an object-like characterization. For the radical conception of the phenomenal complexes encountered here, it is decisive to deal with the problem sensibly sinma squared from the beginning. For reasons that will not be investigated further here, Augustine did not approach the problem in this way, even if precisely the problem of tentatio yields valuable indications, if one has seen the problem. The molestia is not a piece of objective region of being, present in some sense of the theoretical objectification of natura but designates a how of experiencing. And precisely as such a how, it characterizes the how of factical experiencing, insofar as we now consider it in aligning it to our special task, at least from different perspectives, that is, from the full sense of facticity that which is full of sense. How we can experience it ourselves in today's situation is not determined by this. What is perhaps missing in the explicit articulation of the problem is precisely the authentic determination of sense, the historical. The modes of factical experiencing indicated in the different senses of molestia are not an ordering juxtaposition. Rather, their formal relation is itself, in turn, only a how of experiencing and articulating of facticity, the expression and enactment of facticity. Now, we only want to indicate, by taking them, together, the explicative directions of the phenomenon of facticity, under the following qualifications one inch limiting ourselves to what we find in Augustine II above all, with the qualification that we do not discuss the problem of the starting point of the explication, a problem which represents an essential part of the explication, and which precisely co-expresses the peculiar sense of facticity and three the problem of the connection between these modes of factical experiencing and the authentic original sense and final sense of enactment of a facticity, a factical existence. With these three qualifications we at the same time indicate three fields of investigation of facticity and the problematic of existence. The house of one's own self-life full being. Factical life occurrence, being present, existence dasein. Situation or care of the situation these are also with the others being among dab a sane, existing neither strata nor levels to be articulated in no particular order at all. The difficulty lies in the otherness of genuine articulation, and in a phenomenologically radical uncovering of the problem complex but therein also lies the decisive sense which can only be interpreted enactment historically in each case. Insofar as this problem finds its origin of sense in existence which is itself enactment historical, Factical explicates of sense to be uncovered in this problem are existential existence alien, that is, categories formally viewed, and indeed enactment historically hermeneutic categories, not attitudinal categories of order. Formal sense of category each of the house above set apart attitudinally, and consider genuinely in its material results in its own field of objectities objectitatin of different sense is important for the construction alf bow of the objective historical objectity. See a more laudies love appraise. The desire to validate oneself is motivated, and maintained in its enactment, by a certain self-importance selbst which tinam abamore laudis, qui ad privatam quam dam excellentium contrahatum indicate a suffragia from the love of praise which collects the votes it begged for to advance a certain private excellency.221,222 and this self-importance has its effects in worldly experiences the bustling activity Corrado gain praise not only an esteem of value, but a certain explicit declaration of value before others or for oneself. Thus an explicit placing in validity and bringing into validity within the communal world and within factical achievement and ability. That explains the preponderance of laudare to praise, laudare to be praised, and laudatia praise in the following considerations. This bustling activity for the sake of praise, for a communal worldly standing of validity, is a cura concern for being liked or being pleasing to fallen. That is, those who extend liking toward us, those who maintain us in our experience in their own communal world, themselves now become important. Divitiae riches, significance is vero quae ob hoc expectanture, ad ambition I servient is for riches which are sought for this, that they may serve ambitions. 223 Homo moved or laudibus humanus human beings are moved by human praise, that is, the real source of motivation for one's own life concentrates itself fully on one's standing of validity in the communal world. 
the special complex of achievement of life receives its direction from the effort at attaining concrete possibilities of setting oneself up in validation and maintaining oneself therein. Here, Tunli in a more hidden and more dangerous manner, own is praised instead of praising oneself, but precisely one's own life is viewed in this as if it were eminently important and deserved for its own achievement. Giving into temptation is now explicated in an axiologizing manner as a shifting of the direction of placer liking, being pleased. Foida I act ancha shameful arrogance. Hink fit vel maxim non amarite, nec cast time ir te hence especially it comes that men do not love you nor fear you in purity. 224 Love of God, fear. God himself is not taken to be decisively important anymore. The amplius placet what is more pleasing has become different. Shifting the cure from its direction towards summum bonum the highest good amor maximus the greatest love and timor cast as pure fear are not enacted. Et averitate tua gaudium nostrum deep bonimus, at qui in hominum fallacia bonimus and we give up our joy in your truth, and place it in the deceitfulness of human beings. 225 Important for the correct grasp of the veritas de truth of God. Deponier shifting the direction of cura, or the esteem and the positing of the finis end, and ponier moving it toward the opinions of human beings, making an effort in regard to how they think of us, how, and as what, we are held in validation by them settling oneself there with one's aspirations of factical life. Libit knows Amari et de Mary, non propter se, said prote it becomes our pleasure to be loved and feared not for your sake, but instead of you.226 we find it more pleasing, and like it more, and prefer to be loved and esteemed instead of you, in your place. You are pushed back and set aside. Not for your sake, so that every bonum good in us is really and only esteemed and praised as bonum to your good. In all of this instant adversarious very beatitude and eyes nostri the adversary of our true happiness threatens us. 227 with the possibility of a false beatitude or false happiness the tendatio always revolves around this. D the genuine direction of placer. What, now, is the connection between this preferring and setting aside, and the law d'ari as the manner considered here of the really existing existential being and communal worldly validity? Peccator homo. Non laudator and desideris animae suae, laudator homo propter aliquad donum quad de diste no sinner human. Is praised for the desires of his soul a human being is praised, for some gift which you gave him. 228 Thus, insofar as a human being is praised at all, and is seen and declared as important and valuable, this happens neither on the basis of, nor with regard to, his own most concerns and resolutions. He has nothing which he could ever bring forth as deserving of praise, and if he does have it, he has received at the donum, gift, endowment. The significance in relation to oneself, of which one can dispose, is a donum de gift of God. 229 A special enactment of experience, cannot be viewed merely objectively. Thus it comes about that before God, it is rather that Melior est il qui laudavit, quam iste qui laudatus est better is he who praised, than he who is praised. 230 For Ili Ki Law David Plaket and Homin Donum De He who praised is pleased by God's gift to the human being. 231 He has the genuine direction of the placer, the genuine mode of preferring he performs the praising and view of the donum as the donum deadhat is, he really refers the law dari to God, the summum bonum. By contrast, Huic Ki Laudatus Est Amplius Plaket Donum Hominus Quam De the other who is praised is better pleased with the gift of human beings than of God. 232 The donum hominus gift of human beings is the law dare. The law datio itself is stemming from human beings. Augustine interprets this more closely at il plus go de sibi la darse, quam ipsum donum habere unde laudatur, but he finds more joy in being praised than in having that gift for which he is praised. 233 Finding joy in being praised as such as a taking oneself to be important, and in the context of tentatio, it is a falling, since the human being, according to its significance, is a nothingness before God. Life in the communal world had is. Herein the possibility of being praised contains in itself the danger of an unexpected taking oneself to be important. Finding joy in the donum is the highest duty and by no means convenient. How, then, does Augustine himself stand in relation to this tentatio? What does he have to confess? Quid, nice ideal actari me laudibus? What, but that I am delighted with praise? 234 I am open to it, I find joy in it. But Hempelius ip severitate quam laudibus with the truth more than with the praise. 235 Video quid ligum, I see, I am clear about, what I choose and prefer if I have the choice utra malim forens passionate, having let go, unbridled, releasing the voluptates pleasures, out an omnibus rebus erots, ab omnibus hominibus laudari and constance keeping to oneself, secure, et in veritate certissimus, ab omnibus vituperari of being praised by all human beings, though wrong and mad passionate, having let go unbridled, 
releasing the pleasures, or erring in everything or of being reproached by all, those steadfast keeping to oneself, secure on most certain and having the truth. 236 Veritas Truth 1 Security, Steadfastness 2 Absolute Validity Existing in Itself, Directly a Being Both, Things Do Not Have to Go Together 3 Priority of the Foundation. In Veritate Certissimus Constant Steadfast in Most Certain Truth is a Bonum Good. Viram tamen nalam ut vel augure mihi gaudium cujus libet boni me suffragatio or saliani yet I truly do not want the vote born of another to increase my joy for whatever is good in me, 237 that is, I see the full value of truth, and that this bonum is a donum day, and that it does not need help from applause, privilege, and admiration from others. And I do not want it, because this laudatio does not increase the gaudium joy, but only deforms it. Viram tamen nalam, said Augit. Fadir I truly do not want it, but, I admit, it increases, and yet, I have to admit, at the heart of it I do enjoy it more, that is, I let myself be drawn away from genuine, concerned joy. The vituperatio reproach is a sign for my not being able to maintain myself in the pure enactment of joy, in its genuine sense. Vituperatio wheat reproach diminishes it, 238 assails my joy, that is, attending to the reproach, taking it and thus myself, the one in question will be important. I experience a diminishing of the joy, which would not be possible if I lived in the pure enactment of this joy. The reproach, after all, makes me stagger, and makes me look to others. I do not keep purely to the genuine joy as to miserium ma perturba this my misery disturbs me, 239 and so I am confused. I am no longer sure of myself and fall into the communal world. Sub entrat me he excusatio excuses enter me subliminally, 240 and an excuse sneaks its way into me then, and pushes itself in. I seek to rescue and justify myself by saying that it is not really my fault that I am falling human beings simply are like that, it is nature and things like that. Qua qualis sit, tu says, deus nam me incertum facet how good the excuse is, you know, God for it makes me uncertain. 241. So what is the authentic conduct in the communal worldly life context, in what is experienced, in being praised? One ought not to see oneself as the one who is praised, but as the one who praises, and indeed how one praises. To rejoice in one's genuine ability to praise then, that he is so far along as to see, value, and thus validate, a genuine donum dea gift of God in this joy I am myself co-concerned only for the bonum good is such to perfect to delectare or demolo in the vituperatio contristari to take delight in progress or to be saddened by the failure in the reproach. In this tentatio, the direction of overcoming is precisely a genuine giving oneself over to the communal world but a giving enacted from the clear position of one's own and the facticity of one's own life such giving can never be proven and even the most radicomere giving over to the objective in every sense. In the continentia continence which, in the experience of tentatio, represents the mode and direction of the overcoming and the halting of the fall we do not only find the cohibibiram ramaboliqua refraining from love of things. Rather, what is also demanded is the iustitia justice, the collatio, positi or amoris quo bringing together, positioning of love toward, Love's bringing toward, leading toward, and genuine direction of concern. Iustitia is the authentically and originally sense-like directedness piety cf. Luther's understanding of Iustitia, in its entirety, of the factical experience of significance. This original sense of enactment and of existence of Iustitia has to be separated even more and entirely from the axiologization. The how of the enactment of the endurance of tentatio. It is a certain and competition between two directions of loving. The direction of pleasing points toward the communal world before it itself, a taking oneself to be important is enacted in regard to a bonum which one supposedly is and has in oneself. Now, this bliss here least pleasing others may be lacking, and also such a communal worldly validation of oneself may even be repressed and explicitly kept at bay. Toward the outside, in the communal world, overcoming a more laudy's love of praise but it can have settled itself all the more tenaciously, primarily determining one's own existence again day seen in the sense thereof. 16. Self-importance. Chapter 39. Etiam yet in decestale ud in iodem hinere tentationis malum, quo inanus con qui placent sibi de se yet, within us is another evil, in the same kind of temptation by which those who please themselves and themselves become vain. 242 In this kind of temptation, there is the possibility of a falling which is such that the self and with it, the design of the individual in general becomes vain and dissipates into the void and into nothingness. Sibi placents pleasing oneself validating oneself to oneself, taking oneself to be important to oneself, ascribing a bonum good to oneself the gaudium delectatia joy delight is directed toward the self-world in making an effort at beata vita the happy life, 
the self-world is taken to be important. Here, the enactment of experience is such that always in the concrete form of an enacted past of one's own one's own self-world that is, the sphere of one's action, one's occupation, the possibilities and abilities of accomplishment is presented to oneself this is already in itself a mode of self-importancy in order to explicitly take oneself to be important in one's presented self-world. In this, a number of different possibilities result, possibilities which in themselves always indicate a certain mode of one's own design, insofar as these modes are seized as, in each case, the decisive how of the enactment of experience. Different possibilities as different modes of the god you're rejoicing to oneself pleasing oneself, thus taking oneself as important, thus rejoicing in a bonum or a quasi bonum. 1. De non bonus quasi bonus and not good things, as if they were good 243 thus one takes as important what one has done, what one does but what cannot really be seen as a genuine good. Not only does one take goods, especially self-lie directed ones, as important, but one advances the tendency of this self-importance to the point at which one, first of all, marks a non-good a good. One is conceited build at Zichet was ein. With the bonum, of course, we are always dealing here with a bonum as the endowment of the self qua self, thus not with, for instance, the disposing and possessing of worldly objective goods which the self also has. Existence. Self is this singular self which I myself am, and not according to the general what of objective properties is such an object, but the how of am. 2. Vera medium de bonus tuis quasi sus but also taking your goods as if they were one's own. 244 or now even if genuine insight into the character of the good exists, and if a genuine good belongs to the self being good authentic existing. Which, as such, can only be from God it is, to oneself, taken as self-appropriated, as having been given to the self by itself day seen existence, having elevated oneself to this position and this level of existence. 3. Out idiom secut to two ease, said tanquam ex meriti sus or as if your goods, but is given to oneself for one's own merits 245 even if this self-importance is given up to the extent that the good existence is recognized as not appropriated by oneself, as not created and worked for by the self, one's own self is still taken as important. For the self is, and takes itself for, such a self that has elevated itself to the position, not in order to give itself the good, but to be worthy of the gift, and somehow to deserve the bonum and its ascription to oneself. 4. Out idiom secu text to agratia, non tamen socialiter godens, said elise in vidente ca or as if from your grace, and yet not rejoicing in it socially, but grudging it to others 246 but even if the self does not ascribe the desert to itself, and confesses to possess the good without deserving i text gratia from grace the gaudium bony joy of the good may be such that the self finds joy not in sharing it with others, in co-rejoicing with others about oneself in which case the self has had, as it were, objectively, separated from having itself but in having this undeserved good enviously for oneself, keeping it locked up and not wishing it for others. Concetein Bildung, Superbia, Amor Sui, Peccatum Pride, Self-Love, Sin. In the end, the self-world becomes a communal world, as in one and two, self-absorption in world, likewise of the communal world in world, possible connections of enactment among one, two, three. We are dealing with phenomena which the axiologization in its most exaggerated form, precisely overlooks, although here they are still grasped mostly in an axiologizing manner. The direction of the placer and the gaudium is moved into the self, but precisely in such a way that the self world here becomes the still dominant communal world. Precisely in this worldly positioning holding before oneself or halt self is lost. The meaning of the authentic fall from the self is losing or never gaining and, on the other hand, precisely the overcoming of the tentatio can lead to insight and self revelation. For what is overcoming? A genuine enacting or understanding of enactment. Explicatively tendatio is an existential complex of expression. It is a peculiarity of these four modes of self-importance that a genuine appreciation of the bonum is indeed enacted more and more the bonum not only as such, but in its whence and how and why of being given as a gift but that the self always sees itself before itself, positing vorzets its own self-world to itself, and taking it to be decisively important even if only in such a way that it is the one in which and before which grace realizes itself. But this means that it is precisely in that mode in which the self no longer attributes any achievements to itself, that everything is released in rejoicing before God. For, ultimately and first of all, the concern leaps off precisely here in a self-importance, and indeed in such a way that the enactment of concern becomes novel a positing of this in itself genuine experience or existence to one's own self-world. Indeed, 
this occurs in such a way that through this hidden movement everything falls into the void, in an s it becomes vain or void, and everything is invalidated in regard to the summum bonum before God. In the last and most decisive and purest concern for oneself lurks the possibility of the most groundless dive of Grundigst and Sturzes, and of authentically losing oneself. Groundless, because the dive has no longer any hold, and it cannot be enacted before anything, so that one could finally turn it into a secular importance after all. Here lies what is really satanic and temptation. There is no alien control here, no assistance, and the falling itself is something which could be turned into a big thing. The self concern appears easy and convenient, interesting and superior as egoism, at the same time destructive of the general good, a dangerous individualism. Really, self concern is precisely the most difficult, taking oneself to be less and less important by engaging oneself all the more positing to oneself precisely an objectivity in the face of which that of the generality is mere playfulness, a convenient getting done of the things themselves and of the beings in their connections. Augustine clearly sees the difficulty and the ultimately anxiety-producing character of Dasein in such having of oneself in full facticity. In his omnibus at qui hujus modi periculus et laboribus vitus tremorib cordis me et vulnera me amagus sub inditesonari, quam mihi non inflige sentio in all these and other similar perils and toils, you see the trembling of my heart and I often feel my wounds to be healed by you, rather, than inflicted upon me.247. 17. Molestia trouble te facticity of life. A. The how of the being of life. Without indicating explicitly the interpretory methodical context, and without pointing out explicitly how the object is determined more closely in principle according to its how, we now want to pre-delineate the direction of interpretation with regard to the phenomenal connections indicated by molestia and exploratio. The interpretation as a whole runs in such a way that it now takes the return route, and indeed in such a way that the explication becomes visibly more original. Tota vi tatentatio the whole life temptation 248 non ut ipse disket, set ut quad in homine latete period for the human being itself, having oneself we do not learn for ourselves, but so that what hides in humans becomes apparent for the human being itself, having oneself. 249 intenitione apparent, qualis sit homo in temptation appears what kind of a human being one is. 250 nesit se homo, nice i intenitione disket say you do not know a human being unless you have gotten to know him in temptation. 251. Molestia burden of life, something which pulls life down and what is peculiar to the burden lies precisely in the fact that molestia can pull down. In this, the kin is formed by the enactment that belongs to each experience itself. Thus this possibility grows the more life lives this possibility grows, the more life comes to itself. These two determinations belong together not only in so far as a certain how of the being of life has been posited here from which talk of molestia is meaningful at all in the end, a radical self-concern before God leading to the objects in strictly phenomenological explication. Thus, a certain how of the being of life what it means here life, my life is gives direction to the complexes of sense. But the two determinations belong together more concretely in this way the belonging together of esse, nos, amari to be, to know, to love the real pre-structuring prostriction, pre-forming basic experiences precisely what is decisive. Worldly objectivity as such, also already significance, also nos to know as such, likewise amare to love all three of theme as self-willed constitute the possibilities of tentatio. But they also constitute, at the same time, the world as that in which I live in this or that way at all. 1. The the more life lives means the more fully the directions of experience of facticity are enacted. In the first instance, this does not so much concern the fullness of what is experienced, but the directions of experience as such the surrounding worldly, communal worldly, and self-worldly directions the more these as such are full that is, the more they surrender to themselves their complex of enactment, or the complex of enactment proper to their facticity, the more the full sense is explained historically factically. This means the more the curare engages itself in every direction and pulls alongside itself the others according to their sense of experience in the respective engagement. This more isolates it seems to be an objective quantification, but not in the genuine connection with two. This pre-separation belonging together is no objective belonging together, but an enactment like, historical one, and it can horizon, passage of time in the most radical sense, the happening of enactment which has to form itself, and especially itself, and which is only in the enactmental self-formation. 2. The the more life comes to itself is the second determination and indicates that the being of life somehow also consists in the fact that it has had the more life experiences that it is itself, its being, that is at stake in its full self-enactment. The categorial sense structure of this being is the problem for which the executed interpretation should provide a certain cultural historical, 
Phenomenal situation. Regarding the concept of life, cf. The Critique of Jaspers in the Lecture Phenomenology of Intuition and of Expression. 252. Now the life in which something like molestia can be experienced at all, in which is the life growing in itself, coming to itself the possibilities of molestia grow, is a life whose being is grounded in a radical having of oneself. It is a having of oneself that takes effect only in enactment, and fully only in its historical facticity. B. Molestia the endangerment of having of oneself. In this tendency toward a radical factical historical having of oneself and its specific self-clarity, the concrete worldly experiential complex of enactment first of all becomes fully visible cf. Tentatio. The directions of experience as directions of experience, their possibilities as possibilities of this factical experience in its own enactment, and that means the sense of molestia, are determined by the authentic how of life itself. Insofar as molestia is experienced in its own sense, it is not something like an objective equipment of human being, an objective quality in an existing something, which one should cut off and throw away. All Greek pagan ascesis views human beings like this, and so does every Christian ascesis which remains entangled in Greek antiquity, according to the cultural historical situations. Molestia a how of experiencing, a burden to, and an endangering of, having of oneself in full facticity. This having of oneself is, as factical, such that it enacts this endangering itself and forms its zishine build it. In the concrete and genuine enactment of experience, it gives itself the possibility of falling, but in its own most radical self-concern, it gives itself at the same time the full, concrete, factical opportunity to arrive at the being of its own most life. Thus, what is decisive is the factical having of oneself in forming out us build and in forming I and build and of the possibility as the opportunity to pass the test of tentatio, and of the enactment, grasping the authentic direction of concern of one's own factical Dasein. Thus, molestia determines itself according to the how of having oneself in the how of the factical enactment of experience. How life has itself, how it can have itself, historically factically. 1. Having of oneself enacted, intended in that of life is the concern for the being of itself. The self is crucial, it is important. Hidden in this thus lies the self-importance. Molestia goes along. In self-concern. The self forms in the how of its own most being radical possibility of falling, but at the same time the opportunity to win itself. Thus, our life must somehow concern Ange and us ourselves. For having, having in life. The how of being, being of facticity. Quiestionum fieri sibi I have made a question of myself. For question, a questioning oneself that does not stand out. 2. Propter qui dem humane societatis officia necessarium est mari et de mari ab hominibus because certain offices in human society make it necessary to be loved and feared by people. 253 Thus, the communal worldly enactment of experience, the co experiencing in and for the communal world, aims in itself at a certain standing and validity. As such, it in turn carries with itself, and forms, the molestia, the possibility of the communal worldly desire to be validated. 3. Factical experiencing, the worldly one, a mode of taking cognizance of, a looking about oneself, the formation of the possibility of the self-willed mere looking about oneself precisely in the seriousness of the radical effort at confronting and desiring to know the world. The how of having of oneself. Subjectivism, relativism are very mistaken categories. They argue from a position that does not even see the phenomena about which it speaks. These hows are there, not objectively like things, but historically they're an historical enactment of the object cultural historically, in historical enactment. 4. Factical experiencing, dealing with, use, enjoyment, care for daily life, reficier ruinum to restore the decay, procreation, preservation. In the radical effort lurks the bustling activity. The forgiving of phenomena phenomen vergabe is always a factical interpretation motivated in enactment. The question is not such that we orient ourselves toward a how that accidentally came to stand out and is formed out in itself. Rather, it is asked which can ground it in the facticity of a genuine enactment of a possible cultural history as present for us factically and historically. The can comprises in itself the objectity and objectity rooted in something altogether different off the existential in the direction of its own most sense. What am I? Quaestio mihi factus sum. Quid amo? I have become a question to myself. What do I love? Questionable in the experiential directions, in experiencing and having myself. Life a how of having and indeed an experiencing of tentationes. It is a tentatio, it forms the possibility of losing and of winning oneself. Life a how of a being of a determinate structure and categorial expression. The having oneself of life, having oneself, 
exploratio, quaestio mihi factus sum, what and how I am. Dependence of the possibility of explication upon the historical, cultural historical, and enactment historical level and for conception of interpretation. The having and for having that does not stand out, in the factical experience of life, in a certain historically objective, factical situation and possibility. Life finds itself in such a way, without it being necessary that the historical how and where and whither of its own facticity is also found as already explicitly standing out and demarcated. The complex of motifs of the standing out of life's having of oneself against the factical experience of life. We are by no means close to the self yet. In a radical sense, it is not really necessary that it ever comes to that. This standing out in the articulation of the four conception, the determinateness of the four conceptions and the changing four conception from the surrounding world and the communal world not standing out. The breakthrough of the historical and the first self aspect of life that stands out. Appendix I Notes and Sketches for the Lecture Course Augustine, Confessions Confitari, Interpretari On 7b Interpretation as a determinally characterized interpretation of oneself, in such a way that that in front of which one becomes familiar to oneself is not only the empty in front of, but leads the authentic interpreting, making it precisely something special. Special that means here. Concretely naming possible stages of the interpretation's informal indication. Then showing how the confitary confessing is motivated in its basic starting point quaestio mihi factus sum I have become a question to. Grasping the theological philosophical writings sermonis, epistolae sermons, letters, polemical pieces, and so forth from this viewpoint as what has been interpreted determinately in communal worldly complexes of experience and in the surrounding worldly state of knowledge. To what extent a new lead book dissenters the theological concepts, to what extent this tendency succumbs not only to the church, but to Greek antiquity. On the destruction of confessions X. On 7b. Memoria not radically, existentially, as enactment, but Greek, falling in regard to the content, not how it was with him and how it is in A was, but separately, what is present in itself, that truth has its standing B stand unchanged, toward which he then throws himself away and into which he orders himself. But in this, always radically existential movements. Enactmental complex of the question. On 8b. How the self wins its existence, and in what existence consists, already through the searching placing oneself somehow before God or Vita Bay out of the happy life. In searching, it places itself in the absolute distance, and tries to win the distance. Explicated phenomenologically? The criterion for the self is always that directly before which it is a self but that in turn is the definition of criterion. 1. The greater the conception of God, the more self there is the more self, the greater the conception of God. 2. Tentatio temptation. On 12a. The tentatio is no event, but an existential sense of enactment, a how of experiencing. What is it about? The sense in which experiencing is encountered. Not such that it is present self-sufficiently, significantly, not an absorption, but that a possibility is experienced, that significance refers, in terms of content, toward something else, cf. Conflict. Experiencing possibility, living in the open, keeping open, opening authentically. Prestruction prestruction intentionally. The how of the breaking apart of tentatio. Authentically forming. For whom is it truly present in the enactmental renewal? For those who radically become questions to themselves. An opening in relation to oneself. Possibility is the true burden. Difficult. Vita equals tentatio life equals temptation. Experiencing tentatio passing, falling does not simply happen, but is experienced. What I do with it. Whether I appropriate it in such a way that it opens up only possibilities? The falling, the ability to fall and the future of falling, increase the anxiety and reveal disco I learn. In this context, how is Augustine's classification and sequence of stages to be explicated? Increase? Of possibilities, of burden phenomenon of the transistus transition. In how far? Insofar as solid reality disappears and freedom in terms of content becomes more one's own. That is, the modes of tentatio in which it becomes accessible. Experiencing possibility, which means viewing oneself fully in enactment and misery, that it is stronger, and that existing means to live radically in possibility, and also objectively being left open to hingestelt sein. Receiving existence. Significances of the surrounding world, communal world, self-world limits of life negligible in the face of anxiety, of possibility. I being honest in the face of possibility. Two. Administering, in an orderly manner, the discoveries of honesty. 
Wonder I me he some I am a burden to myself. On 12 a. Colon hasero tbx omni me at viva erit vitum a when I will have adhered to you with my whole self and my life shall be truly alive. 3 My life is authentic life, I exist. When I adhere to you, with the last part of myself, when I put everything radically onto you that a erit tota plena te my entire life will be full of you all relations of life, the whole facticity permeated by you, enacted in such a way that all enactment is enacted before you. Since that is not the case, one or I me he sum, for I am a burden to myself fall back, non sublev is not lifted up. I fall away from there and am unable to authentically search. How this is connected to what came before. The burden lies in the strife wider street in which I live, contendant in strife ladies yaf lendame orsli tondi regrettable joys joyful sorrows. Five do I not live in joys about which I should weep, and sorrows about which I should rejoice there at strife. Six at ex quay party stead victoria nescio and on which side is the victory, I do not know. Seven. Contendant may roars may molly cum gaudiis bonus my sorrows over my evil and my good joys are in strife with one another. Eight sinful sorrow, despair optimistic joy. Nine vulner and obscondo I do not hide the wounds being torn apart. Numquid non tendatio est vita humanese nullo interstitia? Is not human life all temptation without intermission? Finding oneself between these possibilities that impose themselves, and over which one does not reign. The comfortable ones do not see this rather. One is the replacement of the other they let themselves be born in an unemphasized lightheartedness and tepidness. But those who experience it seek to fix the end, to gain a stand. Certamen and multidifluxum a strife scattered into the many. Hopeless. Thus, I ubs continentium. Totus pes me and non nice I in magna valde continentia tua you command continents. All my hope is nowhere but in your very great continents. Ten. Out of the dispersion. And this dispersion is founded in like manner in the basic tendency of chimere fearing and desiderare desiring. Both lie in the concern for the secular and that is one's own era or defluere rushing into being scattered gliding down, sinking down, in the sense of slackening. In the defluxus, I give myself, and create for myself, a situation that is, in a determinate sense, closed, a situation that carries a possibility in itself, but its tendency is directed toward delectatio delight bustling activity only insofar as it is present as time here and desiderare emerge. Prospera in adversus desidero, adversa in prospera stimeo in adversity I desire prosperity, in prosperity I fear adversity.11 because in experience I have a certain knowledge of how things always go according to what came before, and because I somehow always stand within experiences, a fallen historical knowledge intending toward delectatio. Experience is somehow always co-present in desiderium, Si choose anima as vox media desire, lying in the middle of the soul's voice. There is no medius locus, 12 ubi non sit tentatio middle place, where there is no temptation. In how far? What is this? Nescio in quae party stead victoria I do not know on which side is the victory. May roars lit and dilatitia flende me roars may molly cum gaudiis bonus joyful sorrows regrettable joyce me sorrows over my evil and my good joyce and, in addition Nescio I do not know. 1. Conflict within factical life itself in the defluorethi unrest being thrown. 2. Conflict within oneself again easy? Timur may early tondus for joyful sorrow. Or is it murmala's evil sorrow? Do I have it such that I ought to rejoice in it? Ladies yaf lend a regrettable joys or gaudium bonum good joys? Is it a joy about which I ought to weep? 3. Nescio I do not know, where victory is I do not know what will be and what the outcome will be. Tentatio and the historical. How the historical raises itself to the Neshu how I experience myself quastio factus sum I have become a question. Conflict objective, it is, which historical horizon existential intentionally. The taking a stance itself, the how of appropriation, of the taking along in time here and desiderare is conflictual, and these in turn are in conflict among themselves. On 13a. Reaching back to Ayur Continentium at Iustitium commanding continents and just as 13 related to the concupiscentia that turns in three directions following 1 John 215, 16, 17 1. Concupiscentia carnis desire of the flesh, 2. Concupiscentia oculorum desire of the eyes, 3. Ambitio seculi secular ambition. Militia di the evils of the day. They are present and tempting as delicious delights and suavitates loveliness, and one turns them into enjoyments, whereas they are really the danger for me. What is base pulls down, turns the will into a servant, and has it confirm the falling is what is authentic. What does this complex of movements mean factically, historically, existentially? What happens and occurs and what I enact. No juxtaposition, 
but existential phenomenologically. The authentic facticity, not biologically, objectively isolated, but concrete life, marriage, eating, drinking, meals, tea time concrete, surrounding worldly significance. Temptation lurks precisely in what belongs to my facticity, what is with me and in which I am. Temptation is historically present. Vita equals tentatio total life equals all temptation. In the factical, I slide into possible self, individuations. Against the opening up of possibilities, against the genuine self-possession and being of Vita, delectatio life, delight. Chapter 32 experiences historical tentatio belongs here, to be interpreted, contrarily, on the basis of tentatio toward the historical. Experience the opening up tentatio, but nescio I do not know what will be. Existential motivation of the destruction from the basic experience of being hidden from oneself and concealing oneself again in life blocking off. This increases more and more so that the most uncanny power of tentatio opens itself precisely in the most radical, genuine self-concern so that only here has the most radical situation of self-experience been won, in a direction of consideration in which the self knows neither in nor out guess chio mihi factus sum I have become a question to myself. Cf. End of chapter 40. In the end, what I am, my facticity is the strongest temptation and the counter-attack on my existence and existing it is the self-projection toward oneself of the genuine possibilities tat is, more precisely, the concern for this complex of enactment in it, I move in a somehow falling manner. Tentatio. On 13a, b. Concupiscentia direction in itself, directions of concrete, factical experience, of the full self-facticity of life. The direction of experiencing indicates something possible, opens up possibilities but only if they are experienced as directions, that is, if the facticity of life itself lives in a directed enactment as directed. The as directed may be illuminated in different ways as always, in the as directed, that is equals directed thus it is a toward and an away from. The away from is itself co-experienced, and with it so is the away from what? The possession one which understands radically off the as in the quaestia sibifieri being made a question a sense genetically, factically enacted connection between the as in a merely objective, absolute taking cognizance off somehow also possessing it carelessly, but pushing it away at the same time and the authentic approach to the as, that is, to oneself. The tempting or the being tempted is an experiencing in which an experiential direction, as thus directed in itself be virtue of its full sense and this full facticity tempts this facticity and addresses while attracting it, searchingly preferring it in the self-direction, and indeed in such a way that the authentic cura concern is lost in this. This curare in every concupiscentia into which the individual lets himself enter I unless 14 letting oneself go and enter leads into the significance of the world, delightful, curious self-significance. In this, the wherein, where into, itself has a pull for its eye hand. The letting go is now itself let it only keeps alive the direction in general further, more but it leads into the world, and indeed into the historical facticity therewith, the latter undergoes a shrinking and finally opens up get let's lish off. The authentic cura concern is factically somehow present in the away from and the away from what, for life, which is in general so far advanced that it stands at all in temptation, that is, a life that somehow searches its facticity and that has a clarity of its own. Two principally different interpretations of molestia trouble they are connected to the possibility of seeing the occurring phenomena at all. 1. Molestia is a characteristic Bischoffen height or objective equipment, as objective burden, standing there and operating as a thing. A hardening? Of oneself in this making disappear through objective means casting off and removing one's own being itself a conditioned Zeus stand, an objective characteristic. 2. Molestia is opportunity of seriousness, an opportunity with oneself pre-forming it as such first of all, rendering it experienceable to myself as facticity, grasping it existentially, possessing life and memory and experiencing in this way, increasing the seriousness. Bringing oneself to encounter, and forming out, the existential possibility as the authentic one. It is entirely lopsided to represent the radical self-possession as a hyper-reflected solipsism, or something like it. The self is the self of the full historical facticity, the self in its world, with that in which it lives thus the possessing in conformity to its relational multiplicity and its multiplicity of enactment not only multiplicity, but historical factical connection and the possession is no temporary, quietistic and leisurely one, but is enactment historical. Only in this opportunity formed in the existential enactment opportunity is a character of enactment. The giving of existential sense also for the existentially full objectivity fate, predestination, etc. that has been experienced for existence. 
The authentic concept of facticity cannot be determined on the basis of an objectivity that has been posited in advance and that is grasped attitudinally, but in the existentially enacted interpretation of a how of being from the existentially experienced content. The Phenomenon of Tentatio On 13 c. The tentatio arises the how of arising belongs to it, as an experiencing viewed phenomenologically not objectively, as material, biological emergence which has no tentative meaning. From experiences that open up into significances whose following and enactment of appropriation belong themselves to historical factical existence they also make up existence. Thus they are really placed in the genuine enactment of existence which stands in the possibility of falling so that of the seemingly authentic enactments of existence of Delicie, Hilarita's delights, hilarity, one's own choosing and deciding factical molestie troubles are turned, through seemingly genuine enactments of existence, into false non-genuine significances. The significance can be placed away in different ways, for example, being unmarried as the opposite not eating or drinking. Still, it is decisive for its meaning that it can be experienced as such being firmly attached to a certain apprehension of value. The danger of the axiologization of the connections of phenomena is as faithful as the theoretical regional forming out be the way, these two go together. In how far the tentatio is a genuine existential. Light. On 13f. Multimodo elapsu blanditur mihi eliud agendi, et im non advertendi. Insinuate autum se eta vehementer, ut si repente subtrahater transistus, cum desiderio requiratur et seed u absit, contristat animum. Gliding by in many forms, enticing me while I am busy with something else, taking no notice of it. For it insinuates itself so forcibly, if it is withdrawn suddenly transition, it is sought with longing and if it is absent for long, it makes the soul sad. 15 falling significant possession. Non atom sentio sine quo esiat i quo animo, out e grapossum, nice I cum ab furit. For I cannot know whether my soul can be balanced or upset to be without something, unless it is absent. 16. Ipsa est lux, una est, et unum omnes qui vit in etamontim. This is the light, it is one, and one are all those who see it and love it. 17. For as sequence humans quad facient. Outwardly humans follow what they make. 18. Came in venerum chemi reconciliare tibi? Who could be found to reconcile me to you? Question mark 19 Depravity for from God. Molestia. Hic esse valeo, nec volo illic volo, nec valeo miser utero beak. Here I am able to stay, but I do not wish it there I wish to be, but I am not able miserable in both places. 20 That, being by myself, I move away from you further and further. Anxiety before one's own most deceiver within oneself. Weaning oneself from the calculations of significance. In Augustine, not everything breaks through clearly. Because he attached himself too temptingly and fruity enjoyment, but within it. Guilt is a more concrete conception, which becomes more and more possible in the relation of possibility to freedom. 21 But whoever becomes guilty also becomes guilty of that which occasioned the guilt. For guilt never has an external occasion, and whoever yields to temptation is himself guilty of the temptation. 22. Deus Lux. On 13 grams. Deus Lux God the light highest object and highest self brightness knowledge. Deus Delectio God the love authentic existing. Deus Summum Bonum God the highest good the highest good object of valuing. Deus Incommutable is Substantia God the unchangeable substance cognizing search for subsistence. Subsisting in itself, derived sense of substance. Deus Summa Pulchritudo God the highest beauty highest beauty of joyful contemplation. In every determination, a different point of departure, of access, of determining within the access. The whence of the means of determination, the how of forming out. Here in the old, conceptual framework, there are frameworks used in novel ways and reformed, now new points of departure. Since the basic tendency is still Greek as is philosophy up to the present date here is no destruction. Mere so-called critique of knowledge does not help here. Problem unity and multiplicity of the connections of the access enactment. Origin theory facticity authentically, meaningfully enacted. Less psychologically, classification in general. Regional schemata of order, transcendental ideas are not only insufficient, but obstruct the problematic. The tentatio in our interpretation but an opportunity to lead toward decisive phenomena molestia. Forme concupis and diacarnis, oculorum forms desire of the flesh, of the eye not according to capacity, three especially shows. Tentatio in carn per carnem temptation in the flesh. Through the flesh. On 14a. I. The temptation of Utai use, 
of the dealing with, in the Cupiditas Ablictandi and Cornelist of Entertainment in the Flesh, taking delight in, comfort, calculation of significance, pretending to oneself, more precisely pretending one significance before the other one and, in this, wriggling oneself out of the noose. Direction letting the significance force itself upon oneself. Saving oneself in the uncovering and ascertaining of one possibility of delight, even if that were one's own neediness and uncertainty. 2. The temptation of knowledge curiositype or carnem leading is a self line tension. Ideas inventive? In a certain sense, mediating can it be gotten rid of. Palpable molestia. But easier precisely because of this, for they can be found more easily in the singular as falling. The others conceal themselves more to the extent that in the end, I discover in myself the most difficult tentatio. A comparison of the three forms of tentatio. On 15a. Explicating on the basis of the three form a forms. Tentatio what for 23 away from what? How is the falling conceived, and what does it mean existentially? To what extent objective, constative, normative theoretizingly, attitudinally? To what extent factical, self-lie, existential, in the manner of enactment? The different modes of molestia attach? To necessity, levels of sense of facticity. To what extent a connection between the what for? To what extent an increase? Whither, in what direction? In I and 2, each time an attitude exclamation mark 24 and 3, self-concern, but self-concern viewed from attitude and from what has been accomplished for the world in attitude. The transference of the tentatio like significance from the specially experienced content ito the relation, or in the direction of the relation needs? The peculiar concealment. The relation as such is the source of enjoyment, of the falling three. Axiologization. On 15 BD. The giving in sin. The getting lost. Not giving and overcoming faith. Cf. Luther, de triple. And de duple, 1518 I justicia justice f Teutonis. Factical complex of enactment for the sake of God, from love of God, that is phenomenologically, existence one in God that is, wanting to gain the authentic enactment as existential. Decisive is here not a preference of values, the axiologized separation is a theoretical misinterpretation of the real phenomenon, but existential concern enactment of existence. Faith 1 Genuine, Radical Self-Love Absolute Egoism 2 Genuine, Absolute Love of God Absolute Surrender In this authentic existence, the most radical fear is constitutive of concern. But the being absolute is not to be dissolved and being universal, in the law, but radical, concrete, historical being the individual. The orientation toward the axiologized summum bonum highest good, etc., turns the whole conduct into a near aestheticism in yet another sense not only as attitude, but as delectatio delight. By contrast, the historical problematic of enactment gaining the terrible, the difficult, the questionable quaestio, or what is to be indicated in the communication. In giving in, one steals away from this, and axiologization as attitude is a concealed giving in. C.F. Augustine, Confessions X.C. On dispersion and prayer monstrosity however, not the most radical execution in Augustine consideration of misericordia mercy. Agnosa Ordinum. On 15 C. Agnosa Ordinum, Query Pachem. Tu Deo, D.B. Caro. Quid Justius? Quid Pulcrius? Tu Majori, Minor D.B. Servi Tu A. Key Fecate. At DB serviet quad factum est propter de. Non enim hunc ordinum novimus, neque hunc ordinum commendamus. DB caro et tu deo sed, tu deo, et DB caro. Si autum contemus tu deo, nunquam officis at DB caro. Primo ergo te subdes deo de in deal docente te et adjuvant prioleris. Observe order, seek peace. You belong to God, your flesh to you. What more just, what more beautiful? You to whom that is greater. He that is less to you serve him who made you, so that that which was made for you may serve you. For we do not know nor commend this order. Your flesh to you, and you to God, but you to God, and your flesh to you. For if you despise you to God, you will never bring about your flesh to you. First, then, submit yourself to God then, with him to teach you and encourage you. Fight.25. An order of value ranks, and a correspondingly axiologized forming out fails here entirely in regard to the authentic interpretation. It becomes clearer and clearer how the tendatio and the modes of enactment of coping for tig wordens, on the one hand, aim at a certain direction and mode of enactment of self-lie experiences, on the other, on a higher level of an interpretation given by Augustine himself, how they aim at determinately regulated modes of making decisions. 
tentatio meaning on the basis of an order order of value ranks modern Augustine apparently the question about this, whether genuine or not. Greek. Theorization directed in a certain way being interwoven with the Greek Platonic. Axiologization directed in a certain way, incommutable unchangeable and summum bonum highest good in the whole order on the basis of this, which can become even more faithful because it also pays attention to precisely those phenomena that are crucial in a certain regard. These orders present in Augustine, explicitly cf. De Doctrina Christiana. For the interpretation of the confessions, however, do not move forward in this direction, but stay with the way in which they are secured there the existential predelineation is to be grasped from there and attempt to depart the destruction already here. In this, however, the axiological view in Augustine is not only attached, but holds sway throughout all considerations. Cf. De Doctrina Christiana. On 15 c. Having validity in the communal world being loved and feared in order to enjoy this for oneself, that is, one takes oneself to be important firstly as the one who is superior, and secondly, as the one who is so valuable that he is esteemed by others. One views oneself in this entirely in the eyes and tendencies of the others. One takes oneself apart, elevates oneself. But that is miserable view to the miserable life. Hink fit vel maxime non amarete, nec cast time your day. Hence especially it comes that men do not love you nor fear you in purity. 26 Through this, the authentic and highest love, directed at you, is impaired. Through this, the pure fear, directed at you, is endangered. Tu superbus resistus. You resist the proud. 27 You resist, because they do not really stand by you but run away from you and, in fear, prefer something else to you. To prefer axiologizing, transferring everything to one plane objects of value. Precisely the decisive complexes of enactment are covered up, and especially the transitions. Through the axiologization, the character of calculation, leveling, and ordering posits itself in the self conception, interpretation, and conceptuality placing in a direction ordering, that is, the authentic concern is disfigured and viewed as concealed calculation? The emphasis of meaning and the origin of explication do not lie in the authentic and historical enactment. Propter quaedam humanae societatis officia necessarium est amari et demariab hominibus. Because certain offices in human society make it necessary to be loved and feared by people. 28 The obligations, services, and relations in human society, however, render these communal worldly relations necessary. But instant adversarius very beatitudinize nostri the adversary of our true happiness threatens us. 29 Possibility of a false beatitude or false happiness. Libit nos amari et demari, non propter se, said prote it becomes our pleasure to be loved and feared not for your sake, but instead of you. 30 Facticity of having an attitude that is significant in the communal world. Not for oneself alone in a different sense. Quotidiana fornex nostra est humana lingua. Our daily furnace is the human language. 31 Language is the manner of enactment of communal worldly concrete factical experiencing. Et multum time or cultum a appease. 18, 13. Quain or ad oculi tui, me adam non. Est enum qualis cumque in elis generibus tentation in mihi facultas explorandi me in hoc pin nulla est. And I much fear my secrets peas. 18, 13. Which your eyes know, but mine do not. For in other kinds of temptations, I have the capacity for self-examination, but in this matter almost none. 32. Every kind of temptation has a certain, corresponding how of explore or examining. According to each level and significance in which the tentatio is possessed in its full sense, the grasping and interpretation is easier or more difficult easier, if it is even more objectifiable more difficult, if we are dealing with the self-interpretation, and the self-possession can cover itself up more and more temptingly, and can move in surrogates. Through this, the tentatio even more dangerous. Four groups of problems. 1. Tentatio 33 Problematic of enactment with regard to the self. Basic sense of the self is historical. 2. Defluere 34 Multimonum flowing down, scattering many one. Molestia facticity. 3. Quaestio mihi factus sum I have become a question to myself and security, conflict, becoming questionable. Authentic manner of becoming a question to oneself. What this expresses? Possibility. Decisive is the how the phenomena push themselves increasingly into the complexes of the enactment of sense. All the content receives its sense from their dot problem how I experience myself insofar as I experience tentatio. What kind of concern for facticity? Can be, accidental, objective, objective measure of value axiologization, cf. Augustine himself. 4. 
Tentatia basic orientation in a certain, axiological forming out. Moving away from God, increasing the distance. In the question of possessing God the more he advances toward the authentic conditions of enactment, the more dangerous these conditions turn out to be, in hostility to themselves. Discussion of Ram. 120 Basic Structure Delineated, that is, this passage in particular for the vestibule vorbau of Greek philosophy theoretical and practical. Yet it did not remain there, but precisely in Augustine the following is decided one total ignorance of Augustine himself casting off of the Plotinian, of the historical era, two misunderstanding of the Christian reaching back to Augustine. There where every serious attempt at a radical appropriation of the soil cultural history is lacking, there is not the slightest right to even start uncovering the essential views. Today's unhealthy, non-genuine religious fraud here metaphysical curiosity with the gesture of inwardness it is revealing that it falls into the trap of surrogate appearances. Only indicates scientifically the cultural historical connections, no apologies for Christianity. Sin. What is base has its power in pulling toward itself, in blocking authentic understanding and in obscuring it. Understanding passes on to the side of the will, follows the falling inclination and even confirms that this is what is authentic. Christian complex of motivation. 1. Not understanding what is right. 2. Not wanting to understand. 3. Not wanting. The human being? What is not genuine, although he understood what is right, has the authentic defiance. Therefore, interpreted Christianly, sin has its roots in willing, not in knowing, and this corruption of willing embraces the individual's consciousness. 35. That the sin is before God is precisely what is positive about it. The category of sin is the category of individuality. Axiologization. On 17. In understanding facticity, its questionability and the enactment of questionability, what surfaces is the faithfulness, and inappropriateness for existence, of the axiologization. And very strongly present in Augustine in particular. Precisely that which Scheler retains must be eliminated, that is, he does not understand the problem radically enough. Preferring spurning being indifferent. This is basically bustling activity with God, which takes the easy path and one only has to follow essential insights. But here there is no trace at all of the authentic sense of the enactment of love. What is precisely crucial is to constantly have a radical confrontation with the factical, and not to flee. In order to attain existence, I precisely must have it. This having precisely means living in it, but not giving in, not even overcoming it comfortably and axiologically. The sense of existential overcoming. The sense of facticity. Holding on to, appropriating, in a genuinely factical manner, the worldly or the experiential relation and enactment. This means neither valuing positively, since this is not at issue and is a misinterpretation Luther and misunderstanding, nor making compromises, which likewise is now merely an inferior bustling activity Catholicism. Trying to gain that facticity that forms existence. Correspondingly, molestia is to be determined existentially not burden ascetically Greek but opportunity of seriousness. I precisely must only preform the molestia itself in the first place, not falsely overcome it. Molestia. On 17. Being the singular one being under the own most, strictest observation. The molestia radically forming mine is molestia determinate complex of enactment. To appropriate, in the manner of enactment, the mole's burden is what is pulling down objehendes, not letting it stand as a thing and as nature but grasping the sense of facticity and enacting it existentially and understanding it thus historically in memory and expectation. Giving life this existential facticity and brightness, that is, increasing the seriousness. Exploratio. The how and the possibilities of the enactment of the exploratio are different also in the how in which the tenediones are encountered. They can be massively emphasized and become clear. They can be entirely hidden and protect themselves by means of the enactment of experience itself in which they lie. Explorer simultaneously concerns and comprises within itself the seeing of 36 quantum secutus simposi refrainer animum meum how much I have succeeded in being able to refrain my soul. 37 that I see, that is, the exploratio is easier if and insofar as this tentatio 38 cum is rebus cario, vel voluntate, vel com absent when I do without those things, either willingly of when they are absent. 39 reads things the contents of the tentatio. 40 and being free of the tunc enemy and arago. Quam magus minus mihi molestum sit non habere then I ask myself how troublesome it is to me not to have them. 41. Divitiae vera quae ob hoc expecientur, ut servient alica triumest aram cupiditatum, si percentisir non potest animus utramis habens contemat, posund et dimiti, 
ut se probatas for riches which are sought for this, that they may serve you in one of those three lusts, if the soul cannot discern whether it condemns having them, that can be tested by giving them away.42. Possibility of seeing the being free, the overcoming and the having overcome, the understanding of who I am and what I can. But when it comes to praise, how may the possibility of doing without it be tested? Quid in corenda laudis possum explorandum male vivendum est. At si bone vitae bonarm coparum comes at solid et David esse laudatio, dam comitatum aeus, quam ipsum bonum vitam deseri non oportet. What is explored in being able to do without praise is an ill life. If praise is the usual and proper companion of a good life and of good works, we ought to renounce it as little as we ought to renounce the good life itself. 43. The danger of tentatio and the prevention of the genuine exploration must precisely be enacted. The low praise as comes companion libido carnis, wo luptus lust of the flesh, pleasure also comes? But how? The abyss being absent of low can only be accomplished by living without disgrace, opening ourselves to disgrace and scorn. For we are supposed to strive for bonum vitam the good life, in bonum. Non atum sentio but I do not know the possibility of doing without, nice I cum somehow abfor it unless it will somehow have been absent. Anxiety. Letting the corresponding possibilities encounter. Corresponding to that which I experience in a worldly manner. Delectation gaudi revel. Delight wanting to enjoy. What is other? Something is missing. With this, already placed in possibility, even if entirely in worldly falling. But even here, there is still something of the genuine existential movement and the twitching, as it were. Attacks of anxiety. Historically enacted preserving the earlier ones. To open possibilities itself historically. Anxiety discovers fate. 44. The experience of directionless anxiety no direction from the authentic self. Anxiety itself directs. The self lie directed anxiety. Direction. Free of the preference for worldly significances. In anxiety, fearing them is driven out. Term anxiety not better the directionless fear of significance. Fear forked the real anxiety reverence air forced. The counter expected. Wider wordage, the temptation, the appeal and fectung. The counter expected, counter to the expectation the relation posited from significance to significance within the falling direction of experience. The temptation ethical the lowly one lures, and seeks to pull down what is higher. Being pulled away in the factical direction of significance. The appeal religious what is higher jealously, as it were limits the individual away from itself, increases with religiosity. The absolute's own resistance. Being pushed back in concern already requires existing. How? How does concern encounter us, and how is it characterized? What does being pushed back mean in enactment? On the destruction of Plotinus. Since, in the end, factical existence is crucial, and in it, destruction is lived and has meaning, everything to be destructed is, in the end, to be explicated as to its how. That is, the task is precisely to see the unspoken lead dictus that one does not gain as long as one lives only in the matter itself, for example by discussing it improving, reforming, and the like. One can only see the unspoken lead in an authentic existential for reconception itself. And what is crucial is precisely to observe the steps sharply and not let oneself be seduced by any convention in this. Appendix 2. Supplements from the Notes of Oscar Becker. 1. Continentia. Supplement to 12a. Jubes continentium you command continency the your commanding is a directio cordis direction of the heart. Cf. In narrations in Samos on the Psalm 7, v. 10 ayer is not oriented in the church, in objective faith. Quomito ergo justus duragi potist, nice I in occulto. For how can the just man be directed except in secret? One through events at the beginning of the Christian age, the effectivity of God could indeed once be experienced objectively as a miracle. But now, when the name of Christians has grown to such heights, the hypocrisy the hypocrisy of those who want to please people rather than God grows as well. How else can the just one be led out of such confusion simulationized confusion of simulation, if not by God's testing him in the heart and gut core, heart equals inner consideration ren, gut equals delectatio and malam partem delight in the bad parts. The delectatio is something base in life that is why it is designated by a baser, lower organ. Augustine now elaborates, in what this scrutiny and scrutiny is enacted. Finisenim curi delectatio est for the end of concern is delight too for everyone strives and his concern and consideration for what is attainable by his own delectatio, but God himself speaks in our conscience, and he sees our concern and our goal that which we are doing through actions and words may be known to a human being, said quo animo fiant but what we do in the soul, 
3. And what we thus aim at, God alone knows. Ayub's continentium is to be understood in this sense. 2. Utine Frui. Supplement to 12b. The curare the being concerned is a basic characteristic of life, it is meant as vox media and bona met in malam partem the middle voice between the good and the bad parts there is genuine and non-genuine concern the latter equals bustling activity. Utai use I deal with what life brings to me this is a phenomenon within the curare. Frui enjoying. Beatus est quip qui fruiter samabano. Happy is he who indeed enjoys the highest good. For a certain basic aesthetic meaning lies in this one notices the Neoplatonic influence the beautiful belongs to the essence of being. And then we also say that a thing is a joy if it is such qua nos non alud referenda per se ipsa delected that it gives us delight in itself, not by reference to something else. 5. As Utai, we grasp that way of pleasing in which we strive for something for the sake of something else. Utai vero ea re more. Qua propter ale ud qua urimus, but we are said to use something we need for the sake of something else. 6. In enjoyment, we are said to possess eternal and unchangeable things. The appropriate comportment to the other things is utai, since precisely through this, we will attain to the frui of what is genuine. Cf. De Doctrina Christiana, Lib. 1, Cap. 22. Only the Trinitus Trinity must be held in enjoyment, that is the highest and unchangeable good. Fruenda mesteribus invisibilibus. To be enjoyed is the invisible thing. Frui enum est amore alic arain harrier propter sipsum. Uti autum, quad in usum venerid added quad am a zubnandum refer, si taminum andum est. For to enjoy a thing is to stay in love for it for its own sake. To use, on the other hand, is to use whatever means are at one's disposal to obtain what one loves, if only it is love. 7. Omnis attack humana perversio est, fruendis uti vel, at qui utendis frui. Et versus omnis ordinatio, qua vertus etium nominatur, fruendis frui, et utendis uti. However, all human perversion is the will to use for the sake of enjoyment, and to enjoy for the sake of use. By contrast, all order which is to be called virtue demands that one enjoy for the sake of enjoyment, and use for the sake of use. De diversus qua estionibus octa genitribus, qua est. 3083 Various Questions, 30 Written Soon After Augustine's Conversion.8 Aesthetic basic meaning of frui fruendum estrini date, re intelligibilis pol crituto? Equals? Incommutable asset ineffabilis pol crituto equals God to be enjoyed as the Trinity, the beauty of intelligible things equals unchangeable and ineffable beauty equals God. The frui is thus the basic characteristic of the Augustinian basic posture toward life itself. Its correlate is the pol crituto, thus, there is an aesthetic moment in it. Likewise, in the summum bonum. With this, a basic aspect of the medieval object of theology and of the history of ideas in general has been designated it as the specifically Greek view. The fruitio de enjoyment of God is a decisive concept in medieval theology this basic motif led to the formation of medieval mysticism. However, the fruitio in Augustine is not the specifically Plotinian one, which culminates in intuition, but is rooted in the peculiarly Christian view of factical life. In the end, the fruitio de is opposed to the possession of the self they do not stem from the same root, but have grown together from without. Connected to this is the fact that for Augustine, the goal of life is the quis rest. Vita prisens in re laboris, sed in sp quietus in care and vita status, sed in fide novitatus present life in actual labor, but in hope of rest in the flesh of aging old life, but in faith of the new. Nine inches the flesh in Paul not only sensual libido, but factical life in general off decay falling, in faith in the renewal. Quo preced it spes vestra, sequater vita vestra. Whether your hope moves ahead, let your life follow. 10 Life is enacted in the direction of that toward which expectation runs ahead. Schematic Overview of the Phenomena The Karari concern consists of the Utai and Frui. The basic direction of Vita the Delectatio. The Temptatio lies in the Delectatio itself. It has the possibilities of turning into the defluxus flowing out, sliding down, scattering in the continentia continents. 3. Tentatio Supplement following 12b Tentatio circa 28 different meanings of tentatio tentatio deceptionist temptation of deception with a tendency to bring to a fall to tentatio probationist temptation of probation with a tendency to test in the first sense only the devil diabolus tempts in the second god tempts 2.11 diabolus and augustine there is here still vivid a belief in demons with concrete ideas but this is not all see letter 146 no human being is equipped with justice to such a degree that no appeal and fectung of confusion would be necessary for him. 12 This is the real tentatio, the tentatio tribulationis, 
so that the human being becomes a question to himself. It is necessary velad proficientam, velad confirmandam be it for perfection, be it for confirmation.13. Nesit se homo, nisi intenitione discat se you do not know a human being unless you have gotten to know him in temptation.14 A human being does not know himself at all unless he gets to know himself in tentatio. One notices the historical basic meaning of disir to learn, to get to know, which takes place in concrete, factical, historical self-experience. Tentatio is a specifically historical concept. Amoris duo in hoc vita secum in omni tentatione luctenter, amor seculi, et amor day in all temptation, two kinds of love are struggling with one another in this life love of the world, and love of God.15 On the concept of Diabolus, cf. In narrations in, Samos, at. Pease. 148. Within us, the appeal and fectung and struggle daily, not always for, for we also bear, and there is a constant danger within us, so that he who is not awake will be conquered but if we do not consent, we do indeed gain the upper hand but in this too, there is a burden, resist and o delectation of us resisting delight.16. Paul, Gal. 517 Caro enim concupiscit adversus spiritum for what the flesh desires is against the spirit. You do not do what you want and that is a struggle and what makes it even more burdensome is the fact that it is an inner struggle. In quo balasis it quisque victor, illos quos non videt inimicos, continuo superabit. Non enim tentat diabolus vel angelia use, nisi quad in te carnale dominator is alive in this real facticity and in this war, each one who is victorious will straightaway overcome enemies whom he does not see. For the devils and his angels do not tempt, except the carnal part that rules in you is alive in this real facticity.17. And when the devil tempts someone in whatever manner, he always tempts the one who agrees with him, non cogit invitum he does not force a person against that person's will he seizes only the one came in venerate ex aliqua party jam similim sibi whom he finds to be in some part like himself, and thus, the gate is open for the entry of devilish suggestion I you attenitione the gate of temptation.18. The emergence of tentatio from factical life takes place on different levels. Division of phenomena in concretely tangible temptations for example, sexual ones, and not concretely tangible ones metal ones, performed in cogitatio thought. The tentatio has a twofold connection to the authentic experiences of the self. In what basic direction of experience does it itself have its sense? We must go back to its authentic basis of enactment. Here is an opportunity to refer to a connection we have not seen so far, a connection between Augustine and Neoplatonism. Augustine assumes a concrete situation of temptation in De Doctrina Christiana living in Avaris Avaritia. What is decisive is the delectio esteem, love, the amor pecunia love of money. What kind of delectatio delight is dominant will become decisive for one's comportment in the appeal and fectung and in coping with it. From the outside, the devil suggests a game, one which, however, requires fraud. He places before you what you have overcome internally. That is, something significant that corresponds to the relational direction of the experience that is already alive in that human being. If you defeat avarice, if it is internally dominated in you, the temptation will have been overcome. Everything depends on the dominant direction of delectatio. But an expectation always remains alive. Something else, however, may be placed before expectation, so that an inner struggle emerges. The human being is placed before a decision. You are broken within yourself by sin. E tenum ex peccato, devices s adversum te for through sin are you divided against yourself. 19 Hobbies contra quad puns in te, hobbies quad expugnus in te you have within you that with which to fight, you have within you what to overcome. 20 Implied in this is the fact that, in considering the tentatio, what is crucial is not the objective situation that leads to the temptation, but the situation of self of he who experiences it. In each case, something different is required when you are struggling, when you are victorious, when you rejoice, for instance, a gain is set before you, delectation em hobbit it has delight. Suggerator aliquad lucrum, delectit, hobbit fraudum, said magnum est lucrum, delectit, non consentus some gain is suggested to you, you take delight in it, it involves deceit, but great is the gain, and you take delight in it, yet you do not consent. 21 The persuasion and urging is still going on. Already considered. Already fallen. Contempts at justitium, ut fraudum facerity is thought lightly of justice so that he may commit deceit. 22 or contempts at lucrum he is thought lightly of his gain for the sake of justice. Sed et emil qui vicit, num quid omnino and jet in say but even he who is victorious, has he altogether achieved in himself 23 that money cannot trouble him any longer? 
out nihil in eo excite delectation as that it excites in him no delight question mark 24 although money no longer seems to him to be worth the struggle in his taminali qua delectation as titillatio yet there is in him a titillation of delight 25 this titillation is present and remains in the human being even if temptation is no longer present here augustine comes to the problem of original sin the role played by the setting before and setting after shows that a certain order order is the basis of the phenomenon you belong to god but the flesh belongs to you the flesh refers to what is at one's disposal in factical life you belong to what is higher in value the lower value belongs to you it is not the following order that we recognize and recommend db caro et tu deo said tu deo et db caro see autum contemus tu deo nunquam officies ut db caro primo ergo te sub des deo your flesh to you and you to god but you to god and your flesh to you for if you despise you to god you will never bring about your flesh to you first then submit yourself to god then with him to teach you and encourage you fight 26 then you will struggle in his illumination and under his guidance it does not only depend on the relation to god but on the how of the ordo agnosa ordinum observe order 27 put in modern terms observe the ranking order of values for us it is important first how this order of rank is the basis second that the order is viewed in a certain conceptual form it is not natural that that which is experienced in the delectatio stands in a ranking order of value. Rather, this is based on an axiologization which, in the end, is on the same level as the theorization. This ranking order of values is of Greek origin. In the whole manner of concept formation, it stems ultimately from Plato. Proof of this is, among other things, the connection to the incommutable unchangeable. Thus, such a ranking order is already present in Augustine. However, does this axiologization correspond to the explicated phenomena? The axiologization is more difficult to grasp than the theorization, because it actually deals with what is in question. Chapters of Book X of the Confession show how Augustine indeed uses a ranking order as a basis, but it ultimately takes on an essentially different meaning. This ranking order dominates Augustine to a very large extent. However, it is not grasped in a manner as removed as it is today for example. In Scheler it is connected to his concrete metaphysics, and the conception of reality res is tailored to it. What does Augustine mean by res reality? The modes of concern, of uti use and frui enjoyment, in their relation to res, result in the following division into three kinds res ergo alii sunt quibus fruendum est, alii quibus utendum, alii quae fruinture et utensure there are some things, then, which are to be enjoyed, others which are to be used, others still which enjoy and use.28. The res things are opposed to the signa signs. Propriatum non cres apolavi, qua non ad significantum aliquidit habenture, secut es lignum, lapis, pecus, at qui hujus modi satura on the other hand, a thing, properly speaking, is designated as that which is not employed to signify anything else, such as wood, stone, cattle, and other things of that kind. 29 But this is not understood in the sense of the wood that Moses cast into the bitter waters, nor of the stone that Jacob put under his head etc. Opposition signum equals symbol. This is connected to the interpretation of scripture and goes back to the Alexandrian school of exegetes which, in turn, goes back to the school of philologists' problem of the interpretation of all texts. These latter things Moses would, etc. are signs of other things at the same time. But there are still other signs whose consistent and full use consists in designating itself whereas the wood does not necessarily possess the character of indication. No one uses words for purposes other than designation. Every sign is a res, otherwise it would be nothing, but not every res is a signum. Thus, when looking at the res, we only pay attention to what they are according to their content, not to what else they might indicate. And, vice versa, if I deal with a thing as a sign, I must pay attention not to what it is, but to the fact that it is a sign such that I have to look away from them.30. What is the human being itself? Is he a fruendum, utendum an object of enjoyment, of use, or both? We who from Maret Utimer enjoy and use are, somehow, a res thing ourselves. Magna enim, quaitam res est homo for man is a truly great thing, 31 because he has reason. Attack magna quaest eo est utrum frui se homens de bed, an uti, an utrum qua and so it is a great question whether human beings ought to enjoy, or use themselves, or do both. 32 There is the commandment of reciprocal love, but the question is whether one human being is loved by another as a human being propter se on account of himself or for the sake of something else. If a human being is loved for his own sake, fru Maria we enjoy him, if not, utimorio we use him. However, it now seems that a human being must be loved for the sake of something else, 
for in that which is to be loved for its own sake, in eo constituit or vita beata in this consists the happy life. 33 But we do not have the reason from the vita beata we do not have the latter as such, said Spes but hope. If you see clearly, the human being may not even be the object of frui for itself. See Adam say propter say dili git if, however, he loves himself on account of himself, 34 he does not relate to God. If he is turned toward himself, he is not turned toward the unchangeable. And since that which he supposedly loves in himself is characterized by a defect defectus, that is, transience, it is to be preferred that he is attached without defect to the incommutable unchangeable, rather than that he adds ipsum relaxator opens himself toward himself. 35. He key rerum integer estimator est who estimates things without prejudice, 36 that is, key ordinatum delectionum hobbit who is ordinate love lives in a holy way. 37. The positioning stellung nam within the tentatio is enacted from the sort order from it, the basic comportment to things is decided. This doctrine of value is already on a high level of forming out. But one misperceives it if one isolates it and does not view it in its context. Then the problem emerges whether such ranking order of values is a meaningfully necessary one, or whether it does not merely rely on the role Greek philosophy plays in Augustine's thought. More on the doctrine of value non autum omni equibus utendum est, diligent assunt said ea soliqua out nobis cum societate quadam referendor in deum being related to God on the basis of a community with us. However, not all those things which are to be used, are to be loved, but only those which are in a community with us in relation to God being related to God on the basis of a community with us. 38 Here lies the origin of the thought of Christian solidarity. Those things deserve an estimation of love that are related to us, but beneficio de per nos indigent, Sicity est corpus the flesh as the seed of sin they need the goodness of God through us, such as the body the flesh is the seed of sin. 39 Thus, there are four kinds of objects that are to be loved 1 what is above us. 2 what we are ourselves. 3 what is next to us. 4 what is beneath us. Regarding 2 and 4, no special reason is required to love them. However much a human being may fall from the truth, the self-esteem and the esteem of his body remains intact. Nemo ergo se did no man, then. Hates himself. 40 But because of self love of a certain kind, commandments of a certain order are necessary. The human being has a certain posture in relation to himself, since his self esteem is there by itself with the facticity of life. This comprises a certain phenomenal complex of self experience, which is to be explicated. He who is the integer estimator rarum unprejudiced estimator of things, who possesses the ordinate adelectio ordinate love loves in an authentic way, so that he does not either love what may not be loved at all or love that more which may not be loved more, etc. 41 A certain formalism lies in the stratification of the order of value. However, one may not remove this order of value ranking from its cultural historical context, from the peculiar entwinement of Greek philosophy in particular, Platonism with the Christian view of life. In considering the following chapters of the Confessions Lib. X. Cap. 30 FF, we will have to pay attention to the following four groups of problems. 1. The problem of tentatio. In this, the complex of enactment of my concrete full self-experience how I decide. From the problem of tentatio, we will get to the basic sense of self-experience as historical. 2. Connected to the tentatio is the defluxus in multum flowing into the many into the multiplicity of the significances of factical life. The molestia burden, trouble proves to be constitutive for the concept of facticity. 3. The problem of the meaning of quaestio mihi factus sum I have become a question to myself. The becoming a question to oneself is meaningful only in the concrete context of self-experience. It is not a question of objective presence, but of authentic self-like existence. 4. The problem of the basic orientation of delectio in a determinate axiological system. It is to be decided to what extent this originates from one's own experience, and to what extent it can be demonstrated to have been determined by the cultural historical situation of Augustine. The problem of the universal theory of value is connected to Neoplatonism and the doctrine of the summum bonum, in particular, to the conception of the way in which the summum bonum becomes accessible. The Pauline passage of the letter to the Romans, chapter 120 is fundamental for the whole of patristic philosophy, for the orientation of the formation of Christian doctrine in Greek philosophy. The motif for the Greek underlying structure and restructuring under a new bow of Christian dogmatism has been taken from this passage. However, this pre-structure vor bow was then structured into the basic patterns of the Christian thought of the dogmatism. For this reason, one cannot simply dismiss the Platonic and Augustine and it is a misunderstanding to believe that in going back to Augustine, 
one can gain the authentically Christian. Rom. 119f. Says. Since the estimation of the world, what is invisible in God is seen by thought in his works. This proposition returns again and again in patristic writings it gives direction to the platonic ascent from the sensible world to the supersensible world. It is or is grasped as confirmation of Platonism, taken from Paul. However, this is a misunderstanding of the passage from Paul. Only Luther really understood this passage for the first time. In his earliest works, Luther opened up a new understanding of primordial Christianity. Later on, he himself fell victim to the burden of tradition then, the beginning of Protestant scholasticism sets in. The insights of Luther's early period are decisive for the cultural Geistigen connections of Christianity to culture. Today, this is misperceived in the concern for Christian religious renewal. Luther's view finds a clear expression in his 1518 Heidelberg dissertation. In it, he defends 40 theses 28 theological ones and 12 philosophical ones. For us, the theses 19, 21, and 22 are important here. 19 non Dina Theologus Dissiter, qui invisibilia de perie, quae facta sunt, intellecta conspicit the man who looks upon the invisible things of God as they are perceived in created things does not deserve to be called a theologian. 42 He who sees what is invisible of God in what has been created, is no theologian. The presentation of Orgabi of the object of theology is not attained by way of a metaphysical consideration of the world. 21 Theologus Gloriae Dissit Malum Bonum et Bonum Malum Theologus crucis dissidid quadris as the theologian of glory calls evil good and good evil, while the theologian of the cross says what a thing is. 43 The theologus gloriae who aesthetically takes delight in the wonders of the world, names what is sensible in God. The theologian of the cross says how things are. 22 Sapientia illa, quae invisibilia de ex operbus intellecta conspicit, omni noin flot, exicat et endureth the wisdom that looks upon the invisible things of God from his works, inflates us, blinds us and hardens our heart. 44 Your wisdom that sees what is invisible of God in his works, inflates, blinds us, and hardens us. 4. The Confitary and the Concept of Sin. Supplement following 13b. It is important that the molestia belongs to facticity, a belonging together that arises in one's own experiencing, just as the continuous experiencing of, and self-confrontation with, molestia belongs to authentic life. Later on, the molestia is intellectualized virgis digt the tentatio is no longer sensuous material, but more hidden and more dangerous. With this, the sense of facticity, and the sense of the quaestio mihi factus sum I have become a question to myself, increase. Thus, we have treated four basic phenomena, which are important for the further discussion of the confessions. 1 The tentatio 2 The defluxus in multum flowing into the many and the molestia 3 The quaestio mihi factus sum 4 The question of the axiological forming out. In our further interpretation, we have to take into account two things. 1. That Augustine communicates all phenomena in the posture of the confitary to confess, standing within the task of searching and of having God. The reference to the authentic condition of the enactment of experiencing God is important. The condition is such that, if one takes it seriously, one initially moves away from God. With the quaestio mihi factus sum, the distance to God increases. 2. That our possibility of interpretation has its limits, for the problem of confitary arises from the consciousness of one's own sin. The tendency toward vita be out of the happy life not in re actuality but in spin hope emerges only from out of the remissio peccatorum remission of sins, the reconciliation with God. But we have to leave aside here these phenomena because they are very difficult and require conditions of understanding that cannot be achieved in this context. However, in our consideration, which is of the order of understanding, we will gain what is basic for the access to those phenomena of sin, grace, etc. However, the consciousness of sin and the manner in which God is present in it stands, in Augustine, in a peculiar interrelation to Neoplatonism. For this reason, his conception of sin cannot guide the phenomenological explication of the genuine phenomenon. In Augustine, the concept of sin has a threefold character. 1. A theoretical one sin is privatio boni privation of the good, oriented toward the summum bonum highest good. Sin is a lower measure of reality for this reason, it bears within itself a higher measure of mortality so that it itself is death, so that death is given with it. These are Plotinian ideas that connect to a certain conception of Paul's thoughts in the letter to the Romans. 2. An aesthetic 1 cf. For this the beginning of Confessions bk. 8. ch. 7. After the narrative of Pontitianus about St. Antony, it is said to Autum, Domini, 
interverb aeus retor cabras me ad mapsum, offerns me adorso me ubi me posuram, dum nala me ad ret constituum as me antifacium meam, ut viderem quam turpus essum, quam distortus et sortitus, maculosus et ulcerosus. But while he spoke, you, my lord, turned me around toward myself, so that I no longer turned back on myself where I had placed myself while I was not willing to observe myself. And you showed me my face so that I might see how ugly I was, how disfigured and dirty, blemished and ulcerous. 45. 3. The character of an enactment only he loses you who leaves you he who leaves you, to where does he flee, if not from you as the merciful one to you as the wrathful one? This is the decisive conception. 5. Augustine's position on art de musica. Supplement following 13e. Ch. 33. Important for Augustine's position on art in particular, on music. 1. May not extract an analysis of art from Augustine. His basic motives are important. Art must be integrated into a higher complex. Likewise, aesthetics. It must explicate the aesthetic objects such that they are grasped as a path to absolute beauty Neoplatonic conception. For this, Augustine's statement in the retractation is about his book De Musica Libri Vi is characteristic. Of the six books on music, the sixth one is the most crucial one because it deals with its object in an authentic mode of knowledge, namely in the following way it is shown how the transition is possible from the sensible and mental relations of numbers, which themselves are changeable, to the unchangeable relations of numbers, which themselves are an unchangeable truth. De Musica is Augustine's formal aesthetic in this book, he delivers a theory of numbers and a doctrine of relations. He distinguishes five different species of numbers Musicar as Beni Modulandi music is the art of playing well. 1. Numerian ipso sono numbers in the sound 46. 2. Numerian ipso sensu audientis numbers in the auditory sense itself 47. 3. Numerian ipso actu pronunciandis numbers in the act of pronunciation 48. 4. Numerian ipso memoria numbers in memory 49 as they are in consciousness. 5. Numerian ipso naturali judicio sentendi numbers in the natural judgment of the perceiving listener, 50 or numeri additionals numbers of judgment. In these numbers in themselves lies the motive of the transition toward the unchangeable. Augustine does not offer a psychological presentation, but the manner of comportment in listening. Cf. In the Inerations and Samos, the frequent designation of the New Testament is Canticus Novus New Song. Cantare est Rizamantis singing is the loving thing. The interpretation of art taking art back into the wholeness of factical human life, albeit in such a way that it is not metaphysically formed out, but has its determinate place on the basis of the order of value from out of the summum bonum. However, these considerations may not be severed from the whole context, or else phenomena are overlooked. Augustine's own words about de musica are characteristic for this those who read these books will find that we are dealing with things in art not on the basis of taking an evasive stance in which we then dwell, but from out of the necessity to understand art itself as a path. Illo zigitur libris quilegit, invenient nos com grammaticis et poeticis animus, non habitandi election said itinerandi necessitate versatos and so, whoever reads the preceding books will find us dwelling with grammatical and poetical minds, not through choice of permanent company, but through necessity of wayfaring.51. Even if the way is base wheelis via, the goal does not have to be base. These writings have been written for those who deal with worldly science and literature, and who are entangled in manifold errors, and who squander their good mental capacities on little things and new just without seeing what is really valuable e be delected what is delightful therein the objects with which they are dealing. The entire structure of de musica has to be understood in this context. The individual numeri and their order has to be understood on the basis of the basic orientation toward the summum bonum. This order stems from Neoplatonic aesthetics. 6. Vitere lucam deum to see God the light. Supplement following 13 grams. Dacus meum my glory, said about go to Neoplatonic thought. Lux light, determined through the Neoplatonic tradition and the Gospel of John, both of which go back to Greek philosophy. John 14. In it the word was life, which was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. Connection to the question of grasping God. Cf. Augustine's commentary on the Gospel of John Tractatus and Ioannis Evangelium and Letter 146 to Videndo Deo The older writings are frequently different. Lux and Lumen are to be distinguished. Lux in an objective sense, what is present is the object of seeing Regina color and the Queen of Colors. Lumen brightness, always of the soul. Cf. 
quiestrinum evangeliorum libre duo si quad luminest in te tenebrae sunt, ipsi tenebrae quanti mathi vi, 23? Lumen dissit bonum intentionem mentis, quae operam er tenebras autum ipsa opera appellate, sive quia ignorator abilis quo animo illa facimus, sive quia eur mexitum etium ipsi nesimus, id est, quomito exient at qui provenient is quibus nos ie bono animo impendimus if the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness itself mat. 623? Light speaks of the good intention of the mind with which we labor but darkness calls itself labor, be it because it does not know of another soul through which we may do things, or because we do not know their ruin even in itself, that is, how they go out and flourish through those things that we use in that good soul. 52 They are those in whose direction we intended them, with good intentions. Tractatus to Ioannis Avon Helio Ion John et Vita Eret Lux Hominum et Ex Ipsa Vita Verbi Hominum Illuminander. Pecor non Illuminander. Quia pecor and non habent rationales mentis, quae possent vitere sapientiam and life was the light of men and through the life itself of the word men are illuminated. Animals are not illuminated because animals have no rational minds which are able to see wisdom. 53 The truth of life not theoretical. 119 said forte stult accorda ad hu capere istam lucem non posunt, quia pecatis sus agravanture non ideo cogitant quasi absentem esse lucem. Ipsi and impropter pecata tenebrae sunt but perhaps foolish hearts cannot grasp that light because they are weighed down by their own sins but they should not think, therefore, that the light is absent for they are darkness themselves because of their sins. 54 Quomito homo positus in sol secus, prisens est illi sol, said ipsi soli absens est he is not to be had for the sun, whereas the sun is waiting for him possibly, the sun is objectively at his disposal sic omnis stultus, omnis iniquis, omnis impius, secus est cord. Prisens est sapientia, sed cum caico prisens est, oculus eus absens est quid ergo faciat iste? Mundeto culos unde posset wit eridaeus. Quia sorta de set socios oculus habere just as a blind man stands in the sun, the sun is present to him, but he himself is absent to the sun he is not to be had for the sun, whereas the sun is waiting for him possibly, the sun is objectively at his disposal so every fool, every unjust man, every impious man, is blind in his heart. Wisdom is present, but since it is present to a blind man, it is absent from his eyes so what should that man do? He is to purify his eyes so that God can be seen. Because he had sordid and wounded eyes. Then that which corrupts pulvis, fumus dust, smoke seen is removed by the physician so that you can see what is meant for your eyes. Tala on dista omnia, et vitibus sapientium take all of this away, and you will see wisdom. Matt. For blessed are the pure in heart, etc. How does this purification of the eyes proceed? Through faith. Acts of the Apostles 159 and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith after he purified their hearts through faith. Monday Cor Fides Day, Mundum Cor Videt Deum Faith in God purifies the heart, the pure heart sees God. Through what faith qualified he is the heart purified? The demons, too, fear God and have a kind of faith in him, that is, not the right kind. Acts of the Apostles. Answer Fides Qua per Delectionum Operator Galat. V6 Sparat Quad Deus Policitor. Nihil is to definition perpetuous, nihil perfectious. Ergo tria sunt elephides, spes, caritas faith which works through love gal, hopes for what God promises. There is no more perfect, more thought out definition than that. So we have these three faith, hope, love. Comes as tergo fidei spes. Necessary equip spes s therefore, hope is the companion of faith. Hope is indeed necessary. 59 As long as we do not see what we believe. So that we do not fall. This is a Plotinian concept, in a good Christian refunctioning. Tola fidem, parat quad credis, then what he believes will perish till a charitatum, parat quad augis. Fidei and impertinent credis fides equals fiducia equals trust, as in Luther charity pertinent, ut augis take away faith, and what you believe perishes, then what he believes will perish take away love, and what you do perishes. For it belongs to faith that you may believe faith equals trust equals trust, as in Luther it belongs to love that you act. Et modo ipsa fides quid agit? And what does faith itself do? All the testimonies from scripture, all doctrines and the corresponding instructions, what do they do? Only that we see per speculum in enigmata via mirror in an enigma.62 but merely because faith does only that, there is no reason that you, in turn, return a distam facium tuum to that face of yours. 63 to your own makings that is, to what you have made of God for yourself, as an object. Fakim Cordis Cogita think of the face of the heart. 64 God in his objecthood and der G. Gen Standlichkeit, as appropriated by the heart in its authentic life.
Kohe Kortuam Conjetera Divina Force your heart to think about divine matters, 65 Do not leave it alone. To interpret this as subjectivism is misguided. We are dealing with the condition of access to God. God is not made rather, the self gains the enactmental condition of the experience of God. In the concern for the self lie life, God is present. God is object in the sense of the facies cortis face of the heart operates in the authentic life of human beings. Shut out all those similar bodily things that leap into the mind of the one thinking in this way. You cannot say of God that is how he is, but only non est hoc this is not what he is. When will you be able to say that is what God is? Nec com vidi bisqui ineffable est quad vidi bis not when you will see him, because what you will see is ineffable. 66 Cogitant ergo tibi de Deo. A current ali qua fortasse in humana specie mirror et amplissima magnitudo so when thinking about God, perhaps some vast and wonderful shape in vaguely human form occurs to you 67 for example, God is compared to an enormous human being. However, when you are engaged in this effort, finisti alicubi si finisti, deus non est. Si non finisti, facies ubi est? Somewhere you have reached the end of it if you have reached the end of it, it is not God. If you have not reached the end of it, where is the face question mark 68 quid agis, stelta et carnalis cogitatio. What are you doing, foolish and carnal thinking question mark 69 you have created monstrosities for yourself and yet you have removed yourself further and further from God. Another makes God even larger by simply adding a yard. An objection from scripture is raised against this sermo 53, ch. 12 n. 13. This matter is important for Augustine's interpretation of scripture. From Isaiah, a contradicting passage is drawn upon Isa. 661, where God is thought of as a giant human being. Heaven is my throne. Augustine responds to this you did not read it to its end. Who measured the heaven with the palm of his hand? The thought of Munder purifying, as a condition of access, is already present in the earlier philosophical writings of Augustine, a Platonic thought, in Platonus connected to his conception of Assisus. The Munder is enacted through the Fides Christiana Christian faith not through demonic faith. Fides is an enactmental complex of trust and love the posture of expectation must be present. Every cosmic metaphysical reification of the concept of God, even as a rational concept, must be warded off. One has to appropriate the facies, cortis face of the heart inwardness for oneself. God will be present in the inward human being when we will have understood what breadth, length, height, depth latitudo, longitudo, altitudo, profundamian, and therewith, the sense of the infinity of God for the thought of the heart. Ponder within yourself when I say extension. Do not leap away with your imagination to the measurements of earthly extension. Understand everything in te and yourself. Latitudo equals richness, wealth and good works longitudo equals persistence and perseverance altitudo equals expectation of that which is above you sursum core the heart upwards profundum equals God's grace. All this is not to be understood according to an objective symbolism, but rather referred back to the enactmental sense of inner life. Symbolism of the cross latitudo where the hands are fixed longitudo the body that stands altitudo the expectation of g profundum concealed on from its 70. Delectio love if you count it, it is one plotinian, but if you consider it, it contains many moments. Si deus delectio, quisquis diligit delectionum, deum deligit if God is love, whoever loves love, loves God.71. Every love includes a certain benevolence benevolentia for the one who is loved. Sensuous love equals amor. Delectio relates to things of higher value. We do not love the human being in the way the Lord asked Peter do you love me? But we also should not love the human being in the way Germans talk when they say I love wild game. The Germand loves them only to kill them. So he loves them such that they are not non esse One may not love human beings in this way, assigning them into one's own aims. Friendship, however, is something like benevolentia after all, a gift of our love. But what if there were nothing of our love that we could give? Since one loves, the pure benevolence as such suffices. We ought not and may not wish for miseries that enable us to do good deeds. Take away human misery and good deeds disappear. The work of mercy disappears, but the glowing of noble love remains. Originally per me aims? You love through me, you love the human being in happiness, to whom you have nothing to give. Such love is pure and more noble if the other is noble you elevate yourself, you attribute to yourself the achievement and you view the other to whom you give something as submissive to you.72. So wish for an equal to whom you cannot give anything in human affairs, so that he stands with you under the one to whom nothing at all can be given by humans. In this opt-air wishing, you appropriate the possibility of genuine loving. Authentic love has a basic tendency toward the delectum, utsit being loved so that he may be. 
Thus, love is the will toward the being of the loved one. The content of the sense of being must correspond to the particular kind of the loved object. Love of oneself eigenleib has the tendency to secure one's own being, but in the wrong way not as self-concern but as the calculation of the experiential complex in relation to one's self-world. Thus, self-loves albstliba is really self-hate. Eliminate the secondary meaning of hate. Communal worldly love has the sense of helping the loved other toward his existence, so that he comes to himself. Genuine love of God has the sense of wishing to make God accessible to oneself as the one who exists in an absolute sense. This is the greater difficulty of life. The problem of the phenomenological study of emotional acts, placed in the framework of the schema of the complex and order of value ranking, is nonsensical. The problem of love must be removed from the axiological realm. F. Brentano's so-called phenomenological analysis of acts runs exactly counter to the genuine tendency of phenomenology. Objecthood of God. Deus lux, delectio, summum bonum, incommutabilis substantia, summa pulchritudo god light, highest god, unchangeable substance, highest beauty. In each of these determinations, different modes of access, and different modes of the point of departure and of the motive for the access, show themselves. Further, different modes within the access, within what is experienced in the access to be explicated later. The means of determination will be taken from different fields. Finally, different modes of forming out through the means of explication, which are at times self-illuminating that is, they arise from a new point of departure in one's own experience at other times, they keep within the traditional framework sometimes entirely, sometimes in a modified form. On the whole, however, the explication of the experience of God in Augustine is specifically Greek in the sense in which our entire philosophy is still Greek. We have not arrived at a radical critical posing of the question and consideration of the origin destruction. This is especially true in reference to the determination of the objecthood of God from the modes of access. Here, it is also questionable whether all modes of access themselves are original. The modes of access have a connection in the current enactment, in the facticity of experience itself. An orientation toward the different attitudinal possibilities, faculties of reason, and the like, leads us astray, both in an ordering classification and in a transcendental formulation of the problem. One has to liberate oneself from this if one wishes to understand the problems of enactment. This liberation is not enacted all at once rather, it is itself a task of gaining access as such. For this problem, Augustine's treatment of the tenediones may serve as a guide. For the different directions of the tenediones are not gained by way of a classification according to the faculties of the soul, but in the factical enactment of Christian life. This becomes clear in progressing from the concupiscentia carnis desires of the flesh to the ambitio saculi secular ambition. 7. Intermediary consideration of T. Timor Castus chaste fear. Supplement following 16. As a complementary discussion, the phenomena of the love of God and the fear of God shall be treated in view of the objecthood of God that is rendered closer through them. By falling into tentatio, one forsakes the possibility of a genuine love and of a pure fear of God vel non amarite, nec cast time irte that men neither love you nor fear you chastely. 73 The team or day fear of God characterizes a decisive moment of the experiential complex in which God becomes an object g gent stand like veert. This is supposed to rid us of the misunderstanding that the real experience consists in a certain act of a theoretical or non-theoretical kind or in a connection of parts of such acts. Rather, the experience of God in Augustine's sense is not to be found in an isolated act or in a certain moment of such an act, but in an experiential complex of the historical facticity of one's own life. This facticity is what is authentically original. From it, isolated modes of comportment can be separated out and, in being torn loose from it, they can lead to an empty conception of religiosity and theology. The tendency of Amare to love is a concern for oneself, the genuine Amor Sui self love is love of oneself. Exactly this leads us into temptation. For this reason, it is precisely here that serious trouble molestia arises. Since the individual is entirely on his own, the greatest danger emerges, the danger that he forms his possible communal world for which he puts on airs from out of himself. From this latter consideration, Augustine comes to the tremor cordis sui trembling of his heart. 74 This is a phenomenon that is constitutive of the concern for oneself, the genuine timor fear. Slipping away from it is a self removal from the cast time your te chaste fearing of you, the pure fearing of God. What now is the genuine timor castus chaste fear as opposed to the non genuine timor servilis servile fear? 1. The time here in general and its possible motives. 2. Opposition timor castus timor servilis. The how of the motivating effect. 3. 
What sense does genuine fear have in connection with experiencing oneself? That is, at once, in the basic experience of God. How does God become an absolute object? Absolute G. Jensh Tondlik in genuine fear? How is his objecthood determined on this basis? NB our interpretation is still moving on a preliminary level we do not yet have the authentic phenomenological concepts. Augustine begins with the concrete enactmental complex of fearing. He analyzes the non-time you're not fearing and its possible motives. He describes the mind of someone who claims to be without fear. In this, Augustine gains two motivational directions of not fearing, and thus, the starting point of the division between Timor Castus chaste fear and Timor serveless servile fear. He links time here with delir feeling pain delir as a disposition of the mind, not pain but distress. In this, he begins with a non delir or sanitas health, of which different kinds are distinguished. In narrations in Samos, ad P's. 55, v. 4 non timeo I do not fear. Question as to the cause a cause. The cause may be one. The prey is umptio, spes, trust two. Derisha heartening multi anonymia superbia nihil timid for many do not fear anything in excessive pride. 75. Aliudes sanitas corporis, aliud stupor corporis dullness, aliud immortalitas corporis. Sanitas quid imperfecta, immortalitas est something else is the health of the body, and yet something else the stupor of the body dullness, and yet something else the immortality of the body. Indeed, perfect health is immortality. 76. However, there is already health in this life when we are not sick. What does this show? There are three affections corporis conditions of the body 1 sanitas health, 2 stupor stupor, dullness, 3 immortalitas immortality. 1. Sanitas e gratutinum non hobbit sed tamen quando tangitur et molestatur, delay health does not have sickness, but it is painful when one is being touched and disturbed. 77. 2. Stupor autum non delay amizit sensum dolores, tondo and sensibilior. Quanto pedra but stupor feels no pain it has lost the sense of pain the more insensitive, the worse it is. 78. 3. Immortally does it has no pain, since the possibility of corruptio corruption, temptation has been taken from. Thus, with stupor and immortally does, there is no pain, but this does not mean that the stupid is stupefied, del person is immortalis immortal. On the contrary the delir of the healthy person is closer to immortality than is the dull person's lack of pain vicinior est immortalitati sanitas dolentis, quam stupor non sentientis the pain of the healthy one is closer to immortality than is the stupor of the insensitive one. Eighty. At times, arrogant people are seen as braver than Jesus who says my soul is sad until death. That cannot be. He who does not feel the pain because of his insensitivity has not put on immortality but has taken off sensitivity non immortality and dutus, said Sensu Exutus 81. Do not keep your soul in a state without passion. Genuine bravery requires the possibility of fear. The delectary to be delighted itself is eliminated in the one who is hardened, although, in this hardening itself, there is still a certain sense of delectary. Agreeableness with everybody is insensitivity, but not true tranquility. Having no fear and trusting something is what is genuine the fiducia trust, as always holding on to something connection with spes hope and a more caritas love charity, love. The interpretation of two textual passages that seemingly contradict each other. 1. 1 John 418 Timor non est in charitate there is no fear in love. There is no fear in authentic love. 2. Psalms 18, v. 10 Timor Domini Castus, permanence in saculum saculi the fear of the Lord is chaste enduring forever and ever. An observation of the interpretation of scripture follows a comparison of two passages with the consonants consonantia of two flutes. The contradiction is resolved by the distinction between two kinds of fear Timor castus chaste fear and non castus non chaste fear. See enum adhuc propter penis times deum, known to may amaze came sick times. Non bona desideras, said Malakaves for if you as yet fear God because of punishment, you do not love whom you thus fear. You do not desire the good things, but you are afraid of the evil ones. 82 Timor non anum benedex amore dei, said ex Timor poeni this fear does not come from love of God, but from fear of punishment. 83. But he who has begun to strive for the good for its own sake lives in pure fear. Qui est Timor castus? Neomit is ipsa bona. Intendite. Aliud est timir deum, ne mitit de in gehanum cum diabolo aliud est timir deum, ne resedite what is chaste fear? The fear that you lose the good things. Mark. It is one thing to fear God lest he cast you into hell with the devil, and another thing to fear God lest he forsake you. 84 This fear does not have the direction of keeping something or someone at bay, but of pulling something or someone toward oneself. 
Time ear separation ms to mer veritatum fearing separation I loving the truth. In this fear, the soul feels the majest is day majesty of God. Pure fear is connected to trust. See times latronim if you fear the robber, you, hope for somebody else's help, not for help from the one who threatens you most of all the robber. But if you fear God this way, to where should you turn? This abilo fugere? Ad ipsum fuge. This fugere aberrato, fuge ad placatum. Placabus, cease pers you want to flee? Flee to him. You want to flee from wrath, flee toward reconciliation. You will reconcile if you have hope. 85. The first fear team or serviless servile fear, the fear of the world from out of the surrounding world and the communal world, is the anxiousness that grips and overwhelms a person. By contrast, team or cast as chaste fear is the self life fear that is motivated in authentic hope, in the trust that is enlivened from out of itself. This fear forms itself within myself from out of the relation in which I experience the world, in connection with the life's concern for authentic self experience. Nam si non times, offert Deus, quid edit for if you do not fear, God carries off what he gave. Precisely in fear, I keep a bonum good thing. 8. The being of the self. Concluding part of lecture. Vita life is no mere word, no formal concept, but a structural complex which Augustine himself saw without, however, yet achieving sufficient conceptual clarity. Today, this clarity has still not been attained, because Descartes moved the study of the self as a basic phenomenon in a different, falling direction. Modern philosophy in its entirety has not been able to rid itself of this. Descartes blurred for was heard Augustine's thoughts. Self-certainty and the self-possession in the sense of Augustine are entirely different from the Cartesian evidence of the Cogito. Cf. De Civitate Dei, Lib. 11, circa 26 ff. Following the dogma of the Trinity, Augustine considers the human being. Cf. The Treatise to Trinitate. We find in ourselves an image of the highest Trinity, for 1. Sumus we are esse. 2. We know about ourselves, as such nos. 3. We love the knowledge about our own being amare. These are the determinations of the authentic being of the self. In his autum trebus nulla knows false it is very similar sturb ad moreover, in these three statements we are not confused by any falsity masquerading as truth.86 These are not objects rather, without the stormy play of the imagination, that being which I know I love is most certain to me. Thus, it is certain one that we love being, two that we love the nos knowing, three that we love the love itself in which we love ipso amor quo amamus the love itself that we love. Ebsi nostrum non habibit mortem, ebi nos nostrum non habibit terrorum, ebi amare nostrum non habibit affection then our being will not possess death, then our knowledge will not possess error, then our loving will have no obstacle.87. Although we have a self-certainty of our being, we are nonetheless uncertain as to how long we have to live quam dio futurum sit how long the future may be, whether our being will not let go at some point. The self-certainty must be interpreted from out of factical being it is possible only from out of faith. Methodologically, it is important that one may not view this evidence in isolation, which would constitute a falling. The evidence of the cogito is present, but it must find its foundation in the factical. For every science ultimately rests in factical existence. The Philosophical Foundations of Medieval Mysticism Outlines and Sketches for a Lecture, Not Held, 1918-1919 The Philosophical Foundations of Medieval Mysticism 1. The formulation is ambiguous. Phenomenological research into religious consciousness is the driving problem and method. This means 1. Negatively renunciation of constructive philosophy of religion, 2. Negatively non-absorption in the purely historical as such, 3. Tracing back to the genuinely clarified and genuinely originally seen phenomena to pure consciousness and its constitution. But herein lies the problem gaining and understanding such phenomena in the first place out of the historical thesis and its facticity in phenomenological primordial understanding. In regard to this principal original tendency and this is the only genuinely scientific one pronounced project involves a limitation in several respects, and indeed precisely when we become conscious of the ambiguities. First of all, turning to this, there arise. A. The theme can be viewed purely according to the history of philosophy. Philosophical foundations means then the metaphysical presuppositions, the epistemological views, the ethical doctrines, and above all the scientific aspect of the sphere of experience, the psychological positions of medieval mysticism. In this, the latter is understood as much as a form of experience as it is understood as and especially live theory and doctrine thereof and at the same time as metaphysical interpretation and illumination on its basis. 
Pursuing these foundations in the history of philosophy leads us to Augustine, Neoplatonism, Stoicism, Plato, and Aristotle. With this, philosophical foundations receives a different meaning, depending on how mysticism is to be understood. The four conception of mysticism can be clarified to a certain extent from the beginning, insofar as the differences are separated into entirely different regions I experience life or lapeness leaven too. Theory of the experienced mystical theology and its theoretical metaphysical utilization religious, mystical worldview 3. Theory of the experiencing itself 4. What is tightly and in part necessarily bound up with I experiential guidance of experience itself, not to be confused with 3 which taken genuinely is what phenomenological understanding in its original return means, but which certainly may then no longer be characterized as theory. Re. 4. The forms and shapes of practical guidance and realization and their teleology and structure, themselves experiential, not yet seen asceticism. Why precisely for? In mystical religiosity? Because here, the religious world concentrates on the turbulence of the specific experience of the finding of God that secludes itself. Question in what direction and aim does our investigation regarding medieval mysticism proceed, if the primordial scientific, phenomenological goal genuinely guides us? Which aspects of mysticism? and how do they come into consideration? How is understanding guided and motivated? This means b. How must the theme be understood primordial scientifically? Question mark 2. This leads to problems of principal regional division of worlds of experience their completeness a spurious problem historical position in pure consciousness. Are all equally primordially historical? Genesis of the basic level also in the religious? Experience and concept. Our goal can never be to awaken religious life. That only occurs through such life itself. Difficulty only a religious person can understand religious life, for if it were otherwise, he would have no genuine reality. Certainly, but does this have any systematic or methodological disadvantages? It means only hands off for those who do not feel genuinely at home here. That holds everywhere. On the other hand, experiences are brought into the sphere of absolute understandability precisely through primordial understanding. They are understood, and indeed genuinely so and as such, they are themselves experienced but not themselves in the sense of being unedited. Opposition self is edited and unedited. Above all, understandability does not mean rationalization, dissolution of experience into its logical components. The phenomenological primordial understanding is so little prejudiced not in the sense of neutral, rather originally absolute that it carries within itself the possibilities of entering into the different worlds and forms of experience. It may not be thrown together with the specifically or regionally theoretical. In order to arrive at the primordial theoretical, a new destruction of the situation situation Schurstorum within the theoretical itself is required modification to original seeing Ursprungszehen. To be carried out further, and likewise in order to illustrate the phenomenon of religious experience. Understanding religious experiences, access to their forms of expression. How does a religious experience express itself? Prayer is expression an individual starting point for return and entry. The relational motif reference of this entire problematic. Ultimately this holds true for the entire phenomenology. If we approach the religious life itself, genuinely and purely methodically which fundamental strata, forms, turbulences are found there? How is this life constituted? In this question of constitution one may not be misled by analogy with the theoretical and the constitution of the object of cognition, in the sense that one inquires only, raw and naked, into the religious thing or object. Rather, One has to begin purely and, without prejudging the matter with the fundamental turbulences and their motivational genesis the fulfillments of an entirely originary originary and I can. I? Here one must always pay attention to the levels and preforms and types of completion as well. These and the resulting of the result is itself always to be taken into the idea and essential motivation. Mysticism in the Middle Ages Medieval mysticism is form of expression of religious experience. Philosophical foundations has several meanings intentionally without prejudging. It means the means for the formation of the expression, means for the ways of experience itself, means for the systematics conceptual expression. Medieval mysticism is form of expression forms of expression of religious experience in general. The problem of expression is such. C.F. Sprenger, Vokeltfest Schrift interpretive expression justifying expression. Problem of the fulfillment of experience in principal connection with it. To extract the moments of constitution in medieval mysticism phenomena of love of God in particular. Understanding from out of the genuine aspect of consciousness precisely to dismiss the scholastic Aristotelian, Platonic explanations and in part misinterpretations. 
reigning viewpoint motivation, and consequently, also to research the doctrine of causes. Always to be separated in the investigation are pure experience as such, the expression the expressing elements, the explanation interpretation, the employment. The forms of experience are always only and only to be taken in their essence from out of their genuinely possible situations and situational circles. At issue is the concrete fullness precisely in the Eidos, not isolated deduced concepts of genera. Problem of the eidetic concretion, and that always at once with full fitting into a general structure of experience and possibilities of modification. Time therein, freed from its linear spatial conception, not as bare frame of construction, but as motive. The experiential effects of power, grace, wrath of God. Constitution of religious objecthood is God constituted in prayer? Or is he already somehow religiously pre-given in faith love? And prayer a special comportment toward God? To what extent is there a possible multiplicity of constitutional types? Is there an essential connection between them? Pay attention to the view that the Middle Ages had of emotional life. And indeed how? Released from the specific scholastic character.4. Mysticism Directives A constituting moment comportment toward the world negative irrepulsive? To integrate the phenomenon and really localize it. To extract the problem as a fundamental one of constitution. Therein to separate I. The religious person in himself, too. The one coming around to religiosity. The latter type is derivative, and the ways of coming are to be understood only out of I. Return to the phenomenological aspects of the world and access to its constitution. The medieval image of the world may here not disturb the in itself of phenomenal givenness, as long as only naturalistic and metaphysical explanations are taken not as a theoretical result about, but rather as motivated by, a particular aspect of world. This aspect itself is to be taken into account. Seclusion its primordial motivation in the religious, also in the form of devotion to the world, also in Luther.5. What is the positively constituting, and out of what common ground are these negative and positive turbulences motivated? Is this a genuine characterization at all? Seclusion not a theoretical not seeing, but an emotional one, in its primordial form precisely religious, and accordingly the ways and steps to it is repulsion. Here, it also becomes questionable, whether the genuine is reached, with the bare seeing of God as the positive side of seclusion whether the form of unification is not a different one. Love. Construction starting points. The constitution of the experience of God birth of God. The specific a priori of natural corruption not capacity, humble letting be glass and hide, gratia operans gratia cooperans. To see everything in pure consciousness and to understand it as motivation. To understand the absolute originarily as religious, independent of any naturalistic theoretical observation and valuation of being. It is precisely seen from out of the religious. The motive of mysticism in absolute history is the preparation of Fides faith. Realization of humilitas humility through seclusion. Mysticism gave Luther a world of inner experience and also showed him the methodical way to win it and to expand it. For this reason, the motive of humilitas could also not by itself impede the happy, secure unfolding of fiducia. The humilitas, the tribulatio, comes to express itself as the personal certainty of salvation. 6. The basic kinds of fulfillment of religious experiences, the motivating forms of constitution and formation of the fulfillment of given experiences revelation, tradition, congregation. A part of the ontology of religion, major aim phenomenology. Only a certain strongly methodical radius. No high-flying philosophy of religion. We stand at the beginning, or more precisely we must go back to the genuine beginnings, and the world can calmly wait. For as a religious person I need no trace of the philosophy of religion. Life generates only life, but not the absolute intuition Chao is such an entirely original material complex with its own laws. Faith and Knowledge the problem moves within a falsely one-sided epistemologically oriented sphere and is therefore no genuine problem at all, insofar as one has once seen the originary problem of the origin of worlds of experience. A certain real kernel of legitimacy which for a long time has still not been purely worked out, and which can be worked out only on the basis of the above in the problem of theology as the science of faith in contrast to the other sciences. Sharply divorce the problem of theology and that of religiosity. In theology one must take care to note its constant dependency on philosophy and on the situation of the respective theoretical consciousness in general. Theology has heretofore found no original theoretical basic posture that corresponds to the originality of its object. On note 1, p. 67 Protestant faith and Catholic faith are fundamentally different. Noetically and noematically separated experiences. 
in Luther an original form of religiosity one that is also not found in the mystics breaks out. The holding to be true of Catholic faith is founded entirely otherwise than the fiducia of the reformers. Phenomena which first come to be understood within the doctrine of the constitution of the religious world in general. From there also the concept of grace differentiates itself, and with it, the entire relationship of grace and freedom, nature and grace and the meaning of the phrase gracious upon it naturam grace underlies nature the doctrine of the iustificatio and the conception of the sacrament. In turn, the religious sense complexes are qualitatively entirely otherwise in primordial Christianity. The development of theology out of its various motives and its relationship to faith. Irrationalism 7. The chatter about mysticism as the formless is merely talk of fundamentally unscientific methods of conceptual or clever oppositions. One reduces it to formulas, which is to say, says nothing substantial and cannot, in clinging to a word and a dogma. One intends what is correct religious experience is not theoretical. But what does theoretical mean, and what does not theoretical mean? In order to first of all reach this differentiation, I must understand from a higher point and without prejudice. The concepts of understanding, and all understanding in the genuinely philosophical sense, have not the slightest to do with rationalization. What does it mean to destroy experience? What lies within this indicated destruction surstirring then, as soon as one becomes clear about its aim and its necessity? No substitution, no dissolution into concepts, no better explanation, not an active, likewise originary, motivation of the experience in question. As if now the philosophy of religion could after all encourage and enliven religion and the religious. But one can, after all, do only one thing in the case of the inauthentic platitudes and constructive conceptuality, push aside into regional districts of life, into a fabricated dimension of alleged philosophical problems. Historical pre-givenness for Jajab and Hyde and the finding of essence. Pre-givenness has precisely grown into essential constitution. The problem must be divided into different strata, and all inauthentic and alleged difficulties are to be excluded. The question of whether non-religious persons understand the analysis as well as to be distinguished from the question of whether only religious persons can have a genuine absolute givenness. Further, whether that somehow limits the essential validity of the analysis, which, after all, is entirely independent of the number of those who recognize and understand. From this, the entirely different question is to be distinguished in how far a completion of the essential determination can be reached through one historical formation or through several. Essence essence constituting determinateness, that is to say, essentially, belonging to the essential. And essence totality is essential fullness and essential completion of the essential complex of what belongs to essence. And the corresponding constitutive correlates and modes of comportment and attitude. Religious Phenomena Problem silence as religious phenomenon in connection with the problem of irrationality. Worship exuberant astonishment. All things and values to be differentiated from the nothing non-being, non-value, their being emphasized, model plastic of existentiality. Phenomenology of admiration and astonishment bewundering and verwunderung admiration something higher than. Each does ionizes an emphasis in relation to what? Thus also a brightness hellish kite, grows up through particular illuminations or hellung and concept of the primary brightness hella primarily in the sense of an order of values. Irrationality and the problem of being. The religious a priori. The problem has no place outside of transcendental philosophy. Within modern psychology of religion, it is usually falsified and badly grounded. And the vivacity of the problem is in the least to be found in dogmatic, casuistic pseudo philosophies, which pass themselves off as such philosophies of a particular system of religion, for instance, Catholicism, and supposedly stand close to religion and the religious. Indeed, one ends up in the embarrassing predicament of having to be able to philosophically locate such a problem in the first place, since something like the philosophy of religion is unknown. In the environment and sphere of realization of such systems, the capacity of experience in regard to the different regions of value in general and the religious in particular, stagnates these being caused by a complete lack of original cultural consciousness. Apart from this, it is the fault a priori of the structure of the system had itself did not grow out of an organic cultural deed tat the value of content of religion as such, content to be experienced in its sphere of meaning, must first find its way through contorted, inorganic, theoretically entirely unclarified, dogmatic principles and evidential procedures, only to finally dominate, darkly burden, and repress the subject with police force as an ecclesiastical legal statute. Still further within itself, the system fully excludes an original genuinely religious experience of value. Where one personality, who belongs to such a system, brings to the fore the elementary force of experience despite this, 
there the experience of value succeeds only to the effect that the system is eliminated for the sphere of experience and a new kind of context is sought. Because a genuine sphere of experience and achievement, which as such must belong to the subject and must be of the subject, is at issue, such sweeping to the side and transcending of the system becomes, positively, some kind of loosening up of the subject sphere. Supplementary note already in the strongly natural scientific, naturalistic theoretical metaphysics of being of Aristotle and its radical elimination and misrecognition of the problem of value in Plato, which is renewed in medieval scholasticism, the predominance of the theoretical is already potentially present, so that scholasticism, within the totality of the medieval Christian world of experience, severely endangered precisely the immediacy of religious life, and forgot religion in favor of theology and dogma. And already in the early days of Christianity, these dogmata exercised a theorizing, dogma-promoting influence on the institutions and statutes of church law. An appearance such as mysticism is to be understood as an elementary counter-movement. But the turn itself occurs always only within the limits of the respective cultural consciousness, so that it carries within itself its conditions and constitutive factors as after-effects in themselves, due to which certainly a new kind of sphere may be discovered albeit such that it does not master the new sphere with radically new means but grasps and interprets it according to the principle of the genuine multiplicity of achievement. The loosening up within the subject sphere leads to a specific experience of the meaning and structure of the subject of mysticism. Object problem and the subject in scholasticism. The emergence of a new motivational complex in the experiencing subject. As impetus to a mystical theoretical superstructure. Means and aim of the rational mastering of this a theoretical sphere stem from cognitive psychology and object metaphysics. The ethical ought is methodological form of the constitution of objects in correlative to subject formation in mysticism. Central concept seclusion. Increase of inner vivacity. The structural character of the unity of object and subject. The specific irrationality of this mysticism. Before this, short presentation of the view of the religious a priori and transcendental value philosophy Vindelbond, Trielch. This natural necessity of the norm adverse in the empirical functions of reason is the general fundamental fact from which critical philosophy in all its disciplines begins it is, grasped in this generality, the problem of all problems, and likewise the touchstone of the philosophy of religion. This antinomial coexistence of norm and norm adverse in the same consciousness is the primordial fact, which can be shown but never conceptualized rather, out of this all problems of critical philosophy develop. 8. The holy is to be determined only through the epitome of the logical, ethical, and aesthetic norms. They are holy as the value contents of a higher reality of reason. The holy is thus the normal consciousness of the true, good, and beautiful, experienced as transcendental reality. 9. Religion is transcendent life. 10. Irrationality in Meister Eckhart. The immediacy of religious experience, the uncontained vivacity of devotion to the holy, godly, does not issue forth the form from out of itself and the contemplation of the genuine performance character rather, it emerges as the culmination of a particular historically determined epistemological doctrine and psychology, a culmination which, however, as such results in the new and the correlate of the vivacity of experience. One must get clear about this connection in order to really understand Eckhart's mysticism as such, and not fall into misinterpretations from the beginning. From here also first arises the concept of the specifically irrational in this mysticism. The irrational is not what lies before all rationality as the fullness of multiplicity. The decisive moment is not that of a lacking overview, of theoretical indomitability, of sinking into fullness, but rather because the object dos g gen standliche is approached in the essence or the form as the general or the universal, the value of object hood g gen standliche kind increases with the increase of the general ever expanding exclusion of particularizations from the form, out of the magnified emptiness of the same. Not the not yet determinable and not yet determined rather, that which is essentially without determination in general is the primordial object, the absolute. Corresponding to the fundamental principle that the same is recognized only through the same a thought the same becomes object only for the same theory of the subject, the soul eleven develops here also the process of undoing the multiplicity, of the rejection of the individual forces in their individuality and determinate directionality, the return to their ground, origin, and their root. Elimination of all change multiplicity, time, absoluteness of object and subject in the sense of radical unity and as such unity of both I meant, and it is I from this the namelessness of God and ground of the soul. In this sphere, no opposition and therefore the problem of the precedence of intellectuals intellect or volatiles will no longer belong to this sphere, although Eckhart necessarily requires a designation and characterization of mystical experience. 
an opinion that grasps the subject correlate of the absolute summation, as the totality of specific achievements and faculties, and correspondingly views the value of the holy as some kind of result of the true, good, and beautiful, is entirely misguided. Eckhart's fundamental conception you can only know what you are, 12 becomes conceivable only from out of specific concepts of cognition. Here cognition determines subject and object. The problem of universals is unclarified problem of objects suffused with a bad metaphysics of nature. Realism nominalism. Form of objectivity as general validity becomes the content and ontologically constitutive principle of the general universal universal. For the actual problem, nothing results because one does not go further to the subject which at least in nominalism lies along the way attempts in Scotus and in particular in his doctrine of meaning. Now, it is strange that in as extreme a realism as that of Eckhart, a progression to the subject is found. The motive is not a theoretical one, just as the return to the ground of the soul in general may not be grasped as a theoretical process. It remains a theoretical only Eckhart seeks to grasp it rationally and thus places it into theoretical contexts. The new motivational complex for the mystical theoretical superstructure stems from living religiosity, the living subject. Means and aim of rational mastery stem from cognitive psychology and a metaphysic of objects. Along with the generality character of the form of essence, the value of objecthood as such increases. Objecthood in general is indeed an empty form, but as object itself, the primordial object, the absolute. The process of progressive elimination of contents and differences, oppositions, has an essential relation to the ethical telos. Multiplicity disperses and unsettles life, the subject. From an ethical perspective, the vacillation is as such unworthy. In religious experience, what is most valuable is to me an object with a priori certainty. Thought theoretically, each possibility of what is unworthy, thus of the multiplicity, of opposition, of difference, must be held a distance from it. Absolute value coincides with absolute oppositionlessness, that is, lack of determination, which is to say coincides with the object mg gen stand like and only as the object. Only as such as it present to the mystical subject. And for this objecthood, the mystical subject must not be itself a subject beyond opposition, prior to opposition. Only in this way does the mystical theoretical meaning of the central concept of seclusion first become clear. The here and now. Space and time are the forms of the multiple and oppositional they offer no place to the perpetual now, to the supratemporal. Sensuousness is therefore not the subject correlate of the true objecthood, but neither is the understanding, as judging, pulling apart into the duality of subject and predicate. Reason and will, knowledge and love, however, lead to the absolute. Controversy regarding the primacy of each of the two faculties. Eckhart is not in favor of theoretical reason as juxtaposed to the will but rather of the primacy of the soul's ground, which is, mystical theoretically, ranked above both. In another regard, he sees precisely in free will, by virtue of its freedom and devotion to value, the faculty that is superior value. The form of objecthood in general becomes an absolute object gegenstand. The less the object g gen stand liche presents distracting content, stimulating a diverting and captivating apprehension, the more valuable and pure the objecthood itself becomes. On Schleiermacher's Second Address on the Essence of Religion Necessity of a Phenomenological Attitude Toward the Religious Experience For it belongs to the still ever-developing opposition of contemporary times against the old, that one is never any longer just one, rather each is everything. And thus it occurs, as the educated peoples have opened up such a many-sided commerce amongst themselves, that their own particular character in the individual moments of life no longer surface unmixed and such that in the sphere of human feeling such a wide-ranging and complete sociability is founded, that 13 no performance proceeds and takes effect in isolation, but rather is moved and pulled through by the obliging love and support of the others 14 and thus it remains most difficult to differentiate the reigning initiating force in this combination 15 that is, the essential meaning of the performance in its pure essence. Thus now everyone can understand each activity of the mind de geistus only in so far as he can, at the same time, find it and observe it within himself. 16. The reigning intention religion one now a kind of thinking, faith, its own way of observing the world, a theoretical formation two now a way of acting, its own lust and love, a special way of comporting oneself, and of moving inwardly, a practical phenomenon. Religion belongs to both sides. 17 most often, and also now, one appreciated the expressions, the documents of religion according to the profit they yielded for morals and metaphysics. So the cutting opposition of faith to morals and metaphysics, of piety against morality, is first to be shown. Thus religion renounces such pretensions and gives everything back what it lent there, 
or what was imposed upon it from there, so in order to rightly reveal and situate with determination its original and own particular possession. 18 Elimination of particular positings which carry within themselves an independent teleology within phenomenology This particular is valid in order to purely isolate out the individual teleologies for themselves. For what is your science of being striving, your science of nature, into which all that is everything real of your theoretical philosophy must still unite itself? To know, I think, the things in their own particular essence to show the special relationships through which each thing is what it is to determine each in its position in the whole and to correctly differentiate it from all the rest to place everything actual in its mutual condition necessity, and to demonstrate the unity of all appearances with their perpetual laws. The essence of religion is perceived without community with this knowledge, even if it ascends up to God as the highest order of the lawfulness of being. For the measure of knowledge is not the measure of piety. 19 Measure, that is, criterion of value. God placed in the sphere of knowledge, as the ground of the knowing and the known, is not the same as the pious way to have God and to know about Him. Reflection but trocting is essential to religion, not closed off stupidity. Reflection under this is grasped the excitement of the mind retracted from everything externally effectual. Twenty cents and taste for the infinite equals life of the finite immediately in us, as it is in the infinite. Twenty one. Infinite being with this it is impossible not to imply God. This particular meaning in the respective expression had been avoided, because otherwise with the idea itself, a certain kind of representation would have easily emerged and thus a decision would have been given or at least a critique would have been exercised, about the different ways to think God and world together and separately, which does not belong here at all. 22 Foreign teleology, and precisely the most dangerously confusing theoretical one, is eliminated. The point is to get down into the innermost holiness of life, 23 where the original relationship of feeling and intuition is to be found. But I must refer you to yourselves, to the grasp of a living moment. You must understand, likewise, for your consciousness to, as it were, eavesdrop on, or at least to reconstitute, this state out of the living moment for yourselves. You should notice here the becoming of your consciousness, rather than somehow reflecting on a consciousness that has already become. 24. The point is to uncover an original region of life and performance of consciousness or feeling, in which religion alone realizes itself as a certain form of experience. 25. From there we can read off 26 the elements of religion which, with that, proves to belong neither to a foreign teleology nor to corresponding foreign noetic contexts, and not to be determined in its meaning through them. Religion is to be sharply differentiated from what belongs to it. 27. Universe fullness of reality and uninterrupted flows and operations all individuals as parts of the whole. Religion is the specifically religiously intentional, emotional reference of each content of experience to an infinite whole as fundamental meaning. Devotion original streaming and of fullness, without restraint letting oneself be excited. To lead back the respective experience into the inner unity of life. Religious life is the constant renewal of this procedure. To act is then the repercussion of this feeling only acting in its entirety, not each individual act, should be determined in this way. Mysterious moment of unstructured unity of intuition and feeling, the one without the other being nothing. The noetic moment is itself constitutive for the noematic entire content of experience. Because any thetic character at all, any claim about being, is lacking, because nothing is decided about something, the fullness of experience stands in a certain neutrality no object takes precedence over any other. A specific infinity of religious experience is thus given. History in its most authentic sense is the highest object of religion, religion begins and ends in it. Humanity is to be seen as a living community of individuals in which isolated existence is to be lost. Do all with religion not from religion. Religion should accompany, like a holy music, all the doings of life. Phenomenology of Religious Experience and of Religion The Typical Forms and Formations of Religious Life and of Historical Consciousness The Independence of Religious Experience and its World is to be seen as an entirely originary intentionally with an entirely originary character of demands. Likewise originary are its specific worldliness and valuableness. Historical Fullness More precisely the few great uniquenesses of living religion is to be evaluated with the elements of meaning and experience of religious consciousness, and not according to extra-religious and especially not scientific standards. Only thus will religious life be maintained in its vivacity, and not be endangered by so-called scientific worldviews. Religion, just as any world of experience, can gain its form only in historical consciousness, and come to a totality no universality in the sense corresponding to each value region. No real religion allows itself to be captured philosophically or philosophy or in philosophy, moreover, 
can hardly offer a legitimate standard of criticism, insofar as it has grasped its true vocation cf. Historical consciousness. One of the most meaningful, founding elements of meaning in religious experience is the historical. However, that which gives the specifically religious meaning is already found in experience. The religious world of experience is centralized in its originality and in its theoretical theological separateness into one great unique historical form personally affecting fullness of life. The constitutive character of the concepts of revelation and tradition in the essence of religion is connected to this. Analysis of the not intellectualized phenomenon of faith The dogma historical material and primordial Christian material is to be divided on that point, and to be assessed phenomenologically. The phenomenon of trust and that of the co-given specific meaning of truth. Weakening the thinking of the transcendental a priori in its theoretical nature through the integration of the idea of a theoretical validity is still a rationalization of the problem of religious experience and faith. A legitimate tendency lies here, but with wholly inappropriate means in the framework of a heterogeneous, systematic transcendentalism. Over and against this, only phenomenology can offer rescue and philosophical need, but only if it remains pure in its radical moments of origin, if intuition is not theorized and the concept of essence is not rationalized according to the general idea of universal validity it can offer rescue only if essence is assured of the living possibilities of change and fullness of meaning corresponding to the different conduct of value and experience. The view that then the superhistorical sphere of essence as such given an intuition would be an imminent heightening of the respective experience itself, is to be energetically dismissed. Such realizes itself only in the specifically philosophical form of experience, where the intuited itself takes on an indeed new, and entirely genuine, kind of world character, corresponding to the subject comportment. The Absolute 28. The relation Stellung to God gives direction for our experiential comportment to Him. 29 What does relation to God mean? Meaningfully and constitutedly, only to be formulated as a comportment of consciousness, not, for instance, ontically, as being next to, or under, an absolute being. Rather, the opposite holds our experiential comportment to God primary one, because welling up within us by grace gives direction to the specifically religious constitution of God as a phenomenological object. Rhinox sees this also in a certain sense but does not take it as a methodological principle of the phenomenology of religion. Therefore, the determinations of sense of this had is, of the absolute are to be discovered only in the specific structures of the constituting experience and they are to be demonstrated to have the initially constituting moment of meaning with the character of having been experienced for the logical ontological element closed off, to being off no longer increasability. The weight of experience and the sphere of the contents of experience are different indeed, but in which functional connection? Perception of reality Wirkulich Keats' name on lies imminently contained in the meaning of experience itself. 30. Validity and cognitive meaning of religious experience is genuine and still today a problem entirely new kind of sphere, where mere analogizing with the aesthetic realm of values or with the taking of values in general does not suffice, if it does not, from the beginning, take us in the wrong direction. Here alone is the cure radical analysis. Critique of the fundamental concepts of metaphysics. The absolute determinable only in the respective sphere of experience. Inside the respective sphere, it receives its full concretion only in the way that it shows itself in a historicity historicitat and accordingly the analysis must incessantly show moving only within it historical as determinative element and always otherwise directed an effective element of coloration, as well as element of the living consciousness in general that gives primordial meaning and structure. The living unity of sense of living being, found in the sense structure of consciousness as historical per se, determines also? Somehow even if they're again beginning entirely originarily in the manner of a structure at specific worldliness of the sphere of experience concerned as a religious one. Conceptual material, such as absolute, highest standard, standard in general, taken from rationalistic metaphysics, separated from its constructive method, is not only inappropriate to a genuine sphere of experience insofar as it may not be brought in from above, methodologically or unmethodologically, in an a priori moment insofar as it further unexpectedly leads to a constructive dialectic, or at least allows it to lead of an in returning to the experience of such imparted conceptual content. Above all, this conceptual material has such a neutral, faded content, uncharacterized by the sphere of experience, that it is shown in serious investigation as not at all original to that is to say, as not being a conglomerate of sense elements that originarily arise from a sphere of experience. The critique of such fundamental concepts of metaphysics would have to show precisely the arbitrary, historically coincidental compositeness and collusion of its sense elements, 
above all the disastrous influence of the concept of nature and its many faceted elements such is also the case with the entire operating with the concept of infinity in Reinach, for example, in the opposition of leading into the infinite and containing infinity within itself. 31. Reinach speaks of innerly motivated transitions 32 and the experience of different absolutenesses formal ones can be experienced at all. And fulfilled ones as opposed to any logical theoretical development of their separation. Here again is seen the same methodological dualism, which, however, allows the basic direction toward the experiential to shine through. Phenomenon of motivation is here also significant in principle, as it is for the constitution of historical consciousness in general. Rhinox differentiation between explicit knowledge and knowledge imminent in experience is valuable. 33 The perception of reality is entirely otherwise in the feeling of shelter in God. Logically speaking, such perception would be the presupposition for that. But no one would draw the logical conclusion. Rather, it lies imminently contained in the sense of the experience. We must distinguish two things here on the one hand, the knowledge of being sheltered, and then, on the other, the knowledge of the existence of Godhead is to say, an immediately and immediately imminent knowledge. Only immediate knowledge dwells within the experiences of gratefulness and love as modes of taking a position, they are in a certain sense derivative experiences. 34. I experience an absolute dependency on God. Insofar as I myself, am participatory in this experienced relationship, this state of affairs does not stand before me rather I myself experience myself in this relationship, a relationship than which, naturally, cannot become an object to me. In this way, if I perceive an object, the corresponding relation of perception and object is not an object to me. Then, however, a difference immediately follows to me, in perception, the knowledge I perceive emerges with reflection on perception. Whereas in the experience of dependency I find author's emphasis myself dependent, without a reflection being necessary a reflection which could, after all, only lead to the knowledge that I feel myself dependent. 35. These brief suggestions are very significant, even if the analysis has yet to begin here. The absolute dependency, the absolute being sheltered, is not a fact. 36. Reinach also sees at once the problem of validity. It will be necessary to show that it cannot be disturbed from out of purely cognitive skepticisms, as long as what is specifically originary in the respective experiences, and above all the structure of primordial sense of historical consciousness, have been clarified. Hegel's original, earliest position on religion and consequences. Decisive influence of Kant, who from the beginning excludes an immediate relation to the holy, one founded on an original experiential relation. Morality is the guiding purpose, and so religion is degraded to a means. Meaning of the acts of Jesus to raise religion and virtue to morality. 37. This fundamental approach to religion as a means is decisive for the entire further spiritual geistige development of Hegel and is to be followed and critically presented in this direction. Further, it is to be seen to what extent the problem of the historical is thereby pushed onto a very determinate direction, and first becomes a philosophical problem in full originality and unbounded form. Problems. The experience of being in its typical form within particular periods of the history of ideas geistesschicht and within different worlds of experience lyrical poetry, art in general, science etc. For example, Verheeren and Verfil. Today it is, for instance, not characterized in connection or in summation, but teleologically, value-taking, as having the character of an act. Concept of life worlds, their principal structure determined through historical consciousness in general, their specific structure determined through what are the essential possibilities of their connections and complications. Faith. This title ranges over a multiplicity of modalities, which are not equal in the sense of species of a genus rather, among which one is distinguished from the rest primordial doxa, toward which the others are referred back in a certain way. Correlatively, the modalities of being. If the distantiation of modalities of faith from the primordial doxa and accordingly the referral back in each modality is a different one, such that a simple juxtaposition of species is excluded, then precisely the respective meaning of this distantiation and interpretation back is central. That means which moment of meaning in the primordial doxa is modified, and how is it modified. How that means also with what kind and extension of the modification to the plain entire content of the primordial doxa. Piety, faith. In Kam Sheba waiting you will find salvation, your strength consists of quiet trust I, Moses 30, 15 General 30 15. CF. The article Faith, in Die Religion in Geschichte und Gegenwart Religion in History and the Present, Volume 2, especially 3, where the analysis is, however, most inadequate, and 4. 
Glaube und Geschichte. Faith according to Trielch The Cognitive Moment of Piety 38 NB Faith in Luther. Faith is a unique religious, mythical symbolical, and practical way of thinking and knowledge, one that proceeds from historical personal expression, which believes in myth for the sake of the practical religious force conveyed by it, and which knows how to express, to communicate, and to objectivate these forces only through myth. 39. Structure and Type and Lawfulness of the Life of Faith. CF. Real Encyclopédie der Protestantische Kantelegie, Faith, Volume 6, 3rd Edition. On Schleiermacher, Christian Faith der Christliche Glaube and Phenomenology of Religion in General. Schleiermacher's characterization of piety as a determinateness of feeling or of immediate self-consciousness. 40 Historical Consciousness Stefan's description of feeling the immediate presence of an entirely undivided existence. 41. This authentic immediate self-consciousness, however, is not idea but rather feeling in the authentic sense, is in no way always only accompanying, 42 neither something confused nor something ineffectual. 43. The constitutive form of the somehow determined immediate self-consciousness circumscribes the sense of personal existence and integrates itself into the primordial constituting element of historical consciousness as such. What forms the moment of sense of the specific uniformity, unity, and continuity of personal consciousness? The having been affected from somewhere of consciousness is possible only on the basis of the essential openness to values and primary love of meaning of the personally existing being. What can be affected is not an empty page, no empty eye, no point like self, but rather only a personal being fulfilled and essentially longing for fulfillment, which has such a structure which makes possible for it being fulfilled by certain goods of the life world and, in being fulfilled, makes possible further growth and becoming felt. Feeling dependent is already too close to theoretical objectification, to an exit from oneself and an ascertaining of a relationship of this objectified self to another. Dependency is such this interpretive meaning is too raw, it objectifies too much in the direction of theory of being specifically that of the reality of nature. Rather, the primordial relationship must be interpreted as oscillating from soul to absolute spirit and the reverse of it such that it shows a structure in which the possibilities for fulfillment according to the structure are inherent in the most multifarious way. The changing determinateness of our self means our living consciousness is a constant following and interweaving of situations. Even thus all is still too much characterized according to the theory of nature. The connections are rather such that they develop from out of the basic structure of consciousness. For this structure, the concept of foundation, strongly utilized by Husserl, is an extraordinary step forward into the true connections. Situations can follow one another purely on the basis of the contents of consciousness and their imminent connections, or motivated by certain gradations and vivacities of the specific act characters. The situations are all the more purely immediate corresponding to the specific objectity objectitat, specifically more clear and certain, the earlier the respective experience attains an originary independent fulfillment of a moment of the stream of consciousness, a living, rooted being historical. Consciousness is historical always only in the fulfillment of the moment never in the mere reflection of the pure I. The pure I is the primordial constituting element, the form of the possibility of being affected and of being fulfilled at all. It is not a value of free matter, but also not a good value emphasized object. Primarily, it is the primordial form of openness for the valuable in general, and with that it is perpetually noble an absolute distinction in the course of the a priori of forms. Being able to posit oneself and having become from nowhere else are in no way its essence. Its own most primordial ground is at once and authentically a perpetual vocation and calling as absolute constituent of spirit and life in general. It, too, is of another, namely called by another, whether become so or however, is entirely secondary anima natura leader religiosa the soul is by nature religious. Having become from elsewhere is, therefore, no characterization of the eye as opposed to the consciousness of fulfilled moment. The pure eye is rather the possibility not logical, but vocational off the being historical of a fulfilled consciousness. Fulfillment and being fulfilled cannot, however, be interpreted phenomenologically as having become toward insane, not at all with regard to being sane's masig. That such exists at all belongs to the essence and to the possibility of living consciousness. Only in this way does the concept of intentionally gain its a priori interpretation as the primordial element of consciousness, and in it, any possible not having posited oneself so is first of all grounded. The Holy Preparations for The Review of Rudolf Otto, Das Heilige the Holy, 1917 Principal problems demand initially, if not solution, at least to be named and outlined. 1. Problem of historical consciousness Consciousness of personal existence and fulfilled originary sphere of life, 
and continuous reigning form of constitution therefrom in reference to the other imposing worlds. 2. Problem of the irrational. Cf. M. S. 44. The irrational is still considered as a counter projection judge and wherefore limit, but never observed in its originariness and own proper constitution from there always again the concession of some or other righteous people of reason and the critique of reason. 45 We have no true insight yet into living consciousness and its original worlds, which are entirely originary but still have a common, although many leveled in rootedness and the basic meaning of a genuinely personal existence. The imposition of the irrational onto the rational must be avoided and fought against. The religious world of experience does not need to secure its self-certainty in measuring itself against cultural lawfulnesses and ideas. In order to allow full insight into this, the phenomenon in principle of the self-sufficing of what originarily gives itself as certain must be set out and presented in its every marked out dominance of consciousness. Basic remarks about 1 and 2 The holy may not be made into a problem as theoretical also not an irrational theoretical nema, but rather as correlate of the act character of faith, which itself is to be interpreted only from out of the fundamentally essential experiential context of historical consciousness. That does not mean the explanation of the holy as a category of evaluation. Rather, what is primary and essential to it is the constitution of an originary objectivity. The noumen is the special element in the holy minus the ethical and rational moments. On what is the attachment of the latter to the holy grounded? And does this attachment belong somehow to the originary structure of the noumenus? In principle, a debate over category and form and their function is necessary. Distinguish between the pure holy and the constituted holy worlds and objects. Vindelbaum das Heilige 46 shows insight into almost the same fullness of religious phenomena, if, however, in strongly rational formulation, but he shows above all that the principle of the formulation of the problem in general is decisive and the division of the groups of problems and the methodological approaches are dependent upon that. On the Sermonis Bernardi and Conticum Conticorum Serm. 3. 1. Hodia Legimus in Libro Experienti. 47 Today, we read in the Book of Experience. Today we want to move apprehendingly descriptively in the field of personal experience. Turning back to one's own sphere of experience and paying attention to the manifestations of one's own consciousness. A strong, implicitly formulated consciousness of the exclusive, principal value and right of one's own religious experience. Religious longing for experience and giving effort toward the presence of Jesus is possible as genuine only as growing out of a basic experience. Such experience is not freely and deliberately at one's disposal in the observance of the rules of church law. Knowledge about these experiences and their essence arises only in actual having experienced. Such an experience is only truly effective in a closed complex of experience stream of experience not transferable, cannot be elicited, through description. Est fond signatus, qui non communicate alienus. 48 It is the signified source that another does not communicate. The constitution of the noetic religious experiential context is a historical one key bibit, ad hunc satiate who drinks, may be thirsty for this. The basic experience is therefore not only temporally primary this is perhaps not required for it at all, but primary in the sense of founding. Direction of sense and form of such founding are essentially historical, whereby the latter word should indicate not yet something final, but certainly self-enduring and primary. Thus we may not even link up with the founding relations of theoretical acts rather we must begin with primary origins which necessarily demands insight into the universal radicality of phenomenologically intuitive description and its lack of presuppositions but precisely because of this plainness of attitudinal form, it itself is the problem, to the phenomenologist, in the whole of the constitutions. Which 49 is the basic phenomenon in the total field of historical knowing and forming? How are the aim and meaning of its specific object constitution to be one? The constitutive elements of memory and their functional value in the objectification process of historical understanding. The originary constitution of the value characters and their function and meaning for the historical is connected to this. The moment of distinction, of precedence, of the increased, of the not at all purely theoretical, indifferently objective gigent stand like an end with that the noetic moment of originary relationality to the aforementioned noematic moments indicate a specific condition of religious primordial experiences. Imminent essential connections of gradation nolare pente fieri summus politime profi servolo. 50 I do not wish the highest thing to be made all of a sudden I wish to accomplish it little by little. Sicius placasium deum, si mensurum tuum servivaris, et alterior te non quijuris. 51 You do not reconcile him God if you have kept your measure, and have not searched for the other of you. The higher than you, the superior should not be pulled down toward oneself, nor rigidly in its manner be excluding, 
rather the experiential realities of the religious should grow continuously from out of him he should let the imminent connections take effect in him. The phenomenon of inner concentration and in its motivations and tendencies special phenomenon mystical silence, keeping silent, the problem of the relation to the I. Basic tendency of life more life. Already from out of this, the meditative meaning motivated activity nothing of the character of having become receptivity as originary activity of the religious world. Loneliness a phenomenon of the personal historical existence as such. Phenomenon of the constituting process of the presence of God is an originary one. The levels of prayer to be studied preliminarily concentration, meditation, prayer of calmness. Analysis, that is to say hermeneutics, works in the historical eye. Life as religious is already there. It is not as if a neutral material consciousness were being analyzed, but rather is to be detected in all the specific determination of meaning. Problem the intuitive eidetic is, as hermeneutical, never neutral theoretical rather it itself has the oscillations of the genuine life world only eidetically not eidetic. The stream of consciousness is already a religious one, at least in motivation and tendency. Thus for instance St. Teresa sees, as a mystic, phenomenologically, without seeing eidetically in the specifically religious eidetic. The soul is somehow the place for God and the godly cf. Eckhart, the place dies at, the dwelling place of God, primordial motivation. Can be judged as to its worth only according to that. Cf. Seelenberg Castle of the Soul 4, 6 Citation Entering into the Castle of the Soul. We bear in mind at least only seldom which great goods can be in this soul, or who dwells therein, or what value, what dignity it has. 52. Whoever does not believe such a thing such as the dwelling of God in the soul the religious and holy in general, he will also experience nothing of it for the Lord is very pleased if one does not posit for him a standard and a name in his works. 53. For that, which I want to present, is very difficult and dark, where no experience is there. 54. Demand always see the innermost and the whole of the castle, not the mere sequence and adjacency of room see totally and with understanding. 55. Afterward of the editors of the lecture course winter semester 1920-21. Martin Heidegger held the lecture course Introduction to the Phenomenology of Religion as a private lecturer in the winter semester 1920-1921 at the University of Freiburg. According to the schedule of courses, it was held Tuesdays and Fridays from noon to 1 o'clock. It began on October 29, 1920 The last class was held on February 25, 1921. This is what it says in the dating of the postscripts. The manuscript of the lecture course is lost. Even an announcement by the manager of the Nachlos and several wide circulating newspapers brought no hint of its location. Yet there are five sets of notations, which allow for the approximate reconstruction of the train of thought and articulation of the lecture course. Three of these notations Oscar Becker, Helene Weiss, Franz Joseph Brichter found in the German literary archives of Marbach II are kept in the Husserl archive of Leuven. From the total notations it is clear that Heidegger's lecture course falls into two distinctly differentiated parts, which are separated by a sejura at the end of the lecture on November 30, 1920. In Oscar Becker's notations, which employ a separate pagination for each of the two parts, the end of the first part is marked by the following sentence owing to uncalled for objection Zein van Unberufener, broken off on 30 November, 1920. A query addressed to the archive of the University of Freiburg could find no explanation of the sort of objections. Presumably through these Heidegger saw himself forced to proceed abruptly from the extensive methodological introduction to the phenomenological explication of concrete religious phenomena in Hashex 2014 thus the title of the second part of the lecture course according to Becker. Becker's quite legible notation probably derives from stenographical notes which were immediately transcribed after each lecture. Even if he at times significantly simplified Heidegger's sentences, and, as a rule, shortened them as well as providing his own structure, his notations can serve, in regard to the first part of the lecture course, as a foundation for the preparation of the text. Becker's notes on the first part of the lecture course are complete in the second part are missing the lectures given on December 10th, and those from the 10th to the 20th of February. The notations of Helene Weiss and Franz Joseph Brecht, dated throughout, are dependent upon one another for many long passages, and in others literally identical. In Helene Weiss's handwriting there are three different versions convolute the relatively legible, paginated text of notations itself additions to this text as well as a partial copy of Brecht's notes. Compared to Becker's notations there is here a sort of terminologically simplified, considerably shorter version of the lecture course. This is also true of the notes taken by Brecht, in which some paragraphs without doubt originate from other unidentifiable note-takers. 
To these sources, we can add the notations of Franz Neumann of the Husserl Archive of Leuven, which was available to the editors in a transcription of unknown handwriting. They were made readily available to us by Professor S. Eisling and Mr. S. Spilliers. The version contains only the first part of the lecture course, but it offers additional materials that were taken into account for the constitution of the text. The as yet untranscribed notations by Fritz Kaufmann in an old stenography, which are also in Leuven, could not be enlisted. The preparation of the text required, first of all, the complete transcription of the Marbach notations through the editors. The reconstruction of the train of thought, which was carried out on the basis of an ascertained chronology of the particular lectures, made it possible to bring the available text material into a coherent order. For the first part of the lecture course, Becker's notation served as the guiding text. The preparation of the second part was more complicated in that Becker's notations lose precision and are also incomplete. Thus, the appropriate passages had to be reconstructed out of the other sets of notes. Every statement that was not redundant was considered. In regard to authenticity, the text, prepared in this manner, cannot be compared to editions based on original manuscripts. The editors are aware of the problems regarding this sort of secondarily authentic constitution of texts. In addition to the notations, there are Heidegger's handwritten notes from the context of the lecture course. We are dealing with single pages in a folder found in the German Literary Archive of Marbach. The handwriting is microscopically small and extraordinarily difficult to decipher. Because the pages are immediately related to the work of the lecture course and, in the absence of the originally handwritten lecture, are the only remaining original documents pertaining to the lecture course, they are reproduced in the appendices. The punctuation has been updated carefully according to today's accepted rules. Titles originate from the editors in using Becker's table of contents as an orientation. The organization of sections and paragraphs was conducted likewise by the editors. In contrast to this, all the titles in the appendices are those of Heidegger himself. The wording of the various notations was in general maintained, but in integrating them into the body of the text they were occasionally modified with care. Square brackets in the quotations of the appendix indicate Heidegger's additions, while square brackets in footnotes indicate remarks of the editor. Instances of a missing passage are marked with ellipses and stars, and questionable interpretations are marked with question marks. Abbreviations were left alone if what they indicate was at all in doubt. The lecture course Introduction to the Phenomenology of Religion, held in the winter semester of 1920 in Hash X201321, is especially important for the understanding of Heidegger's early thought. Although there have been references to this lecture for decades in the scholarly literature, there reigned a general unclarity with regard to the available textual basis as well as the precise train of thought. The present edition should rectify this lack as much as possible. The position and status of the lecture course within Heidegger's oeuvre are determined by its object nowhere else has the uniqueness of the philosophical four-conception Vorgriff been established as decisively in contrast to the scientific method, or are religious questions taken up with such extension and exegetical exactitude. Heidegger combines a critique of contemporary philosophy of religion trilch with fundamental considerations of how factical life experience may be grasped in its historicity. The expansive discussion of the methodological fundamental concept of the formal indication constitutes the background against which the earliest witnesses to primordial Christianity undergo an intensive phenomenological analysis. In the framework of an enactment historical explication Heidegger interprets selected passages from the letter to the Galatians as well as both letters to the Thessalonians. Heidegger works out in this manner the basic determinations of primordial Christian religiosity out of the phenomenon of the Pauline Gospel. According to these determinations, we can recognize the enactmental character of factical life as such. Since 1918, Heidegger's closeness to Edmund Husserl, both personal and in terms of philosophical content, determines the fact that these analyzes stand under the sign of a phenomenology of religion. Husserl had entrusted the more specific working out of this phenomenology to his student, who, however, already worked on his own conception of phenomenology on the basis of the notion of factical life experience. In this way, the constant confrontation with the Christian tradition constitutes the background against which Heidegger will develop his hermeneutics of facticity. For the winter semester 1919 and hash X2013192 he had announced a lecture course on medieval mysticism which he did not then give cf. Part 3 of this volume. The lecture courses published here from winter semester 1920 and hash X2013-1 and from summer semester 1921 indicate the high point, and at the same time the end, of his studies in the phenomenology of religion. The editors thank the manager of Heidegger's Nachlass, Dr. Hermann Heidegger, for entrusting us with this edition of the lecture course.
It is also necessary to thank Professor Friedrich Wilhelm von Hermann and Dr. Heidegger for help with deciphering passages which were difficult to make out. We gratefully thank Dr. Hartmut Tietjen for countless instruction regarding formal and textual composition of the lecture course, for transcription of notes and sketches of the lecture's appendix that were very difficult to read and for reading through for corrections we thank you to Heidegger, Torsten Steiger, and Dr. Mark Michalski for their generous assistance in working out the corrections. Frankfurt, Maine, August 1995 Matthias Jung Thomas Regali Afterward of the editor of the lecture course Summer Semester 1921 and of the Outlines and Sketches 1918-19. The bibliographical main title of Volume 60 is taken from a school binder in which Heidegger had bound his 1918-19 studies of the Phenomenology of Religion. On the second page is found the original title Phenomenology of Religious Consciousness. Later the word consciousness is crossed out by Heidegger and replaced with the word life. This earlier title is also found in his letter of May 1, 1919. To Elizabeth Blockman my own work is very concentrated, basic and concrete basic problems of the phenomenological method, becoming free from the last shackles of acquired positions and hash x 2014 constant new progress toward the real origins, preparations for the phenomenology of religious consciousness and hash x 2014 firmly geared up for intensive, high quality academic effectiveness, constant learning in the company of Husserl Martin Heidegger Elizabeth Blockman. Letters 1918-1969, edited by Joachim W. Stork, Marbach on the Necker, 1989, p. 16. That Heidegger speaks of preparations in respect to his studies of the phenomenology of religion probably refers to the announcement of Heidegger's planned lecture course of winter semester 1919-1920, The Philosophical Foundations of Medieval Mysticism. But beyond that it seems to indicate in general a longer-standing project, for, Next to the basic problems, the phenomenology of religion is the only concrete problem that Heidegger seems to approach at this time. The original text of the summer semester 1921 three-hour lecture Augustine and Neoplatonism consists of 1900 pages in folio format. Along the left side Heidegger wrote the progressive text, on the right side he left room for notes, insertions, citations, supplements, as well as explanations of the translations. In the interpreting part of the lecture manuscript are found 15 to 20 in one page even 30 marginal notes per page many of them not only underneath one another, but also in outlined bundles next to each other, often again with further insertions and supplements, and, accordingly, most of the time with a loss of grammatical congruence. The high number of these associative notes probably has to be explained by reference to the oscillation between the progress of the interpretation and the deepening reading. Except with the insertions, the marginal notes are without clear reference to the continuous text. These references could be established only by attending to the relations of content and by considering the spatial nearness parallel lines, position of the text of the paragraphs Heidegger made. In order to make the differentiation between the text itself and the marginal notes clear to the reader, the notes were consistently rendered in round brackets and pushed to the end of the respective paragraph. Inside the round brackets, the single notes were separated by dashes. The order of the notes was again measured by the context of thought and the spatial nearness. In those cases in which additions and insertions afforded no integration into the text at all or impeded the interpretive flow, footnotes were introduced. If Heidegger himself used round brackets, these were in all cases changed to parentheses. Square brackets were used above all for Heidegger's explications inside citations in a few, easily recognizable cases they were used also for conjectures of the editor. The editor completed the punctuation which was often given only sparingly in the manuscript. Passages in the manuscript which could not be deciphered missing passages are marked in the text with square bracketed ellipses, and, in addition, the missing numbers of words or syllables are indicated in starred footnotes. Questionable readings are indicated with question marks in square brackets. For the transcription of the original handwritten manuscript, a copy by Dr. Hartmut Tietjen was available to me. Also helpful were the handwritten notations of Oscar Becker, Fritz Schock, and Karl Loeth. All of these writings were repeatedly collated. All titles were given by the editor. Most of the time they are phrases out of the interpreted text or prominent formulations in the lecture manuscript. Regarding appendix I some supplements indicated through cross-references that Heidegger must already have made a large number of sketches above all on the problem of tentatio. These were found in a collection that Heidegger apparently put together again in preparation for his seminar Augustine, Confessions 11 on Time WS 1930-31 because they represent a central theme of the lecture course and with reasonable certainty also belong to the preparations for the lecture, which the notations also make clear, they are presented in print in this volume.
All of these notes and sketches have been transcribed for the first time. The location for all of the employed citations was established the citation follows the addition of Migna. Regarding Appendix 2 since Heidegger went beyond his prepared text several times during the lecture course, I adopted a number of supplementary notes from Oscar Becker's extensive notations. For the overview of the phenomena there was, in the aforementioned fascicle, a scanty blueprint on a small piece of paper. It holds the same for all of these supplements as it does for the lecture course notations and sketches for all citations, the source locations had to be established. On the third part of the volume the already mentioned fascicle, Phenomenology of Religious Life, consists of 22 sheets. For the transcription I had available a copy, probably from Fritz Heidegger. The sheets begin with the first notes on the never-held lecture course The Philosophical Foundations of Medieval Mysticism. Heidegger had announced such a lecture course for winter semester 1919-1920. The manuscript that was left behind makes it known that he began working it out on August 10, 1919, and on August 14 attempted a continuation and then broke it off. On August 30, 1919, Heidegger requested from the Department of Liberal Arts a change in the lecture course in setting up the plans, the undersigned had counted on a longer autumn break. In the current conditions, however, a working through of the material alone that meets stringent demands for the announced lecture course The Philosophical Foundations of Medieval Mysticism is impossible. The undersigned requests therefore permission, instead of the aforementioned lecture course, to change the lecture course otherwise announced as a one-hour course on selected problems of pure phenomenology into a two-hour course under the title Fundamental Problems of Phenomenology. Tuesdays and Fridays from 4 to 5 o'clock for beginners with additional colloquium Tuesday from 6 to 730. University Archive of Freiburg, Documents on Philosophical Seminars, Call No. B13348. The non-chronological ordering of the sheets, which in this printing is maintained, may be understood in that the further notes have been assigned to the planned lecture course. Work on mysticism had indeed already been announced in the concluding chapter of the Habilitation Schrift. In regard to the study of the absolute inspired by a philosophy of religion fragment by Adolf Reinach, it is to be mentioned that Heidegger cited the manuscript of this fragment. It is possible that the manuscript was made accessible to Heidegger by Husserl. The manuscript was partly published in 1921 in the introduction to the collected works of Reinach by Hedwig Conrad Martius. A complete verification of the citations was first made possible through the critical edition by Carl Schumann. The phenomenological interpretation of the three tenationes is the focus of the interpretation of the tenth book of the Confessions. Heidegger worked out here what he would later carry out in Sein und Zeit being in time as the existential analytic of fallenness. Discussion of the falling of a purely self-worldly directed significance into the surrounding worldly significance, and, within it, in the faded strata of the mostly secondarily carried along Phenomenologie der Anschauung und Deostrux Phenomenology of Intuition and Expression, read by author. GA Volume 59, p. 84 cf. p. 37 is already found in the lecture course of summer semester 1920. But this falling remains comparatively external as opposed to the inner temptation of life itself and thus does not yet reach the full phenomenon of fallenness. The question of historical development of Heidegger's intentions regarding a phenomenological interpretation of Tentatio in Augustine leads back to the lecture course from winter semester 1919 to 1920, in which Heidegger once briefly mentions that Christianity is the deepest historical paradigm for a particular possibility of factical life, namely for transposing the principal points of factical life and of the life world in the self world and in the world of inner experience Grundproblem der Phenomenologie Basic Problems of Phenomenology. Red. By Hans Helmut Gander George of Volume 58, p. X and a little later Heidegger continues, only to these newly emerging basic motives of a new position of the self-world is it comprehensible why we encounter in Augustine something like his Confessions and City of God. Creedy, ad intelligence of faith, so that you understand live yourself vivaciously and knowledge is first erected on the basis of this experience, your last and fullest experience of self. Augustine saw in an quietum cor nostrum our unsettled heart the great unstoppable distress of life Ibid, p. 62. That Heidegger in no way gave up his interest in Augustine after turning to Aristotle a seminar and de anima in the same semester and the lecture courses in the following semesters is occasionally asserted, is shown by a remark from the first Marburg lecture winter semester 1923-24. The latter shows that to him all of these problems which he already indicated in this lecture course on Augustine for instance the ambiguous tendency of Augustine toward axiologization still occupied him, and indeed as much in the material problematic as in regard to their historical effects it also clear that justice fell to verum the true and certum the certain, 
that has undergone up to the present a process of decay fair fall, to the point where it becomes determined as value. I will draw out the most important points about these connections in the Augustine lecture course, and indeed in the analysis of the Augustinian concepts of summum bonum, fides, timor castus, gaudium, peccatum, delectatio the highest good, faith, chaste fear, joy, sin, delight. In Augustine are centered various possibilities of the kind whose efficacy extends to the Middle Ages and modernity. Einforung and die phenomenologische Forschung Introduction to Phenomenological Research Ed. by F. W. von Hermann Georgia Vol. 17, p. x. During the work on this edition, I have often remembered the maxim of Hotho, editor of Hegel's Aesthetic. It had been his endeavor, he says in the preface, to give the lectures a bookly character and context. In order to achieve this goal, much support was needed. I am very grateful to Dr. Hermann Heidegger, who worked on especially stubborn problems of deciphering, which only he was able to solve. Likewise, I thank Professor Dr. Friedrich Wilhelm von Hermann for his additional collation of the extended supplemental material, and that means as well gratitude for many improvements. The same goes for Dr. Hartmut Tijen, who looked through the proofs at various stages, and to whom fell the task of final editor of the entire volume, a task that includes considering everything together. I am also thankful to Mrs. Uta Heidegger for her collaboration with the Reading for Corrections, as well as Dr. Mark Michalski, who double-checked all Latin and Greek citations. And finally a special thanks goes to Dr. Andreas Priesner and Mr. Georg Scherer for their all-encompassing assistance that was never restricted to the letter. Cologne, August 1995 Claudius, 